Ever the story will take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Macedo today on ABC News Live. First, former President Trump is set to appear in a New York court this morning. Here's a live look at Trump Tower, where he's expected to leave in just a few minutes for his civil fraud trial set to begin at 10 a.m. Eastern. He'll be facing the judge who already ruled that Trump inflated his net worth by as much as $2.2 billion. Now the former president is at risk of losing control of part of his business and some of his buildings. This morning at 9.15 Eastern, New York Attorney General Letitia James will hold a press conference. We'll take that as it happens, plus team coverage all morning. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy is in danger of losing his job after striking a deal with Democrats to avoid a government shutdown. Florida Republican Matt Gates is threatening to introduce a motion that would allow House members to oust McCarthy from the speakership with a majority vote. McCarthy says he's determined to keep his gavel. And we now know who will fill late Senator Dianne Feinstein's Senate seat. Governor Gavin Newsom has named LaFonza Butler to represent California. She's the leader of EMILY's List, an organization that supports female candidates who favor abortion rights. She also served as a Democratic strategist and advisor to Kamala Harris during the 2020 presidential campaign. Butler could be sworn in as early as Tuesday night. Feinstein will lie in state at San Francisco City Hall Wednesday before her funeral service on Thursday. And the trailer saga is growing. Taylor Swift was at the Chiefs-Jets game last night with some famous friends. Blake Lively, Ryan Reynolds, Sophie Turner, and Hugh Jackman were all spotted in a suite at MetLife Stadium last night. The normally private celeb has been coming to see her rumored boyfriend, Travis Kelsey, and all the gossip seems to be good business for the NFL. USA Today reports her anticipated appearance at last night's game triggered a nearly 20% increase in ticket sales. But first, we're following breaking news today. Former President Trump is expected to appear in court in New York for opening statements in the civil fraud trial against him. The trial comes after the judge ruled that Trump committed fraud by repeatedly inflating the value of some of his properties, exaggerating his net worth by more than $2 billion. Now the trial will decide what additional penalties he could face with prosecutors asking for a fine of $250 million. Senior investigative reporter Aaron Katursky has the latest. Donald Trump begins a civil trial that puts him at risk of losing control of the business that propelled him to the White House. New York Attorney General Letitia James sued Trump, his adult sons, Don Jr. and Eric, and their family real estate firm for persistent and repeated business fraud that grossly inflated how wealthy Trump really is. Donald Trump engaged in years of illegal conduct to inflate his net worth, to achieve, to deceive banks and the people of the great state of New York. The investigation began more than four years ago after Trump's former lawyer, Michael Cohen, told Congress Trump lied about the value of his properties. It was my experience that Mr. Trump inflated his total assets when it served his purposes. The judge has already decided the core of the case, finding clear, indisputable documentary evidence Trump inflated his net worth by as much as $2.2 billion to win more favorable terms on loans and insurance. Trump has denied it, calling the judge deranged and telling a campaign rally in Iowa. It's happening for a single reason, because I'm the only candidate they do not want to run against. But the judge's ruling said Trump was living in a fantasy world, and it's already threatening to wrest from Trump's control some of his prized assets, including his signature skyscraper, Trump Tower on Fifth Avenue, where he rode the golden escalator to announce his first run for president. The stakes here are enormous for former President Trump because if he is barred from doing business in New York and he is required to sell off all of his New York real estate portfolio, it could cost him hundreds of millions of dollars and severely damage not only the Trump brand, but also the value of his business. The trial will help the judge determine how much Trump has to pay in penalties. The state has asked for $250 million. And let's bring in senior investigative reporter Aaron Kaczorski outside court in New York and ABC News legal contributor Brian Buckmeyer for more on this. Aaron, this is an interesting case because the judge has already ruled that Trump committed fraud. So what will this trial be looking at? What's at stake now? 
there are still several causes of action that the attorney general's office is seeking to prove Diane as it tries to enlarge the financial penalty that Trump is ultimately going to have to pay. And that's going to be up for the judge to decide. It's a bench trial. There's no jury here. And so the attorney general is going to try and convince the judge that Trump should pay as much as $250 million in penalties for what she has called years of persistent fraud. Brian, why do it this way? Why would the court make a summary judgment this big before the trial even starts? Yeah, so the parties had filed motions asking for certain claims to be dismissed or to continue to trial. This is the judge going through the due process of saying, hey, there are no disputed facts here. Trump and other associates have already sat down for depositions, and this is what we see. He, the judge being, said, I see the fraud. I see the inflation. But for these issues, like whether or not the bank insurers were defrauded or whether or not there were falsified documents, were there factual dis disputes, that's going to be at the forefront of this trial. One of the questions at play uh, in, in the original ruling is Trump's licenses, his ability to do business in New York. What can happen now with that? Yeah. So right now, as it stands, the judge has already made a decision as to that, that his license to do business in, the set, in a set amount of ways through his companies, either through partnerships through the other named defendants, those being his adult male sons, and also where he is not using his name. But we know he uses his name for the most part, so it's, it's partnerships for the most part. Those licenses are suspended. Now, there's potentially going to be an appeal down the road, but he could lay the groundwork for arguments here in this court for the judge to reverse, highly unlikely, or groundwork for potential appeals down the road. This is just the beginning, not the end of his fight and probably a lot of his troubles. And I know his attorney has said he does plan to appeal that decision already. Uh, Aaron, New York Attorney General Letitia James is expected to hold a news conference shortly. What are you watching for there? She's going to arrive here any moment now, Diane, make a brief statement to, to cameras before she walks up the steps of this courthouse and, and sits in on opening statements uh, very much the way former President Trump is expected to. Uh, he's due to arrive here shortly as well. There are metal fences up, just a handful of protesters penned in a, across the street. In a statement already this morning, the attorney general has said that Trump's net worth was the result of fraud. That's what the judge has already found. And she is seeking to hold him accountable because she said no one, be it the former president or anybody else, is above the law. So, Aaron, what can we expect to hear from prosecutors in opening statements today? So the, the state attorneys uh, who are going to be delivering the opening statements, probably Kevin Wallace, who's the deputy chief counsel for the attorney general's office, he's going to try and, and, and lay out a case that in some ways, because of the judge's ruling, has already been well established. That for years, the former president, his eldest sons, some of the, the executives at the Trump organization, all worked together to provide fraudulent financial statements of Trump's net worth. And, and they're going to list individual properties. So Mar-a-Lago, the former president's estate in Palm Beach, Trump said it was worth $600 million. The assessed value in Florida is $27 million. Trump's apartment in, on Fifth Avenue in Trump Tower is 11,000 square feet. When Trump went to value it, he tripled the square footage and just out of the blue said it was 30,000 square feet. I don't, I'm not sure there's an apartment that big anywhere in New York City. And, and the, the attorney general's office is going to say that these kinds of uh, random valuations were part and parcel of how the Trump organization did business. Uh, Brian, in the partial summary judgment, the judge wrote in that ruling, the defenses Trump uh, attempts to articulate in his sworn deposition are wholly without basis in law or fact. With that foundation, how do Trump's lawyers now try to mount a defense for this stage of the trial? I mean, that's the $2.2 billion question, because... <clears throat> Whether you're talking about, hey, this is just business. We inflate numbers so that we can get a competitive edge. Whether it's, uh, we use these numbers for tax purposes to get a better tax break, and we're only off by about a couple thousand dollars. Or this worthless clause argument that the judge, in fact, used in his ruling, the, Trump's own words, to say, this is not how this clause is used. This is not how the law works. Or even Trump's very infamous argument of, Everyone does this. We're, we're just one of the many businesses in New York that does this. As the judge says, those are not arguments that are based in the law, and so there's going to have to be some sort of new creative argument here, either that there's a lack of intent or a lack of knowledge, but Trump sitting down for a deposition and potentially Trump even testifying in this trial might hinder his arguments for defense. 
So, Aaron, uh, former President Trump, he doesn't actually have to, there's no role for him to speak today. So why come at all? It's an interesting question, and while you can't get into the former president's head, there may be a couple of reasons. Uh, you know, he's tried to minimize the stakes of this trial. He said, called it a witch hunt. He says the judge is deranged, the attorney general is racist. But at bottom, this trial is threatening to take away control of the business that catapulted him to the White House. And so just the, the fact that he's making it a point to attend today may reveal the, the seriousness with which he is taking the potential consequences here in a civil case brought by E. Jean Carroll, uh, just in a different courthouse down the block. Trump declined to attend, and the judge knocked him for that. I said, you know, he didn't even bother to show up. A and so it may be worth it to try and do what he can to, to sway the judge to attend. Now, he's going to have to come back here to testify. He is scheduled to be one of the last witnesses for the state. Uh, that's going to be perhaps weeks from now. All right, Brian Buckmeyer, Aaron Kaczorski, thank you both. And we will have more coverage of Trump's hearing right after the break as we wait for the former president to leave Trump Tower, which is expected to happen in just minutes. Also at 9.15 Eastern, New York Attorney General Letitia James is expected to hold a press conference ahead of the hearing. We will take that live right after this short break. Whenever news breaks. To crush the families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland, reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi, Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City, getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime, we'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights, wherever you stream your news, only on ABC News Live. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me.
Welcome back to ABC News Live. First, we are following breaking news. Former President Trump is expected to appear in court in New York for opening statements in the civil fraud trial against him. That trial comes after the judge ruled that Trump committed fraud by repeatedly inflating the value of some of his properties, exaggerating his net worth by more than $2 billion. Now the trial will decide what additional penalties he could face with prosecutors asking for a fine of $250 million. I want to bring in senior investigative reporter Aaron Katursky outside the court in New York and ABC News legal contributor Brian Buckmeyer for more on this. Aaron, the judge already ruled that Trump committed fraud here. Part of that penalty was uh, he revoked Trump's business licenses in the state. So what happens with that now? Well, it's actually not entirely clear, Diane. In fact, Trump's attorneys and the attorney general's office both asked the judge for some clarity about what it means to dissolve all of his business certificates, how quickly that has to happen. Uh, the judge wants them to find an independent monitor to try and start to dissolve the former president's business certificates, take receivership of them, and then I guess sell off the assets. But how that process works, when it has to happen, isn't entirely clear, but it does threaten Trump's control of at least three properties here in New York. A building on 40 Wall Street, a compound in Westchester County called Seven Springs, north of the city, and then Trump's signature skyscraper, Trump Tower, where, where he lives, where he keeps an apartment, where he rode that golden escalator when he first announced his candidacy for the White House. And that's the, the property that really signaled Trump's entry into the world of Manhattan real estate. The, the Apprentice was, was filmed there. So, so that could be the, the biggest blow uh, to, to Trump, maybe psychologically, in addition to financially. Brian, what does the judge have to consider for this stage in the trial? So this stage is a number of things. We're looking at, one, the disgorgement, so it's a fancy way of saying the taking of Donald Trump's money based on illegal gains. They're saying that you fraudulently made all of these re uh, representations, that your property was X amount of square feet, was X amount of dollars. Now the question is, how much did they gain from that and how much should they take away uh, in order to satisfy um, the claims here. It's also an issue of accounting. Uh, uh, Brian, sorry, I'm going to interrupt you for one second just to point out that it looks like former President Trump just left. We just saw him getting in the car there, so we'll be following as he now heads to the courthouse. But uh, Brian, continue, please. So it's, it's a lot of accounting. It's a lot of numbers which attorneys don't like, but the judge is gonna really going to focus on. Again, it's a judge trial, not a jury trial. Uh, but it also comes down to a few other allegations as to falsifying business records and also what lies they gave to the to the bankers and the insurers. And uh, I want to bring in our editorial producer, John Santucci, for a little bit more color on this. John, how big are the stakes here for the former president? It, it, it's Donald Trump being put out of business in New York. Donald Trump, who wanted to make it in New York City, wanted to reimagine the New York City skyline. The ruling that came down just a couple days ago pretty much foreshadowed where this judge's head is already at, is that Donald Trump committed fraud, and Donald Trump should be out of business in New York. And if this ruling that has already happened is upheld and he is found guilty in these proceedings, if they lose on appeal, Diane, it means Trump Tower, uh, the Trump Hotel that's right near Central Park, any other properties that are connected to the former president and his family in the state of New York have to be sold and no longer can have the Trump name on them. So quite frankly, it's a death blow to everything that had Donald Trump has built as this image, his brand. It would all quite literally be taken away from him almost instantaneously. And we're watching there as former President Trump leaves Trump Tower. He's now headed to the courthouse where he will face the judge in his civil fraud suit. The judge has already decided one of the core issues at hand, ruling that Donald Trump did commit fraud. And now this part of the case uh, will decide primarily the penalties, what other penalties Trump will face here. Now, Aaron Katursky is outside the courthouse. And Aaron, former President Trump, is attacking the judge on social media, saying he should resign and be sanctioned for what Trump is calling abuse of power. Could those comments affect this case? In all likelihood, they, they won't. The judge is, is making rulings for partial summary judgment despite the former president's criticisms of him. He has already called Judge Arthur and Gorin deranged, called for his resignation, says he doesn't get it. Because in, in Trump's telling, Diane, he can value things and see the value in things the way nobody else can. That's part of the reason why he believed that his estate in Palm Beach, Mar-a-Lago, was worth $600 million because he saw the, the development potential. 
The judge said, well, it was assessed at 27 million and the state of Florida has put a bunch of restrictions on what you can actually develop on the property. So Trump was was way off. But, but Trump has said, and he said in a, in a deposition for this case, that he has the Mona Lisa's of properties, that there's no way to really value his portfolio because it's simply priceless. And the judge clearly has a, has a difference of opinion, says there are hard numbers attached to these properties, and that's what he should have been following and didn't. Brian, these comments saying things like the judge is, you know, guilty of abuse of power here. Could this be a legal strategy, trying to lay the groundwork for an appeal? No. Um, I don't think anything that Donald Trump says on Twitter or social media or wherever he is is, is a legal strategy. If anything, I think his, his attorneys are feverishly hoping that he puts his... I don't know they're not Twitter anymore, but puts his Twitter fingers away and stops doing this. Um, this is a bench trial. You literally have one person deciding both the law and the facts, and Donald Trump has made a number of attacks on him as well as the attorney general. I don't think this helps in any way, shape, or form when this person's gonna be doing the calculations of this is how much his property actually is valued at, and this is how much you lied, and this is how much I'm taking away from you. John, he doesn't have to be there today in person. There's no speaking role for him, so why show up? Uh, he's a little bored, quite literally. No, I'm kidding. No, he he is using this as a political weapon, right? He wants to show that he's there, the strong man approach. You saw that image of him. I think we were on the air together, Diane, when he walked into Fulton County da Jail down in Georgia. He wants to be there, frankly, to put it somewhere for the campaign ads, a T-shirt, a hat. It doesn't matter to say, I was in the courtroom staring them down. I'm standing in their way. They want to come from you. This is all not too surprising. This is Donald Donald Trump's campaign shtick. He's been doing it for the last several months. He believes that is the fuel to keep his campaign going. And look, you got to say one thing, which they come out and say, and then the FEC reports confirm. Every time Donald Trump has been indicted, it is a boon to fundraising. It is good for polling for him. So if you're Donald Trump, and we know he watches the polling better than anybody, he sees that and says, huh, you know, I need a little boost. Let's go to court. Now, Aaron, prosecutors, despite he may not have a speaking role today, but prosecutors do say they plan to call Trump as a witness in this case. What do they want to hear from him, and does he have to testify? He will have to testify, assuming he is called, and according to the government's witness list, uh, he is going to be called as the, the last or the second to last witness, along with other members of the Trump family, including Donald Trump Jr., Eric Trump, Ivanka Trump. So this case really puts the entire family effectively on trial. Uh, and for, from the former president, I think they're going to want to question him about how he came to the valuations that he did and, and why. Because to hear Michael Cohen, his former lawyer, tell it, and, and his testimony to Congress started the entire investigation almost five years ago, uh, Trump would simply adjust the values of his properties to get better terms on loans or insurance. And the attorney general says that's just not the way you're supposed to operate. So I think they want to hear some of that from the former president's mouth. And they can also follow up on questions they ask in a deposition. How do you come to these valuations? Because the former president says, you know, my properties are priceless uh, when that may not necessarily be the case. And we're awaiting a press conference from Attorney General Letitia James. That's the scene you're seeing outside the courthouse right now. She's expected to speak before the hearing. Uh, but, Aaron, if you can, set the scene for us, because we were showing a shot just a little while ago of people outside the courthouse holding up signs. What's it like there right now? It, it's it's quiet. I mean, it's crowded, and they've had to make all sorts of adjustments to the security posture to accommodate the former president as a Secret Service protectee. So there's metal barricades up all the all over the place. There are protesters who are kept in a pen across the street. Uh, frankly, many of them, Diane, show up anywhere. Uh, the former president's case is on for court action, whether he's here or or not. But they were chanting earlier in the street that Trump lies all the time. Uh, there are also counter protesters. Who, who are here, uh, who are supporters of the former president and believe, like he has said, that he's getting a raw deal here. Uh, but any moment the former president should show up, go up into court on the third floor, take his seat at the defense table with his attorneys who are already inside. Brian, is it a risk for prosecutors to call him as a witness? 
From his depositions in the past, when I believe he pled the fifth through most of one and then in the other, uh, the judge actually shows that he understands, for example, the worthless clause, uh, seems to know that it manipulates and can be manipulated in one way, shape or form, but is doing it in the wrong way. I think it's a good move for them to get him on the stand. He's almost more focused on the court of public opinion than the court of law. And so I think in that aspect, the attorney general is saying, go for it. And this is a lot different than in a criminal case where you cannot call the opposing side because they can invoke the Fifth Amendment. Yeah, he can invoke the Fifth Amendment, but the difference being, in a criminal case, you can't hold it against him. In a civil case, especially with a judge trial, you can. John, you were nodding in agreement. Well, because I think if you read uh, th that transcript, the second one, the first one he does Fifth Amendment, you're right. Second one, we actually give some answers. Some of those answers are really damning. He basically says he made up some of the evaluations out of thin air. Says that uh, you know these are just iconic names and brands. Like there's no defense to it. Nothing is rooted in fact. So I think Donald Trump up on a stand getting peppered and peppered and peppered. Donald Trump also is his own worst enemy, let's be clear, right? Most times when he is out speaking and there is nobody that can grab him to stop him, he's going to say something he shouldn't. And when you're on a stand, you're nodding with me too, Brian. If you're on a stand, it's not like his lawyers are gonna run up there and say, boss, shut up. That's not going to happen. He's probably gonna put his own foot in his mouth. So, Brian, why is this a, a civil trial and not a criminal one? So civil and criminal have different things, such as statute of limitations, as well as elements of the crime, the, the level of knowledge. But on top of that, different standards. If you recall, criminal case, proof beyond, uh, proof beyond a reasonable doubt, right? Civil, preponderance of the evidence. It's like a 51%. So it's a lower standard, and the connective tissue that Trump and the other defendants have to have towards the fraud, fraud can be a little bit more attenuated than in a criminal case. This might just be the crescendo leading up to the climax. We've already seen Weisselberg and other cases, and other criminal cases with the Trump organization leading up to this. Could there be criminal case charges in the future? I don't think so, but I think this is just a, a movement from the other cases leading to this case here. And just to update our, our viewers, maybe some of you just joining us, what we're watching right now is former President Trump heading from Midtown Manhattan to downtown Manhattan, where he is facing a civil fraud trial today. The judge uh, has already ruled part of this case, ruling that Donald Trump did commit fraud and exaggerate his net worth. And this is the Attorney General Letitia James about to speak before the hearing. Let's listen. Last week, we proved that in our motion for summary judgment. Today, uh, we will prove our other claims. My message is simple. No matter how powerful you are, no matter how much money you think you may have, no one is above the law. And it is my responsibility and my duty and my job to enforce it. The law is both powerful and fragile. And today in court, we will prove our case. I thank you all for being here and again, Justice will prevail. Thank you. And again, that was Attorney General Letitia James speaking very briefly before today's civil trial against uh, former President Trump for fraud. Former President Trump is currently on his way to the courthouse. He will be appearing there in person. John, what do you make of her comments? I feel she chose her words carefully there, saying no matter how much money you may mm -hmm. think you have, she, no one is above the law. That felt like a, 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 a little chosen dig, statement. A little dig. I mean, you know, I think there's one thing everyone knows, which is there's the way to get under Donald Trump, which is to pierce his ego. And, you know, Donald Trump has often said on the campaign trail, I'm really rich. I have some of the greatest assets. I have all of this. And others that have known Donald Trump in New York, uh, Forbes magazine, for example, has been a constant thorn in Donald Trump's side where they've questioned his wealth. Tisha James knew exactly what she was doing right there, just to egg him. And you know Donald Trump is in that motorcade. He's getting a briefing of what she just said. It's basically, you know, opposition players, right? You're heading into a game. You want to psych the other side out. She knew what she was doing heading into that moment. But I think also Donald Trump is very interesting when it comes to Letitia James because in that first deposition, the one where he, he said the Fifth Amendment over and over again, he was telling uh, folks afterwards, you know, I really like her. There's something about her I like. You know, I, I, I feel like we get each other. We, we, we connect. We're both New Yorkers. And then the questioning happened, and I'm told it all went south from there. But it does talk to the way Donald Trump tried to charm, tried to be a friend, tried to woo. Donald Trump's given up at this point. He knows what New York State is going to try to do to him now. Aaron, what does the attorney general need to lay out at this point in the case? 
Well, at this point, it's only a matter of proving some uh, technicalities on the part of the uh, financial statements. The judge has already ruled that the paperwork the former president turned in was, was fraudulent. That's the core of the case. Now she simply needs to show how it was transmitted to banks and to insurance companies. She doesn't even need to prove that it was material. In other words, that the banks and insurance companies even relied on those financial statements when they were dealing with Donald Trump. She just needs to prove that he sent the fraudulent documents uh, and that he got the loans or the insurance that, that he was seeking on bad terms and that's all going to speak to how much the former president is going to have to pay in penalties but I think it's noteworthy Diane that Letitia James uh, along with Fonnie Willis in Fulton County Georgia and E. Jean Carroll are the three people who have sought and and actually succeeded in some respects to holding former President Trump to account Tish James gets the, the partial summary judgment. There's already a guilty plea in the Fulton County criminal case. E. Jean Carroll won her defamation and battery civil case against former President Trump and is owed, the judge said, uh, $5 million. So it, it's three women uh, who have sought and who are now holding the former president to account, and there are still the special counsel cases and the Manhattan DA case uh, yet to come. And right now we are watching former President Trump's motorcade heading downtown to the courthouse to that civil fraud trial where he will face the judge in person. I want to bring in our ABC News Deputy Political Director Avery Harper uh, into the conversation as well. Avery, as John just pointed out, every time Donald Trump has been indicted, they've seen a boost in polls, they've seen a boost in fundraising. It's not been a bad thing in terms of the politics for him so far. He's tried to argue in this case, among other arguments, that he's such a master businessman that he can see value in properties that other people can't. That was part of the explanation from him and his legal team about why they're accused of overvaluing these properties and exaggerating his net worth. That didn't fly with the judge who ruled against him on that. But can it fly politically for him? Right. I, I think what makes this case a little bit different than the other uh, indictments that we saw over the summer is that it really cuts at the core of uh, former President Trump's identity, his perceived wealth. It's what made him relevant before he became uh, the president of the United States. And uh, what we've seen is that uh, this has been a boon to his campaign, these uh, legal troubles with his supporters. He's been able to argue uh, that this is political persecution, uh, that this is uh, so-called uh, election interference from his vantage. Uh, and there are support who have bought into that. And this is going to be a further boon to his ability to say, well, listen, uh, they are coming at my livelihood, and you could be next. Uh, and, and so that there are many supporters out there who are going to buy that argument. Uh, and, and this is coming at a really interesting time in the campaign. There's been a sort of a lull in the action uh, from those indictments over the summer. And, and so this could be an effort to revive those attempts, to uh, galvanize voters, galvanize his supporters around these legal troubles. And, and we're also seeing that many of the folks who are in this GOP primary field, they are not taking the opportunity to attack him uh, on any of these legal troubles, with the exception of, of uh, former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie. And it looks like they are getting close to that courthouse now. Again, we're following former President Trump's motorcade heading to the courthouse. Aaron Katursky is there outside the courthouse. Aaron, the judge has already ordered the cancellation of the Trump Organization's business certificates. So what sort of impact is that having so far, and what other penalties could he face here? The, the impact so far has been a little bit of chaos because both former President Trump's attorneys, even the attorney general's office, uh, asked the judge for some clarity about what his ruling exactly entails. And it seems that within the next couple of weeks, both sides have to agree on an independent monitor to take control of Trump's properties with a goal towards selling them off. But, but nothing is set in stone as of yet. And the judge has said that uh, all will become clear as the trial goes on. But, but the civil case is really starting under this cloud of uncertainty. And, and for the former president and his children who control the business, there's a real question as to whether they are going to have control of all the properties that they did when this trial started. Uh, Diane, I can see the president's motorcade now arriving here at the courthouse, which is known by its address in Lower Manhattan, 60 Center Street. Uh, 
former president has just walked inside using an entrance that's normally reserved for the judges. Members of the Secret Service remain outside, shaking hands now with some of the court officers. This courthouse is uh, known to many uh, primetime TV watchers as the Law and Order Courthouse because that's where uh, many of the famous scenes are shot as uh, attorneys and defendants and uh, and the like walk up the giant staircase. Former president using a separate side entrance this morning uh, as he goes in to observe the opening statements in his civil trial, which should begin uh, about 20 minutes from now. Diane. And, and Aaron, we watched uh, as former President Trump walked into the courthouse, walked into that side door, walking pretty slowly, pretty casually, not a whole lot of fanfare around him. Uh, obviously, that was the point of walking into that private entrance, normally just reserved for judges. Now what we're seeing upstairs is a bunch of photographers and security clearly awaiting the former president to walk through that hallway, uh, presumably on his way to the courtroom. What's the scene like there right now, Aaron? So inside uh, the courtroom on the third floor, they've, uh, they've made some accommodation in the hallway for uh, photographers to take pictures of the former president as he walks in. Uh, this is customary. It, it's often the case that, that pictures are allowed in the hallway. Ordinarily, though, uh, not in, in the courtroom itself. In this particular case, the judge has granted a request by news organizations, including ABC News, for still photographers to be allowed to take some, some uh, images as the, the trial gets underway, and then in all likelihood they may be asked to, to leave. But uh, everything is occurring in the, the rest of the courthouse as normal. Just a short while ago, we've seen, and you can still see, uh, some attorneys entering for, uh, for, for other court cases. There was a whole pool of potential jurors that, that are going to be coming into this courthouse to sit, see if they are going to get put on a case, uh, because this is the main courthouse in, in Lower Manhattan where, where civil cases are, are hurt. So uh, court is functioning normally, even though it's hardly a normal day with the arrival of the former president, Diane. John, are you surprised at all, given he chose to show up today, he doesn't have to be in court today, that he chose to show up but also chose to go in through a side entrance like that? No, I mean, well, that's security, right? I mean, he, he definitely has said many times in all of the proceedings we've seen over the summer uh, that he wanted to go through the front door. A Secret Service jumped in and said, yeah, no, we can't do that for a whole host of reasons. So he knows that. That's Trump's team coming in right now. It's Dan Scabino, Eric Trump right there one of the president's eldest sons. And that's, uh, I see his lawyers there, Diane, uh, Alina Haba, Chris Kyes, and that's most of his campaign staff. So that's Alan Garten. He is the chief counsel to the Trump organization. And we have to remember that this is a case, Diane, that not only defendant Donald Trump, but also defendant the Trump organization. Mm. So it makes sense to see them there. I would imagine, based on that being the team that went with Trump, that it should be any second we see the former president around the corner and knowing him, he definitely wanted to do that walk alone. How much is at stake for the president, given this isn't just about the money, it's also about his ability to do business in New York? It, you know, there's a famous uh, image in our vault here at ABC. It's Barbara Walters flying with Donald Trump over the New York City skyline. And Barbara says to him, uh, what do you see? What do you want to change? And he talks about how he wouldn't change things, but would just add little touches to the New York City skyline. Donald Trump always wanted to be a fixture in Manhattan. He wanted to be on Fifth Avenue. You have to remember, too, though he is a New Yorker, his family, until he did, it uh, lived predominantly in Queens and Brooklyn. They never had any Trump organization or Trump family business on the island of Manhattan. So for Donald Trump to think that his name could be coming off, as he says, the most iconic block in the world being Fifth Avenue, that will burn Donald Trump beyond belief. And again, we saw former President Trump walk into the courthouse just a few moments ago. Part of his team and his son have already walked through the hallway into the courthouse. And now we're waiting to see the former president himself. You can see photographers there lined up. The judge has made some special accommodations for them to be there uh, today as he comes through the hallway. But former President Trump will face that judge who has already ruled against him in part of this ruling. That judge found that Donald Trump did commit fraud, saying he inflated his net worth by more than $2 billion. Now, this phase of the trial will decide penalties. The judge has already uh, revoked his licenses to do business in New York. Clarity on that is still a bit in question. Both sides have asked for more on how that will work, what exactly that means. And this was just moments ago where you can see former President Trump slowly making his way 
into the door of the courthouse. That's an entrance normally reserved for judges, but clearly a security measure there for the president to make it inside the courthouse with no issue. And again, we've already seen part of his legal team come through, his son come through as well, and now we're waiting to hear from the former president or to see the former president himself come through the hallway to go inside that courtroom. The trial is set to start at 10 a.m. Brian, this is a case that will be decided by a judge, not a jury. How does that change the strategy for both sides? Well, first and foremost, remember whose decision that is. It's the defense who has that opportunity to say, I want to do a judge trial, or we call it a bench trial, or a jury trial. Typically, in broad strokes, a jury trial, as a defense, you usually want to have issues of fact before a jury because it's hard at times for 12 people to all decide on one issue. You can find some form of doubt or a preponderance of doubt if you're a defense attorney looking at a very tough case. When you go to a bench trial or where a judge is deciding, it's usually because you're focusing on an issue of law, that the facts may not be the prettiest, so to speak, like you value your Manhattan uh, property at 30,000 square feet rather than 11. But you want to argue an issue of law that is very technical that you're hoping that a judge will review uh, a little less emotionally and a little bit more technically to try to get the result that you want. And if they mess up, you always have an appeal to another higher judge. Aaron, what are you listening for today as this trial... Oh, I'm sorry. It looks like Aaron's making his way into the courtroom. John, what are you watching out for today in terms of the president when he walks in, his demeanor, and what actually happens in the proceedings? Well, I think right now, I mean, you know, listen, unfortunately, New York state courts, there's no cameras allowed, but thankfully, we have a team of ABC reporters there. So we know right now, if we could all use our mind's eye for a second, we are, our understanding is that Letitia James is in the courtroom, the attorney general, that is. She's seated right behind the state's team, going to be right there to see Donald Trump as he walks in across the aisle behind the defense table, Eric Trump. The former president's son, who you mentioned we saw walk in a couple seconds ago, his lawyers already taken their seat to the table. So a, a, a bit of palpable tension our team is describing already in the courtroom, but that's even before Donald Trump has walked into the room. So I think what we're going to be looking for in the courtroom is obviously what's said, the information that's coming out in the opening statements from both the prosecutors and the defense, but really the body language. Does Donald Trump, as he has done in previous settings, take a moment? Does he look around? Does he nod at the attorney general? Does he not look at her? I mean, Donald Trump is very telling in his mannerisms, in his body language. Everything with Donald Trump is done on purpose. So I think that's gonna be the fascinating color because here's the other thing too, we have to remember, every proceeding so far with Donald Trump, about an hour, 10 minutes to an hour, give mm -hmm. or take. Donald Trump, from our sources, his plan is to stay in court today until 4 p.m. That is hours of Donald Trump sitting in court. So you're gonna see a lot of Donald Trump's real-time reaction multiple times throughout today. Brian, that's Donald Trump's reaction. How careful do the judge and the attorney general have to be about their reactions in court today? Well, they are the attorney being an officer of the court and the judge being the judge has to appear to be neutral even though we saw the September 26th decision. He seems all but neutral <laughs> in the way that he's not only handled the case and, ta and talking about how Trump's own words incriminate him, but also the attorneys for Donald Trump, they're facing sanctions. This is a very rare time or very rare issue that you see uh, a judge say that your arguments are so frivolous that I'm going to hit your wallet. And so there's going to be tensions, I think, around everyone. But as an attorney general and a judge, you've got to show your focus on your duty as an attorney or your focus as a judge in being impartial, even though names and, and nicknames and, and, and whatnot have been slung around by almost both sides, but mainly from Trump and his camp. And Aaron, what do we know about the arguments prosecutors are going to make today? Well, the state complaint that brought this whole case on last September is here. Look how big this is. This is more than 200 pages. So the challenge for Kevin Wallace, the, the deputy attorney general is going to be giving the opening statement, is to synthesize this. But there's no jury. It's just for the judge. And the judge, he knows all this already. So it, it, a lot of this is to establish a record for an appeal later on down the road because the judge in effect has already made up his mind and already knows the facts of the case as, as both sides see them. But I think his challenge is to say these statements of financial condition were, were, were not only fraudulent but they were put to use uh, in, a, in a way that, that was illegal and that the attorney general will say is uh, is necessitating a large financial penalty and for the for the defense 
their effective argument is no harm, no foul. The loan to Deutsche Bank, Deutsche Bank made money because Trump never missed a payment. The insurance company, okay, so they gave us uh, some terms that maybe we didn't deserve. But who cares? There's no real victim here, Trump's side is going to argue. Of course, the attorney general says that the victim is all of us and a level playing field that the center of the financial universe deserves. Brian, could they argue standing still? If, if they try to say there are no victims here, could they say that this case shouldn't be there at all? They could, but I go back to the whole issue of sanctions where the judge says, you've made this argument, I ruled against it. You had an uh, opportunity to go to a higher court, they ruled against you. You made the argument again, and now I'm issuing sanctions. Do I think they're gonna continue down this pattern of arguing things that have already been decided against them to their detriment? Yes, but I don't think that's the smartest thing here. Standing's already been an issue. There's a reason why Ivanka Trump, for example, is no longer defendant. The statute of limitation on her claims uh, had run their time, and so the judge had separated her from the case. So to keep beating the same drum, uh, I think it's only gonna hit them harder from a legal standpoint, also probably financially from their pocketbooks. And Aaron, what do we know about the judge in the case? I want to bring in investigative reporter Olivia Rubin, who's outside the court. We're going to go to Olivia in just a little bit. John, what are you watching for in terms of demeanor? You've said a few times that Donald Trump is very telling mm -hmm. uh, in, in life in general, but mm. also inside the courtroom. Um, is there anything in particular that you're looking out for today? I, I'm looking for, you know, listen, I've covered him for almost 10 years. Where I'm thinking right now is that Donald Trump is doing what I'm doing, which is watching that clock and waiting for it to hit 9.58 and then he's gonna come out. He wants to create a moment. Uh, he wants to create a, a show of things. Um, he wants to create a buzz, a hype around today. So Donald Trump, always the TV producer in mind, uh, is gonna be doing, I think, a lot of that today. And listen, we're all gonna be here. Let's see if I win my bet in about 15 minutes. But you know, I think that Donald Trump also um, knows that he needs to keep this going. This is, this is the campaign at this point. It isn't Donald Trump going to a diner in New Hampshire or heading out to a state fair in Iowa. It's Donald Trump in a courtroom. And days like today, are awesome in Donald Trump's mind. They're not good, really, but in Donald Trump's mind for the campaign, this image right now, all the cameras there, everybody waiting for him. That shot that everyone's gonna throw on the cover of newspapers and magazines tomorrow morning, that is how Donald Trump considers the day a win. And he's gonna get it. Now, Brian, he does not have a speaking role today, so we don't expect to hear from Donald Trump inside the courtroom, but it looks like someone is outside speaking. Let's listen. Fighting. At the end of the day, we have a judge that has told us that Mar-a-Lago is worth $18 million. He has failed to acknowledge what the appellate division has said, and we will continue to fight in hopes that there is some level of law and order in this country at this point. Although my faith in the system is weary, I do have faith in Donald Trump. Thank you very much. Letitia James campaigned on getting Trump. That's what this is about. Election interference, Letitia James, Alvin Bragg, Fonnie Willis, Merrick Garland, and Joe Biden. This is designed to do nothing else but stop President Trump as he's leading by 10 points in the general election. We have a renegade judge here who's ignoring ruling of the appeals court. President Trump's assets are worth way more than what the court would have you believe. But this is all about 2024. Do not get it confused. This is nothing more than election interference. Democrats know that Pre President Trump is leading Joe Biden by wide margins, and this is the only way that they can stop them. President Trump is gonna be defiant He's going to take a stand, and he's going to fight back like he always has. Thank you. Former President Trump's legal team saying a few words before today's trial begins for this civil fraud suit. The judge has already decided on one of the key elements of this trial, ruling against Donald Trump, saying that the former president committed fraud by overvaluing his properties and estimating overestimating his net worth by more than $2 billion. We heard from the Attorney General a little bit earlier today, and now there we heard from his legal team. Pointing fingers at the Justice 
department in general, at the justice system in general, and promising that they will continue to fight. Our investigative reporter, Olivia Rubin, is outside that courthouse in New York. Uh, Olivia, what's the, what's the scene like there as Donald Trump's attorneys just finished speaking? Well, the scene, Diane, is that all morning we have seen every major player in this case enter the courtroom and make their statements. We heard from the attorney general herself just moments ago saying that justice will prevail today, and she made her way up the steps right behind me. And now former President Donald Trump's team speaking their own uh, statements outside of the court, and you just heard them. They said that this is election interference, and that is a common theme, Diane, that we have seen from the former president's team in essentially every Every single case, painting his civil and criminal legal troubles as election interference as he runs for the 2024 presidential campaign again. So now what we are waiting for, Diane, is for the president himself to enter into that courtroom. Of course, there is the camera right outside of the courtroom on the third floor here. So we will see him enter. And then opening statements will begin. And again, the former president just a spectator today. Now, of course, we don't count anything out in court, but he is not expected to say anything in the courtroom. But here to watch is sort of this case that has come so close to his personal identity and who he is. His company is set to get underway. So he will be in that courtroom listening as the attorney general begins her case against him, his children, and his namesake company, Diane. And Avery, this isn't just part of his personal identity. It's also part of his political identity. He on the campaign trail is constantly touting his business acumen and his net worth. So what are his political rivals saying about this? Right. His wealth uh, arguably gave way to his political rise. And I'll tell you that uh, the bulk of the party is not attacking him on uh, any of these legal troubles. I think when you look at this GOP field, uh, many of them are walking a fine line where they want to uh, both appeal to Trump supporters uh, and, and try to get them to come over to their side. And so uh, largely we've seen uh, folks stay away from uh, former President Trump's legal troubles, with the exception of folks like uh, former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie, uh, like uh, former Arkansas Governor Asa Hutchinson. Uh, those have really been the only folks to uh, directly target uh, former President Trump for his legal troubles. Uh, but uh, you have to remember that Trump is still far out ahead of uh, any of his competitors in this race. And it's uh, unlikely that we'll see his legal, uh, his standing in the race uh, be shaken by, uh, by, these, uh, by this case or any of the others. Brian, Trump's attorney is already promising to appeal after that first partial summary judgment. What could that appeal look like? What, what are the main arguments? So appeals are typically based on what a defense or whoever's appealing is a mistake of law or fact or how that fact is applied to the law. I think the big ones we're going to be looking at is the determination that fraudulent uh, instances occurred, the appointment of a re receivership, as well as the suspension of the licenses. They're going to go to this intermediary court and say, hey, the judge overstepped. They made errors in terms of why this was fraudulent, that it should have been X instead of Y. And then I think based on what we see in this trial, they're going to add on to that whatever the calculations are. So you'll say, this house should have been X amount of square footage. A judge got it wrong. They should have looked at this calculation rather than this calculation. And they'll say, okay, you said that our property is only $20 million. Well, in fact, it is $400 million. And so we're appealing not only the math, but the process. And Olivia, former President Trump's sons, Eric and Don Jr., are also implicated in this fraud scheme. What's their role in all this? And, and we know Eric Trump is already uh, in the court. We haven't seen Don Jr. yet. But just talk me through their, their part in all of this. Well, Eric Trump specifically, Diane, was heading up the Trump organization while his father was president of the United States. So he has a really serious role in that he was essentially guiding the company, leading it. And much of this, these allegations, would have been done under his leadership, if according to what the attorney general has brought forth here. But as you also said, Diane, Eric in the courtroom right now, where his father is also expected to be, and that is really, really, really significant. And I would say that we have been to, you know, a number of hearings where the former president has had to come to court. We have seen him arraigned four times now in court, but none of those times, Diane, has he been alongside of a family member. So this could potentially be the first time, you know, in recent memory, Diane, that the former president, Donald Trump, is inside of a courtroom with his family. And they will be sitting there, as I reiterated earlier, but, you know, need to say again, as they listen to the attorney 
attorney general essentially try to strip away their right to conduct business here in New York, which they have essentially done their entire life. So a father and son, it is a family company here. That is the significance of Eric and Don and the significance of all of them here today. John, how much does it up the stakes for former President Trump that it's not just him on the line and not just the business, but also his sons? Oh, hugely. I mean, listen, part of this ruling, the summary judgment ruling from the judge, it puts Donald Trump, Eric Trump, Don Jr. and Ivanka all out of business in New York. And for the kids who, you know, have maintained the company over the last couple of years, they had looked at expansion. They had looked at doing other things with the company. Um, part of what they were looking to do at some point was to do uh, a, a um, if you will, a cheaper version of the Trump Hotel, a more moderate cost around the country. Those plans eventually went nowhere. But now, if this ruling holds, they absolutely can go nowhere because the Trump Organization incorporated in New York could not do business like that. So it limits them all, if you will, from carrying the Trump brand forward. And at the end of the day, look, that's the only way you stay relevant in this business, right, is creating new, being on it, doing something different. You've already seen a lot of the Trump companies and assets go out of New York. Look at just a couple weeks ago. Uh, for those of us that live in New York, when you drive over the Whitestone Bridge, Trump Links, the golf course that has his name etched in the grass, it's gone. He sold it now to a casino magnet. So another property leaving New York. But the problem, though, as things leave, this ruling says that neither Donald Trump or the children can bring something new. Brian, a few witnesses are going to be called throughout the course of this trial. Who are you looking out for? I think his name is Donald Benger, if I'm wrong. The accountant, right. Yeah, the accountant. I, I would anticipate that he would probably be one of the first ones to testify, mm -hmm. and I think I've heard reports of it as, as well. Yep. The way prosecutors typically do it is they display the case to either the judge or the jury in a similar fashion to they to, to the way that they learned about the case. So here's the accounting. Here's the irregularities. Here's what we found. We did the investigation. Here are the officers or the people who did the investigation. This is what they found. And that's why you're probably hearing that a lot of the Trump family members are going to be near the end because once they establish the irregularities and the investigation then it's facing those uh, Trump family members with why did you not know this why did you think this why did you say this and if you can maybe put them in a position where they end up pleading the fifth or where I don't know where their statements can be used against them not only for summation in this case but potentially for other cases down the road yeah. And John, you want to add to that? No, I mean, I think the reality is that, you know, if Donald Trump or anybody tries to argue, well, my children weren't that involved, that's just simply not true. The children were actively involved in the business. So to Brian's point, all of them are going to be held accountable here if there are issues, if there are irregularities, because they were constantly asked to go through things with the banks, with the insurers. Every year, like all of us, they had to file tax returns. So with Donald Trump in the White House, it was Eric, Don, and Alan Weisselberg who were the three custodians, the guardians of the company, if you will, on behalf of the former president. So for the four years that Donald Trump was in D.C., it was up to those three to keep things going to certify it was a legitimate business. And John, the former president has said going after his business would be a red line. Yeah. So what does this mean for him, that it's not just the business, it's also his sons? Well, keep in mind, you could argue, you know, the, the company, the business is like Donald Trump's uh, sixth child, mm -hmm. right? It's the one that he's had the longest, the one that he's nurtured, the one that he takes care of, protects, keeps adding to, brags about the most, the way we all talk about our children, right? Donald Trump and that company are synonymous. I mean, think about years ago when Donald Trump was the star of The Apprentice. The images that were around Donald Trump was the company, the plane, the helicopter, walking out of Trump Tower. Those are the images that made Donald Trump. So for any of them to be taken away, it frankly would feel like the loss of a child to Donald Trump. He'd be lost without it. So Olivia, how do we expect this to play out today? Well, today, really, Diane is opening statements. It is setting the stage for the case. The uh, uh, attorney general's team will make their opening statement. Trump's team, his lawyers, will make their opening statement. And if there is still time, it's very possible that we could get into that first witness that Brian just outlined. So again, there's not really much of a role for the former president here right now today. He's really here just as a spectator. But as we're talking about witnesses, the attorney general has submitted her witness list, which has put the former president himself, 
Don Jr., Eric, Ivanka, the entire Trump family could be called in to testify here as part of this case. So while it's not something that we expect today, again, today is about opening statements, about setting the case. It is very possible that moving forward here, we see Trump and his children come on the stand here. But of course, it's, it's worth remem remembering that Donald Trump himself has already been deposed twice as part of this litigation. And the, the judge actually, in deciding that Trump committed fraud, used some of the statements that the former president said in his deposition position saying the reasons he gave for why they valued things the way that they did were completely not based in law. So it will be interesting to see what the former president then says if he does take the stand here in this case, how he changes it at all from the deposition, which the judge clearly did not find worthy Olivia, of explaining the Olivia, valuations. Olivia, we are seeing the former president now walking down the hallway headed to the courtroom. He's got about a minute to go until the trial starts. Let's listen. Thank you very much. This is a continuation of the single greatest witch hunt of all time. We have a rogue judge who rules that properties are worth a tiny fraction, one one hundred, a tiny fraction of what they actually are. We have a racist attorney general who's a horror show who ran on the basis that she was going to get Trump before she even knew anything about me. She used this to run for governor. She failed in her attempt to run for governor. She had virtually no polling. She came back and she said, well, now I'll go back to get Trump again. And this is what we have. It's a scam. It's a sham. Just so you know, my financial statements are phenomenal. They are actually less in terms of the numbers used than the actual net worth. The actual net worth is substantially more. No bank was affected. No bank was hurt. They don't even know why they have to be involved. And they've so testified. They can't believe that they're involved because they were paid back on time. There were no defaults. There were no problems. And it was like a perfect client. In the meantime, people are being murdered all over the sidewalks of New York. There was no victim here. The banks were represented by the best, biggest, most prestigious law firms in the state of New York, actually in the country. Some of the biggest and best law firms, in all cases, the biggest and best law firms. That's who represented them. The banks got back their money. Again, there was never a default. There was never a problem. Everything was perfect. There was no crime. The crime is against me because we have a corrupt district attorney, but we have a corrupt attorney general. And it all comes down from the DOJ. They're totally coordinated this in Washington because I'm leading. I'm the leading candidate. I'm leading Biden by 10 points. And I'm leading the Republicans by 50 and 60 points. That's pretty much, they say, over. I never accept that, but they say it's over. This has to do with election interference, plain and simple. They're trying to damage me so that I don't do as well as I'm doing in the election. Our country's gone to hell. We have a country that's in decline, serious decline. We have a man running our country who has no clue, doesn't know what he's doing, and you know it better than anybody because you have to cover him. What they've done with open borders, what they've done with interest rates and taxes, it's a disgrace. So what we have here is an attempt to hurt me in an election. It's an attempt to hurt me in an election. This never happened before where President of the United States leaves office and gets indicted. And the reason I got indicted was that I ran. 
If I didn't run, I'd be sitting right now at a beach like Biden does every time, even though he's supposed to be working. So very simply put, it's a witch hunt. It's a disgrace. We have a corrupt attorney general in this state. You see how she does. This trial was railroaded and fast-tracked. This trial could have been brought years ago, but they waited till I was right in the middle of my campaign. The same with other trials and indictments. It's all run by DOJ, which is corrupt in Washington. Everything goes through them. They're all corrupt people. Frankly, our country is corrupt. And that's one of the reasons I'm running. We're going to straighten it out. They have one property that's worth anywhere from 50 to 100 times what this judge put down as a value. Put down a value, $18 million. And the property's probably worth could be anywhere from 50 to 100 times more than that. And a lot of those numbers could even be low. We have other properties, the same thing. So he devalued everything. I didn't even put in my best asset, which is the brand, in terms of value. Coca-Cola, take a look at their value. They have a value. The value of their brand is more than everything else put together. My brand is extremely valuable. I didn't even use it in my financial statement. If I wanted to build up a financial statement, I would have built it up by using brand in addition to everything else. With the Former President properties. Trump making a statement outside the courtroom the as he gets ready to head into his civil fraud trial. The judge has already decided a key part of this case, ruling that Donald Trump did commit fraud by inflating his net worth by more than $2 billion by overestimating the value of some of his properties. We're hearing him now say that this is a, the greatest political witch hunt of all time, calling the judge a rogue judge calling the attorney general racist. Brian, what do you make of some of the comments that he's making in terms of the values and the math involved in this case? I don't know how he's doing the math. It, it's, I, I hear his arguments on, on one sense where I've heard them many times from clients. You know, there's no damages. I, my clients would say, I, I stole from CVS, but as I walked out, they got all the property back, and so no harm, no foul. But that's not how the law works. He's talking about valuation being 50 to 100 times more, uh, but he doesn't seem to have the own accurate numbers himself. This seems to be far more about politics for him, somehow connecting three distinct legal bodies, the New York Attorney General's office, the prosecutor in Georgia, and then the DOJ, as all being somehow cahoots. When these allegations came far before he started running, it seems like he's grasping at straws to try to create some kind of doubt in someone's mind. But the one person whose mind is going to decide both the law and the facts here has already had a ruling against him that hurts him in so many ways. There's not a jury here, it's a judge. So I don't see how this is going to help him in any way, shape, or form. And John, part of this seems like it was aimed at people who are concerned about this trial. Part of it seemed like it was aimed at the country in general, almost like a campaign speech. Well, well I, and I'm looking at this image right now of Donald Trump speaking at court. And just look at uh, the confluence, if you will, of two different worlds around him. His lawyers are standing to his left, and then the campaign team is standing to his right. And one of his co-defendants, in the other case, Walt Nauta, who's right behind him, also in a blue shirt, blue tie, like his boss, that is the co-defendant in the documents case, that is the special counsel's case from Jack Smith down in Florida, is behind him as well. It's this small orbit around Donald Trump that is constantly colliding. His personal operations with the company, the campaign, Jason Miller, as chief spokesperson to his right, and his lead lawyer on this case, Chris Kyes, to his left. That is Donald Trump's world right now. And I think seeing Donald Trump still speaking, I mean, I don't know if someone in the control room has been taking a clock of how long he's been going, but we were told he would not speak. I didn't believe that for 10 seconds because Donald Trump and a microphone can never be separated. But I didn't think he'd be going this long. I think we're somewhere at, at what, guys, like eight, nine minutes, something like that. For Donald Trump, who has really got to watch himself in one way, and Brian, this is a question I, I would ask you out of curiosity. He has already been told by several judges on the other cases, watch it, stop, stop commenting, stop tweeting, stop rallying up your base. You're gonna cause harm and threats to people, a la January 6th, what we saw happen there. This being outside the courtroom, attacking the judge and the attorney general right outside the room where it's going to happen, this trial about to start any minute, that to me is just shocking. So Brian, if you're his attorney, what are you thinking right now? Why did I get this client? No. Um, 
I'm thinking to him, we have to limit the liability here. Let's stop taking shots at the judge. Let's stop taking shots at the other uh, prosecutors in the other cases. Let's try to limit this to a, an issue of math and calculation. That the judge has their interpretation, we have our interpretation. Let's get the best and brightest, as Donald Trump always says, to evaluate his property. Yes, if you look at, for example, Mar-a-Lago and the other properties surrounding there in Florida, they might be of, of a different valuing system than his, but he has the ability to say, yeah, my brand, as he said, Coca-Cola brand is huge compared to the actual assets. The ability to have people come in and, and just buy time from him as a former president adds value that might not be able to be seen in the simple square footage calculation that they're using. Make this an argument of the science, the math. Don't make it an argument of politics. And we just saw former President Trump head into that courtroom. Olivia Ruman is outside the courthouse. Olivia, what can we expect to play out in court today? Well, I think really we're going to hear the top lines from each side's case. So like Brian said, Trump's team is going to want to keep it to the valuations. It's not about attacking the judge or the attorney general, as we just heard Trump do, but rather why the valuations on all of the tr Trump properties were made the way that they were and why it was done legally. Then, of course, from the attorney general's team, we're going to hear not exactly why it was fraudulent, but why they did it the way that they did and why they went through each calculation that way and why the judge should award a $250 million penalty as well as further limitations to what Trump and his kids can do. And I would just say, now that sort of everyone is inside, there were a few protesters out here this morning, the attorney general actually arrived to applause as she made her way into the building. She smiled at them who were chanting, Trump lies. So it's died down a little bit here outside as court gets underway. But sort of the usual protesters and, you know, chants that we've seen every single time that Trump comes to court here, Diane. And just the last point I would make is that this is probably, as John said, John, he, you know, the, Trump spoke for about nine, ten minutes inside. That is one of the first times that we have seen the former president speak inside of a courtroom. We have been there every single time he's been court, and he never speaks in the way that he just did. And it was actually just the building just to my right over here, one building over where Trump was arraigned just a few months ago on a criminal trial. So, again, the trial getting underway, the former president here, but again, Every single time in New York, we see the walls closing in on the former president. So the second time he is here in a courthouse now. And Avery, he spoke outside the courtroom. He is not expected to have a speaking role inside the courtroom today. He came on his own accord. Uh, but he is expected to be called to testify by the prosecution. That could be a legal risk for him. But politically, what does that mean for him, Avery? I mean, when you look at that statement that he made outside uh, of the courtroom, I mean, the extended pause before the cameras, the statement that he made, the attacks of the judge and the attorney general, all intended to uh, give his campaign ammunition to claim political persecution. Uh, uh, his, his quote, the crime is really against me, that this is a witch hunt, right? Uh, a message to his supporters to uh, galvanize support for him uh, outside the courtroom uh, and in the race for uh, the nomination and for the presidency. I mean, but he even had to acknowledge uh, that uh, despite uh, all of these legal troubles, including the, the, the courtroom that he sits in right now, uh, it has not hurt his standing in this race. He is still far out ahead of uh, each and every one of his uh, GOP competitors in this primary race. And, and I don't see that changing uh, because of this case. And our senior reporter, uh, Catherine Falders, is in D.C. also following the developments on this case. Catherine, let's talk about Trump's calendar because this is just one of several cases that he has going on simultaneously while he's also campaigning for president. So what does that calendar look like now? Yeah, look, I think his political and his legal calendar are starting to become one and the same here. You see uh, the former president at rallies. He's talking about his legal troubles. You saw him there inside the courthouse, and he's making this uh, about politics, uh, about the attorney general, for example. So uh, while these dates are building up on the calendar, at the end of the day, Trump didn't need to come today. He chose to do that. He chose to spoke about, speak about politics inside uh, that courthouse. This is something we'll likely continue to see. Of course, we don't know 
when he will appear in court next in any of these other cases, whether it be Jack Smith's cases, a probe since January 6th, or the Mar-a-Lago classified documents cases. Uh, those cases, for example, have multiple deadlines due. Trump doesn't have to appear in court for any of the appearances where his lawyers have to show up. But, Diane, what this shows me is that he's really trying to capitalize on this. As Avery said, this hasn't hurt him in the polls. He knows that, and that's why he's showing up there today. All right, John Santucci, Avery Harper, Catherine Falders, Brian Buckmeyer, Olivia Rubin, and Aaron Katursky. Thank you all. The former President Trump is now in that courtroom facing that trial for civil fraud. Uh, we will keep you updated, of course, and have more team coverage, plus other top stories right after the break. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. From America's number one news comes the all new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. Wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Streaming free on ABC News Live. For 30 years, my brother's death was this mystery. There's been some human remains found at the bottom of North Head. That night, everything changed. It's about finding justice for my brother. Sometimes you just have to stir the pot. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Reporting in Moscow, Idaho, I'm Kana Whitworth. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy is facing a possible vote to oust him from his job. The fallout from a last-minute deal averting a government shutdown has Republicans angry that he turned to Democrats for help. Senior congressional correspondent Rachel Scott is on Capitol Hill. With the government shutdown averted, House Speaker Kevin McCarthy bracing for another political fight, now facing the most direct threat to his leadership yet. At this time, next week, Kevin McCarthy is still Speaker of the House. It will because, be because the Democrats bailed him out, and he can be their Speaker, not mine. Congressman Matt Gates telling our Jonathan Carl he will try to remove McCarthy as Speaker this week after he relied on Democratic votes to keep the government funded. McCarthy's response to those threats, bring it on. It's all right if Republican and Democrats join together to do what is right. If somebody wants to make a motion against me, bring it. There has to be an adult in the room. Under rules McCarthy negotiated with his own party, one member can now force a vote to oust him, and several Republicans are furious. He once again worked with Democrats on a spending deal. We're throwing up a new <clears throat> new plan, uh, plan de jour every, every few minutes, and that's, that's not governing and that's not leadership. But McCarthy worked for days to satisfy the far right wing of his party. It was never enough. 
With time running out, he suddenly dropped his demands for border security and instead put a bill on the floor to keep the government funded until November 17th and provide $16 billion in disaster aid. 90 Republicans voted against it. Democrats carried it across the finish line. I think this is a big victory for Democrats. Uh, and frankly, I think that this could have happened much sooner. The bill passed the Senate with strong bipartisan support, making it to President Biden's desk with just hours to spare. But the president didn't get everything he wanted either. No additional funding for Ukraine. Democrats and Republicans, Senate and House, support helping Ukraine and the brutal aggression that's being thrust upon them by Russia. Stop playing games. Get this done. Senior Congressional Correspondent Rachel Scott, thank you. And ABC's Jay O'Brien joins us from Capitol Hill with more on that. Jay, after weeks of trying to win over the far right wing of his party, House Speaker McCarthy ended up working with Democrats to avoid this shutdown. Now it could cost him his job. So does it look like this push to oust him will actually be successful? Well, as you heard Rachel just note there, it's Matt Gates leading the charge to oust Speaker McCarthy. And sources tell us that move to boot him from his job could begin as early as today, if not tomorrow. Gates has to bring the motion to vacate, it's called, to the floor. And remember, Diane, this was a concession that McCarthy made to become Speaker of the House with the further right of his conference, to, make, to lower the threshold to one member of the House Republican Conference to bring a motion to oust McCarthy. So now, to your question of if this could be successful, what we're watching is twofold. One, we're watching to see how many House Republicans join Gates. It's unclear what the number is right now. Some have said that they're open to the idea, but not necessarily strongly behind Gates. If it's more than five, and this is the second thing we're watching, more than five House Republicans, McCarthy has to start offsetting, once you get to that fifth Republican, have to start offsetting those with Democratic votes to keep him. And so so does McCarthy work with Democrats? Does his office make overtures to Democrats? We've spoken with House Democrats who said they haven't yet heard from Speaker McCarthy's office, but they also haven't heard from their own Democratic leadership as to what leadership wants to do about this. So you're going to see a lot of different political machinations going on this week as to if Democrats bail out McCarthy, if Gates goes for McCarthy, how many jump on board with him. That we're waiting to see in the next few hours and days. All right, ABC's Jay O'Brien on Capitol Hill. Jay, thank you. Coming up, ready or not, the holiday shopping season is here. The deals you should be looking for right now. This is ABC News Live. The crushing of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Give it to me. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Tomorrow. The heat is overwhelming. He's been right there as wildfires raged. And now, after the devastating Maui fires, GMA's Mac Gutman showing how quickly these fires can spread in a live demonstration that could save your home. Tomorrow morning on GMA. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. 
from the Federal District Courthouse in Washington, D.C., I'm Terry Moran. Wherever the news is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back. It's October, but that doesn't mean the heat is done with us just yet. In the Midwest, scorching temperatures are hitting records in some parts. This is a cross-country storm is expected to bring severe weather to the heartland. Meteorologist Samara Theodore is tracking it all for us. Hi, Samara. Hey, Diane. I want to jump right into this heat because it's really impressive. We're talking record-breaking heat. Uh, Minneapolis had their all-time hottest October temperature on record, 92 degrees yesterday. They had to cancel a major marathon out there. Uh, th this is relatively unprecedented. You gotta think about the fact that they should be around 66 degrees today, and here they are in the 90s. This record heat continues through our Monday. Take a look where you're seeing those little circles in purple. That is where records are possible. We could break one in Houston, but we could also break records as far north as Sioux Falls, Minneapolis, Green Bay, Des Moines, Omaha all in for some really groundbreaking heat here. Now, cooler air is on the way, so that's good news. You just gotta hang in there, hang tight. We've got cooler air that's gonna surge in behind this cross-country storm, and that will bring a big drop. Look at Thursday morning in Minneapolis. No, 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 look at Saturday morning, 39 degrees. 90s yesterday, 39 by next weekend, waking up Saturday morning, so the cooler air is coming. Keep the winter coats on deck. As far as the storm system goes, like we said, it's cross country, brought snow to parts of California. Now it's getting ready to sweep through parts of the heartland. We do have a threat for severe weather there, both today and into tomorrow as far north as Kearney. Back to you, Diane. Hoping they stay safe, Samara, thank you. And forget the pumpkin spice lattes, it's eggnog time. Retailers are already vying for your holiday shopping dollars with stores like Target, Walmart, and Amazon, rolling out deep discounts this weekend. ABC's Alexis Christophorus has more on where you can save. Ready or not, the holiday shopping season is here. With 84 shopping days until Christmas, retailers are giving consumers more time to shop deals. These early sales give you a chance to get some things early and gives you more of a chance to hunt for deals so that Black Friday is not your only chance this year. Target Circle Week kicks off today through October 7th for members of its free loyalty program with up to 40% off thousands of items. Plenty Beauty is coming to Ulta Beauty at Target. Spend $25 on certain beauty brands, get a $5 Target gift card. Walmart's baby day deals is back. Walmart's holiday kickoff runs October 9th through the 12th with discounts across fashion, home, and tech. Amazon's unwrapping its prime big deal days October 10th and 11th for prime members. You're kind of a big deal. Also October 10th and 11th, Best Buy hosting a 48-hour flash sale on hundreds of gadgets. But with inflation still top of mind for consumers, does holiday shopping early really pay off? If your child wants a specific toy, you may not find it at the last minute, and you're better served by getting an early holiday deal when you find it. Data from Adobe shows last Black Friday, electronics were discounted nearly 30% on average, while toys could be had for about 34% off. Experts recommend shopping early for those hard-to-find items. Barbie is getting lots of buzz, and throwbacks like the Nintendo 64 console are expected to be hot sellers. And Alexis Christophers joins me now for more on this. So, Alexis, what are your biggest tips for getting a good deal right now? Whether you're buying in-store or online comparison shop, you can use web browser extensions like Honey or uh, Shop Savvy, Camel, Invisible Hand. There are a bunch of them out there to make sure that you're really getting a deal. Also, sometimes go right to the company or the brand themselves. Instead of buying Nike at Macy's, go to the Nike website. Um, they're, you know, incentivized to give you a deal so they don't have to give a cut to the retailer. And finally, don't don't feel pressure. You know, a lot of those websites have those clock down, uh, those ticks down with a, with a clock yeah, the saying, you know, hey, oh, buy now. Um, the deal will happen again. Don't feel pressured. Okay, love that. Alexis Christophers, thank you. You bet. And thank you for streaming with us. I'm Diane Macedo. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context, and analysis. We'll be right back. I think vulnerability is extremely powerful. This is an artist that I looked up to at one point. I never would have imagined that the ending would have been what it was. They do not shock me. The treatment was just so disgusting on everyone's part. Did Lizzo ever put her hands on you? No, she didn't get to that point. She attempted to come at me with her fist balled up. Lizzo is denying it all. 
Lizzo's Legal Limbo. You never, like, expect for it to turn into that. Now streaming on Hulu. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. ABC News, America's number one news source. Welcome back to ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. You're looking at New York City on this Monday, and we have a lot of news to get to. Former President Trump is in court for opening statements in the New York Attorney General's civil fraud trial against him. The trial comes after the judge ruled that Trump committed fraud by repeatedly inflating the value of some of his properties, exaggerating his net worth by more than $2 billion. Buffalo Bills safety DeMar Hamlin is playing again after suffering an on-field cardiac arrest nine months ago. The third-year player took the field against the Miami Dolphins as part of Buffalo's return team. With the crowd cheering him on, Coach Sean McDermott called his return a surreal moment. What could be the largest health care strike in U.S. history could begin Wednesday. The coalition of unions representing 75,000 employees of Kaiser Permanente says it hasn't reached an agreement with the company. The coalition's contract with Kaiser expired Saturday night. The health care workers are seeking pay raises, improvements to their pension plans, and protections against outsourcing. And Toys R Us is plotting a comeback. The toy store has announced plans to expand its brick-and-mortar presence with as many as 24 new stores, as well as opening in airports and cruise ships. The retailer's parent company, WHP Global, announced the expansion Friday. The first airport store is set to open in November at Dallas-Fort Worth International the world's second busiest airport. And federal student loan payments have resumed after being put on hold due to the pandemic. It's a change that affects nearly 30 million Americans. ABC's Elizabeth Schulze spoke to borrowers who now have to start making payments again after a three-year pause. Whoa. <laughs> For Sarah Wood's family of four in Denver, the three-year pause on federal student loan payments was a rare financial reprieve. It was a huge, huge relief. Apples and peanut butter. With her $440 in monthly student yeah. debt payments on hold, Wood started putting aside savings for her twin daughter's education. My husband and I sat down and with us both on a payment pause, it's like, let's put whatever we can towards our daughter's 529s. Her hope? The interest is 7.65. That her daughters won't be burdened with student debt like hers, totaling more than $180,000. What is that number? mean to you? You know, it's this thing that I am probably the most ashamed of in my life. We have to think of and we have to budget for every day and we have to budget for, for the future consequences of this loan every single day. Now with payments due, Wood says she will forego saving for her daughter's future education fund to pay off her own. You need to live in a house, you need to pay groceries, you need to eat and then from there on you kind of have to figure out where to skimp and save. And Elizabeth is joining me now for more on this. Elizabeth, what do borrowers need to know about how to restart their payments this month? 
Well, Diane, so this is about 28 million borrowers that we're talking about who at some point during the month of October will now have to restart paying back their federal student loans. So this is a big change for those borrowers. The first thing to know is that if you haven't gotten onto the studentaid.gov website to check when your actual bill's due date is, you should do that now. You should make sure you still know your FSA ID and your password. This is going to be over the course of the next month, sometime within that time. The Education Department should have notified you about 21 days before that bill is due. Also important to know, there are a couple of steps to give some borrowers relief. Now, of course, we saw that the Supreme Court struck down President Biden's broader plan offering up to $20,000 in debt. But in the meantime, the administration has rolled out this one-year grace period. So if you do miss a payment, you aren't going to be reported to credit bureaus and you wouldn't be held delinquent. So it is a little bit of a buffer there. But one really important thing to know is that in addition to that pause on payments over the past three years, there was also a freeze on interest rates. So most borrowers really saw their balances stay the same. And now those balances are starting to go up again. Interest is accruing at the rate that you were at before the pandemic started. So right now you do want to try to make a payment if possible because even if you use that kind of grace period, you're still going to have to have interest go up and you're still going to see that balance go up over time. Diane. And I know you've been speaking to borrowers. What sticks out to you from those conversations? You know, one of the most striking uh, parts of a lot of the conversations we had with borrowers is just that when these loans, when they took out the loans in the first place, they weren't aware of some of the repercussions like interest, right? You know, this understanding that over time, even if you're making payments, the balance can go up. You might not have a dent, and that can really quickly add up to your debt pile. And I did press all the borrowers we talked to about this idea of, hey, a lot of other people before you paid off their student debt, why should cancellation be a thing? Why should this be any different for you? And there's kind of this understanding from many of the people I spoke with is the cost of getting those degrees is so high. And, and many of those borrowers wanted to go into careers in public service, social work, teaching. And what they ultimately said, Diane, was the tuition costs and the debt that they had to take on were so high that it meant that they had to either leave those careers or they had to take on this huge burden of debt. So there's this understanding of, okay, this might have been a bad financial decision, but you know, how do we fix the system in a broader way going forward, that's a bigger conversation to have. All right, Elizabeth Shelsey, thank you. And you can see more of Elizabeth's student loan story on ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis later this week. And a former Broadway performer is sharing her story after battling cancer and then facing the fear that she wouldn't be able to have a family. Some cancer treatments can cause infertility, forcing some women like Sarah Strimmel Bentley to answer even more difficult questions during that fight. ABC's Rebecca Jarvis has more on this Breast Cancer Awareness Month. At 38 years old, Sarah Strimmel Bentley, a former Broadway performer turned yoga instructor, was in a new relationship and a picture perfect image of health until she found a lump the size of a walnut in her left breast. I got the biopsy results back that indeed I had stage two invasive ductal carcinoma and it was like time stopped and of course I was terrified. In the same breath, her doctor recommending an appointment with a fertility specialist. I had no idea that when you have breast cancer that, you know, your fertility would be affected. It was my dream. Uh, for as long as I can remember to be a mother. Studies have found that about half of young women with breast cancer say they'd like to have a child after completing the treatment. But some treatments, including certain types of chemotherapy, can affect fertility. We try to be extremely proactive when a young woman is diagnosed with breast cancer about preserving her fertility. Sarah undergoing two rounds of IVF with her then boyfriend James resulting in a single embryo. I feel so lucky that we have this chance to be able to, to make embryos before I go into treatment. Sarah holding on to hope and her positive spirit through rigorous rounds of surgery, chemo, and radiation. Through it all, her future baby remaining in sight despite the challenges. My oncologist had told me that Due to my age, my type of cancer, and the fact that we only had one shot, she said, you need to have a surrogate if you want to bring this baby to life. Sarah and her now husband, James, documenting their surrogacy journey every step of the way. Surrogacy is not a straight line and it is not easy. The Bentleys finally matching with Whitney, their surrogate. Leading up to finding out that the embryo transfer was successful was the longest two weeks of my life. That call 
was either going to be the best day of my life or the hardest news. I lost my mind. And the most in incredible moment of my life. Now, the couple are eagerly awaiting the arrival of their baby boy. It's becoming real, and we can't wait to meet the little guy. Just know that if you get diagnosed with breast cancer and you are a young woman and you think your life is over, it is not. I'm so, so thankful to be here. Huge congratulations to them, and our thanks to Rebecca Jarvis for that story. Coming up... She's putting the B in box office. How you can get your ticket to Beyonce's Renaissance Tour, now heading to theaters. Also ahead, the trailer effect is getting some extra star power. How Taylor Swift is impacting NFL ticket sales with her rumored romance and the familiar faces joining her at this weekend's game. at stake. So much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Customized to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. We're honored. ABC's 2020 winner of three Emmy Awards for Excellence. Thank you for making 2020 Friday night's most watched and most honored news magazine. I think vulnerability is extremely powerful. This is an artist that I looked up to at one point. I never would have imagined that the ending would have been what it was. They do not shock me. The treatment was just so disgusting on everyone's part. Did Lizzo ever put her hands on you? No, she didn't get to that point. She attempted to come at me with her fist balled up. Lizzo is denying it all. Lizzo's legal limbo. You never, like, expect for it to turn into that. Now streaming on Hulu. Welcome back to ABC News Live. First, Queen B is putting the B in box office. Beyonce's hugely successful Renaissance tour ended last night, but now you have a chance to see it. Janae Norman has the details. Everyone, welcome to Mother's Mind. Big B, and this morning the B stands for box office. Overnight, the 32-time Grammy winner confirming that a concert film of her record-breaking Renaissance World Tour is anticipated to hit theaters December 1st in a deal with movie chain giant AMC. Posting this video across social media, fans already in a frenzy. I hope you ain't throw away that silver outfit. I mean, it only makes sense. So many people, including myself, were not able to go to the Renaissance Tour, and the demand is so high. Sign me up. The hugely successful platinum album Renaissance making way for the highest grossing tour by a solo female artist. Highlighted by Beyonce's eldest daughter Blue Ivy taking the stage and cameos from artists like Diana Ross, Kendrick Lamar and Megan Thee Stallion. 
You're taking a tour like that, which is still having a tremendous amount of blast radius. So to release a film in theaters just months or weeks even after she's played certain dates as recently as her hometown in Houston in September, that is going to pick up a lot of fans. Renaissance raking in a reported $450 million and generating an estimated $4.5 billion for the U.S. economy. Just a reminder. Though it's not her first foray into concert films, Homecoming, the 2019 critically acclaimed film of her historic HBCU-inspired Coachella performance, winning a Grammy for Best Music Film. The news echoing word of Taylor Swift, the Eras Tour concert film set to hit theaters this month, which broke AMC single day advance ticket sales and notched more than 65 million bucks in pre-sales. Following in the footsteps of other artists like U2, Katy Perry, and Justin Bieber, leveraging successful tours into lucrative films. Movie theaters looking to cash in at a time of slumping ticket sales and as several high-profile films face delays because of the actor strike. If you look at the potential of these concert films, they have a really big chance of reinvigorating cinema. You don't have actors out there to promote movies. With Taylor Swift and Beyonce, you have a great ability of these big names automatically attracting a lot of attention, which will get people in the theaters, and that is the name of the game. Right, thanks to Janae Norman for that piece. Tickets are on sale now, though you'll have to fight our producer, Ashley, for the Beyonce ones. I think she may have bought all of them in New York. Uh, meanwhile, Taylor Swift fans were in a frenzy last night after Taylor Swift showed up to cheer on Travis Kelsey at the Kansas City Chiefs with some A-list friends. The Grammy-winning superstar was flanked by fellow celebrities at MetLife Stadium, and now experts say it could help the NFL attract a whole new fan base. ABC's Trevor Alt was there to see it all go down. The Kansas City Chiefs sliding their way to a narrow win over the New York Jets. And there is the guest of honor in Taylor Swift. But once again, the biggest spotlight may have been on Taylor Swift, this time bringing her superstar friends and devoted fans to MetLife Stadium. Ladies and gentlemen, the Eras Tour continues. Taylor Swift is in the building. Taylor was flanked by an entourage of Blake Lively, Ryan Reynolds, Hugh Jackman, Sophie Turner, and more to cheer on two-time Super Bowl champ Travis Kelsey. She even had quarterback Patrick Mahomes' wife Brittany with her and reunited with Kelsey's mom Donna, hugging her in the suite. Donna Kelsey's living the best life of all. Had to go to the upper deck to get in. One of those suites down here is the hottest club in the New York City area. From the top level, I met diehard Swifty Annette, who made this custom hoodie just for this game. And she's not even a Kansas City Chiefs fan, though she sure seemed like one after this touchdown. This couple, who coincidentally dressed as Swift and Kelsey for Halloween three years ago, pulling out their friendship bracelets and Kelsey jersey to see the duo in action. I would say this is probably the best football yeah. game experience, just yeah. given everything that's going on around it. And to know that Taylor Swift was there watching it too was way different, obviously, than any of the other games we've been to. And down on the sidelines, Kelsey was seen greeting Jets quarterback and known Swift fan Aaron Rodgers as he made his return to the stadium for the first time since his injury. Rodgers famously cheering on Taylor when she performed at the stadium in May. And fans are going wild at home, some throwing watch parties. And online, the TikTok hashtag trailer, Travis plus Taylor, viewed more than 65 million times. Since Swift's first sighting last weekend, Jets ticket sales skyrocketed, up by 34%, selling the most tickets in a single day that they have all season. In Kelsey's jerseys, they saw a 400% increase in sales. And the NFL clearly sees a marketing opportunity, changing their Twitter bio overnight to honor Taylor, and plastering her photos on their page, and posting multiple TikToks about her in the past week. Just to see this convergence of these two super passionate fan bases, it's been wonderful to see, and especially from our end, the number of young women now that are engaging in our content and exploring NFL players and obviously with the Chiefs and Travis Kelsey, it's been tremendous. 
Swift is on a short break from her record-breaking Eras Tour, which has been so successful, the Federal Reserve credits it with boosting the nation's economy. Experts say Taylor's NFL era is a golden opportunity for the league to attract new fans. I know the Kansas City Chiefs play at Minnesota Vikings next week. If I was Roger Goodell, I'd tell the Minnesota Vikings, let her and her people know. However, she wants to get to the game, make it as easy as possible. If that means landing a helicopter on midfield, let it happen. Just get her in the stadium because that's going to draw more eyeballs. All right, thanks to Trevor Alt for that story. And ABC News business reporter Alexis Christophorus and ABC News contributor and Sirius XM radio host Mike Muse have some more on this. Mike, first Taylor Swift announced the Eras Tour movie. Now we're going to get Beyonce's Renaissance Tour. They have their own predecessors that they're following here. Is this the way forward for big acts now? It absolutely is the way forward. You know, acts are always looking for ways to kind of keep the extension, the shelf life going, or whatever album and project that they have. And if you think about Beyonce's album, came out in 2022, she did not give us any visuals until the actual concert into itself. And the brilliant strategy that after the last stop in Kansas City, an hour later, she announces that she's actually going to release a film of the tour beginning in December 1st. So the, uh, the tour of Renaissance just keep going, but she is the queen of reinvention in terms of the way she did the Netflix special, the way she reinvented and changed business models on surprise albums. I mean, when she did it, Target was in a frenzy. Mm. They had to have an emergency meeting to prevent <laughs> other right. artists from doing exactly what she did. So every time she drops something, she changes business models, business economics, yeah. and talk about life extension of a project. And we still have two more acts to go <laughs> of Renaissance. This is just the first act. Let's talk about the economics here, because Alexis, the Eras Tour and the Renaissance Tour have boosted consumer spending. They've boosted local economies. Tina Knowles just posted that she was proud of both Taylor and Beyonce for stimulating the economy. <laughs> How big of a financial impact are we talking here? Also, to your point, you know, they're masterful marketers, right? I mean, these are mega house performers who have now become economic powerhouses. Mm. I mean, and it and it was it had the ripple effect. It wasn't just the ticket sales. It was Swifties going on Swiftcations and, you know, taking out hotel rooms and spending money big time for a full weekend if they were to travel uh, for a Taylor Swift concert. So, um, the, you know, four and a half billion dollars injected into the economy from Beyonce. Mm -hmm. Same kind of numbers that we're seeing for Taylor Swift right now. So, I, you know, and, and just when you thought the NFL couldn't become even more popular, Taylor Swift kicking it up a notch <laughs> yeah. and really opening up the NFL to an audience I highly doubt would have been checking out the game this past weekend. Uh, Impact spread far and wide to that point. Mike, tickets for the Renaissance Tour movie, they're already going fast. We're seeing, to Alexis's point, all the attention that Taylor Swift and Travis Kelsey are getting, literally boosting NFL ticket sales. His yeah. jersey's up 400%. Yeah. How powerful are, A, these two women, but also the power of celebrity in general? Are we seeing that increase? I love that you said uh, the power of these two women because I'm glad you framed it that way so we're not putting them in competition with each other. Oh, no. Uh, these two women are incredible and is literally moving economies and markets. Uh, there's reports out there that suggest that combined is going to be more than the Beijing Olympics when you take mm -hmm. into consideration wow. inflation. European economists have suggested that when Beyonce went to certain countries over in Europe that she was a reason for inflation due to hotels and foods and restaurants. She's changed the game in terms of wardrobe and how everybody started going for silver clothing. It changed merchandise and strategy and purchasing and buying power when it comes to that. And so these two powerhouses combined are creating movement and it's also two spilling over into the NFL. I was actually at that game yesterday. And when I tell you, it felt, and I go to the games all the time. It felt right, like, right, right, right. Yeah. He wasn't there to see Taylor. <laughs> He's trying to pretend like he wasn't there to see Taylor. But I gotta admit, no lie. <laughs> <laughs> it felt like a concert. Right. From the right. moment I Different got onto energy. the train moving, people in the subway cars was talking about Taylor. She on the train. It literally was from about Taylor from the time I got onto the train into the stadium. Are you going to the, the Viking game? Because she might be there next. No, I'm not a fan of the Vikings. <laughs> <laughs> okay.
<laughs> I'm a right. Mahomes guy, so okay, wherever Mahomes okay. go, I shall be. <laughs> um, Alexis, quickly, could this have a big impact on the box office, especially yeah. when they need it post-pandemic? Exactly. Movies like Dune, um, Ghostbusters now pushed to next year. This is going to be a huge infusion for the for the box office. $100 million is what they're expecting Taylor Swift's Eras Tour movie to bring in, and we didn't even talk about Beyonce. I mean, ticket sales just went on sale, what, yesterday? Yeah. And I tried to get tickets today. You can still get them. Uh, but I, I have a feeling but they're going to be sold out But not for all the seatings. But not for all the seatings. Some of the seatings are already sold out. Oh, Incredible. okay. <laughs> Alexis Christophorus, Mike Muse, thank you. But I know because Ashley tried to buy all of them, and she could only buy some, so <laughs> no, there's okay. that. All right, coming up, the Latino origin story in the U.S. We're taking a look at how it started and how the culture continues to make an impact daily. Stay with us. After Stonewall, uh, Sylvia Rivera and Marsha P. Johnson actually founded STAR, which was a center um, that was dedicated to helping homeless transgender youth um, in New York City. I believe in the gay power. Sylvia once actually showed up at a uh, gay rights center and broke the desk because she was frustrated and angry that homeless gay youth would be sleeping outside of the center and were not allowed inside the center. They really wanted transgender homeless youth to feel supported in a movement that didn't always show them, you know, the attention that they deserved. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. 30 years. My brother's death was this mystery. Was he pushed? Did he kill himself? Despite some human remains found at the bottom of North Head, and the body was naked. Committing suicide naked is almost unheard of. What's going on here? You had some chilling evidence. Oh my goodness. No one knew it was coming. It's about finding justice for my brother. Sometimes you just have to stir the pot. from the auto workers picket lines in Michigan. I'm Faith Abube. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. We're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back. The latest census shows Hispanics and Latin Americans currently make up 19% of the U.S. population. That's more than 63 million, making them the largest ethnic group in the country. But what is the Latino American origin story? Puerto Rican icon and EGOT winner Rita Moreno has more. A legacy that goes from the Olmecs to the Mayans, whose empires predate the birth of Christ, to the Aztecs and the Incas, whose empires existed and thrived for hundreds of years before the arrival and invasion of European settlers and their introduction of African slave trade to the Western Hemisphere. The Latino identity has a rich and complex ancestry. The Aztecs ruled over an estimated 15 million people. The empire stretched from what today is known as the United States borderlands through southern Mexico. At its peak, the Aztec capital of Tenochtitlan had over 140,000 people. Just south of the Aztecs were the Mayans, who were known for their advanced pyramid building, astronomy, and mathematics. Their agricultural technology developed the basis of what is the majority of the world's diet. As you make your way down to what is now known as South America, we find the Incas. At its peak, the Incan Empire was made up of 12 million people. Today, one of the most sacred archaeological centers of the Incas is a modern wonder of the world, Machu Picchu. The Tainos and Carib peoples navigated from the coast of South America to the Caribbean islands, named after the Caribs themselves. 
Once the most numerous indigenous people of the Caribbean, the Taino population may have reached anywhere between one or two million at the time of the Spanish conquest in the late 15th century. The Spaniards' quest for land didn't end there. By 1513, they arrived to a land with many flowers that they named Florida. Unknown to many, the first European language spoken in what is now the United States of America was actually Spanish and not English. The conquistadores brought with them diseases such as smallpox, mumps, and measles. They also brought with them one of the worst abuses of humankind, slavery. About 15 times as many African slaves were taken to Spanish and Portuguese colonies than to the U.S. The Spanish Empire would dominate throughout the Western Hemisphere for hundreds of years. Finally, in the early 1800s, the majority of Latin American countries and their people would gain their independence except Cuba and Puerto Rico. For Mexico, the victory would be short-lived thanks to their neighbors, the United States. The U.S. wasn't content with what it had, pushing westward to seize the land that many presidents believed was America's destiny. To reach that goal, President James Polk provoked war with Mexico. After a long and bloody battle, there was an agreement called the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. Mexico signed the treaty under the promise the U.S. would recognize all Mexicans as citizens of their new nation. But the U.S. failed on its promise, granting only white Mexican citizenship and leaving indigenous and black Mexicans entirely disenfranchised. This would forever change the fate of generations of Mexican Americans to come, and in turn, mold the identity of all Latinos in the United States. Our thanks to Rita Moreno for that report. And our thanks to you for streaming with us. I'm Diane Macedo. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context, and analysis. We'll be right back. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 store. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students. It was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. ABC News, America's number one news source. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from the aftermath of the Maui fires, I'm Melissa Adan. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. I'm Diane Macedo today on ABC News Live. Right now, former President Trump is appearing in a New York court. What's at stake is the former president's civil fraud trial gets underway. House Speaker McCarthy is in danger of losing his job. Members of his own party are threatening to vote him out. Why hardline Republicans are furious over his last-minute spending deal. 
The NASCAR crew member slammed by his own driver. How it happened and the latest on his recovery. Plus, together in pink, we have a look at the latest in cutting-edge detection and treatments for breast cancer and how two women are coming together after being diagnosed to help others. But first, we begin with former President Trump in court for opening statements in the New York Attorney General's civil fraud trial against him. That trial comes after the judge ruled that Trump committed fraud by repeatedly inflating the value of some of his properties, exaggerating his net worth by more than $2 billion. Now the trial will decide what additional penalties he could face with prosecutors asking for a fine of $250 million. Former President Trump is denying all wrongdoing, calling the trial election interference. So very simply put, it's a witch hunt. It's a disgrace. We have a corrupt attorney general in this state. You see how she does. This trial was railroaded and fast-tracked. This trial could have been brought years ago, but they waited till I was right in the middle of my campaign. That was President Trump just before walking into that courtroom. Our senior investigative reporter, Aaron Katursky, has the latest. Donald Trump begins a civil trial that puts him at risk of losing control of the business that propelled him to the White House. New York Attorney General Letitia James sued Trump, his adult sons, Don Jr. and Eric, and their family real estate firm for persistent and repeated business fraud that grossly inflated how wealthy Trump really is. Donald Trump engaged in years of illegal conduct to inflate his net worth to achieve, to deceive banks and the people of the great state of New York. The investigation began more than four years ago after Trump's former lawyer, Michael Cohen, told Congress Trump lied about the value of his properties. It was my experience that Mr. Trump inflated his total assets when it served his purposes. The judge has already decided the core of the case, finding clear, indisputable documentary evidence Trump inflated his net worth by as much as $2.2 billion to win more favorable terms on loans and insurance. Trump has denied it, calling the judge deranged and telling a campaign rally in Iowa. It's happening for a single reason, because I'm the only candidate they do not want to run against. But the judge's ruling said Trump was living in a fantasy world, and it's already threatening to wrest from Trump's control some of his prized assets, including his signature skyscraper, Trump Tower on Fifth Avenue, where he rode the golden escalator to announce his first run for president. The stakes here are enormous for former President Trump because if he is barred from doing business in New York and he is required to sell off all of his New York real estate portfolio, it could cost him hundreds of millions of dollars and severely damage not only the Trump brand, but also the value of his business. The trial will help the judge determine how much Trump has to pay in penalties. The state has asked for $250 million. Our thanks to Aaron Kaczorski for that report. Let's bring an investigative reporter, Olivia Rubin, outside the court in New York, ABC News executive editorial producer John Santucci, ABC News legal contributor Brian Buckmeyer, and ABC News political director Rick Klein for more. Olivia, the judge opened these proceedings saying one thing he knows a lot about is the de legal definition of fraud. What did you make of the judge's remarks? The Trump Organization committed fraud. We have seen from the former president that he has stood by the valuations that his company made about the various properties, saying that there was sort of a method behind that madness. But today we hear the judge saying, you know, I know the definition of fraud. So just inside the courtroom, Diane, I was just inside. Opening statements are underway, and the attorney general's team is beginning to lay out their allegations. And just from that overflow room, Diane, you can sort of see the the former president. He is seated at the defense table. He is there between his attorneys. And he is listening very closely to every single word that the prosecutors are saying about his namesake company. He is shaking their head when they talk about fraud. He's sort of leaning around, trying to get a good look, to look directly at the prosecutor. And at the same time, Diane, while he's in this room, they're playing the recorded depositions of his son, Eric Trump, of one of his, you know, close allies at the company, Alan Weisselberg. So that is what the former president is sitting through, at, at times even looking down at the floor. So really diligently listening in there as sort of the prosecutors lay out what they say are these fraud allegations at the company. Brian, how could the fact that the judge has already ruled on the central allegation in this case affect the rest of this trial now? 
So this again, this is a judge trial, not a jury trial. So the judge plays two roles here, both the arbiter of fact and of law. And so the fact that he's already come out on that first claim, saying that there is in fact fraud, that the valuation of the properties and the way that they came about, and even the, 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 the methodology of it is fraud, puts Donald Trump and the rest of his party and teams uh, behind the eight ball, so to speak. They've got to convince the judge what they could not have done in moving papers and in motions, that their methodology is sound and that it is not fraud. John, former President Trump spoke just before entering the courtroom. He called the judge a rogue judge. He called the attorney general corrupt and racist. This is not a jury trial. So how important is the court of public opinion both legally and politically. Well, for that statement, cut, clip, paste. It'll be in your inbox shortly in a fundraising email from Donald Trump for his presidential campaign. Look, Donald Trump needs these cases, needs this visual. The images we're seeing right now on screen, these are images that Donald Trump provokes, wants, and needs, in his opinion, to keep his campaign going. Let's be very clear. Donald Trump campaigning in Iowa, glad handing, whatever else, is all going to go away very soon, especially as the calendar flips to physical year 2024, because almost every day, week, month, he is going to be in a courtroom. He is going to be sitting through proceedings. Four trials are actively being scheduled for next year. So this, quite frankly, is a little bit of foreshadowing to our new year ahead. Donald Trump in a courtroom, get used to it. Rick, campaign disclosures show that Trump's two political action committees have paid at least $6.3 million to firms representing him in this case. How significant is that? I think it's significant on two levels. First, it, it tells you exactly how much of his legal campaign uh, and his political campaign are one and the same. To, to John Santucci's point, uh, he, he uses these moments because they are probably the best thing his campaign has going for him. And this, I think, um, financially and, and on paper, shows that reality, that what he does in court matters politically and what he does politically uh, will also matter in court. And then secondly, it's a lot of money. And the idea that uh, people are giving money to Donald Trump for president and having to fund his legal bills, many of them are aware of it. Uh, some of them may not be. Uh, and, and it is definitely an issue that's going to be more of a strain as time goes by, because there are a lot of presidential candidates that would love the kind of money that's going right now to lawyers just to spend on ads uh, in early voting states. They'd love to be able to commit that kind of time and that kind of campaign attention to it. But this is a drag on it. And right now, Donald Trump's most urgent issue is keeping himself uh, from, uh, from convictions, uh, from major penalties and major fines. And that's one reason that so much of the money that he's raising for ostensibly political purposes is paying off his legal bills. All right. Rick Klein, Olivia Rubin, John Santucci, Brian Buckmeyer, thank you all. Meanwhile, House Speaker Kevin McCarthy is facing a possible vote to oust him from his job. The fallout from a last-minute deal averting a government shutdown has Republicans angry that he turned to Democrats for help. ABC News political director Rick Klein joins me now, along with ABC's Jay O'Brien on Capitol Hill for more. Jay, let me bring you back here into this conversation now. And let's start with the big picture. Rick, why are hardline Republicans so angry with Speaker McCarthy right now? Well, I think the, 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 some, of, some of this has to do with the circumstances in which he got the job. He cut all kinds of deals with some of these conservatives, some of the MAGA Republicans in his conference. And uh, right now, those bills are coming due. And they feel like they ha he hasn't made good on some of the promises, particularly as it, opposed, it, it pertains to the rules of the House and to spending bills. And then, uh, over the weekend, he averted the government shutdown by getting virtually all the Democrats on board and barely more than half of the Republicans. So he now is in the position where uh, his agenda depended on Democratic votes. And now now, his continued existence as Speaker could depend on Democrats. There's nothing quite that get, that, like that to, to upset at least some Republicans, although we should note it's right now a, mi a distinct minority of Republicans. Uh, it does not appear that there's a huge number of people who are clamoring to oust uh, Kevin McCarthy, but the rumbling is there, and, and right now it is a little bit bigger than just Matt Gates and some of his friends. Jay, McCarthy worked for days to satisfy that right wing of his party, the holdouts, but some are still turning against him. What is he saying today? Yeah, well, he's saying, Diane, well, first, let's say this. He just gaggled with reporters moments ago right over there, and he was asked that key question that Rick was just alluding to. Will you work with Democrats? Will you reach out to Democrats to try to secure their votes so if you lose Republicans, when and if that motion to vacate is brought by Matt Gates, you can offset them with Democratic votes? And McCarthy did not answer that question. Instead, he said that the process of ousting a speaker, and he 
took a line from former Speaker Pelosi here, is quote unquote, not good for the House of Representatives. He didn't necessarily say, no, I'm not going to work with Democrats, or yes, I am going to reach out to Democrats. I can tell you from the Democrats I've spoken with, they have not heard from Speaker McCarthy's office, but they also have not yet heard from their own Democratic leadership of what leadership is going to tell them to do. Are they going to tell them to bail out McCarthy, vote to table that motion and potentially move it to committee, or just vote present and lower the threshold McCarthy needs in terms of Republican votes to keep his job? So Democrats have a lot of options here. As for Republicans, I can tell you, sources tell us that Matt Gates is likely to bring that motion to vacate as soon as today he has promised to do it, of course, as you said, this week. Rick, if McCarthy is ousted, what happens next? Well, nothing can get done in the House of Representatives at all until they choose a new speaker. And one of the quirks of this, or the strange uh, twists of all of this, is that it's not like the people that want to get rid of McCarthy have a backup choice in mind. Uh, the House of Representatives would be paralyzed. There'd be no movement whatsoever on any legislation until they figure out a speaker of the House who can get a majority. We remember what happened in January, those 15 votes and days and days and days and nights and nights and nights of Kevin McCarthy trying to get the votes. We'd be squarely back there. And in the interim, nothing at all can get done. And of course, even though this, this continuing resolution, this government funding bill, covers 45 days, at the end of that time, uh, middle of November, middle of next month, we're going to be back at it with another big showdown over a potential shutdown. So uh, this is something that the, 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 the Republicans are now wrestling with. The it's going to be on the Democrats' laps uh, as well. But uh, there is not going to be a functional House of Representatives in the United States uh, until or unless there's no speaker. All right, ABC News political director Rick Klein, ABC's Jay O'Brien on Capitol Hill with plenty to report on today. Thank you both. And even though it's October, that doesn't mean the heat is done with us just yet. In the Midwest, scorching temperatures are hitting records in some parts. This is a cross-country storm is expected to bring severe weather to the heartland. Meteorologist Samara Theodore is tracking it all for us. Hi, Samara. Good morning, Diane. So let's start with this cross-country storm. It started out west, bringing snow to parts of the Sierra in uh, California. And now it's driving through the heartland, right on the periphery of that cold front. We have these storms erupting, bringing us a chance for severe weather, both today and tomorrow, Roswell, New Mexico, Lubbock, Texas, down to Forks, Stoughton, up towards Garden City, parts of Oklahoma, all at risk for damaging winds. Really large hail is certainly possible, and uh, a few tornadoes as well, so keep that in mind. The other thing it's bringing is rain, and boy, oh boy, do we need this rain, especially in the state of Texas. You all uh, in Texas and throughout the state of Louisiana, Mississippi, extreme drought. That has been an issue. So this rain is coming just in the nick of time. As far as totals go, we could see anywhere from two to four plus inches, maybe five inches in some spots. Again, this is really needed. This will help reduce that drought throughout the state of Texas. Something else I want to put on your radar is the wildfire smoke. So Fires are still burning in Canada. It has been quite some time. All summer long, we've been tracking these fires. And with this area of high pressure bringing us tons of sunshine in the East Coast, but what it's also doing is it's bringing that flow of smoke, that low surface smoke, down into uh, parts of Montreal, Quebec, and then down into New England, and even parts of New York. It's a bit hazy. We're looking at low to moderate, so that's good. But if you're wondering where is all that haze coming from through today into tonight, that's because of the wildfire smoke from Canada. And finally, quickly, this record heat, wild. Minneapolis hit 92 degrees yesterday. Diane, they should be around 66 degrees for this time of year. Good news is that storm that's driving through is actually going to cool things down. They're waking up to temperatures. Get this, Diane, 39 degrees Saturday morning. 39 degrees. Wicked. <laughs> what a swing. All right, meteorologist Samara Theodore from the tank tops to the coats. Thank you. And Hollywood writers began voting today to ratify a tentative contract with the major TV and movie studios. Late night TV shows are back in production tonight after last week's agreement ended a nearly 150 day strike. It comes as the Screen Actors Guild heads back to negotiations, hoping for a resolution of their own. ABC News contributor and senior entertainment reporter at ESPN's Anscape, Kelly Carter, joins me now for more. Kelly, how do you think the writer's tentative deal could influence the actor's negotiations?
Yeah, you know, I think that everybody on both sides are hopeful that that the actors are going to arrive at a resolution a little bit quicker because of what happened with with the writers deal. You know, I think some of the things that are that are cheap for them on the list would be those higher residuals and also protection from artificial intelligence. And because the writers really successfully got what they wanted with those points in particular, I think that SAG after members are hoping, you know, for the same thing. Now, many late night shows are resuming production tonight. Last week tonight with John Oliver already came back. What do you expect to hear from the rest of the late night hosts tonight? I, I feel like a lot of the late night hosts are going to take their cue from what John Oliver did on Sunday night, which was, you know, they all have been off the air for for five months. And so what John did was he kind of caught his audience up, you know, running through like five months of, of stories and news. And then he turned serious and talked about the strike and, and talked about how it was immensely important what was happening right now and how, you know, that, that gap, that deal needed to be closed. And I expect that, you know, Kimmel and and everyone else coming back, Colbert, you know, Will and Jimmy Fallon will do the same thing. They're going to poke a little bit of fun about being off air for all of those months. And, and then they're going to also be very clear about what their positioning is with regards to this strike right now. Now, the actors are calling for several changes, including wage increases, AI protections and improvements in health and retirement benefits. What are you watching out for as negotiations resume? I mean, the, the AI thing, I feel like, is is kind of keystone because it's a new uh, it's a new thing that people are talking about, along with the residuals, specifically with regards to what's happening in the streaming world and also in the on-demand world, too. I mean, so much has changed since the last time that contract has been ratified, and I think that they want a reflection of what life is like right now in 2023 and beyond um, to be represented in those contracts. And so looking out for what those changes might be and if they're going to get the things that they want, I think it's also important to note that the kind of union heads for for the Writers Guild told sag after members, you know, at a, at a rally recently, we got most of what we wanted. We didn't get everything that we wanted, but we got most of what we wanted. And so they're very optimistic that the actors will, will do the same when they meet with the big studios. All right, ABC News contributor Kelly Carter. Thanks, Kelly. Thanks for having me. Coming up, the urgent search for a missing nine-year-old girl in upstate New York. Why police suspect she was abducted from her family's campsite. Also ahead, hear from the NASCAR crew member hit by his own driver during a pit stop. What he's saying about the incident and how he walked away with only minor injuries. Whenever news breaks, to crush the families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts.
Welcome back. Police are searching for a nine-year-old girl who vanished while camping with her family in upstate New York. Charlotte Cena was last seen Saturday morning. Now state police say they believe she was abducted. ABC Stephanie Ramos has the latest. An urgent search is underway for a nine-year-old girl who went missing while on a family camping trip in upstate New York. They came here to just have an ordinary time. The kids could have a chance to be in nature, have a chance to be kids. But instead, the day turned into every parent's nightmare. Charlotte Senna was last seen Saturday at Murrow Lake State Park, about 35 miles north of Albany, riding her bike around a loop with other kids when she decided to ride around once more alone. Charlotte was last seen at approximately 6.15 p.m. riding her bike in Loop A of the park. At approximately 6.45 p.m., Charlotte's bike was located in Loop A, and at 6.47 p.m., Charlotte's mom, Trisha, called 911 to report the child missing. Police believe Charlotte was abducted and is in imminent danger or serious harm. Charlotte Isina is a nine-year-old white female with long blonde hair, is approximately five foot one inch in height, and weighs about 90 pounds. She was last seen wearing an orange tie-dye Pokemon shirt, dark blue pants, black Crocs, and a gray bike helmet. Sunday morning, authorities issuing an Amber Alert as more than 100 searchers, including police, forest rangers, and residents from nearby, combed Morrow Lake State Park, hoping to find the little girl. We are leaving no stone, no branch, no table, no cabin, unturned, untouched, unexamined in our search to find Charlotte. Charlotte had just turned nine years old, started the fourth grade, and recently elected a class officer for student council. Police say they are also using specialized technology to pinpoint people who might have encountered Charlotte. Diane. All right, Stephanie Ramos, thank you. And we're hearing from a NASCAR crew member after his driver accidentally hit him while coming in for a pit stop. Oh, Thankfully, the crew member oh, suffered only minor injuries. Ariel Resha has more. That's going to be Zane's, I think. No, he just got, got a little bit too oh. hot. Oh, it's the heart-stopping moment. A high-speed NASCAR truck loses control and rams into a pit crew member at this year's Talladega Super Speedway in Alabama. What about that crew member? That is violent. NASCAR driver Zane Smith's number 38 loves truck skidding off the track into the pit stop. The crew scrambling to get out of the way, but the back of Smith's truck striking tire carrier Charles Plank, sending him into the air. I see the, the rear end just kick around, so I decided to ditch the tire that I was holding on with my right hand and jump up, and I just ended up hitting it with my hip, and that took most of the blunt force. Miraculously, he walks away. I was always told if you're going to get hit, just kind of let your body go limp and just you know, fall with it wherever it goes. So that's that's what I did. The speed for truck drivers at the Talladega Speedway race can be upward of 100 miles per hour, with the average weight of a racing truck roughly one and a half tons. Plank waking up this morning grateful and with quite a story to tell. It's an unfortunate circumstance. I just laugh about it. I mean, there's no sense in being mad. I'm having fun with it. I wouldn't change it for the world. Oh, oh that's where the damage came from. ABC's Ariel Rasha, thank you. Glad he's okay. Coming up, two young women who bonded during their breast cancer treatment are now helping others. We'll show you how right after the break. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television.
America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. We're honored. ABC's 2020 winner of three Emmy Awards for Excellence. Thank you for making 2020 Friday night's most watched and most honored news magazine. I think vulnerability is extremely powerful. This is an artist that I looked up to at one point. I never would have imagined that the ending would have been what it was. They do not shock me. The treatment was just so disgusting on everyone's part. Did Lizzo ever put her hands on you? No, she didn't get to that point. She attempted to come at me with her fist balled up. Lizzo is denying it all. Lizzo's legal limbo. You never, like, expect for it to turn into that. Now streaming on Hulu. Reporting from Orange County, New York on the migrant crisis, I'm Jacqueline Lee. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back. Two women who met in the thick of breast cancer treatment are sharing their story about learning from each other throughout the long and stressful process. Now they're spreading the word about performing self-exams, even though it's not commonly encouraged. ABC Prime anchor Lindsay Davis has their story. When it came to breast cancer, Marquita Morrow didn't think it was in the cards. I've always been a person who was um, very into making sure that I took care of my body. Lauren Davis had an early scare that she says doctors initially told her was nothing. Then came the diagnosis. It was shocking. I dropped to the floor and my world completely changed. While routine breast cancer screening can start when a person is 40 years old, Lauren and Marquita were both in their 30s when they learned they had triple negative breast cancer, finding each other during treatment and supporting each other ever since. It's really nice not to have to overly explain to someone or try to get them to really understand just how horrible it is. And you can even smile and kind of laugh yeah. about it, yeah. um, even though it's, it's very traumatic. One recent study found peer support significantly improved positive emotions among breast cancer patients. And in a time when more young women are being diagnosed with breast cancer, the two friends are calling out the need for women to be their own advocates. It can happen to anyone at any age, at any time. If you feel anything that's off at all, advocate for yourself. Don't be worried about being annoying. Don't be worried about being too loud in the office. While some research shows that there's no benefit for breast self-exams and it's no longer recommended for women to do it routinely, both women found their cancers this way. If you feel something that is abnormal, something that wasn't there last time, say something, because no one's gonna be a bigger advocate for you than yourself. ABC News Prime anchor Lindsay Davis, thank you. And thank you for streaming with us. I'm Diane Macedo. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context, and analysis. We'll be right back. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. ABC News, America's number one news source. Every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. It's time to buy the right stuff. And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. Welcome back to ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. You're looking at New York City on this Monday, and we have a lot of news to get to. Former President Trump is in court for opening statements in the New York Attorney General's civil fraud trial against him. The trial comes after the judge ruled that Trump committed fraud by repeatedly inflating the value of some of his properties, exaggerating his net worth by more than $2 billion. Buffalo Bill safety DeMar Hamlin is playing again after suffering an on-field cardiac arrest nine months ago. The third-year player took the field against the Miami Dolphins as part of Buffalo's return team with the crowd cheering him on. Coach Sean McDermott called his return a surreal moment. 
What could be the largest health care strike in U.S. history could begin Wednesday. The coalition of unions representing 75,000 employees of Kaiser Permanente says it hasn't reached an agreement with the company. The coalition's contract with Kaiser expired Saturday night. The health care workers are seeking pay raises, improvements to their pension plans, and protections against outsourcing. And Toys R Us is plotting a comeback. The toy store has announced plans to expand its brick and mortar presence with as many as 24 new stores, as well as opening in airports and cruise ships. The retailer's parent company, WHP Global, announced the expansion Friday. First airport store is set to open in November at Dallas Fort Worth International, the world's second busiest airport. And federal student loan payments have resumed after being put on hold due to the pandemic. It's a change that affects nearly 30 million Americans. ABC's Elizabeth Schulze spoke to borrowers who now have to start making payments again after a three-year pause. Whoa. <laughs> For Sarah Wood's family of four in Denver, the three-year pause on federal student loan payments was a rare financial reprieve. It was a huge, huge relief. Apples and peanut butter. With her $440 in monthly student yeah. debt payments on hold, Wood started putting aside savings for her twin daughter's education. My husband and I sat down and with us both on a payment pause, it's like, let's put whatever we can towards our daughter's 529s. Her hope? The interest is 7.65. That her daughters won't be burdened with student debt like hers, totaling more than $180,000. What is that number? mean to you? you know, it's the thing that I am probably the most ashamed of in my life. We have to think of and we have to budget for every day and we have to budget for, for the future consequences of this loan every single day. Now with payments due, Wood says she will forego cool. saving for her daughter's future education fund to pay off her own. You need to live in a house, you need to pay groceries, you need to eat and then from there on you kind of have to figure out where to skimp and save. And Elizabeth is joining me now for more on this. Elizabeth, what do borrowers need to know about how to restart their payments this month? Well, Diane, so this is about 28 million borrowers that we're talking about who at some point during the month of October will now have to restart paying back their federal student loans. So this is a big change for those borrowers. The first thing to know is that if you haven't gotten onto the studentaid.gov website to check when your actual bill's due date is, you should do that now. You should make sure you still know your FSA ID and your password. This is going to be over the course of the next month, sometime within that time. The Education Department should have notified you about 21 days before that bill is due. Also important to know, there are a couple of steps to give some borrowers relief. Now, of course, we saw that the Supreme Court struck down President Biden's broader plan offering up to $20,000 in debt. But in the meantime, the administration has rolled out this one-year grace period. So if you do miss a payment, you aren't going to be reported to credit bureaus and you wouldn't be held delinquent. So it is a little bit of a buffer there. But one really important thing to know is that in addition to that pause on payments over the past three years, there was also a freeze on interest rates. So most borrowers really saw their balances stay the same. And now those balances are starting to go up again. Interest is accruing at the rate that you were at at before the pandemic started. So right now you do want to try to make a payment if possible because even if you use that kind of grace period, you're still going to have to have interest go up and you're still going to see that balance go up over time, Diane. And I know you've been speaking to borrowers. What sticks out to you from those conversations? You know, one of the most striking uh, parts of a lot of the conversations we had with borrowers is just that when these loans, when they took out the loans in the first place, they weren't aware of some of the repercussions like interest, right? You know, this understanding that over time, even if you're making payments, the balance can go up. You might not have a dent, and that can really quickly add up to your debt pile. And I did press all the borrowers. We talked to you about this idea of, hey, a lot of other people before you paid off their student debt, why should cancellation be a thing? Why should this be any different for you? And there's kind of this understanding from many of the people I spoke with is the cost of getting those degrees is so high. And, and many of those borrowers wanted to go into careers in public service, social work, teaching. And what they ultimately said, Diane, was the tuition costs and the debt that they had to take on were so high that it meant that they had to either leave those careers or they had to take on this huge burden of debt. So there's this understanding of, okay, this might have been a bad financial decision, but you know, how do we to fix the system in a broader way going forward, that's a bigger conversation to have. All right, Elizabeth Chelsea, thank you. And you can see more of Elizabeth's student loan story on ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis later this week. And a former Broadway performer is sharing her story after battling cancer and then facing the fear that she wouldn't be able to have a family. 
Some cancer treatments can cause infertility, forcing some women, like Sarah Strimmel Bentley, to answer even more difficult questions during that fight. ABC's Rebecca Jarvis has more on this Breast Cancer Awareness Month. At 38 years old, Sarah Strimmel Bentley, a former Broadway performer turned yoga instructor, was in a new relationship and a picture perfect image of health until she found a lump the size of a walnut in her left breast. I got the biopsy results back that indeed I had stage two invasive ductal carcinoma and it was like time stopped. And of course I was terrified. In the same breath, her doctor recommending an appointment with a fertility specialist. I had no idea that when you have breast cancer that, you know, your fertility would be affected. It was my dream uh, for as long as I can remember to be a mother. Studies have found that about half of young women with breast cancer say they'd like to have a child after completing the treatment. But some treatments, including certain types of chemotherapy, can affect fertility. We try to be extremely proactive when a young woman is diagnosed with breast cancer about preserving her fertility. Sarah undergoing two rounds of IVF with her then boyfriend James, resulting in a single embryo. I feel so lucky that we have this chance to be able to, to make embryos before I go into treatment. Sarah holding on to hope and her positive spirit through rigorous rounds of surgery, chemo, and radiation. Through it all, her future baby remaining in sight despite the challenges. My oncologist had told me that due to my age, my type of cancer, and the fact that we only had one shot, she said, you need to have a surrogate if you want to bring this baby to life. Sarah and her now husband, James, documenting their surrogacy journey every step of the way. Surrogacy is not a straight line and it is not easy. The Bentleys finally matching with Whitney, their surrogate. Leading up to finding out that the embryo transfer was successful was the longest two weeks of my life. That call was either going to be the best day of my life or the hardest news. I lost my mind. Oh my God. Oh my God. And the most in incredible moment of my life. Now, the couple are eagerly awaiting the arrival of their baby boy. It's becoming real, and we can't wait to meet the little guy. Just know that if you get diagnosed with breast cancer and you are a young woman and you think your life is over, it is not. I'm so, so thankful to be here. Huge congratulations to them, and our thanks to Rebecca Jarvis for that story. Coming up... She's putting the B in box office. How you can get your ticket to Beyonce's Renaissance Tour, now heading to theaters. Also ahead, the trailer effect is getting some extra star power. How Taylor Swift is impacting NFL ticket sales with her rumored romance and the familiar faces joining her at this weekend's game. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. ABC News Live first. Queen B is putting the B in box office. Beyonce's hugely successful Renaissance tour ended last night, but now you have a chance to see it. Janae Norman has the details. Everyone, welcome to Mother's Mind. Big B, and this morning the B stands for box office. 
overnight, the 32-time Grammy winner confirming that a concert film of her record-breaking Renaissance World Tour is anticipated to hit theaters December 1st in a deal with movie chain giant AMC. Posting this video across social media, fans already in a frenzy. I hope you ain't throw away that silver outfit. I mean, it only makes sense. So many people, including myself, were not able to go to the Renaissance tour, and the demand is so high. Sign me up. The hugely successful platinum album Renaissance making way for the highest grossing tour by a solo female artist, highlighted by Beyonce's eldest daughter Blue Ivy taking the stage, and cameos from artists like Diana Ross, Kendrick Lamar, and Megan Thee Stallion. <laughs> You're taking a tour like that, which is still having a tremendous amount of blast radius. So to release a film in theaters just months or weeks even after she's played certain dates as recently as her hometown in Houston in September, that is going to pick up a lot of fans. Renaissance raking in a reported $450 million and generating an estimated $4.5 billion for the U.S. economy. Just a reminder. Though it's not her first foray into concert films, Homecoming, the 29th 19 critically acclaimed film of her historic HBCU inspired Coachella performance winning a Grammy for best music film. The news echoing word of Taylor Swift, the Eras Tour concert film set to hit theaters this month, which broke AMC single day advanced ticket sales and notched more than 65 million bucks in pre-sales. Following in the footsteps of other artists like U2, Katy Perry, and Justin Bieber, leveraging successful tours into lucrative films. Movie theaters looking to cash in at a time of slumping ticket sales and as several high-profile films face delays because of the actor strike. If you look at the potential of these concert films, they have a really big chance of reinvigorating cinema. You don't have actors out there to promote movies. With Taylor Swift and Beyonce, you have a great ability of these big names automatically attracting a lot of attention, which will get people in the theaters, and that is the name of the game. Right, thanks to Janae Norman for that piece. Tickets are on sale now, though you'll have to fight our producer Ashley for the Beyonce ones. I think she may have bought all of them in New York. Uh, meanwhile, Taylor Swift fans were in a frenzy last night after Taylor Swift showed up to cheer on Travis Kelsey at the Kansas City Chiefs with some A-list friends. The Grammy-winning superstar was flanked by fellow celebrities at MetLife Stadium, and now experts say it could help the NFL attract a whole new fan base. ABC's Trevor Alt was there to see it all go down. The Kansas City Chiefs sliding their way to a narrow win over the New York Jets. And there is the guest of honor, Taylor Swift. But once again, the biggest spotlight may have been on Taylor Swift, this time bringing her superstar friends and devoted fans to MetLife Stadium. Ladies and gentlemen, the Eras Tour continues. Taylor Swift is in the building. Taylor was flanked by an entourage of Blake Lively, Ryan Reynolds, Hugh Jackman, Sophie Turner, and more to cheer on two-time Super Bowl champ Travis Kelsey. She even had quarterback Patrick Mahomes' wife Brittany with her and reunited with Kelsey's mom Donna, hugging her in the suite. Donna Kelsey's living the best life of all. Had to go to the upper deck to get in. One of those suites down here is the hottest club in the New York City area. From the top level, I met diehard Swifty Annette, who made this custom hoodie just for this game. And she's not even a Kansas City Chiefs fan, though she sure seemed like one after this touchdown. This couple, who coincidentally dressed as Swift and Kelsey for Halloween three years ago, pulling out their friendship bracelets and Kelsey jersey to see the duo in action. I would say this is probably the best football yeah. game experience, just yeah. given everything that's going on around it. And to know that Taylor Swift was there watching it too was way different, obviously, than any of the other games we've been to. And down on the sidelines, Kelsey was seen greeting Jets quarterback and known Swift fan Aaron Rodgers as he made his return to the stadium for the first time since his injury. Rodgers famously cheering on Taylor when she performed at the stadium in May. And fans are going wild at home, some throwing watch parties. And online, the TikTok hashtag trailer, Travis plus Taylor, viewed more than 65 million times. 
Since Swift's first sighting last weekend, Jets ticket sales skyrocketed, up by 34%, selling the most tickets in a single day that they have all season. In Kelsey's jerseys, they saw a 400% increase in sales. And the NFL clearly sees a marketing opportunity, changing their Twitter bio overnight to honor Taylor, plastering her photos on their page, and posting multiple TikToks about her in the past week. Just to see this convergence of these two super passionate fan bases, it's been wonderful to see, and especially from our end, the number of young women now that are engaging in our content and exploring NFL players and obviously with the Chiefs and Travis Kelsey, it's been tremendous. Swift is on a short break from her record-breaking Eras Tour, which has been so successful, the Federal Reserve credits it with boosting the nation's economy. Experts say Taylor's NFL era is a golden opportunity for the league to attract new fans. I know the Kansas City Chiefs play at Minnesota Vikings next week. If I was Roger Goodell, I'd tell the Minnesota Vikings, let her and her people know. However, she wants to get to the game, make it as easy as possible. If that means landing a helicopter on midfield, let it happen. Just get her in the stadium because that's going to draw more eyeballs. All right, thanks to Trevor Ault for that story and ABC News business reporter Alexis Christophorus and ABC News contributor and Sirius XM radio host Mike Muse have some more on this. Mike, first Taylor Swift announced the Eras Tour movie. Now we're going to get Beyonce's Renaissance Tour. They have their own predecessors that they're following here. Is this the way forward for big acts now? It absolutely is the way forward. You know, acts are always looking for ways to kind of keep the extension, the shelf life going, or whatever album and project that they have. And if you think about Beyonce's album, came out in 2022, she did not give us any visuals until the actual concert into itself. And the brilliant strategy that after the last stop in Kansas City, an hour later, she announces that she's actually going to release a film of the tour beginning in December 1st. So the, the tour of Renaissance just keep going, but she is the queen of reinvention in terms of the way she did the Netflix special, the way she reinvented and changed business models on surprise albums. I mean, when she did it, Target was in a frenzy. Mm. They had to have an emergency meeting to prevent <laughs> other right. artists from doing exactly what she did. So every time she drops something, she changes business models, business economics, yeah. and talk about life extension of a project. And we still have two more acts to go <laughs> of Renaissance. This is just the first act. Let's talk about the economics here, because Alexis, the Eras Tour and the Renaissance Tour have boosted consumer spending. They've boosted local economies. Tina Knowles just posted that she was proud of both Taylor and Beyonce for stimulating the economy. <laughs> How big of a financial impact are we talking here? Also, to your point, you know, they're masterful marketers, right? I mean, these are mega house performers who have now become economic powerhouses. Mm. I mean, and it and it was it had the ripple effect. It wasn't just the ticket sales. It was Swifties going on Swiftcations and, you know, taking out hotel rooms and spending money big time for a full weekend if they were to travel uh, for a Taylor Swift concert. So, um, the, you know, four and a half billion dollars injected into the economy from Beyonce. Mm -hmm. Same kind of numbers that we're seeing for Taylor Swift right now. So, I, you know, and, and just when you thought the NFL couldn't become even more popular, Taylor Swift kicking it up a notch <laughs> yeah. and really opening up the NFL to an audience I highly doubt would have been checking out the game this past weekend. Uh, Impact spread far and wide to that point. Mike, tickets for the Renaissance Tour movie, they're already going fast. We're seeing, to Alexis's point, all the attention that Taylor Swift and Travis Kelsey are getting, literally boosting NFL ticket sales. His yeah. jersey's up 400%. Yeah. How powerful are, A, these two women, but also the power of celebrity in general? Are we seeing that increase? I love that you said uh, the power of these two women because I'm glad you framed it that way so we're not putting them in competition with each other. Oh, no. Uh, these two women are incredible and is literally moving economies and markets. Uh, there's reports out there that suggest that combined is going to be more than the Beijing Olympics when you take mm -hmm. into consideration wow. inflation. European economists have suggested that when Beyonce went to certain countries over in Europe that she was a reason for inflation due to hotels and foods and restaurants. She's changed the game in terms of wardrobe and how everybody started going for silver clothing. It changed merchandise and strategy and purchasing and buying power when it comes to that. And so these two powerhouses combined are creating movement and it's also two spilling over into the NFL. I was actually at that game yesterday. And when I tell you, it felt, and I go to the games all the time. It felt right, like- Right, right, right. Yeah. He wasn't there to see Taylor. <laughs> He's trying to pretend like he wasn't there to see Taylor. <laughs> 
no lie, it felt like a concert. Right. From the right. moment I Different got onto energy. the train moving, people in the subway cars was talking about Taylor, she on the train. It literally was from about Taylor from the time I got onto the train into the stadium. Are you going to the, the Viking too. game? Because she might be there next. No, I'm not a fan of the Vikings. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I'm All a Mahomes right. guy, so okay. wherever Mahomes okay. go, I shall be. <laughs> um, Alexis, quickly, could this have a big impact on the box office, especially yeah. when they need it post pandemic? Exactly. Movies like Dune, um, Ghostbusters now pushed to next year. This is going to be a huge infusion for the for the box office. $100 million is what they're expecting Taylor Swift's Eras Tour movie to bring in. And we didn't even talk about Beyonce. I mean, ticket sales just went on sale, what, yesterday? Yeah. And I try to get tickets today. You can still get them, uh, but I, I have a feeling but they're going to be sold out But not for all the seatings. Soon. But not, not for, for all the seatings. Some of the seatings are already sold out. Oh, Incredible. Okay. <laughs> Alexis Christophorus, Mike Muse, thank you. But I know because Ashley tried to buy all oh, of them, okay. and she could only buy some, <laughs> so know. there's okay. that. All right, coming up, the Latino origin story in the U.S. We're taking a look at how it started and how the culture continues to make an impact daily. Stay with us. After Stonewall, uh, Sylvia Rivera and Marsha P. Johnson actually founded STAR, which was a center um, that was dedicated to helping homeless transgender youth um, in New York City. I believe in the gay power. Sylvia once actually showed up at a uh, gay rights center and broke the desk because she was frustrated and angry that homeless gay youth would be sleeping outside of the center and were not allowed inside the center. They really wanted transgender homeless youth to feel supported in a movement that didn't always show them, you know, the attention that they deserved. I think vulnerability is extremely powerful. This is an artist that I looked up to at one point. I never would have imagined that the ending would have been what it was. They do not shock me. The treatment was just so disgusting on everyone's part. Did Lizzo ever put her hands on you? No, she didn't get to that point. She attempted to come at me with her fist balled up. Lizzo is denying it all. Lizzo's legal limbo. You never, like, expect for it to turn into that. Now streaming on Hulu. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. You're watching America's number one streaming news, ABC News Live. Breaking news, exclusives, live reporting across the globe. Keep streaming with ABC News Live. Welcome back. The latest census shows Hispanics and Latin Americans currently make up 19% of the U.S. population. That's more than 63 million, making them the largest ethnic group in the country. But what is the Latino American origin story? Puerto Rican icon and EGOT winner Rita Moreno has more. A legacy that goes from the Olmecs to the Mayans, whose empires predate the birth of Christ, to the Aztecs and the Incas, whose empires existed and thrived for hundreds of years before the arrival and invasion of European settlers and their introduction of African slave trade to the Western Hemisphere. The Latino identity has a rich and complex ancestry. The Aztecs ruled over an estimated 15 million people. The empire stretched from what today is known as the United States borderlands through southern Mexico. At its peak, the Aztec capital of Tenochtitlan had over 140,000 people. Just south of the Aztecs were the Mayans, who were known for their advanced pyramid building, astronomy, and mathematics. Their agricultural technology developed the basis of what is the majority of the world's diet. As you make your way down to what is now known as South America, we find the Incas. At its peak, the Incan Empire was made up of 12 million people. Today, one of the most sacred archeological centers of the Incas is a modern wonder of the world, Machu Picchu. 
the Tainos and Carib peoples navigated from the coast of South America to the Caribbean islands, named after the Caribs themselves. Once the most numerous indigenous people of the Caribbean, the Taino population may have reached anywhere between one or two million at the time of the Spanish conquest in the late 15th century. The Spaniards' quest for land didn't end there. By 1513, they arrived to a land with many flowers that they named Florida. Unknown to many, the first European language spoken in what is now the United States of America was actually Spanish and not English. The conquistadores brought with them diseases such as smallpox, mumps, and measles. They also brought with them one of the worst abuses of humankind, slavery. About 15 times as many African slaves were taken to Spanish and Portuguese colonies than to the U.S. The Spanish Empire would dominate throughout the Western Hemisphere for hundreds of years. Finally, in the early 1800s, the majority of Latin American countries and their people would gain their independence except Cuba and Puerto Rico. For Mexico, the victory would be short-lived thanks to their neighbors, the United States. The U.S. wasn't content with what it had, pushing westward to seize the land that many presidents believed was America's destiny. To reach that goal, President James Polk provoked war with Mexico. After a long and bloody battle, there was an agreement called the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. Mexico signed the treaty under the promise the U.S. would recognize all Mexicans as citizens of their new nation. But the U.S. failed on its promise, granting only white Mexican citizenship and leaving indigenous and black Mexicans entirely disenfranchised. This would forever change the fate of generations of Mexican Americans to come, and in turn, mold the identity of all Latinos in the United States. Our thanks to Rita Moreno for that report. And our thanks to you for streaming with us. I'm Diane Macedo. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context, and analysis. We'll be right back. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Give it to me. Hit me with them good vibes. Pictures on my phone lights. Everything is so fine. Little bit of sunshine. Dance a more, just a little bit. Breathe a more, just a little bit. Smile a little more in a minute. Ah, 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 ah. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families Trump. here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now.
Reporting from the border of Texas and Mexico, I'm Mireya Villargal. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Good afternoon, I'm Diane Macedo. We are following two big stories today. Former President Trump is in court for opening statements in the New York Attorney General's civil fraud trial against him. The trial comes after the judge ruled that Trump committed fraud by repeatedly inflating the value of some of his properties, exaggerating his net worth by more than $2 billion. Meanwhile, House Speaker Kevin McCarthy is facing a possible vote to oust him from his job. Some Republicans are angry that McCarthy turned to Democrats to help pass a last-minute deal to avert a government shutdown. Now, Florida Representative Matt Gates may introduce a motion to vacate McCarthy from his post as Speaker. ABC News political director Rick Klein joins me now, along with ABC's Jay O'Brien on Capitol Hill with more. Jay, Representative Gates will deliver a speech on the House floor today after having promised that he would move to oust Speaker McCarthy. What are you expecting to hear from him? Yeah, we've learned from sources that Matt Gates will speak now any moment. The House floor opens at noon today. Exactly what he is expected to say is still very much unclear, Diane. It is our understanding from the House rules, from some individuals that we've spoken with, including uh, House parliamentary experts, that he might not be able to actually introduce the motion to oust Speaker McCarthy until 2 o'clock this afternoon. But we expect Gates to speak. And, of course, Gates for months has promised he would move to oust Speaker McCarthy if the Speaker cut a deal with Democrats to keep the government temporarily open. And that is exactly what happened on Saturday. Democrats voted with moderate Republicans to keep the government open in a stopgap spending measure. That is why Gates is on the floor today. Exactly what he's going to say is still unclear, but he did promise to bring a motion to vacate. That's that motion to oust McCarthy sometime this week. That is why we are going to watch what he's saying incredibly closely. How serious is this threat for McCarthy, Jay? Does he need to be worried about keeping his job right now? Well, if you ask Speaker McCarthy, he will tell you he's not worried. A couple of the questions facing Speaker McCarthy in this moment are twofold. One, how many Republicans, if Gates does bring a motion to vacate like he's promised, join with Gates and try to oust McCarthy. If it's more than four, after four, every additional Republican needs to be offset with a Democratic vote to keep McCarthy because of how slim McCarthy's majority is. And so the other question here is, is Speaker McCarthy reaching out to Democrats or will he try to reach out to Democrats to keep his job? I can tell you this morning he got that question. Do you plan to reach out to Democrats or are you already reaching out to Democrats? And he sidestepped the question, saying that the motion to oust a Speaker of the House, if it were to happen, would not be good for the House of Representatives. So those are the two issues facing the Speaker right now. And then, of course, we have to see what Gates says any moment from now. Rick, why was McCarthy unable to get the hardline Republican vote here to begin with? Well, it depends on who you ask. If you ask them, they say that McCarthy went back on his word, that he had promised early in, the, early in the year as a condition of getting the speakership that he would go through the regular processes, which would allow in input from rank and file members and ultimately uh, involve deep spending cuts that would be part of uh, packages that he would pa pass on the House floor, bring to the Senate and hopefully sign into law. That was the deal that, that he cut to get the job. Uh, a lot of conservatives feel like he, he broke that deal, though, when he agreed on the debt ceiling raise a few months ago. A vote that was very similar to this one and that had a lot of Democrats and, and fewer Republicans on board. Now, if you ask McCarthy and his team what's behind it, they say it's personal. They say it's personal politics, that it's a vendetta, that it's Matt Gates and a couple of others who just flat out hate Kevin McCarthy and, uh, frankly, are rooting for chaos. It's not like they have another candidate in mind. So that's what's led to this moment uh, is that there's been a whole lot of browbeating uh, and a lot of public uh, ruminations on this. Finally, now we're at a point where Matt Gates essentially has to put up or shut up. McCarthy's been saying, if you've got it, if you're going to do it, go do it. And McCarthy told our colleague John Carl yesterday on this week that he intends to do just that. If there's no obvious alternative candidate, Rick, what happens if McCarthy is ousted? Well, everything and nothing. Uh, nothing first, Diane, because nothing else can happen on the, on the floor of the House of Representatives until they have a speaker. And there isn't an alternative candidate right now. So we would have vote after vote after vote until someone can get a majority of the full House, not just Republicans, the full House to become House, House Speaker. So that just grinds everything to a halt. But the everything, of course, is, is, is what then goes on behind closed doors and sometimes very much out in the open. The maneuvering, the posturing, uh, it would be very hard to imagine how Kevin McCarthy could go get the votes again 
again if he has just been ousted. I think we're likely to land somewhere else where Democrats either uh, tacitly agree or agree in sufficient numbers, as Jay pointed out, to, to essentially allow McCarthy to be speaker if Gates makes good on his word. There's other things you can do to bring down the total voting number, like not showing up in the chamber or simply voting present. And if Gates is going to do this day after day, as he as he says he will, he's predicting that he's going to go down in defeat, but says he'll keep doing it. He's going to make a lot of enemies among his own uh, uh, his own friends in the House conference. And uh, I think he, he already a lot of them are fed up with what they consider to be antics that don't really uh, mean anything productive for the American people. Um, but we'll have to see how long it would last in, in kind of a, the, the wild situation like that. All right. ABC News political director Rick Klein, ABC's Jay O'Brien on Capitol Hill. Thank you both. And we will bring you that speech from Congressman Matt Gates live when it happens. Meanwhile, former President Trump is in court for opening statements in the New York Attorney General's civil fraud trial against him. The trial comes after the judge ruled that Trump committed fraud by repeatedly inflating the value of some of his properties, exaggerating his net worth by more than $2 billion. Now the trial will decide what additional penalties he could face with prosecutors asking for a fine of $250 million. Former President Trump is denying all wrongdoing, calling the trial election interference. So very simply put, it's a witch hunt. It's a disgrace. We have a corrupt attorney general in this state. You see how she does? This trial was railroaded and fast-tracked. This trial could have been brought years ago, but they waited till I was right in the middle of my campaign. That was the former president just moments before entering the courtroom. Prosecutors say they've already proven Trump committed fraud, and now they aim to show the defendants were lying year after year. Senior investigative reporter Aaron Katursky has the latest. Donald Trump begins a civil trial that puts him at risk of losing control of the business that propelled him to the White House. New York Attorney General Letitia James sued Trump, his adult sons, Don Jr. and Eric, and their family real estate firm for persistent and repeated business fraud that grossly inflated how wealthy Trump really is. Donald Trump engaged in years of illegal conduct to inflate his net worth, to achieve, to deceive banks and the people of the great state of New York. The investigation began more than four years ago after Trump's former lawyer, Michael Cohen, told Congress Trump lied about the value of his properties. It was my experience that Mr. Trump inflated his total assets when it served his purposes. The judge has already decided the core of the case, finding clear, indisputable documentary evidence Trump inflated his net worth by as much as $2.2 billion to win more favorable terms on loans and insurance. Trump has denied it, calling the judge deranged and telling a campaign rally in Iowa. It's happening for a single reason, because I'm the only candidate they do not want to run against. But the judge's ruling said Trump was living in a fantasy world, and it's already threatening to wrest from Trump's control some of his prized assets, including his signature skyscraper, Trump Tower on Fifth Avenue, where he rode the golden escalator to announce his first run for president. The stakes here are enormous for former President Trump because if he is barred from doing business in New York and he is required to sell off all of his New York real estate portfolio, it could cost him hundreds of millions of dollars and severely damage not only the Trump brand, but also the value of his business. The trial will help the judge determine how much Trump has to pay in penalties. The state has asked for $250 million. Senior investigative reporter Aaron Katursky, thank you. And let's bring in investigative reporter Olivia Rubin outside the court, ABC News executive editorial producer John Santucci, ABC News legal contributor Brian Buckmeyer, and ABC News political director Rick Klein. Uh, Olivia, how are Trump's attorneys making their case in court? Well, Diane, his first attorney just wrapped their opening statement, and essentially the argument was twofold. The first is really arguing that the valuations that the former president put forward were really just estimates, Diane, and it was part of this real estate process in which there is no one way to value a property, and that's the whole part of it. There's all of these different sort of calculations that go into valuing a property like Mar-a-Lago or like his apartment at Trump Tower that can come up with a different number and that that is exactly what the former president and his company did. They made estimates and put those forward to the bank. And secondly to that, Diane, it is then up to the banks, Kais said, his attorney, Chris Kais, to do their own evaluations based on the numbers that the former president 
put forward to them. So one, it's an estimate that they get, and two, then it's up to the banks to crunch their own numbers and come to their own conclusions about what the properties are actually worth. And what uh, Trump's attorney told the judge, essentially, Diane, is that every single time the banks came up with a number and then moved forward with the loan. So really, it was not fraud, they said. It was what he described as the heart and soul of real estate, these different ways to value properties and get loans based on that. And he also noted that even when Trump would put forward uh, one number for a property, sometimes banks would come forward with different numbers. But what Kai said was that was not fraud. That was just differences in opinion on valuations of buildings. So that is sort of what they have laid out. The court went into a big break, uh, a little break after that. And now I believe they're coming back now, Diane, with another opening statement from his other attorney. So we'll have to see what she puts forward. But so far, essentially the argument that there was no fraud, just the heart and soul of the way that real estate State transactions work, Diane. Brian, how strong do you think this opening statement is from the defense so far? So far, I think it's very good. We've stepped away from the political rhetoric, and we've finally stepped into a, uh, a courthouse. We're now talking about, hey, I'm going to put up an expert, and I believe it's an NYU expert who's going to talk about there being differences of calculations, that you can value property there in more than one way, and there's no one generally accepted way. They're also talking about, which makes a lot of sense, attacking the credibility of the AG's star witness, Michael Cohen, saying he's lied to everyone who's, who's ever spoken to. Why should we believe him now? These make a lot more sense in terms of the arguments we're to see from someone who's trying to win this case, trying to reinvent or, or, or reframe uh, the calculations that are put forward, but also discredit those star witnesses who are going to come forward in this case. Uh, meanwhile, prosecutors played clips from depositions of Trump and his co-defendants. What do you think they're trying to show with that? There is nothing more damning for a defense attorney than the words of your own client. And unfortunately, Donald Trump gives it in, in spades. It's his statements that he had when he came in here today. It's his statements on social media. And from what we're hearing in the reporting, and correct me if I'm wrong, even when he heard his own son's words in the deposition of the opening statement, he kind of puts his head down. I think that's very telling of his body language to say, I can't say there's a misinterpretation when my own words or my son's own words or the people who are running this company and know this company mm -hmm. are saying that there is fraud or there could be fraud or there is something that resembles fraud uh, when they're literally just playing their own words for the judge to hear. John, what are you hearing in terms of color from the courtroom, things like Donald Trump's body language throughout? What sticks out to you? Well, I think from what Olivia Rubin and Aaron Katursky were reporting, I mean, Donald Trump uh, sitting there looking angry, staring straight ahead multiple times, uh, looking around the courtroom, taking it all in. I think, as Brian just noted, the looking down as the depositions are just being played. Look, Donald Trump has said he believes every day of his life is a TV show. Donald Donald Trump knows to see video elements like that played in court are not good for Donald Trump. I actually have to wonder if Donald Trump stays the whole day, does he come back again? There are rumors he could return tomorrow, possibly. Um, because today had to be a tough day for Donald Trump to hear all this, to hear his own words, his family's words used against him. So I think all of that right now is weighing on Donald Trump more than any of us could imagine. Now, the judge in the case has already canceled the Trump Organization's business certificates in New York. Mm -hmm. What impact is that having and how significant do you think that part of this is compared to the potential fines he's now facing? Well, remember, I mean, they're both in tandem, right? So obviously if he gets slapped with a fine, that's money. But if you get pulled your license, you can't make more money in New York. So that is a big consequence for Donald Trump. I can tell you moments after that ruling came down a little over a week ago, the summary judgment, employees for the Trump Organization scrambled and said, what do we do? Do we still have jobs? Are we still employed? Now, that has not been figured out. As we've reported, an independent arbitrator is going to be brought in to help sort of piece this out. And we know that the Trump team has said they will appeal. So we're not there yet, but so far, based on the ruling we've seen, not good for Trump. Rick, what could this all mean for Trump politically? Well, in the short term, it means he's spending a lot more time in court and uh, draining a lot more uh, campaign resources in terms of uh, funding his defense and spending time having to defend himself uh, publicly. Uh, I think the image uh, as a businessman is important to Donald Trump. Uh, I have a hard time imagining that this is the thing that finally Trump supporters say they're going to turn on him over. I just can't see that happening. You're seeing him frame it into a witch hunt. It becomes part of his political strategy to, to mount this legal defense. And his campaign is aggressively pushing out information, questioning the motives of the uh, 
uh, of the of the New York uh, Attorney General, questioning the motives of the judge in this case, uh, and making it into a, a broader case to say that this is a witch hunt, that this is a, an attempt to bring him down because of where he is politically. So far, that strategy has worked, but we are reaching a, a season in the campaign, Diane, as we've been covering for a while now. Where we're getting closer to the voting. We had a debate uh, last last week. We've got another one uh, about four or five weeks from now, uh, and there are candidates that are tr starting to make a little bit more headway and a little a little bit more uh, political hay out of the, the Trump legal woes. Um, but of course, his lead in the polls has been uh, as strong as it's ever been. Uh, Olivia, what, you, what are you watching for as court gets back into session? Well, his second attorney for the former president, Alina Haba, is going to get up and make her statement as well. So I'm really curious to see what we see out of Alina today, because she is someone, Diane, that we quite often see outside of the courthouse making statements to the press for the former president. We heard her this morning outside on the court steps calling this a witch hunt, saying it was politically influenced. But again, as Brian said, that's not something that's going to work inside of the courtroom. What Chris Kyes has done is go through the statements, go through the process process evaluation detail by detail to try to lay out for the judge why this was not fraud. So I'm curious to see how Alina is going to add on to that, what different lane she's going to take. And I think the question everyone's wondering as well, Diane, is are we going to get to the first witness today? It does seem like things are moving on quite quickly, that they're almost done with opening statements. So it could be very well that they finish up and really get to the crux of the case and start putting on witnesses for the attorney general to show her case and why it is that Trump and his, you know, company should pay $250 million for what they say was fraud here. All right, Rick Klein, Olivia Rubin, John Santucci, Brian Buckmeyer, thank you all. And do stay with us. We'll be back with more of the day's top stories right after the break. Whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. For 30 years, my brother's death was this mystery. Was he pushed? Did he kill himself? There's been some human remains found at the bottom of North Head, and the body was naked. Committing suicide naked is almost unheard of. What's going on here? You had some chilling evidence. Oh my goodness, no one knew it was coming. It's about finding justice for my brother. Sometimes you just have to stir the pot. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Welcome back. Police are searching for a nine-year-old girl who vanished while camping with her family in upstate New York. Charlotte Cena was last seen Saturday morning. Now state police say they believe she was abducted. ABC Stephanie Ramos has the latest. An urgent search is underway for a nine-year-old girl who went missing while on a family camping trip in upstate New York. Florida Representative Matt Gates is on the House floor now delivering remarks. Let's listen resolution so as to avoid having to take the Senate's plus up in Ukraine money that the Speaker of the House was actually cutting a side deal to bring Ukraine legislation to this floor with President Biden and House Democrats. So let me get this straight. To extend 
Joe Biden's spending and Joe Biden's policy priorities, the Speaker of the House gave away to Joe Biden the money for Ukraine that Joe Biden wanted. It is going to be difficult for my Republican friends to keep calling President Biden feeble while he continues to take Speaker McCarthy's lunch money in every negotiation. The Speaker of the House has responded to these reports of a secret side deal on money for Ukraine, opaquely stating that he still wants to fund Ukraine and our border. I have a few replies to this statement. First, the Speaker's statement confirms the existence of a secret deal. And I have talked to members of our own leadership who have said they didn't even know that Speaker McCarthy was negotiating a secret side deal outside of our conference, outside of his own leadership team, for the sake of Ukraine. Second, Ukraine has lost the support of a majority of the majority. The last time there was a freestanding Ukraine vote on this floor, it was last week. 101 Republicans voted for it. 117 Republicans voted against it. According to the Hastert rule, which Speaker McCarthy agreed to in January, you cannot use Democrats to roll a majority of the majority, certainly on something as consequential as Ukraine. So for all the crocodile tears about what may happen later this week about a motion to vacate, working with the Democrats is a yellow brick road that has been paved by Speaker McCarthy, whether it was the debt limit deal, the CR, or now the secret deal on Ukraine. For, or third. This is swampy log rolling. The American people deserve single subject bills. I get that a lot of folks might disagree with my perspectives on the border or on Ukraine, but can we at least agree that no matter how you feel about Ukraine or the southern border, they each deserve the dignity of their own consideration and should not be rolled together where they might pass where each individually wouldn't? This is what we're trying to get away from. This is the spirit of the January agreement we made with the speaker. No more lashing these disparate issues together so that the American people's interests are subjugated here on the floor of the House. You know how we should stand up for our border? Demand that the United States State Senate take up our single subject appropriation bill that funded the border. It created Republican unity. We voted for it. It has the policy demands that the continuing resolution that Speaker McCarthy advocated for on this floor did not. Our DHS funding bill requires you verify. And then hours later, after we passed that, the Speaker wanted us to vote for a continuing resolution that didn't include E-Verify. Retreat is never a strategy to win anything. So Mr. Speaker, just tell us, just tell us, what was in the secret Ukraine side deal? What commitments were made to, pre to President Biden to continue the spending of President Biden in exchange for doing things for President Biden. It is becoming increasingly clear who the Speaker of the House already works for, and it's not the Republican conference. Mr. Speaker, I would ask that these questions be answered soon because there may be other votes coming today or later this week that uh, could, could be implicated by the answers to these questions. Members of the Republican Party might vote differently on a motion to vacate if they heard what the Speaker had to share with us about his secret side deal with Joe Biden on Ukraine. I'll be listening. Stay tuned. And I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Now, members are reminded to refrain from engaging in personalities. As Florida Representative Matt Gates on the House floor delivering remarks, he did not announce that he will be introducing a motion to vacate Speaker Kevin McCarthy from his post as Speaker, but he did insinuate that that could be coming. ABC's political director Rick Klein joins me now, along with ABC's Jay O'Brien on Capitol Hill. Jay, he kind of danced around this, saying he wants questions answered and that there could be a vote maybe sometime coming up soon, but... No vote yet. What did you make of that? 
Yeah, welcome to Politics by Matt Gates. I've covered Matt Gates for many years, and Matt Gates knows when he has a spotlight on him. He knows when there are people who are going to pay attention to what he's saying. His staff even indicated he was going to give that speech, so there was a lot of anticipation ahead of those remarks. And then he talks about a vote that might be coming today or might be coming this week. He doesn't say, I'm introducing a motion to vacate today, which would be that motion that would oust Speaker McCarthy. He instead says, because of what he believes is a deal that the Speaker may or may not have cut as it relates to Ukraine funding, that would implicate, he says, how people would vote on a motion to vacate. That might come in the future. We know that Representative Gates is going to gaggle with reporters on the Capitol steps as he leaves the House floor right now. Our Rachel Scott is there, and I anticipate, Diane, the first question he's going to get is, are you going to introduce a motion to vacate like you promised you would this week? And if you are, what's the timeline going to be? And it would be very interesting to hear what Gates says about that, because clearly, in those remarks just there, he didn't commit to any timeline. He just said in those remarks that he believes the speaker works for President Biden, not for the Republican conference. So why bother posing these questions and asking for a response from the speaker? If he's firm in that belief, why not put forth the vote now? Rick. All I can think is that it's strategy for Matt Gates, and, and, it's a, and it's a bit of a tease for something that may come later today or, or tomorrow. The timing matters in as much as this is the kind of resolution that comes up immediately. There are procedural things that the majority can try to do, uh, like uh, t tabling it, which essentially shelves it in, in, entirely. Uh, but they are forced to grapple with this within 48 hours of it being introduced. And uh, Matt Gates just hinted at some of the strategy there and saying that he'll want to expose more of what he views as a secret deal that the speaker cut. Uh, he wants to to make sure that Democrats and Republicans alike know about what he views as a betrayal of the principles of the honesty of Kevin McCarthy. Uh, but look, uh, he, he's not going into this with, under any pretensions of having the votes. He told our colleague John Carl yesterday on this week uh, that he expects this to end with uh, Kevin McCarthy having to rely on at least some Democrats for him to keep his job. And that puts McCarthy in an awful position vis-a-vis uh, -vis his own leadership and his own uh, po potential leadership path forward. But it is the reality of the House of Representatives right now. So this is a giant game of chicken uh, between, between two men, between Gates and McCarthy primarily, but Gates essentially loses that leverage as soon as he pulls the trigger. As soon as he goes forward and says, We're gonna, I'm going to enter this resolution, anything that he can do behind the scenes is off, and then, and then the ball's in McCarthy's court. And McCarthy has a lot of options as the Speaker of the House that he can begin to deploy. Uh, Jay, how careful does Gates have to be with how he plays this? Because if he does you know, overplay his hand, so to speak, as Rick is saying, and drives McCarthy to need Democratic support, he's driving even further in the wrong direction from what Gates and his holdouts would like to see. Well, and the other question that remains, Diane, is how committed is Matt Gates to bringing up motions to vacate McCarthy? And by the way, you're seeing Gates right there on the House steps. Jay, he's speaking right now. Let's listen. Two hours to read legislation. He blew past that. Kevin McCarthy agreed to a rule that we would uh, not put anything over $100 million on the suspension agenda so that it couldn't be amended. He blew past that. Kevin McCarthy agreed to the Hastert rule, which is that you would never use a major the Democrats to roll a majority of the majority. On the last Ukraine supplemental, 101 Republicans voted for it. 117 Republicans voted against it. So do, this doesn't, does this sound personal to you? I'm pointing to specific things that Kevin agreed to that he hasn't complied with. He's just trying to subjugate his real and significant breaches of our agreement as some sort of personal dispute. But that says more about him than it says about what we're trying to do to change Washington. Mr. Gates, if you lose this vote, how many people do you believe share your sentiment among House Republicans or in the House overall? Well, I think tens of millions of Americans share my sentiment. And if you go look at you know, Newt Gingrich and Mark Levin trying to attack me online, it is an avalanche of criticism from their own supporters and their own followers and listeners where those folks are standing with me, not some of these folks who are with McCarthy. Now, Can you get more than five or six Republicans to sign on to this? Well, uh, we'll see, and we'll see where the votes are. That's a great thing about Mr. having Mr. If you lose this vote, If you lose this vote, will you continue to do this? And are you worried about throwing this institution into chaos, paralyzing an institution that your party runs? Well, you know what I think paralyzes us? 
continuing to govern by continuing resolution and omnibus. You know what I think throws this institution into chaos? Marching us toward the dollar not being the global reserve currency anymore. You talk, you talk about chaos as if it's me forcing a few votes and filing a few motions. Real chaos is when the American people have to go through the austerity that is coming if we continue to have $2 trillion annual deficits. You don't know chaos until you've seen where this Congress and this Uniparty is bringing us. Chaos is not forced. Who would you want to see as speaker instead? What? Who would you want to see as speaker Yeah, look, instead? we have a lot of talented people in our conference. There's probably 100 Republicans in Congress that I would vote for for a speaker, and maybe 100 Republicans throughout the country that I would vote for. Remember, the speaker doesn't have to be... Like who? Uh, hold on, hold on. Excuse me. I'm, I'm, finishing, y I'm finishing answering your question, but Sorry. if you interrupt it, then the other people can't use my answer. Then they just get you asking questions, and they don't want to put you on because you're not an anchor for, or a reporter for their network. So the answer to your question question is that we have a lot of folks in Congress who I think would be very capable to serve as speaker. Uh, we need to rebuild trust. And so I think we need someone who can connect the most conservative features of our conference uh, to the most moderate features of our conference. And I understand that. I'm not running for speaker. Uh, I, I understand that it might not be someone who agrees with me on every position, but it is awkward to talk about names until we understand how Mr. Scalise comes out of his treatment for blood cancer. I am not the type of person that just says you blow by somebody because they're they're getting a medical treatment. Just to follow up on Monty's question, you didn't obviously lose this resolution today here. Some are saying, well, you're going to maybe string this along for a few days. Tell us parliamentarily what your goal is. Are you going to drop this at 2 o'clock? Are you going to wait to the answers to your questions and then drop this Wednesday, Thursday? Explain the timing of this. Yeah, I'm going to be doing it this week. Just to follow up, just to follow up, just to follow up on Manu's question, if this does fail, will you bring this up again? Yeah. How often? How often? I mean, what's your, I mean, this would, you know, do you think that you could win this vote? Eventually, you know, you're going to keep doing it until you think that you have the vote. Well, like I've said, it took Speaker McCarthy 15 votes to become the speaker. So until I get to 14 or 15, I don't think I'm being any more dilatory than he was. Some of your Gates, colleagues say that they want to change the motion to vacate rule after you bring it forward, saying that one person shouldn't be allowed to do this. Obviously, that was an agreement that you came to uh, in January. Um, what do you say to those colleagues who want to change the motion to vacate? These are GOP colleagues. Yeah, it's certainly within the prerogative of my colleagues to offer any change to the rules that they would like. That would be subject to a vote on the House floor, and there's a procedure and a process to do that. The rules aren't written in uh, in stone and so uh, we'll see how that goes have, have you spoken to, to mr have you talked to president trump about this i have and what, what was his advice to you uh i think i'm going to keep that between the two of us have you talked to speaker what mccarthy is your... Here's Why are you waiting? Oh. 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 excellent Why catch that was representative matt gates I'm okay. insinuating yeah, I'm or talking okay. about a potential motion to vacate uh, the Speaker of the House, he did not call for a vote today, as some expected. Uh, but he is saying that could be coming and that he could call a vote as many times, at least as many times as it took Speaker McCarthy to be voted into the speakership. Uh, we want to go back to our Jay O'Brien on Capitol Hill for a little bit more and our political director, Rick Klein, for a little bit more. Rick, what do you make of this, of McCarthy not calling the vote, but, you know, definitely, definitely threatening that and talking about how he could do this multiple times, more than a dozen times? Yeah, and he says he will do it this week. Maybe the most telling part of that uh, of that that little exchange, though, was him talking about how the other reporters uh, were were speaking over each other, and you wouldn't be able to get a clean soundbite. I mean, so much of this is a PR strategy, almost Trumpian in its execution. And yes, the news that he has spoken to Donald Trump about this uh, is interesting, given McCarthy's alliance with Trump and Gates's alliance with Trump. It has scrambled some of the traditional expectations. But look, Matt Gates has now put himself in a position where um, it's going to be hard to t uh, to, to to give these threats much credibility much credence unless he goes ahead and, and moves forward with that motion. Uh, it's, he says it will be sometime this week. He says it will be multiple times. He talks a good game. I have a hard time imagining he's going to keep the friends that he has if he puts the House through anything like it went through back in January. But the bottom line is it's something he can do. And in fact, uh, it's something that he negotiated as a condition of him allowing McCarthy essentially to become speaker early in the year, this ability for any one member to, to call up the, 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 the up or down vote on whether the speaker should continue. And that's, an, that's the option that he has. And it's an option, again, that he says he's going to use this week. Jay, in terms of potential replacements for McCarthy, Gates didn't mention anyone specifically, but he said he's got about 100 Republicans that he would vote for and even said he had 100 more that aren't in the House, uh, explaining that they don't have to be in the House to be named Speaker. What would you make of that? 
Yeah, that kind of sounds like a line. Um, I've heard him say that before. Um, it, the reality is the House Republican Conference really doesn't have a, a, a you know plan B in the works right now. There isn't really another choice for Speaker. We saw this during the Speaker fight when McCarthy kept losing round after round after round. The word went out, well, who's the backup? And nobody really had a good answer for that. So that's the answer to your question. But to go back to, to two things from that uh, gaggle that Matt Gates just had, he got asked, um, what is your timeline? When are you going to bring this motion to vacate? I can tell you that is the question I have been texting and calling sources with all weekend long, and nobody has really been able to give me a good answer. And on the steps right there, Matt Gates himself gets asked, what's your procedural timeline? Will you bring it today at 2 o'clock when legislative business opens? Will you bring it tomorrow? And he just says he'll bring it this week. So he's not committing to a timeline there. The other thing worth pointing out when you talk about timeline is he got this question from our own Rachel Scott that you see in the refeed is standing right there next to Matt Gates because she's always in the middle of every gaggle. And she asks, because she's so great at her job, and she asks, asks, are you going to bring this motion to vacate over and over and over again? And I can tell you, as a Hill team, as Rachel's colleague, that's the thing that we've all been asking each other. And that's why she asked Gates that question, is are we going to see these motions to vacate every week, every month? Are you going to keep trying to chip away at McCarthy's support and forcing him to go to the well and get Democratic votes to save his job? I can tell you that is something that are, those are conversations being had amongst lawmakers on Capitol Hill. They're not quite sure what Gates's end game is. But as you heard in that gaggle, he hasn't committed to an end game yet, Diane. And Jay, you did call it. You said, Ashley, will be in the middle of it. And uh, Rachel will be in the middle of it. And sure enough, there she is. Uh, Rick, let's talk about the long-term game here for Matt Gates. Where does his leverage go as this continues to unfold? And what is he trying to get at with this message of chaos and finances and deficits and, and austerity? Because that is a message that tends to resonate with, with his base, with Republican voters in generally, that we need to spend less money in Washington. So could this be a win for him politically, even if he doesn't actually oust McCarthy in the process? Sure, and, and certainly for publicity's purposes, it, it works as well. Although keep in mind that the, the, the way this went down, he actually set his actual policy goals back by, because Kevin McCarthy ended up having to do what's known as a clean continuing resolution, basically keep government funding at its current levels. The Republicans were hoping for budget cuts. They thought they were going to get some cuts as part of the deal over the debt ceiling earlier this year. So in a weird way, uh, by standing on whatever the principle is here, Congressman Gates actually went backwards in terms of the policy. But in terms of his own image in terms of uh, the, his own politics as he potentially goes back home and runs for, for governor of Florida at some point in the future or just campaigns to be uh, one, of the, one of the closest and, and most Trump-aligned members of Congress, uh, there's different incentives here. And that, I think, is a, is a, a dynamic that is new to, to me or new-ish to me, that you have members of Congress whose ultimate goal isn't necessarily governance. Sometimes it's actually the opposite. And in this case, uh, it is personal. And you can't you can't separate the, the political uh, and the policy from the personal. Uh, Gates and, and McCarthy don't like each other. They've made no secret of that. Uh, and and this, this gambit by, by Gates, he acknowledges, is unlikely to succeed. Uh, he would love to make Kevin McCarthy's life a little bit more miserable. And, yeah, there's an upside for him politically uh, along the way. All right, ABC News political director Rick Klein, ABC's Jay O'Brien on Capitol Hill. Thank you both. And stay with us with more of the day's top stories. We'll have that right after the break. Whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. You 
your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love that. Me. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today? YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about. The new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Welcome back to ABC News Live. First, Queen Bee is putting the B in box office. Beyonce's hugely successful Renaissance tour ended last night, but now you have a chance to see it. Janae Norman has the details. Everyone! Welcome to Mother's Mind. Big B, and this morning, the B stands for box office. Overnight, the 32-time Grammy winner confirming that a concert film of her record-breaking Renaissance World Tour is anticipated to hit theaters December 1st in a deal with movie chain giant AMC. Posting this video across social media, fans already in a frenzy. I hope you ain't throw away that silver outfit. I mean, it only makes sense. So many people, including myself, were not able to go to the Renaissance Tour, and the demand is so high. Sign me up. The hugely successful platinum album Renaissance making way for the highest grossing tour by a solo female artist. Highlighted by Beyonce's eldest daughter Blue Ivy taking the stage and cameos from artists like Diana Ross, Kendrick Lamar and Megan Thee Stallion. You're taking a tour like that, which is still having a tremendous amount of blast radius. So to release a film in theaters just months or weeks even after she's played certain dates as recently as her hometown in Houston in September, that is going to pick up a lot of fans. Renaissance raking in a reported $450 million and generating an estimated $4.5 billion for the U.S. economy. This a reminder. Though it's not her first foray into concert films, Homecoming, the 29th 19 critically acclaimed film of her historic HBCU inspired Coachella performance winning a Grammy for best music film. The news echoing word of Taylor Swift, the Eras Tour concert film set to hit theaters this month, which broke AMC single day advance ticket sales and notched more than 65 million bucks in pre-sales. Following in the footsteps of other artists like U2, Katy Perry, and Justin Bieber, leveraging successful tours into lucrative films. Movie theaters looking to cash in at a time of slumping ticket sales and as several high-profile films face delays because of the actor's strike. If you look at the potential of these concert films, they have a really big chance of reinvigorating cinema. You don't have actors out there to promote movies. With Taylor Swift and Beyonce, you have a great ability of these big names automatically attracting a lot of attention, which will get people in the theaters, and that is the name of the game. Our thanks to Janae Norman for that piece. Tickets are on sale now, though you'll have to fight our producer Ashley for the Beyonce ones. I think she may have bought all of them in New York. Uh, meanwhile, Taylor Swift fans were in a frenzy last night after Taylor Swift showed up to cheer on Travis Kelsey at the Kansas City Chiefs with some A-list friends. The Grammy-winning superstar was flanked by fellow celebrities at MetLife Stadium, and now experts say it could help the NFL attract a whole new fan base. ABC's Trevor Alt was there to see it all go down. First the Kansas City Chiefs sliding their way to a narrow win over the New York Jets. And there is the guest of honor in Taylor Swift. But once again, the biggest spotlight may have been on Taylor Swift, this time bringing her superstar friends and devoted fans to MetLife Stadium. Ladies and gentlemen, the Eras Tour continues. Taylor Swift is in the building. Taylor was flanked by an entourage of Blake Lively, Ryan Reynolds, Hugh Jackman, Sophie Turner, and more to cheer on two-time Super Bowl 
Bowl champ Travis Kelsey. She even had quarterback Patrick Mahomes' wife Brittany with her and reunited with Kelsey's mom Donna, hugging her in the suite. Donna Kelsey's living the best life of all. Had to go to the upper deck to get in. One of those suites down here is the hottest club in the New York City area. From the top level, I met diehard Swifty Annette, who made this custom hoodie just for this game. And she's not even a Kansas City Chiefs fan, though she sure seemed like one after this touchdown. This couple, who coincidentally dressed as Swift and Kelsey for Halloween three years ago, pulling out their friendship bracelets and Kelsey jersey to see the duo in action. I would say this is probably the best football yeah. game experience, just yeah. given everything that's going on around it. And to know that Taylor Swift was there watching it too was way different, obviously, than any of the other games we've been to. And down on the sidelines, Kelsey was seen greeting Jets quarterback and known Swift fan Aaron Rodgers as he made his return to the stadium for the first time since his injury. Rodgers famously cheering on Taylor when she performed at the stadium in May. And fans are going wild at home, some throwing watch parties. And online, the TikTok hashtag trailer, Travis plus Taylor, viewed more than 65 million times. Since Swift's first sighting last weekend, Jets ticket sales skyrocketed, up by 34%, selling the most tickets in a single day that they have all season. In Kelsey's jerseys, they saw a 400% increase in sales. And the NFL clearly sees a marketing opportunity, changing their Twitter bio overnight to honor Taylor, and plastering her photos on their page, and posting multiple TikToks about her in the past week. Just to see this convergence of these two super passionate fan bases, it's been wonderful to see, and especially from our end, the number of young women now that are engaging in our content and exploring NFL players and obviously with the Chiefs and Travis Kelsey, it's been tremendous. Swift is on a short break from her record-breaking Eras Tour, which has been so successful, the Federal Reserve credits it with boosting the nation's economy. Experts say Taylor's NFL era is a golden opportunity for the league to attract new fans. I know that Kansas City Chiefs play at Minnesota Vikings next week. If I was Roger Goodell, I'd tell the Minnesota Vikings, let her and her people know. However, if she wants to get to the game, make it as easy as possible. If that means landing a helicopter on midfield, let it happen. Just get her in the stadium because that's going to draw more eyeballs. All right, thanks to Trevor Ault for that story and ABC News business reporter Alexis Christophorus and ABC News contributor and Sirius XM radio host Mike Muse have some more on this. Mike, first Taylor Swift announced the Eras Tour movie. Now we're going to get Beyonce's Renaissance Tour. They have their own predecessors that they're following here. Is this the way forward for big acts now? It absolutely is the way forward. You know, acts are always looking for ways to kind of keep the extension, the shelf life going, whatever album and project that they have. And if you think about Beyonce's album, came out in 2022, she did not give us any visuals until the actual concert into itself. And the brilliant strategy that after the last stop in Kansas City, an hour later, she announces that she's actually going to release a film of the tour beginning in December 1st. So the, the tour of Renaissance just keep going, but she is the queen of reinvention in terms of the way she did the Netflix special, the way she reinvented and changed business models on surprise albums. I mean, when she did it, Target was in a frenzy. Mm. They had to have an emergency meeting to prevent <laughs> other right. artists from doing exactly what she did. So every time she drops something, she changes business models, business economics, yeah. and talk about life extension of a project. And we still have two more acts to go <laughs> of Renaissance. This is just the first act. Let's talk about the economics here, because Alexis, the Eras Tour and the Renaissance Tour have boosted consumer spending. They've boosted local economies. Tina Knowles just posted that she was proud of both Taylor and Beyonce for stimulating the economy. <laughs> How big of a financial impact are we talking here? Also, to your point, you know, they're masterful marketers, right? I mean, these are mega house performers who have now become economic powerhouses. Mm. I mean, and it, and it was, it had the ripple effect. It wasn't just the ticket sales. It was Swifties going on Swiftcations and, you know, taking out hotel rooms and spending money big time for a full weekend if they were to travel uh, for a Taylor Swift concert. So, um, the, you know, four and a half billion dollars injected into the economy from Beyonce. Mm -hmm. Same kind of numbers that we're seeing for Taylor Swift right now. So, I, you know, and, and just when you thought the NFL couldn't become even more popular, Taylor Swift kicking it up a notch <laughs> yeah. and really opening up the NFL to an audience I highly doubt 
would have been checking out the game this past weekend. Uh, Impact spread far and wide to that point. Mike, tickets for the Renaissance Tour movie, they're already going fast. We're seeing, to Alexis's point, all the attention that Taylor Swift and Travis Kelsey are getting, literally boosting NFL ticket sales. His yeah. jersey's up 400%. Yeah. How powerful are, A, these two women, but also the power of celebrity in general? Are we seeing that increase? I love that you said uh, the power of these two women because I'm glad you framed it that way so we're not putting them in competition with each other. Oh, no. Uh, these two women are incredible and is literally moving economies and markets. Uh, there's reports out there that suggest that combined is going to be more than the Beijing Olympics when you take mm -hmm. into consideration wow. inflation. European economists have suggested that when Beyonce went to certain countries over in Europe that she was a reason for inflation due to hotels and foods and restaurants, she's changed the game in terms of wardrobe and how everybody started going for silver clothing. It changed merchandise and strategy and purchasing and buying power when it comes to that. And so these two powerhouses combined are creating movement and it's also two spilling over into the NFL. I was actually at that game yesterday and when I tell you, it felt, and I go to the games all the time, it felt right, like- Right, right, right. Yeah. He wasn't there to see Taylor. <laughs> He's trying to pretend like he wasn't there to see Taylor. <laughs> No lie, it felt like a concert. Right. From the right. moment I Different got onto energy. the train moving, people in the subway cars was talking about Taylor. She on the train. It literally was from about Taylor from the time I got onto the train into the stadium. Are you going to the, the Viking dude. game? Because she might be there next. No, I'm not a fan of the Vikings. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I'm All a right. Mahomes guy, so okay. wherever Mahomes okay. go, I shall be. <laughs> um, Alexis, quickly, could this have a big impact on the box office, especially yeah. when they need it post-pandemic? Exactly. Movies like Dune, um, Ghostbusters, now pushed to next year. This is going to be a huge infusion for the for the box office. $100 million is what they're expecting Taylor Swift's Eras Tour movie to bring in. And we didn't even talk about Beyonce. I mean, ticket sales just went on sale, what, yesterday? Yeah. And I tried to get tickets today. You can still get them, uh, but I, I have a feeling but they're going to be sold out. But not for all the seatings. Soon. But not, not for, for all the seatings. Some of the seatings are already sold out. Oh, Incredible. Okay. <laughs> Alexis Christophorus, Mike Muse, thank you. I know because Ashley tried to buy all oh, of them, okay. and she could only buy some. <laughs> so know. there's okay. that. All right, coming up, the Latino origin story in the U.S. We're taking a look at how it started and how the culture continues to make an impact daily. Stay with us. After Stonewall, uh, Sylvia Rivera and Marsha P. Johnson actually founded STAR, which was a center um, that was dedicated to helping homeless transgender youth um, in New York City. I believe in the gay power. Sylvia once actually showed up at a uh, gay rights center and broke the desk because she was frustrated and angry that homeless gay youth would be sleeping outside of the center and were not allowed inside the center. They really wanted transgender homeless youth to feel supported in a movement that didn't always show them, you know, the attention that they deserved. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. 30 years. My brother's death was this mystery. Was he pushed? Did he kill himself? There's been some human remains found at the bottom of North Head, and the body was naked. Committing suicide naked is almost unheard of. What's going on here? We had some chilling evidence. Oh my goodness. No one knew it was coming. It's about finding justice for my brother. Sometimes you just have to stir the pot. So much at stake, so much on the line. More Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. 
watching America's number one streaming news. Keep streaming with ABC News Live. Welcome back. The latest census shows Hispanics and Latin Americans currently make up 19% of the U.S. population. That's more than 63 million, making them the largest ethnic group in the country. But what is the Latino American origin story? Puerto Rican icon and EGOT winner Rita Moreno has more. A legacy that goes from the Olmecs to the Mayans, whose empires predate the birth of Christ, to the Aztecs and the Incas, whose empires existed and thrived for hundreds of years before the arrival and invasion of European settlers and their introduction of African slave trade to the Western Hemisphere. The Latino identity has a rich and complex ancestry. The Aztecs ruled over an estimated 15 million people. The empire stretched from what today is known as the United States borderlands through southern Mexico. At its peak, the Aztec capital of Tenochtitlan had over 140,000 people. Just south of the Aztecs were the Mayans, who were known for their advanced pyramid building, astronomy, and mathematics. Their agricultural technology developed the basis of what is the majority of the world's diet. As you make your way down to what is now known as South America, we find the Incas. At its peak, the Incan Empire was made up of 12 million people. Today, one of the most sacred archaeological centers of the Incas is a modern wonder of the world, Machu Picchu. The Tainos and Carib peoples navigated from the coast of South America to the Caribbean islands, named after the Caribs themselves. Once the most numerous indigenous people of the Caribbean, the Taino population may have reached anywhere between one or two million at the time of the Spanish conquest in the late 15th century. The Spaniards' quest for land didn't end there. By 1513, they arrived to a land with many flowers that they named Florida. Unknown to many, the first European language spoken in what is now the United States of America was actually Spanish and not English. The conquistadores brought with them diseases such as smallpox, mumps, and measles. They also brought with them one of the worst abuses of humankind, slavery. About 15 times as many African slaves were taken to Spanish and Portuguese colonies than to the U.S. The Spanish Empire would dominate throughout the Western Hemisphere for hundreds of years. Finally, in the early 1800s, the majority of Latin American countries and their people would gain their independence except Cuba and Puerto Rico. For Mexico, the victory would be short-lived thanks to their neighbors, the United States. The U.S. wasn't content with what it had, pushing westward to seize the land that many presidents believed was America's destiny. To reach that goal, President James Polk provoked war with Mexico. After a long and bloody battle, there was an agreement called the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. Mexico signed the treaty under the promise the U.S. would recognize all Mexicans as citizens of their new nation. But the U.S. failed on its promise, granting only white Mexican citizenship and leaving indigenous and black Mexicans entirely disenfranchised. This would forever change the fate of generations of Mexican Americans to come, and in turn, mold the identity of all Latinos in the United States. Our thanks to Rita Moreno for that report, and our thanks to you for streaming with us. I'm Diane Macedo. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context, and analysis. We'll be right back. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. 
so much at stake, so much on the line. More Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News live. Today on ABC News Live, Donald Trump on trial, accused of inflating his net worth, the former president making an unprecedented appearance in court, calling it the greatest witch hunt of all time. Kevin McCarthy feeling heat from within his own party, Matt Gates threatening to oust him as speaker. We are live on Capitol Hill. Borrowers beware, student loan payments are back and millions of people now on the hook, the crushing debt and what it means for Americans ahead. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kira Phillips. Our top story this hour, the unprecedented court appearance of a former U.S. President Donald Trump in a New York City courtroom facing a $250 million lawsuit that could change the face of his empire and net worth. Trump, his two sons and Trump org execs all accused of acting in a decade-long scheme using numerous acts of fraud and misrepresentation to actually inflate Trump's net worth while lowering his tax burden. Trump denying all wrongdoing, calling the case a political witch hunt and an effort to keep him out of the White House. Joining us now from just outside the courthouse there, our investigative producer, Olivia Rubin, also ABC News executive editorial producer, John Santucci, and legal contributor and law professor at the University of Baltimore School of Law, Kim Whaley. Olivia, let's start with you. What's the latest right now from inside court? Well, the latest, latest, Kira, is that court has broken for lunch uh, for now. And the former president just emerged from the courtroom and spoke to those cameras that are on the third floor hallway. And just by listening to him, Kira, he sounds quite heated about what has gone on here throughout the morning at this courthouse as the attorney general accuses his company of fraud. And I have it here. He said that he is in front, again, denying wrong, wrongdoing, but really about the judge saying that he is before a judge who has already made up his mind and that is, is ridiculous and I will just say Kira it's been a really striking scene inside of the courtroom you can really see that the former president is hanging on every single word that the attorney general's team is saying that his own defense team is saying so it seems that we've wrapped up openings for the morning and just I want to point out one specific sort of uh, interaction that went on towards the end right before the lunch break which is when Trump's attorney uh, you know after their openings were were done was sort of pleading with the judge moving forward uh, in the rest of the case after summary judgment, sort of imploring him to still listen to the evidence and give the defendants an opportunity to put on their case and not rush to judgments because there, as he said, there are different ways to value properties. And it was at that moment that the judge said, you know, you can put on an expert witness, but that's not evidence. That's just expert opinion. And you could see at that moment the former president sort of sitting back in his chair, throwing up his hands a little bit, frustrated with what the judge was saying. So really, really striking in there, Kira, as the former president is listening to every single thing going on, paying attention, and sometimes reacting. And then we're hearing that frustration from him just now outside of the courtroom. 
So let's talk more about that, John. You know, he, he spoke uh, to reporters. Uh, and Olivia, did you say he's still speaking or no? He just shortly addressed reporters, right? Okay, he addressed reporters. And, and he blasted know, yeah. the New York DA, right? So, John, you know, what more are you hearing from the Trump team? And do you think we'll hear more from Trump? I mean, this is not a guy that likes to stay quiet. Uh, no, I mean, we've already had two rounds of this. So you have to imagine when he comes back, when he leaves for the day, eventually he will have something else to say. As you well noted, a camera phone, a camera, a microphone, and Donald Trump, kind of hard to stop that dance. But look, I think what you're seeing from Donald Trump and we're hearing from his team are one and the same. Donald Trump is livid that these proceedings are happening today because this cuts at the core of what Donald Trump is. Donald Trump campaigned for the White House on the guy that made it in Manhattan. Donald Trump's brand, his life, his legacy has all been about his New York success story, as he defines it, getting onto Fifth Avenue and having buildings erected all over Manhattan with his name on it, from downtown to a hotel right along Central Park to years ago, having buildings along Manhattan's Upper West Side with Trump all over them. Now, Donald Trump has lost some of that just over the course of life, but the main main core fixtures remain. If this ruling is upheld from the judge a couple of days ago, Kira, the summary judgment, and if there is another ruling that goes against Trump and they lose on appeal, Donald Trump and New York are headed for an immediate divorce. That obviously to completely destroys what has been Donald Trump's image as the guy who made it in Manhattan. So, Kim, you know, these allegations surrounding his, tax, his taxes have been ongoing for decades, even going back to his father. So what can be done now that hasn't been done in the past? Well, John mentioned it. Really, the big part of the case is over. Uh, there are seven different counts. And on one of those counts last week, the judge found against Donald Trump on liability. The judge already found on the papers that he engaged in massive fraud. And the court said that this is a, a documents case. We don't need any witnesses. And the reason is for that one count, his state of mind doesn't matter. So long as there's false or misleading statements that were used in business, and I'm paraphrasing, he is, is liable for fraud. And the judge lists all the various problems, but one of them has to do with valuing Mar-a-Lago. And the judge in italics says, it was valued at 2,300 times what an assessor put it at. So really this trial, there's six other counts that do involve conspiracy and state of mind. Um, but the big issue here, as John said, they the judges already ordered their certificates of these businesses to be canceled, to be liquidated. So the only thing really that's left here is how much money Donald Trump is going to have to disgorge. Uh, Letitia James is asking for a quarter billion dollars, but his former lawyer and fixer, uh, Michael Cohen, puts that number at closer to $600 million and says he can't pay it either way. Okay, you just mentioned, mentioned liquidation, and we're talking about how this could impact his net worth, his empire, but John, would this be a case that would actually, uh, you know, have Trump in the food line? No, it won't. I mean, listen, it will definitely be a problem for Donald Trump because that much cash is certainly hard to come by. Donald Trump says he's worth billions, so it's definitely possible. But again, the food line put aside for a second, it's the ego line that we need to worry about here. And that is what's going to eat at Donald Trump more than anything beyond the cost of dinner. It's really everything Donald Trump cooks with is his brand. So for Letitia James, who made that statement outside of court saying people who think they're rich, she knew what she was doing. She knows this case is a thorn in Donald Trump's side, and she just wants to stick it to him, Kira. Yeah, well, sticking it to him could create uh, some pretty dangerous uh, situations, as we well know, and move forward. Olivia, John, Kim, thanks so much. We'll follow it, of course. And House Speaker Kevin McCarthy is vowing to stand up to conservative Republicans who are planning to oust him after he narrowly stepped or stopped, rather, a government shutdown by siding with Democrats. He's now facing a direct threat from Florida Congressman Matt Gates, who's accusing the Speaker of secretly working with President Biden on funding for Ukraine. Take a listen. It is becoming increasingly clear who the Speaker of the House already works for, and it's not the Republican conference. Members of the Republican Party might vote differently on a motion to vacate if they heard what the Speaker had to share with us about his secret side deal with Joe Biden. That's all right if Republican and Democrats join together to do what is right. 
If somebody wants to make a motion against me, bring it. There has to be an adult in the room. For more, let's bring in our Jay O'Brien on Capitol Hill. There, also senior White House correspondent Selena Wang. So, Jay, who else is supporting uh, Gates in this effort uh, thus far to oust the speaker? Yeah, that is very much unclear right now, Kira. We've heard from some Republicans who say they have an open mind on this or they're undecided. We've heard from a lot of House Republicans who say they're on McCarthy's side here. As you know, all it takes is five House Republicans to vote against anything in the House. And with Kevin McCarthy's slim majority, that puts him in a tough position. From the fifth Republican on, McCarthy has to start offsetting those votes with Democrats if Gates were to move to oust him. So the other thing we don't know is if McCarthy He's going to try to work with Democrats to keep his job. The last thing we don't know, not to give you a list of things we don't know, is exactly when Gates would bring this motion to oust McCarthy. You just heard those remarks that he gave on the floor. He also gaggled with reporters right after that, and he got pressed. Are you going to bring that so-called motion to vacate today? Are you going to bring it tomorrow? He's promised to bring it this week, Kira, but other than that, he has been very cagey on what the timing he's looking at is. So then, Jay, let's talk about the continuing resolution then. What's missing from this bill and how long do you think it'll keep the government funded? And with a continuing resolution, that CR, that stopgap funding measure that was passed Saturday that kept the federal government open, that's what really, you know, brought this clash between Gates and McCarthy to another level. They've been locking horns for a long time here. But it's a short-term government funding measure. It keeps the government open 45 days, so into mid-November. It doesn't have those conservative border priorities that Republicans initially wanted. It also doesn't have aid for Ukraine. It's got $16 billion in it for a disaster assistance, as you're seeing on your screen. And the problem that Gates has with it is that McCarthy got a lot of Democrats to back it and actually lost a significant number of Republicans. That legislation wouldn't have passed without Democrats. And Gates says that violates the deal that McCarthy made with Republicans when he wanted to become Speaker, that he wouldn't work with Democrats to put legislation over the goal line. That is what he's trying to use to say to Republicans that it's time to boot McCarthy from his job. All right, so Gaze is accusing the speaker of secretly working with Biden on funding for Ukraine. Selena, what is the White House saying about funding for Ukraine? Well, President Biden said that there's some time, but not much time before current money for Ukraine runs out. And he said there's, quote, an overwhelming sense of urgency. But Kira, we don't have the exact timeline here. In fact, we've just learned from a U.S. official that there is six billion dollars in USA to Ukraine to meet those urgent military needs, but not enough to meet long term military needs and no money left to service the economic and humanitarian needs. It is a big blow to the White House that they didn't get more aid in this stopgap funding bill that was passed over the weekend. And it's something that President Biden himself has been urging Congress to do. And less than two weeks ago, Ukraine's President Zelensky was here in Washington directly, in person, face to face, pleading lawmakers to provide more ammunition, to provide more aid. Take a listen to what else President Biden said here. I hope my friends on the other side keep their word about support for Ukraine. They said they're going to support Ukraine in a separate vote. We cannot, under any circumstance, allow American support for Ukraine to be interrupted. President Biden there saying that he is confident and he believes the speaker will keep that commitment to get more funding to Ukraine passed. And leaders from both sides have said they expect this could happen in the coming weeks. But look, nothing here is guaranteed. McCarthy has said that he wants to tie more funding to Ukraine to these border security measures that are not backed by Democrats. And all of this coming at a very critical time for Ukraine. Their counteroffensive against Russia has gone slower than expected and a lawmaker in Ukraine telling us that if more American aid is not given, that it will mean weaker air defense systems and that more women and babies will die. So Jay, end of the day, you know, could Gates actually pull this off? I mean, it's pretty difficult to remove a House Speaker, yes? Yeah, it is incredibly difficult to remove a House Speaker. Some of this hinges on what Democrats do, and Democratic lawmakers we've spoken with over the weekend and into today say they're not clear with what Democrat leadership wants them to do, but all it would take would be the word from Democratic leadership to have some Democrats withhold their votes or maybe not show up and lower the threshold McCarthy would need to clear. And so a lot of this hinges on what House Democrats do. But the other thing that's very interesting here, Kira, is that Gates got a question from our own Rachel Scott 
on the steps of the Capitol after he left the floor for that floor speech. And he was asked, if you don't get this motion to vacate passed, meaning if you lose this vote, will you keep bringing it again and again and again? And Gates said he would. And I can tell you that's one of the questions hanging over the Capitol right now is how much is Gates committed to continually bring these motions and, pack, and maybe paralyzing the work of Congress to get his way in booting McCarthy? All right, Jay, Selena, thanks so much. We'll, of course, track this story throughout the day, see what happens. And coming up, the pandemic pause on student loans lifted. What you need to know if you're one of the nearly 30 million Americans impacted. Whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Glad you're streaming with us. Well, after three years of a pandemic pause, nearly 30 million Americans are back on the hook for their student loan debt. The pause lifted and set in stone after the Supreme Court struck down President Biden's attempt to cancel student debt for millions of Americans. Our Elizabeth Schulze joins us now for more. So what do borrowers, Elizabeth, actually need to know about the restart of this payments? Probably some of them, uh, maybe many of them, not expecting this. Well, and it's been a long time coming. Eight extensions of the pause here, and here we are, October 1st. It's officially done. So that means 28 million borrowers who have federal student loan debt are now on the hook for those payments at some point over the course of this month. Generally, on average, the payment for the borrowers is between $200 and $300. So this will be a strain on Americans' budgets. And we've been talking to borrowers who talk about how this is something on top of inflation, rising interest rates. This is an additional headwind for their spending. So a couple important things to know. First of all, most borrowers should have already gotten a notice from the education department 21 days before their bill is due. If you still don't know when your bill is due, you should go to studentaid.gov. You can find out who your loan servicer is, is there and you can find the exact bill's due date. And then important to know there are a couple other, other steps right now that are trying to kind of ease borrowers back in, Kira. For example, there is a one-year grace period on some of those loan payments. That means that if you miss a payment, you're going to be okay for a year but you are gonna still have interest add up on your loans. Interest was also frozen during the pause and that's now adding up and it does add up really fast, Kira. So you spoke with a few people impacted by the end of the pause. What did they tell you? You know, this was, uh, we wanted to get out and talk to borrowers to see how did they change their spending and their saving over these last three years. When you're talking about the difference of hundreds of dollars every month, where does that money go instead? And what a lot of borrowers said was they were able to have a little bit of a financial relief. They had the, the, the question of could they pay their bills 
they weren't as worried. And, you know, Sarah Wood, she was one of the bars we spoke to. She's a mother. She has two twin daughters. She has twin daughters in Denver. And she, she has $180,000 in student debt, Kira. Here's what she told us about what that number looked like and, and what it meant during the pause. What does that number mean to you? You know, it's this thing that I am probably the most ashamed of in my life. We have to think of and we have to budget for every day and we have to budget for, for the future consequences of this loan every single day. You need to live in a house, you need to pay groceries, you need to eat, and then from there on you kind of have to figure out where to skimp and save. You know, a lot of borrowers understood that they say that they get why there's been backlash to the fact that this pause was in place, that there's a feeling among many Americans who said, I already had to pay my debts. It's time for these people to pay their bills, too. And, and Sarah, for example, said she gets that argument, but said this is should be a conversation around broader reform, about the cost of tuition, about these interest rates. How can we better educate people so that they don't find themselves with so much debt that ends up affecting their investments and their savings for their own kids, too? And so the Supreme Court ruling was, you know, a pretty big setback for President Biden. Does the White House have any future action planned on the student loans? Well, the White House, Kira, says that it is looking into broad debt cancellation. It's trying to pursue other avenues for how to cancel up to $20,000 in debt, as we saw that the president tried to do. That was what was struck down by the Supreme Court. One possible avenue would be through the Higher Education Act, this other legal pathway. But in the meantime, there is that one-year grace period that I talked about as far as missed payments. And then the administration has also launched this new repayment program called SAVE. And this is an income-driven repayment program. Specifically, it could help lower a lot of the monthly payments, especially for lower-income borrowers. So there is a big push from from the education department to try to get borrowers to go on, see what their payments would look like under this new plan, see if you can qualify for those lower payments and, and lower interest rates uh, as a way to try to cushion some of the blow, especially if you've been struggling to, to throughout the past couple of years, Kara. Well, we'll track it. Elizabeth Schulze, thanks so much. And coming up, the roots that helped Latinos rise, exploring the enormous contribution they've made as one of the culture's Latina icons Rita Moreno takes us there. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Customized to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. We're honored. ABC's 2020 winner of three Emmy Awards for Excellence. Thank you for making 2020 Friday night's most watched and most honored news magazine. I think vulnerability is extremely powerful. This is an artist that I looked up to at one point. I never would have imagined that the ending would have been what it was. They do not shock me. The treatment was just so disgusting on everyone's part. Did Lizzo ever put her hands on you? No, she didn't get to that point. She attempted to come at me with her fist balled up. Lizzo is denying it all. Lizzo's legal limbo. You never, like, expect for it to turn into that. Now streaming on Hulu. I'm Rob Marciano in Tampa, Florida, reporting in Hurricane Adalia. Wherever the weather may take you, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live.
former president as he has left the courtroom. They were on a break as he's facing those tax charges. Let's listen in. As I say, murders are going on as you stand here, and they're wasting everybody's time for many months on this case where banks got paid a fortune, loaned money, got paid money back, didn't even need their money. We built a great company, and we have to go through this. So this just broke, but before I discuss that, why are we trying a case that the appellate division of New York State has just ruled recently that we won 80 percent of our case, and this judge refuses to acknowledge the ruling, which is very plain for all to see. We won, as you know, it had to do with Ivanka, and it had to do with other things. It had to do with the statute of limitations, where they wanted to go back to 200 years ago, 500 years ago. It was limited, very much limited, and it amounted to about 80 percent of the case was won by us in the appellate division. And this rogue judge, a Trump hater, the only one that hates Trump more is his associate up there, his person that works with him. And she's screaming into his ear on almost every time we ask a question. It's a disgrace. You want to know the truth? It's a disgrace. Yep. So this rogue judge refused. All right, you're, you're listening to the former president, but he's just going off on the judge in this case, calling him a Trump hater and a rogue judge. But the bottom line is uh, Trump is denying all wrongdoing as we follow this $250 million civil fraud trial. Uh, where New York Attorney General Letitia James uh, has accused the former president of fraudulent business practices. So now what you have is a former president whose empire and net worth uh, is at stake here. The accusations are uh, that he, you know, basically fixed the numbers uh, and didn't pay taxes and all the money he was making. So while he goes off on the judge saying he's a Trump hater, we'll let him do that as we move on to other headlines. This is what we're tracking. Two scientists whose discoveries led to the mRNA vaccines have been awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for Medicine, or Nobel Prize for Medicine, rather. Sorry about that. We're talking about Caitlin Carrico and Drew Weissman. They met in the 1990s, actually, by chance while photocopying research papers, but then came together and their discoveries actually led to the COVID-19 vaccines that helped slow down the pandemic. Well, Carrico says that when she got the call about the prestigious award this morning, she thought it was a prank. <laughs> Simone Biles proving once again that she is one of the greatest athletes of all time. The seven-time Olympic gold medalist became the first woman to land a Yurchenko double pike at the World Championships in Belgium. Now, you won't have to remember that name for long, although she really was an incredible journalist back in the 80s. But that move has now been named the Biles two-on vault, her fifth Name skill, by the way, that Biles has. She'll can complete now all four individual finals, then the all-around final later this week. We'll be watching. Beyonce just wrapped up her record-breaking Renaissance tour in Kansas City and is now moving on to rule the box office. Queen B announcing that her tour is coming to AMC movie theaters December 1st. Pretty clever, right? Well, it happened just weeks before Taylor Swift, era's film, hits the silver screen. Thanks for streaming with us. I'm Kira Phillips. From breaking news to all the stories that matter to you, you can always find us on Hulu, Roku, the ABC News app, and of course on abcnews.com. The news never stops, neither do we. We got a lot more ahead. Stay with us. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You got to think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> I love you. 
Yeah. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. What's good to watch? Read? Where can I get a great deal on what I'm just dying to buy? Oh, it's all right here. GMA Life. Get the latest celebrity buzz, deals and steals, and the coolest lifestyle tips from GMA. I love that so much. Streaming weekends on ABC News Live. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. Today on ABC News Live, Donald Trump on trial, accused of inflating his net worth, the former president making an unprecedented appearance in court, calling it the greatest witch hunt of all time. Kevin McCarthy feeling heat from within his own party, Matt Gates threatening to oust him as speaker. We are live on Capitol Hill. Borrowers beware, student loan payments are back, and millions of people now on the hook, the crushing debt, and what it means for Americans ahead. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kira Phillips. Our top story this hour, the unprecedented court appearance of a former U.S. President, Donald Trump, in a New York City courtroom facing a $250 million lawsuit that could change the face of his empire and net worth. Trump, his two sons, and Trump org execs all accused of acting in a decade-long scheme using numerous acts of fraud and misrepresentation to actually inflate Trump's net worth while lowering his tax burden. Trump denying all wrongdoing, calling the case a political witch hunt and an effort to keep him out of the White House. Joining us now from just outside the courthouse there, our investigative producer, Olivia Rubin, also ABC News executive editorial producer, John Santucci, and legal contributor and law professor at the University of Baltimore School of Law, Kim Whaley. Olivia, let's start with you. What's the latest right now from inside court? Well, the latest, latest, Kira, is that court has broken for lunch uh, for now. And the former president just emerged from the courtroom and spoke to those cameras that are on the third floor hallway. And just by listening to him, Kira, he sounds quite heated about what has gone on here throughout the morning at this courthouse as the attorney general accuses his company of fraud. And I have it here. He said that he is in front, again, denying wrong, wrongdoing, but really about the judge saying that he is before a judge who has already made up his mind and that it is ridiculous. And I will just say, Kira, it's been a really striking scene inside of the courtroom. You can really see that the former president is hanging on every single word that the attorney general's team is saying that his own defense team is saying so it seems that we've wrapped up openings for the morning and just I want to point out one specific sort of uh, interaction that went on towards the end right before the lunch break which is when Trump's attorney uh, you know after their openings were done was sort of pleading with the judge moving forward uh, in the rest of the case after summary judgment sort of imploring him to still listen to the evidence and give the defendants an opportunity to put 
put on their case and not rush to judgments because there, as he said, there are different ways to value properties. And it was at that moment that the judge said, you know, you can put on an expert witness, but that's not evidence. That's just expert opinion. And you could see at that moment the former president sort of sitting back in his chair, throwing up his hands a little bit, frustrated with what the judge was saying. So really, really striking in there, Kira, as the former president is listening to every single thing going on, paying attention, and sometimes reacting. And then we're hearing that frustration from him just now outside of the courtroom. So let's talk more about that, John. You know, he, he spoke uh, to reporters. Uh, and Olivia, did you say he's still speaking or no? He just shortly addressed reporters, right? Okay, he addressed reporters. And, and he I, blasted I yeah. the New York DA, right? So, John, you know, what more are you hearing from the Trump team? And do you think we'll hear more from Trump? I mean, this is not a guy that likes to stay quiet. No, I mean, we've already had two rounds of this. So you have to imagine when he comes back, when he leaves for the day, eventually he will have something else to say. As you well noted, a camera phone, a camera, a microphone, and Donald Trump, kind of hard to stop that dance. But look, I think what you're seeing from Donald Trump and we're hearing from his team are one and the same. Donald Trump is livid that these proceedings are happening today because this cuts at the core of what Donald Trump is. Donald Trump campaigned for the White House on the guy that made it in Manhattan. Donald Trump's brand, his life, his legacy has all been about his New York success story, as he defines it, getting onto Fifth Avenue and having buildings erected all over Manhattan with his name on it, from downtown to a hotel right along Central Park to years ago, having buildings along Manhattan's Upper West Side with Trump all over them. Now, Donald Trump has lost some of that just over the course of life, but the main core fixtures remain. If this ruling is upheld from the judge a couple of days ago, Kira, the summary judgment, and if there is another ruling that goes against Trump and they lose on appeal, Donald Trump and New York are headed for an immediate divorce. That obviously to completely destroys what has been Donald Trump's image as the guy who made it in Manhattan. So, Kim, you know, these allegations surrounding his, ta his taxes have been ongoing for decades, even going back to his father. So what can be done now that hasn't been done in the past? Well, John mentioned it. Really, the big part of the case is over. Uh, there are seven different counts. And on one of those counts last week, the judge found against Donald Trump on liability. The judge already found on the papers that he engaged in massive fraud. And the court said that this is a, a documents case. We don't need any witnesses. And the reason is for that one count, his state of mind doesn't matter. So long as there's false or misleading statements that were used in business, and I'm paraphrasing, he is, is liable for fraud. And the judge lists all the various problems, but one of them has to do with valuing Mar-a-Lago. And the judge in italics says, it was valued at 2,300 times what an assessor put it at. So really this trial, there's six other counts that do involve conspiracy and state of mind. Um, but the big issue here, as John said, they the judge has already ordered their certificates of these businesses to be canceled, to be liquidated. So the only thing really that's left here is how much money Donald Trump is going to have to disgorge. Uh, Letitia James is asking for a quarter billion dollars, but his former lawyer and fixer, uh, Michael Cohen, puts that number at closer to $600 million and says he can't pay it either way. Okay, you just mentioned, mentioned liquidation, and we're talking about how this could impact his net worth, his empire. But, John, would this be a case that would actually, uh, you know, have Trump in the food line? No, it won't. I mean, listen, it will definitely be a problem for Donald Trump because that much cash is certainly hard to come by. Donald Trump says he's worth billions, so it's definitely possible. But again, the food line put aside for a second, it's the ego line that we need to worry about here. And that is what's going to eat at Donald Trump more than anything beyond the cost of dinner. It's really everything Donald Trump cooks with is his brand. So for Letitia James, who made that statement outside of court saying people who think they're rich, she knew what she was doing. She knows this case is a thorn in Donald Trump's side, and she just wants to stick it to him, Kira.
Yeah, well, sticking it to them could create uh, some pretty dangerous uh, situations, as we well know, and move forward. Olivia, John, Kim, thanks so much. We'll follow it, of course. And House Speaker Kevin McCarthy is vowing to stand up to conservative Republicans who are planning to oust him after he narrowly stepped or stopped, rather, a government shutdown by siding with Democrats. He's now facing a direct threat from Florida Congressman Matt Gates, who's accusing the speaker of secretly working with President Biden on funding for Ukraine. Take a listen. It is becoming increasingly clear who the Speaker of the House already works for, and it's not the Republican conference. Members of the Republican Party might vote differently on a motion to vacate if they heard what the Speaker had to share with us about his secret side deal with Joe Biden. It's all right if Republican and Democrats join together to do what is right. If somebody wants to make a motion against me, bring it. There has to be an adult in the room. For more, let's bring in our Jay O'Brien on Capitol Hill. There are also senior White House correspondent Selena Wang. So, Jay, who else is supporting uh, Gates in this effort uh, thus far to oust the speaker? Yeah, that is very much unclear right now, Kira. We've heard from some Republicans who say they have an open mind on this or they're undecided. We've heard from a lot of House Republicans who say they're on McCarthy's side here. As you know, all it takes is five House Republicans to vote against anything in the House. And with Kevin McCarthy's slim majority, that puts him in a tough position. From the fifth Republican on, McCarthy has to start offsetting those votes with Democrats if Gates were to move to oust him. So the other thing we don't know is if McCarthy is going to try to work with Democrats to keep his job. The last thing we don't know, not to give you a list of things we don't know, is exactly when Gates would bring this motion to oust McCarthy. You just heard those remarks that he gave on the floor. He also gaggled with reporters right after that, and he got pressed. Are you going to bring that so-called motion to vacate today? Are you going to bring it tomorrow? He's promised to bring it this week, Kira, but other than that, he has been very cagey on what the timing he's looking at is. So then, Jay, let's talk about the continuing resolution then. What's missing from this bill and how long do you think it'll keep the government funded? And with a continuing resolution, that CR, that stopgap funding measure that was passed Saturday that kept the federal government open, that's what really, you know, brought this clash between Gates and McCarthy to another level. They've been locking horns for a long time here. But it's a short-term government funding measure. It keeps the government open 45 days, so into mid-November. It doesn't have those conservative border priorities that Republicans initially wanted. It also doesn't have aid for Ukraine. It's got $16 billion in it for a disaster assistance, as you're seeing on your screen. And the problem that Gates has with it is that McCarthy got a lot of Democrats to back it and actually lost a significant number of Republicans. That legislation wouldn't have passed without Democrats. And Gates says that violates the deal that McCarthy made with Republicans when he wanted to become Speaker, that he wouldn't work with Democrats to put legislation over the goal line. That is what he's trying to use to say to Republicans that it's time to boot McCarthy from his job. All right, so Gaze is accusing the speaker of secretly working with Biden on funding for Ukraine. Selena, what is the White House saying about funding for Ukraine? Well, President Biden said that there's some time, but not much time before current money for Ukraine runs out. And he said there's, quote, an overwhelming sense of urgency. But Kira, we don't have the exact timeline here. In fact, we've just learned from a U.S. official that there is $6 billion in U.S. aid to Ukraine to meet those urgent military needs, but not enough to meet long-term military needs and no money left to service the economic and humanitarian needs. It is a big blow to the White House that they didn't get more aid in this stopgap funding bill that was passed over the week. Weekend. It's something that President Biden himself has been urging Congress to do. And less than two weeks ago, Ukraine's President Zelensky was here in Washington directly, in person, face to face, pleading lawmakers to provide more ammunition, to provide more aid. Take a listen to what else President Biden said here. I hope my friends on the other side keep their word about support for Ukraine. They said they're going to support Ukraine in a separate vote. We cannot, under any circumstance, allow American support for Ukraine to be interrupted. President Biden there saying that he is confident and he believes the speaker will keep that commitment to get more funding to Ukraine passed. And leaders from both sides have said they expect this could happen in the coming weeks. But look, nothing here is guaranteed. McCarthy has said that he wants to tie more funding to Ukraine to these border security measures that are not backed by Democrats. And all of this coming at a very critical time 
for Ukraine. Their counteroffensive against Russia has gone slower than expected, and a lawmaker in Ukraine telling us that if more American aid is not given, then it will mean weaker air defense systems and that more women and babies will die. So, Jay, end of the day, you know, could Gates actually pull this off? I mean, it's pretty difficult to remove a House speaker, yes? Yeah, it is incredibly difficult to remove a House speaker. Some of this hinges on what Democrats do, and Democratic lawmakers that we've spoken with over the weekend and into today say they're not clear with what Democrat leadership wants them to do, but all it would take would be the word from Democratic leadership to have some Democrats withhold their votes or maybe not show up and lower the threshold McCarthy would need to clear. And so a lot of this hinges on what House Democrats do. But the other thing that's very interesting here, Kira, is that Gates got a question from our own Rachel Scott on the steps of the Capitol after he left the floor for that floor speech. And he was asked, if you don't get this motion to vacate passed, meaning if you lose this vote, will you keep bringing it again and again and again? And Gates said he would. And I can tell you that's one of the questions hanging over the Capitol right now is, how much is Gates committed to continually bring these motions and, pack, and maybe paralyzing the work of Congress to get his way in booting McCarthy? All right, Jay, Selena, thanks so much. We'll, of course, track this story throughout the day, see what happens. And coming up, the pandemic pause on student loans lifted. What you need to know if you're one of the nearly 30 million Americans impacted. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 store. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students. It was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Tomorrow. The heat is overwhelming. He's been right there as wildfires raged. And now, after the devastating Maui fires, GMA's Mac Utman showing how quickly these fires can spread in a live demonstration that could save your home. Tomorrow morning on GMA. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Glad you're streaming with us. Well, after three years of a pandemic pause, nearly 3 million Americans are back on the hook for their student loan debt. The pause lifted and set in stone after the Supreme Court struck down President Biden's attempt to cancel student debt for millions of Americans. Our Elizabeth Schulze joins us now for more. So what do borrowers, Elizabeth, actually need to know about the restart of this payments? Probably some of them, uh, maybe many of them, not expecting this. Well, and it's been a long time coming. Eight extensions of the pause here, and here we are, October 1st. It's officially done. So that means 28 million borrowers who have federal student loan debt are now on the hook for those payments at some point over the course of this month. Generally, on average, the payment for the borrowers is between $200 and $300. So this will be a strain on Americans' budgets. And we've been talking to borrowers who talk about how this is something on top of inflation, rising interest rates. This is an additional headwind for their spending. So a couple important things to 
to know. First of all, most borrowers should have already gotten a notice from the education department 21 days before their bill is due. If you still don't know when your bill is due, you should go to studentaid.gov. You can find out who your loan servicer is, is there and you can find the exact bill's due date. And then important to know there are a couple of other, other steps right now that are trying to kind of ease borrowers back in, Kira. For example, there is a one-year grace period on some of those loan payments. That means that if you miss a payment, you're going to be okay for a year, but you are going to still have interest add up on your loans. Interest was also frozen during the pause, and that's now adding up, and it does add up really fast, Kira. So you spoke with a few people impacted by the end of the pause. What did they tell you? You know, this was, uh, we wanted to get out and talk to borrowers to see how did they change their spending and their saving over these last three years. When you're talking about the difference of hundreds of dollars every month, where does that money go instead? And what a lot of borrowers said was they were able to have a little bit of a financial relief. They had the, the, the question of could they pay their bills they weren't as worried. And, you know, Sarah Wood, she was one of the borrowers we spoke to. She's a mother. She has two twin daughters. She has twin daughters in Denver. And she, she has $180,000 in student debt, Kira. Here's what she told us about what that number looked like and, and what it meant during the pause. What does that number mean to you? You know, it's this thing that I am probably the most ashamed of in my life. We have to think of and we have to budget for every day and we have to budget for, for the future consequences of this loan every single day. You need to live in a house, you need to pay groceries, you need to eat, and then from there on you kind of have to figure out where to skimp and save. You know, a lot of borrowers understood that they say that they get why there's been backlash to the fact that this pause was in place, that there's a feeling among many Americans who said, I already had to pay my debts. It's time for these people to pay their bills, too. And, and Sarah, for example, said she gets that argument, but said this is should be a conversation around broader reform, about the cost of tuition, about these interest rates. How can we better educate people so that they don't find themselves with so much debt that ends up affecting their investments and their savings for their own kids, too? And so the Supreme Court ruling was, you know, a pretty big setback for President Biden. Does the White House have any future action planned on the student loans? Well, the White House, Kira, says that it is looking into broad debt cancellation. It's trying to pursue other avenues for how to cancel up to $20,000 in debt, as we saw that the president tried to do. That was what was struck down by the Supreme Court. One possible avenue would be through the Higher Education Act, this other legal pathway. But in the meantime, there is that one-year grace period that I talked about as far as missed payments. And then the administration has also launched this new repayment program called SAVE. And this is an income-driven repayment program. Specifically, it could help lower a lot of the monthly payments, especially for lower-income borrowers. So there is a big push from from the education department to try to get borrowers to go on, see what their payments would look like under this new plan, see if you can qualify for those lower payments and, and lower interest rates uh, as a way to try to cushion some of the blow, especially if you've been struggling to, to throughout the past couple of years, Kara. Well, we'll track it. Elizabeth Schulze, thanks so much. And coming up, the roots that helped Latinos rise, exploring the enormous contribution they've made as one of the culture's Latina icons Rita Moreno takes us there. I think vulnerability is extremely powerful. This is an artist that I looked up to at one point. I never would have imagined that the ending would have been what it was. They do not shock me. The treatment was just so disgusting on everyone's part. Did Lizzo ever put her hands on you? No, she didn't get to that point. She attempted to come at me with her fist balled up. Lizzo is denying it all. Lizzo's legal limbo. You never, like, expect for it to turn into that. Now streaming on Hulu. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families Trump. here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. ABC News, America's number one news source. Reporting from Bedminster, New Jersey, I'm Mary Bruce. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live.
glad you're streaming with us. This is what we're tracking. Two scientists whose discoveries led to the mRNA vaccines have been awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for Medicine, or Nobel Prize for Medicine, rather. Sorry about that. We're talking about Caitlin Carrico and Drew Weissman. They met in the 1990s, actually, by chance while photocopying research papers, but then came together and their discoveries actually led to the COVID-19 vaccines that helped slow down the pandemic. Well, Carrico says that when she got the call about the prestigious award this morning, she thought it was a prank. <laughs> Simone Biles proving once again that she is one of the greatest athletes of all time. The seven-time Olympic gold medalist became the first woman to land a Yurchenko double pike at the World Championships in Belgium. Now, you won't have to remember that name for long, although she really was an incredible journalist back in the 80s. But that move has now been named the Biles two-on vault, her fifth name skill, by the way, that Biles has. She'll complete now all four individual finals, then the all-around final later this week. We'll be watching. Beyonce just wrapped up her record-breaking Renaissance tour in Kansas City and is now moving on to rule the box office. Queen B announcing that her tour is coming to AMC Movie Theaters December 1st. Pretty clever, right? Well, it happened just weeks before Taylor Swift, era's film, hits the silver screen. Well, she is an icon within Latin culture, musician, actress, dancer, and trailblazer. Now, Academy Award winning Rita Moreno takes us on a journey to the roots and rise of the Latin identity. A legacy that goes from the Olmecs to the Mayans, whose empires predate the birth of Christ, to the Aztecs and the Incas, whose empires existed and thrived for hundreds of years before the arrival and invasion of European settlers, and their introduction of African slave trade to the Western Hemisphere. The Latino identity has a rich and complex ancestry. The Aztecs ruled over an estimated 15 million people the empire stretched from what today is known as the United States borderlands through southern Mexico. At its peak, the Aztec capital of Tenochtitlan had over 140,000 people. Just south of the Aztecs were the Mayans, who were known for their advanced pyramid building, astronomy, and mathematics. Their agricultural technology developed the basis of what is the majority of the world's diet. As you make your way down to what is now known as South America, we find the Incas. At its peak, the Incan Empire was made up of 12 million people. Today, one of the most sacred archaeological centers of the Incas is a modern wonder of the world, Machu Picchu. The Tainos and Carib peoples navigated from the coast of South America to the Caribbean islands, named after the Caribs themselves. Once the most numerous indigenous people of the Caribbean, the Taino population may have reached anywhere between one or two million at the time of the Spanish conquest in the late 15th century. The Spaniards' quest for land didn't end there. By 1513, they arrived to a land with many flowers that they named Florida. Unknown to many, the first European language spoken in what is now the United States of America was actually Spanish and not English. The conquistadores brought with them diseases such as smallpox, mumps, and measles. They also brought with them one of the worst abuses of humankind, slavery. About 15 times as many African slaves were taken to Spanish and Portuguese colonies than to the US. The Spanish empire would dominate throughout the Western hemisphere for hundreds of years Finally, in the early 1800s, the majority of Latin American countries and their people would gain their independence except Cuba and Puerto Rico. For Mexico, the victory would be short-lived thanks to their neighbors, the United States. The U.S. wasn't content with what it had, pushing westward to seize the land that many presidents believed was America's destiny. To reach that goal, President James Polk provoked war with Mexico. After a long and bloody battle, there was an agreement called the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. 
Mexico signed the treaty under the promise the U.S. would recognize all Mexicans as citizens of their new nation. But the U.S. failed on its promise, granting only white Mexican citizenship and leaving indigenous and black Mexicans entirely disenfranchised. This would forever change the fate of generations of Mexican Americans to come and in turn mold the identity of all Latinos in the United States. Uh, Latinas like Rita Moreno and our thanks to her for that. And thanks for streaming with us. I'm Kira Phillips. The news never stops, neither do we. We'll be right back. at stake. So much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. So what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. I think vulnerability is extremely powerful. This is an artist that I looked up to at one point. I never would have imagined that the ending would have been what it was. They do not shock me. The treatment was just so disgusting on everyone's part. Did Lizzo ever put her hands on you? No, she didn't get to that point. She attempted to come at me with her fist balled up. Lizzo is denying it all. Lizzo's legal limbo. You never like expect for it to turn into that. Now streaming on Hulu. America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from near the epicenter of the worst earthquake to hit Morocco, I'm Tom Sufi Burridge. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Today on ABC News Live, Donald Trump on trial, accused of inflating his net worth, the former president making an unprecedented appearance in court, calling the greatest witch hunt of all time. The pandemic pause on student loans lifted and payments are due, the mounting debt and what it means for borrowers ahead. Blazing a trail to the top of the world's highest mountains and bringing the entire deaf community with them, one summit at a time. My interview with the barrier-busting deaf mountaineers this hour. Hello, everyone. I'm Kira Phillips. Our top story this hour, the unprecedented court appearance of a former U.S. president, Donald Trump, in a New York City courtroom facing a $250 million lawsuit that could change the face of his entire empire and net worth. Trump, his two sons, and Trump Org execs accused of acting in a decade-long scheme using numerous acts of fraud and misrepresentation to actually inflate Trump's net worth while lowering his tax burden. Trump denying all wrongdoing, calling the case a political witch hunt and an effort to keep him out of the White House. Joining us now from the courthouse just outside Manhattan, our senior investigative correspondent, Aaron Katursky, also executive editorial producer, John Santucci, along with former chief minority counsel of the U.S. Senate, permanent subcommittee on investigations, Jeff Robbins. So, Aaron, why a bench trial? Uh, well, that's how the, the, the law under which Trump is charged uh, it calls for a bench trial. One of his attorneys, Alina Haba, made mention that uh, Trump had wanted a jury trial, and undoubtedly he, he may have fared better, but th this trial is being heard by uh, Judge Arthur Ngoran, who has already ruled uh, about the core of the case, finding that Trump inflated his net worth by as much as $2.2 billion by overvaluing many of the properties in his real estate portfolio, and this is something Trump has denied, but it already puts him on a back foot as this trial begins. 
So, John, we've heard from Trump, what, three times today? Mm -hmm. He blasted the judge, he blasted Letitia James, he blasted the president, uh, just about everyone under the sun. But getting angry won't change the findings that the judge had no problem revealing today. No, and in fact, it's only going to anger this judge a little bit more, Kira. I mean, look, Donald Trump uh, knows what he's doing. He went to court today for a very clear reason, and that is every time Donald Trump believes he goes to court, poll numbers go up, fundraising goes up. Hey, it worked four times so far. Why don't we go again? So this was all last minute. Donald Trump, as Aaron well knows, was not expected to be at court this morning. Quite frankly, he has no reason to be at court this morning. Uh, this is a civil case. He's not required to be there. He's not going to take the stand anytime soon. That will happen in the coming weeks when he's called as a witness by the attorney general's team. But for now, Donald Trump is just sitting there, can't say much. So Kira, as you and I were talking about earlier, Donald Trump Trump and a camera, they know each other quite well, which is why we've seen him do these repeated statements. And, and just speaking to his team, uh, Kira, I said to one person, it, angry? What word? Livid? They said, we don't have a word for what he is right now, because this case gets to the core of what is Donald Trump, his business, his assets, and being told over and over again, Kira, that you're a fraud and you can't fight back in court. That is a bad day for Donald Trump. Jeff, it's like he uses these court appearances as a campaign event, you know, and it's not like the allegations are brand new. I mean, allegations like this have been surrounding his taxes, even going back to his father for decades. So what do you think can be done now that hasn't been done in the past? Well, Aaron said uh, accurately that uh, Mr. Trump was on his back foot and he is in a very deep hole. He's in a $250 million hole, legally speaking. There are going to be real consequences. Um, the judge has already ruled that these financial submissions were false and dishonest. Uh, and so all that really is left for this case over the next couple of months or however long it takes is, did he have a, he and his colleagues and his family members have a specific intent to defraud? Question how you can defraud without having a specific intent to defraud. And did they benefit by the fraud. And if they've benefited, then they're going to have to pay the money back. The attorney general claims it's $250 million or more. So they're not in Kansas anymore. They're in a tough situation uh, uh, financially. And it's very difficult, it's a very difficult position for his lawyers to be in. They really are, as Aaron says, on their back foot. Well, Aaron, on the back foot, but when you look at how much money Trump has, his family has, his businesses have, is this really going to make a huge dent in his way of life? If you believe the New York Attorney General and the ruling from the judge, much of that wealth, Kira, is a mirage and the, the product of a fraud that, that goes back more than a decade. And in court, in opening statements, the, the Attorney General's representative, Kevin Wallace, said the whole reason that, that Trump did this was for his own gain, because he really, in a vanity play, wanted to be higher up on the Forbes uh, billionaires list. And so, according to the Attorney General's opening statement, he would have his people adjust the value of certain properties, be it Trump Tower on Fifth Avenue or 40 Wall Street in the Financial District or Seven Springs, a resort compound in, in Westchester County. He would adjust the valuations of those properties to make him seem richer than he was. But it wasn't just a vanity play, according to the attorney general, that also had the effect of giving him more favorable terms on loans and insurance. And if, in fact, the judge agrees that that, that was uh, done illegally, he would have to pay back the spoils of the alleged fraud, and that could be as high as $250 million. Yeah, Jeff, Trump says that, uh, you know, this is all about politics and that this is an attack on him because he's leading in the polls. I mean, can he even prove that? I mean, the documents and the evidence have been exposed. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the problem is that you cannot say, if you have properties that are appraised at X, that I met a leprechaun. And the leprechaun took me to a tarot card reader. And the tarot card reader told me that the value of this property was actually 10 times X. You're going to lose if that's what your argument is, unless you have quite some leprechaun. And this judge has been very engaged with this case, knows the record very clearly. And the, uh, Trump's lawyers know that they have a very steep, very steep uh, uh, path to try to persuade this judge that uh, there was not specific intent to defraud and that he did not benefit from submitting these uh, financial statements, which enabled him to get favorable loan rates.
Oh, I think you have to be Irish, Jeff, to have a good connection <laughs> to a pretty savvy leprechaun. Aaron, John, Jeff, thank you guys very much. Well, House Speaker Kevin McCarthy is vowing to stand up to conservative Republicans who are planning to oust him now after he narrowly stopped a government shutdown by siding with Dems. He's now facing a direct threat from Florida Congressman Matt Gates, who's accusing the speaker of secretly working with President Biden on funding for Ukraine. It is becoming increasingly clear who the Speaker of the House already works for and it's not the Republican conference. Members of the Republican Party might vote differently on a motion to vacate if they heard what the speaker had to share with us about his secret side deal with Joe Biden. That's all right if Republican and Democrats join together to do what is right. If somebody wants to make a motion against me, bring it. There has to be an adult in the room. Let's for more, let's bring in our political director, Rick Klein, and also Jay O'Brien, who covers the Hill. So, Jay, I understand you just caught up uh, with Kevin McCarthy. What did he tell you? And it's too late, Kira. Kevin McCarthy was standing right here just a moment ago, uh, and we're working on getting that tape for you. But one of the things I asked him is, will he work with Democrats on a motion to vacate? And the reason why is because if you have more than five Republicans who back a motion to vacate, and it's unclear if Matt Gates would even get those numbers, but if you had more than five from the fifth Republican on, McCarthy would have to offset those votes with Democratic votes to keep his job. There are some other options, too. Democrats could not show up for the vote. They could vote to table the vote and send it back to committee. But I asked him, is he having conversations with Democrats? He says, I talk with Democrats all the time. And then I said, are you having conversations with Democrats on a motion to vacate? And he said he doesn't need them. So the question then becomes, what makes Speaker McCarthy so confident that he won't need Democrats? if Matt Gates were to bring a motion to vacate. He said on the floor earlier that he would bring a motion to vacate this week, but it's unclear exactly what the timetable that Gates is committing to is because the thought was he might bring the motion to vacate today. He could bring it when the floor opened for legislative business at 2 p.m., but we're not clear really when he's planning on bringing this. He got asked earlier today what Gates' plan on the timing of all this was, and he was cagey about that. So, Rick, it's pretty difficult to remove a House speaker, and I'm trying to remember, has that ever been done before? Not directly, no. I mean, you have to go back a, a century to, or almost a century to have a, a, an example of, uh, of the motion to vacate coming up even for a vote. Uh, the most recent example was actually Mark Meadows, the future White House Chief of Staff, who filed the, 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 same, kind of, uh, the same kind of motion that we're talking about right here regarding, regarding Speaker McCarthy back when it was Speaker John Boehner. Uh, and that ended up um, getting shuttled off and tabled, and John Boehner resigned on his own a couple of months later uh, for unrelated, he said, reasons. But I I think he saw what the pressure meant. So it's extraordinarily rare. Keep in mind, too, this is something that the, that rebel group inside the Republican conference fought for, was this ability to have Speaker McCarthy on that short a leash that at any time, any one member can say we want an up or down vote. But at the end of the day, it's hard to do that, especially when you don't have an alternative. It would take a, a major betrayal by McCarthy or a major turn of events to, 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 to force that. Uh, and that's why it's as, as unusual and rare and difficult to get done. You'd need a majority of those present and voting to to vote in favor of that motion to vacate. Uh, as Jay mentioned, there's ways to game that by not showing up or by voting present or other maneuvering, but, it, but you still need a lot of votes to, 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 to topple a House Speaker. So Jay, let's talk about the continuing resolution. What's missing from this bill and how long will it keep yeah, and that was really the straw that broke the camel's back here, Kira. So that was the government funding stopgap measure that was passed on Saturday. It would keep the federal government open until mid-November. It doesn't have any provisions on border security in it, which is something that House Republicans had sought with their version of a CR, which didn't pass earlier last week. And then it doesn't have any additional money for Ukraine in it either. That was something that the Biden administration had asked for, saying that Ukraine's money was dry, was drying out and they're in the middle of an intense counteroffensive and they would need that money. President Zelensky of Ukraine was here on Capitol Hill making the same pitch to lawmakers. Nonetheless, no Ukraine funding in that short-term funding deal. Again, it keeps the federal government open for 45 days. And the criticism from the likes of Matt Gates and the Republican Party is that because there was a sizable number of House Republicans who voted against that CR, the only reason it passed was with Democratic support and they're using that as an argument to oust Speaker McCarthy because he 
pledged when he became speaker that he wouldn't work with Democrats to push big pieces of legislation over the goal line. All right, Jay, Rick, thanks guys so much. And after three years of a pandemic pause, nearly 30 million Americans are back on the hook for their student loan debt. That pause lifted and set in stone after the Supreme Court struck down President Biden's attempt to cancel student debt from millions of Americans. Our Elizabeth Schulze joins us now for more. So what do buyers, borrowers rather, need to know about the restart of these payments now, Elizabeth? Well, Kira, this pause is officially over. As, Oct as of October 1st, this pause that was extended eight times on federal student loan payments is now at an end. So 28 million borrowers are going to have their bills due this month. The average payment is about $200 to $300 uh, every month for a lot of student loan borrowers. Here are a couple important things to just keep in mind right now. First is that there is going to be a one-year grace period if you miss a payment. So a lot of borrowers worried about this. If you don't make a payment, payment, what's going to happen is you won't be in default or held delinquent. So that is good news. But also really important to remember that you're now getting interest accruing on your debt. So that wasn't the case for three years during the pandemic. Interest rates were at zero percent. Now interest is adding up again. And this is really important because interest can add up really quickly. Borrowers end up spending thousands of dollars extra on their loans because of that interest. So if you are able to make a payment now, the experts I've been talking to say you should try to make it as you can because even if you try to take advantage of that grace period, you're still gonna have your balance be going up, Kira. So you spoke with a few people impacted by the end of the pause. What did they tell you? I did, and this is an issue that affects so many Americans who were watching the twists and turns and watched as President Biden proposed broader student debt relief that was ended by the Supreme Court. And they were hoping and wondering if there would be some sort of plan to cancel those debts. Ultimately, a lot of borrowers have been preparing for the end of this pause. They expected that at some point they would have to start making those payments once again. I talked to Sarah Wood, who's a mother of twin daughters in Denver. She wanted to be a teacher, ended up leaving that career pathway because she said she wasn't able to stomach it, pay for those loans every month. Here's what she talked about when it came to the amount of loans, which is $180,000, Kira. What does that number mean to you? You know, it's this thing that I am probably the most ashamed of in my life. We have to think of and we have to budget for every day and we have to budget for, for the future consequences of this loan every single day. You need to live in a house, you need to pay groceries, you need to eat, and then from there on you kind of have to figure out where to skimp and save. So here's the reality is that for millions of borrowers who haven't had to make those payments, it will be a change in their budgets over the next couple of months as they readjust to paying off those debts. And it comes at a time, of course, here we've talked about inflation is high, interest rates are high. So this is an additional headwind for the American economy, but ultimately one that will affect those people who are looking at the monthly expenses and saying, where do they have to make changes? So the Supreme Court ruling, it was a pretty big setback for President Biden, right? So does the White House have any future action planned on student loans? It, wa it was a big setback, and it was one that President Biden had campaigned on and one that the administration says it's still taking steps to try to reconcile. The Education Department has initiated a process to try to pursue broader debt cancellation through the Higher Education Act. Ultimately, any of those options would likely take months before they're available. So in the meantime, the Education Department has launched a new repayment program. It's called SAVE, and this is specifically intended for lower-income borrowers, Kira. The goal is to try to lower those payments. If, for example, if you make $15 or less minimum wage, you could be paying zero. So this is an attempt to at least try to ease the burden on some of the borrowers who've been really struggling over the past years and who are not prepared for this pause to resume. Uh, a lot of the financial ex experts Say go to the Education Department's website, studentaid.gov. You can see actually what your payments would be under the SAVE plan and see if it could benefit you. All right, Elizabeth Schulze, thank you so much. Thanks. And coming up, EU standing behind Ukraine, why Europe's foreign ministers made a surprise visit to Kyiv and what it means for the Ukraine effort. More ahead. Whenever news breaks, the crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. 
from Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. For 30 years, my brother's death was this mystery. Was he pushed? Did he kill himself? There's been some human remains found at the bottom of North Head, and the body was naked. Committing suicide naked is almost unheard of. What's going on here? We had some chilling evidence. Oh my goodness, no one knew it was coming. It's about finding justice for my brother. Sometimes you just have to stir the pot. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Glad you're streaming with us. Uh, some other headlines that we're following this hour for you. The EU's foreign policy chief and top European diplomats are visiting Kyiv amid mounting concerns over the West's financial support for Ukraine. It's the first time the EU's foreign ministers have actually met in a war zone, and it comes after a pro-Russia party won election in Slovakia on a pledge to end military support to Ukraine. And are you feeling lucky? Well, tonight's Powerball jackpot has reached a new high, now totaling $1.4 billion. Yes, that's billion with a B. It's the first time there have been back-to-back billion-dollar jackpots in Powerball history. And the Las Vegas Sphere is finally open after years of construction. The venue, which is the largest spherical structure in the world, opened with a concert from U2. Looking. The show took full advantage of the Sphere's wraparound LED screen, by the way, as you can see with those dazzling visuals. U2 is holding a residency at the venue now through the end of the year. Well, straight ahead, hiking their way into history, meet the first deaf couple to reach the top of Mount Everest, but their barrier-breaking journey doesn't stop there. You'll see why next. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students. It was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murder. I want to take you straight to the White House now. President Biden getting ready to deliver remarks as he celebrates the Americans with Disabilities Act. Let's listen in. All of you are. I look out there and I see one of the guys that got it started, Tom Harkin. Tom, stand up. Stand, stand up for people to see you. Good to see you, Tom. And Elizabeth Dole, Bob Dole was a major, major player in all of this. He really was. 
I remember getting in trouble because someone was criticizing Bob Dole on the floor for why do we need curb cuts, why do we need all those kinds of things. And uh, I got myself in trouble. Anyway, <laughs> but he's a great, and there's so, so, so many really important people here that made all this possible. Tammy Duckworth, is, she's too young. <laughs> Stenny Hoyer, Stenny. Yeah. Madeline Dean, Jared Huffman. I think they're supposed to be here. Mark Pocan, and Mark, you here? Well, I guess what? Mary Kay Sandlin, Scanlon. I keep telling them I think we're related. I found out when I went to Ireland, they did my genealogy, and they say, I got a Scanlon in the background, so you may be my, I may be your 19th cousin. Jan, Jan Sikowski, Jan, good to see you. And Dina Titus. Look, uh, and by the way, is Tim Shriver here? Tim, thank you, pal. You've been there the whole time in the Special Olympics. You've changed. You really, it's incredible what you've done. And I'm not going to read all the organizations because you get sunstroke by the time I get finished doing that. But look, uh, I want to welcome you all to the White House. And uh, Selma, thank you for the introduction, but more importantly, thank you for your advocacy. Your advocacy has given people hope. You've changed people's lives, along with the rest of you who are here. You know, um, Kamala and Doug are here. I want to thank them for being here. They're strong, strong, strong supporters as well. And I want to thank you, Kamala, for your leadership. We're joined by many members of Congress, as I said, and including some of the biggest champions of this uh, disability rights community. And I think I've gone through most of the names already. But here's the deal. You know, the, a big thanks to the courageous activists here who work so hard to make the country more accessible and more just. You know, one of my first acts as a United States Senator, I know I don't look old enough to do it, but uh, <laughs> one of my first acts was I voted, I was a co-sponsor of the Rehabilitation Act, which was... <laughs> The first time in the nation's history we declared in law what we knew to be true, that Americans with disabilities deserve dignity, respect, and an equal chance at the American dream. The Rehabilitation Act is one of the most consequential civil rights laws in our nation's history, banning discrimination on the basis of disability by any entity funded by the federal government. You know, it promoted equal access to for communities, access to our communities, authorized independent living services, and research that supports disabled people in living their lives that they want to lead. <clears throat> Folks, but after the Rehabilitation Act was signed into law, its implementation was delayed. In response, disability advocates uh, staged sit-ins, named for the section of the law that the government had failed to implement. One of those was, as you've already mentioned, Judy Human, who we lost earlier this year. And we're joined today by so many of Judy's family and friends. Would her family stand up, any of Judy's family? <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. As an infant, you all know, Judy contracted polio and lost the ability to walk. At the age of five, she was prohibited from entering kindergarten because her principal deemed her wheelchair a fire hazard, a fire hazard. Judy turned that pain of this rejection and the many more that followed into purpose. After the Rehabilitation Act passed, she led demonstrations in San Francisco, testified in congressional hearings, demanding, demanding that the people in power actually implement the law that was passed. And after four years of protest, Judy and, and disabled activ activists all over the country were successful. History shows it's often not the people in power, but the power of the people that moves the nation forward. And you, all of you did. The Rehabilitation Act laid the groundwork for another landmark law celebrated today, the Americans with Disabilities Act. Steny Hoyer led the charge in the House, 
along with Major Robert, oh, excuse me, M Major Robert Owens and uh, Tony Quello. I don't know, <laughs> as well as uh, Tom Harkin and Bob Dole. They led the fight in the Senate. You know, I was enormously proud to be a senator, a Senate co-sponsor. Today, three decades after his passage, many of us can still recall the America where a person with disability could be denied service in a restaurant or a grocery store, where an employer could refuse to hire because of the disability. And when we passed this law, we made a commitment to build an America for all Americans for all Americans. Perhaps most importantly, we did it together. This was a bipartisan bill signed into law by a Republican President George H.W. Bush 33 years ago on this spot on the South Lawn of the White House. It marked progress that wasn't political but personal for millions of disabled American veterans and families. Folks, for more than 61 million Americans living with disability, these laws are a source of opportunity, meaningful inclusion, participation, respect, and as my dad would say, the most important of all, dignity, being treated with dignity. Ensuring the American dream is for all of us, not just for some of us. A bulwark against discrimination and a path to personal independence. And for our nation, these laws are a testament to our character as a people, a triumph of values, over selfishness. But of course, these laws didn't bring an end to the work we need to do. Disabled Americans are still three times less likely to have a job. And they're often earned less for the exact work someone else is doing is not disabled. Too often, disabled Americans are unable to vote, to get to and from work and school, to enjoy public spaces. But thanks to all of you, we're make, continuing to make progress. In my first few months in office, I was around to sign an executive order, proud to do it, establishing a government-wide commitment to advancing equality and equity in federal employment, including for people with disabilities. It brought together, it brought together the Department of Labor and the Office of Personal Management to ensure that we're making federal workplace, the federal workplaces all over, fully accessible to people with disabilities. So the dignity and rights of disabled Americans are lifted in every policy we pursue. The whole purpose of engaging my Labor Department is to help protect workers with disabilities and fight to end to unjust employment practices. You know, we're also helping state and local governments, businesses and nonprofits access federal funds to hire more disabled Americans. And we continue. We continue to make sure this administration looks like America, appointing people with disabilities to positions all across our government. And over my first two years, my administration, we've seen a 22 percent increase in people with disabilities employed by the federal government. And we're going to continue to grow it. We're making the federal government a model employer when it comes to wages, accommodations, opportunity in advance for people with disabilities. We're also taking action to improve access to health care for disabled Americans. Today, as many of you unfortunately know, some doctors and hospitals are denying medical treatments related to organ donations or life-saving care for disabled Americans based on their disability alone. That's why the Department of Health and Human Services just proposed a rule barring barring these kinds of denials from medical treatment because no American, no American should be deprived of health care they need, period. It's simple. No American. And the Department of Health and Human Services also launched the long COVID clinical trials and created the Office of Long COVID Research and Practice for the first of its kind initiative in our history. And because of your advocacy, the National Institutes of Health just designed, just designated people with disabilities, a health disparity population. Now, you all know what that means, and I'm going to try to briefly explain that to people listening, which opens up new funding for research into unmet health needs specific to disabled Americans. We also launched ARPA-H 
to drive breakthroughs in biomedicine to prevent, detect, and treat diseases including cancer, diabetes, Alzheimer's, and other neurological diseases like MS. The American Rescue Plan provided billions of dollars to all 50 states, all 50 states, to expand home and community-based services under Medicaid. So, again, in my experience, friends who are disabled, my experience is it also just continues to provide the dignity they're looking for, just dignity. More people with disabilities, including intellectual and developmental disabilities, can live independently at home. The Inflation Reduction Act capped the cost of insulin at $35 a month, and out-of-pocket prescription drug costs are going to be limited to $2,000 a year for older Americans, no matter what the disability, no matter how expensive, no matter what drugs they use, even if you're using cancer drugs that are $10,000, dollars dollars $14,000, no more than $2,000 a year. Our bipartisan infrastructure law makes the biggest investment ever, $1.75 billion to make transit and rail stations more accessible. We're, mobile, we're modernizing airports by adding wheelchair ramps, accessible restrooms, and so much more. And the Department of Transportation issued a rule that now requires all new single-aisle aircraft over a certain size to have wheelchair-accessible restrooms. The Department of Justice proposed standards for state and local governments to make their internet content and mobile apps more accessible to disabled Americans so they can easily do things like travel to and from work and school, care for themselves, themselves and their loved ones, and vote. And look, accessibility is the cornerstone of ensuring government works for everybody. Accessibility. So let me close with this. Judy Human. And reflecting on her life, wrote, and I quote, change never happens at a pace we think it should. It happens over years of people joining together, strategizing, sharing, and pulling all the levers they possibly can. Well, that's the story we're celebrating here today. Progress hard fought and won, making real our nation's founding promise that every American, every American has a right to be recognized and respected for who they are. And millions of Americans with disability, this is a source of identity and power. This is the essence of the disability pride. Look, folks, it's the essence of what Judy and so many of you here today have fought so hard for, and the progress we'll continue to make together. Folks, as I look out on all of you, I can honestly say I've never been more optimistic about America's future, and I mean that from the bottom of my heart. Never. We just have to remember who in hell we are. We're the United States of America. There is nothing, nothing beyond our capacity if we set our mind to do it and we work together. And folks, there's so much more. I don't, I, because it's so hot out here, I don't want to keep you, but <laughs> folks, the fundamental research going on for all the various disabilities is staggering. It's staggering. And, for example, whether it's ARPA, we're spending billions of dollars on research and development for health disparities. Everything from, anyway, I won't. <laughs> but it's because of you all. You all not only had the physical courage to deal with whatever your disability is, those of you who are in this community, but you stood up. You spoke for everybody else. You spoke not just for yourself, but for everybody. You've changed people's lives for the better. You've given people hope. You've allowed them, allowed them to regain their pride, their dignity, and be able to do what they want to do as best they can. So I, just, I think this is just the beginning. I think someone's going to be standing here 20 years from now talking about how fundamentally it's changed across the board, across the board. We can never stop. God bless you all, and may God protect our troops. Thank you. Thank you.
The president there at the White House uh, unveiling new steps to improve access to online services for Americans with disabilities. It's amazing to think that it's been 33 years now since the Americans uh, with Disabilities Act uh, went through. So now the president is talking about addressing those challenges for web and mobile-based services um, that those with disabilities have. And more than likely, all of you know somebody that has dealt with those challenges. Our Karen Travers, who covers the White House, is also monitoring to this, joins us now. Let's talk about uh, the new rule that he's putting forward and how this hopefully will help with various challenges, Karen, uh, from filing taxes to, to voting. Yeah, the president, Kira, talking about innovation for people with disabilities in this country, talking about how this is a piece of legislation 33 years old and the 50th anniversary of the Rehabilitation Act, but it has to be a living, breathing thing that has to grow with new technology to make things easier, more accessible for people in this country with disabilities. Kira, what struck me there from the president was hearing him talk about how the Americans with Disabilities Act was a bipartisan piece of legislation. He really emphasized that, that this was something that was signed by a Republican president, George H.W. Bush, and this was passed with support from both Republicans and Democrats, certainly something that we just don't see a lot of right now here in Washington. But the president said that this was all possible because of people like the ones that were gathered on the South Lawn here today at the White House, people with disabilities themselves, their families, their advocates and supporters who pushed for these changes and continue to push for these changes to make sure it's easier for Americans to live their lives and be recognized. The president said that these two bills and what they have done, the impact that they have had, are all about the right for every American to be respected and recognized for who they are. He said this is about opportunity, meaningful inclusion, respect, and dignity. Kira? So let's talk more on how exactly this will work and who exactly will feel the immediate impact. Yeah, Kira, I got to get some details from the White House on that. But of course, the president talking about broadly how this is going to help people with disabilities. And I think you mentioned some of them right there. Uh, and people that were gathered here today. He was introduced by Selma Blair, the actress who has MS. She was diagnosed a couple years ago. And she talked about how long it took her to get that diagnosis. Even though she started having symptoms as a young child, it took nearly 40 years before it was finalized for her because people don't pay attention. People don't listen when people are speaking up and talking about the awareness and the importance of listening. The president saying that the things that his administration is trying to do from health care innovation and making prescription drug costs cheaper are all about trying to help people do more with what they have and listening and, and making things easier for everyday families. So question, in addition to this, anything coming out of the White House today about the government shutdown, about this call now to oust House Speaker Kevin McCarthy after what Republicans say he did, secretly making this deal uh, with Biden, uh, funding you to Ukraine? What's the word? Yeah, the White House, Kira, is not weighing in on what should be happening right now with Kevin McCarthy's future as Speaker of the House, saying that's up for House Republicans to sort out right now. Corrine Jean-Pierre, the press secretary at her briefing, took a lot of questions on this, and she wouldn't even say what the president's position is on Kevin McCarthy's future, and also wouldn't say what conversations, if any, the White House was having with members of Congress on this. She was essentially saying they aren't talking to lawmakers about this, which seems pretty hard hard to believe on something of this magnitude, this significance for how Washington runs right now. Yesterday, the president at the White House talked about a deal on Ukraine funding that came together with Kevin McCarthy and saying that he felt confident, that he trusted that this funding would go through because of a deal with the House Speaker. Well, today, some of Kevin McCarthy's staunchest critics, including uh, Congressman Matt Gates, are really blasting him for what they're calling a secret deal, as if there's some other backdoor thing happening right now on Ukraine funding, the White House won't say what the president means by that. Was there an actual agreement between him and McCarthy over the weekend? Was there a conversation between the president and McCarthy? The White House wouldn't even acknowledge a conversation like that, just saying that the president believes McCarthy's words that he is committed to this Ukraine funding, and also that the White House believes, Kira, that there is bipartisan support for this in the House and the Senate if McCarthy puts this forward for a vote. White House correspondent Karen Travers. Karen, thanks so much. We're going to take a quick break. We've got a lot more news ahead. Right back. I think vulnerability is sexy. I think vulnerability is extremely powerful. 
This is an artist that I looked up to at one point because I identified so much with what she stood for and what her message was. I never would have imagined that the ending would have been what it was. They do not shock me. The treatment was just so disgusting on everyone's part. From the jump, it was not a good environment. Did Lizzo ever put her hands on you? No, she didn't get to that point. She attempted to come at me with her fist balled up. You never, like, expect for it to turn into that. Lizzo is denying it all, defiant for all to see. While Lizzo might be under fire now, she isn't the only one facing backlash. Why would we be scared of any backlash for simply just sharing our truth? Lizzo's legal limbo. This is Impact by Nightline. I was so shocked. The road is going to be rocky for Lizzo. Now streaming on Hulu. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. I'll never forget those sounds. Pow, pow, pow. I go right back to the moment that it happened. I wasn't fast enough. On November 22nd, 1963, the United States lost its innocence. Glad you're streaming with us. Well, after three years of a pandemic pause, nearly 30 million Americans are back on the hook for their student loan debt. The pause lifted and set in stone after the Supreme Court struck down President Biden's attempt to cancel student debt for millions of Americans. Our Elizabeth Schulze joins us now for more. So what do borrowers, Elizabeth, actually need to know about the restart of this payments? Probably some of them, uh, maybe many of them, not expecting this. Well, and it's been a long time coming. Eight extensions of the pause, Kira, and here we are, October 1st. It's officially done. So that means 28 million borrowers who have federal student loan debt are now on the hook for those payments at some point over the course of this month. Generally, on average, the payment for the borrowers is between $200 and $300. So this will be a strain on Americans' budgets. And we've been talking to borrowers who talk about how this is something on top of inflation, rising interest rates. This is an additional headwind for their spending. So a couple important things to know. First of all, most borrowers should have already gotten a notice from the education department 21 days before their bill is due. If you still don't know when your bill is due, you should go to studentaid.gov. You can find out who your loan servicer is, is there, and you can find the exact bill's due date. And then important to know there are a couple other, other steps right now that are trying to kind of ease borrowers back in, Kira. For example, there is a one-year grace period on some of those loan payments. That means that if you miss a payment, you're going to be okay for a year but you are gonna still have interest add up on your loans. Interest was also frozen during the pause and that's now adding up and it does add up really fast, Kira. So you spoke with a few people impacted by the end of the pause. What did they tell you? You know, this was, uh, we wanted to get out and talk to borrowers to see how did they change their spending and their saving over these last three years. When you're talking about the difference of hundreds of dollars every month, where does that money go instead? And what a lot of borrowers said was 
they were able to have a little bit of a financial relief. They had the, the, the question of could they pay their bills they weren't as worried. And, you know, Sarah Wood, she was one of the bars we spoke to. She's a mother. She has two twin daughters. She has twin daughters in Denver. And she, she has $180,000 in student debt, Kira. Here's what she told us about what that number looked like and, and what it meant during the pause. What does that number mean to you? You know, it's this thing that I am probably the most ashamed of in my life. We have to think of and we have to budget for every day and we have to budget for, for the future consequences of this loan every single day. You need to live in a house, you need to pay groceries, you need to eat, and then from there on you kind of have to figure out where to skimp and save. You know, a lot of borrowers understood that they say that they get why there's been backlash to the fact that this pause was in place, that there's a feeling among many Americans who said, I already had to pay my debts. It's time for these people to pay their bills, too. And, and Sarah, for example, said she gets that argument, but said this is should be a conversation around broader reform, about the cost of tuition, about these interest rates. How can we better educate people so that they don't find themselves with so much debt that ends up affecting their investments and their savings for their own kids, too? And so the Supreme Court ruling was, you know, a pretty big setback for President Biden. Does the White House have any future action planned on the student loans? Well, the White House, Kira, says that it is looking into broad debt cancellation. It's trying to pursue other avenues for how to cancel up to $20,000 in debt, as we saw that the president tried to do. That was what was struck down by the Supreme Court. One possible avenue would be through the Higher Education Act, this other legal pathway. But in the meantime, there is that one-year grace period that I talked about as far as missed payments. And then the administration has also launched this new repayment program called SAVE. And this is an income-driven repayment program. Specifically, it could help lower a lot of the monthly payments, especially for lower-income borrowers. So there is a big push from from the education department to try to get borrowers to go on, see what their payments would look like under this new plan, see if you can qualify for those lower payments and, and lower interest rates uh, as a way to try to cushion some of the blow, especially if you've been struggling to, to throughout the past couple of years, Kara. Well, we'll track it. Elizabeth Schulze, thanks so much. And coming up, the roots that helped Latinos rise, exploring the enormous contribution they've made as one of the culture's Latina icons Rita Moreno takes us there. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. 30 years, my brother's death was this mystery. Was he pushed? Did he kill himself? There's been some human remains found at the bottom of North Head, and the body was naked. Committing suicide naked is almost unheard of. What's going on here? You had some chilling evidence. Oh my goodness, no one knew it was coming. It's about finding justice for my brother. Sometimes you just have to stir the pot. So much at stake, so much on the line. More Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news.
Babe Ruth, Hank Aaron, Shoei Otani, legends of the game. But now the list of greats redefined. From ABC News, reclaim the forgotten league, a side of the story of baseball you have never heard before like this. The award-winning podcast is back. Listen wherever you get your podcasts or scan the QR codes you see here. Reporting from the war in Ukraine, I'm Ian Panel. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Glad you're streaming with us. This is what we're tracking. Two scientists whose discoveries led to the mRNA vaccines have been awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for Medicine, or Nobel Prize for Medicine, rather. Sorry about that. We're talking about Caitlin Carrico and Drew Weissman. They met in the 1990s, actually, by chance while photocopying research papers, but then came together and their discoveries actually led to the COVID-19 vaccines that helped slow down the pandemic. Well, Carrico says that when she got the call about the prestigious award, Work this morning, she thought it was a prank. <laughs> Simone Biles proving once again that she is one of the greatest athletes of all time. The seven time Olympic gold medalist became the first woman to land a Yurchenko double pike at the World Championships in Belgium. Now, you won't have to remember that name for long, although she really was an incredible journalist back in the 80s. But that move has now been named the Biles Two on Vault, her fifth named skill, by the way, that Biles has. She'll com complete now all four individual finals, then the all-around final later this week. We'll be watching. Beyonce just wrapped up her record-breaking Renaissance tour in Kansas City and is now moving on to rule the box office. Queen B announcing that her tour is coming to AMC movie theaters December 1st. Pretty clever, right? Well, it happened just weeks before Taylor Swift, era's film, it's the silver screen. Well, she is an icon within Latin culture, musician, actress, dancer, and trailblazer. Now, Academy Award winning Rita Moreno takes us on a journey to the roots and rise of the Latin identity. A legacy that goes from the Olmecs to the Mayans, whose empires predate the birth of Christ, to the Aztecs and the Incas, whose empires existed and thrived for hundreds of years before the arrival and invasion of European settlers and their introduction of African slave trade to the Western Hemisphere. The Latino identity has a rich and complex ancestry. The Aztecs ruled over an estimated 15 million people. The empire stretched from what today is known as the United States borderlands through Southern Mexico. At its peak, the Aztec capital of Tenochtitlan had over 140,000 people. Just south of the Aztecs were the Mayans, who were known for their advanced pyramid building, astronomy, and mathematics. Their agricultural technology developed the basis of what is the majority of the world's diet. As you make your way down to what is now known as South America, we find the Incas. At its peak, the Incan Empire was made up of 12 million people. Today, one of the most sacred archaeological centers of the Incas is a modern wonder of the world, Machu Picchu. The Tainos and Carib peoples navigated from the coast of South America to the Caribbean islands, named after the Caribs themselves. Once the most numerous indigenous people of the Caribbean, the Taino population may have reached anywhere between one or two million at the time of the Spanish conquest in the late 15th century. The Spaniards' quest for land didn't end there. By 1513, they arrived to a land with many flowers that they named Florida. Unknown to many, the first European language spoken in what is now the United States of America was actually Spanish and not English. The conquistadores brought with them diseases such as smallpox, mumps, and measles. They also brought with them one of the worst abuses of humankind, slavery. About 15 times as many African slaves were taken to Spanish and Portuguese colonies than to the US. The Spanish Empire would dominate throughout the Western Hemisphere for hundreds of years. Finally, in the early 1800s, 
the majority of Latin American countries and their people would gain their independence except Cuba and Puerto Rico. For Mexico, the victory would be short-lived thanks to their neighbors, the United States. The U.S. wasn't content with what it had, pushing westward to seize the land that many presidents believed was America's destiny. To reach that goal, President James Polk provoked war with Mexico. After a long and bloody battle, there was an agreement called the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. Mexico signed the treaty under the promise the U.S. would recognize all Mexicans as citizens of their new nation. But the U.S. failed on its promise, granting only white Mexican citizenship and leaving indigenous and black Mexicans entirely disenfranchised. This would forever change the fate of generations of Mexican Americans to come, and in turn, mold the identity of all Latinos in the United States. Uh, Latinas like Rita Moreno, and our thanks to her for that. And thanks for streaming with us. I'm Kira Phillips. The news never stops, neither do we. We'll be right back. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students. It was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting on Capitol Hill, I'm Devin Dwyer. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Today on ABC News Live, Donald Trump on trial, accused of inflating his net worth, the president making an unprecedented appearance in court, denying any wrongdoing and calling it the greatest witch hunt of all time. Speaker of the House Kevin McCarthy feeling the heat from within his own party. Congressman Matt Gates threatening to oust him as House Speaker. We're live on Capitol Hill with that drama. Well, the opioid crisis hits New York as overdoses hit historic levels. Fentanyl abuse surging. How officials are planning to fight back against the drug use. Hello, everyone. I'm Kira Phillips. And I'm Terry Moran. And our top story this hour, the unprecedented court appearance of a former U.S. president. Donald Trump is in a New York City courtroom today facing a $250 million lawsuit filed by the state of New York that could change the face of his empire and his net worth. Trump, his two sons, and Trump org execs are accused of acting in a decades-long scheme now using numerous acts of fraud and misrepresentation to actually inflate Trump's net worth while lowering his tax burden. Trump denying all wrongdoing, calling the case a political witch hunt and an effort to keep him out of the White House. 
Joining us now from the courthouse in Manhattan, our investigative correspondent and producer, Olivia Rubin, also ABC News senior reporter, Catherine Falders, and legal contributor and law professor at the University of Baltimore School of Law, Kim Whaley. So, Olivia, the fir first witness, I understand, is on the stand. What do we know? Kira, Donald Bender is the first witness for the attorney general. He is the accountant for the Trump organization and at times uh, for Trump personally. He no longer represents them, but the attorney general has said that they are calling him for the purpose of introducing a number of financial documents that they are trying to get in on the case. So he has just taken the stand. When I uh, walked out of the courtroom, he was sort of laying the groundwork for his work that he did for Trump for the Trump Organization and doing audits for the company, doing tax turns for the company. So a lot of what is at issue here regarding the company and the way that it valued its assets. But, uh, you know, I will just point out, I know I've been saying it all day, but the former president, again, still in the courtroom as, you know, the trial in earnest gets underway. Opening statements are done. Testimony is happening. And he really still, Kira, is hanging on every single word in this trial. He is reacting when the judge is speaking when Donald Bender is speaking. He is nodding. He is shaking his head. He is very engaged with the testimony that is being laid out in front of him regarding his own company, Kira. Uh, and Olivia, so this is a, a trial in an unusual posture because the judge has already confirmed his opinion of the facts. He has found that Trump is, in fact, did these uh, fraudulent things and is liable for them. That's uh, a pretrial motion he found for the attorney general of the state of New York. Trump is, is out there in the court of public opinion trying to convince people this is part of a political attack. That attorney general did campaign against Donald Trump, saying she'd get Donald Trump. So do you see in the courtroom that sort of political end of this uh, sort of invading the trial? It's funny you bring that up, Terry, because right away, no. When his attorney, Trump's attorney, Chris Kyes, was giving his statement, it was very focused on the facts of the case, why the Trump organization valued the way it did, why the banks had their own responsibility to, to check the valuations that the Trump organization was putting forward. But then Alina Haba, another attorney for the former president, actually got up uh, and gave her own opening. And she actually said that she wasn't planning on giving an opening, but she decided to after she heard the attorney general speak on the court steps and saying that this was personal and she gave a much more impassioned plea and it was certainly much more uh, you know aligned with what the former president has been saying publicly though she certainly did not attack the judge as she was standing there in front of him so you started to see a little bit of that creep in but by and large it has stuck you know quite close to the facts of the case which is really striking in itself Terry you have the former president coming out of court every chance he gets attacking the judge attacking attacking the attorney general, attacking the case as a whole, and then walking 20 feet back towards his seat and sitting before the judge and continuing on with the trial. So it's a really fascinating split screen that we often do see with the former president, what he says publicly, and then the mood inside of the courtroom. Yeah, that's interesting. And, and just to remind people, uh, Letitia James, when she campaigned, she said, quote, she intended to, quote, shine a bright light into every dark corner of his real estate dealings and every dealing demanding truthfulness at every turn. So, uh, Catherine, at the end of the day, uh, look, this is a, the campaign promise being fulfilled in some ways. And the $250 million, how does that square with, with Trump's uh, liquidity, with his fortune? Could it really hurt him? Oh, well, I think the question of could it really hurt him is a good one because I think Terry, uh, at the end of the day, I think it ultimately already has. Now, during this trial, of course, the court still needs to decide six remaining causes of action, as well as the scope of the penalties, that $250 million, what we've been talking a lot about here. But it's really those pre -trial, that pretrial motion by this judge uh, leading up to the trial was a really big blow for Donald Trump, taking away the business certificates for those New York companies uh, under control of key Trump organization figures. It effectively stops business in the state and could ultimately end operations at some of these iconic Trump properties, for example, Trump Tower being one of them. I think the legal team and sources that I've been talking to close to the legal team realize that this is an uphill battle for them. Of course, they've pledged to appeal. How that will work is still to be determined. Certainly something his lawyers didn't see coming this soon, at least from the judge, Terry. So, Kim, as Terry mentioned, Trump made the political 
political argument that this is an attack on him because he's leading in the polls or that Letitia James had political uh, a political goal here. She campaigned that she would reveal every dark side of the former president. But how do you prove that this was political when the documents and the findings have now been presented? Listen, I mean, I think the reason, as Olivia reports, that Donald Trump is so on the edge of his seat is because this one already hit him where it counts. I mean, the big enchilada uh, is the ruling that already came down. And not only is it very, very strong on the facts and the law, but the judge also sanctioned uh, multiple lawyers, including Chris Kyes and Alina Haba, for repeating factually and legally frivolous arguments. I um, mean, you know, this is a case I actually taught my students today because it's so strongly worded. And I really think he has very little chance on appeal to get this reversed because they're so out on a limb, which is why he's trying to frame this as politics. But in the court of law, it's the facts and the law that govern, not politics. And I think that's hard medicine for someone like Donald Trump. But Kim, if I can just follow up on that, uh, about the general environment that this uh, prosecution came up in. I, my hunch is that Donald Trump is not the only New York real estate uh, developer who inflates the value of his assets, all right? <laughs> and here's the attorney general of the state of New York who had campaigned that she'd get him. Is that right? Well, you know, Laura, there, it is right in that, you know, prosecutors are elected in certain parts of the country. So the fact that there is an, an electoral part to this job is just by virtue of how they pick people in Manhattan, or excuse me, here in the state of, of New York. And just to be clear, this is not a prosecution, it's a civil case, which is ironic because it's probably going to have the bigger impact uh, than potentially on Donald Trump than the various uh, criminal cases. But I just have to, the thing that jumped out me at the decision was, you know, he notes, uh, the judge here notes, and it was a judge, not not Letitia James who made this decision, it was a judge, notes that, for example, Mar-a-Lago was inflated 2,300 times, 2,300 times. Um, my guess is, uh, you know, other people that might be in this neighborhood, you're talking negligible inflation, maybe double, triple, not 2,300 times. So I think the facts are so off the charts here that if you actually read the decision, and I encourage everyone to read that decision from last week who cares about this, uh, I, I don't think this is political when you look at um, already an appeal he lost on the, the same ar arguments he's regurgitated you know, I just don't think the political argument stands up to the facts and the law here, at least so far. All right, uh, and Olivia, what's what's coming up next in the trial? Then, thank you, Kim, for that, Olivia. Well, they're going to start making their way through witness after witness after witness. And the state has said that they have 28 witnesses that they plan to call, according to the witness list that they submitted. And that does include Trump himself. That does include Eric Trump. That includes Don Jr., Ivanka. So almost the entire Trump family that is involved in the business there could get subpoenaed and come down to court where they have to testify. And then it moves over to Trump and his case. And his team has submitted over 100 witnesses that they could uh, theoretically call in this case. So the judge has lined out a case of nearly three months. So that is what we're looking at here, Terry. Opening statements are done, and now it's getting into the meat of the case. The accountants really are the ones that are going to come in and bring in the financial statements that they need to show the rest of their claims. Olivia, Catherine, Kim, thanks so much. And conservative Republicans say they plan to oust him, but House Speaker Kevin McCarthy vows he's not going anywhere. This call comes after McCarthy narrowly stopped a government shutdown by siding with Democrats, and now he's facing a direct threat the of from the this man, Florida Congressman Matt Gates, who's accusing the Speaker of secretly working with President Biden on funding for Ukraine. It is becoming increasingly clear who the Speaker of the House already works for and it's not the Republican conference. Members of the Republican Party might vote differently on a motion to vacate if they heard what the speaker had to share with us about his secret side deal with Joe Biden. Today, our rate pressed Speaker McCarthy on that alleged deal, that accusation from Matt Gates that there was some kind of secret deal with President Biden. 
He says that there was a deal made on Ukraine. Really? What is By he who? Talking about? I that's have what, no idea. And the president he, said something similar to that. No. That the, it, was there a deal was, at all? You, you weren't there. There is no side deal going forward. There you have it. ABC News contributing political correspondent Rachel Bay joins us now on Capitol Hill. Rachel, uh, first I read your article in Politico, sort of slicing and dicing, and it was great. So sort of <laughs> inside, you said you called it in the weeds. I, I thought it was fascinating. What is going on here? Who's supporting Congressman Matt Gates? What are you looking at when you see the House? Are they going to kick out Kevin McCarthy from the speakership? I mean, we'll have to see, Terry. It's certainly going to be a roller coaster up here on Capitol Hill. In terms of who is actually supporting Matt Gates right now, it is a small group of lawmakers, both a mix of fiscal conservatives and sort of Trump allies, but they're all united behind this belief that Kevin McCarthy lied to them. He made a bunch of promises when he tried to get the gavel and eventually got their support uh, to become speaker, and he hasn't lived up to them. And truly, to be Truth be told, uh, he actually hasn't followed through a lot on a lot of those promises. They are also mad that he worked with Democrats to avert a shutdown. But I actually think the, the more interesting question here is who is not supporting Matt Gates. There is actually a lot of conservatives in the House who frankly don't like Kevin McCarthy and would love to see him go. But I'm thinking about people like House Freedom Caucus leader Scott Perry. These folks are out there actually blaming Gates for the fact that they got jammed by the Senate into accepting larger and higher funding levels. They're saying that Gates and this group of Republicans basically undercut the GOP's negotiating hand in a shutdown showdown. And so they're actually more mad at Gates than they are at McCarthy. And so I'm going to be watching this week as lawmakers come back tonight. Uh, what do these conservatives like Scott Perry actually say about this effort? Are they going to side with the speaker or are they going to side with Gates? because that could really impact how McCarthy is able to hold the gavel. Okay, well, that's the scoop we need from you. That's exactly what we're going to be looking to, uh, Rachel. So what about the White House? Uh, what's the White House saying about this uh, alleged deal with Speaker McCarthy, where we just heard right there, uh, he told our Rachel Scott, didn't happen. Kira, they are being extremely cryptic about this. I was on the phone with the administration last night at like 10 p.m. trying to get some clarity. They just wouldn't give it. And it's hard to tell, does that mean there actually was a secret deal or are they just trying to troll Kevin McCarthy? We just don't have enough clarity right now. People might wonder, why does this even matter? And it matters because a majority of Republicans just a few days ago uh, rejected a proposal for about $300 million worth of Ukraine funding. That's actually a lot smaller pot than the White House would like to see. But the vote showed that Republicans are not by and large, a majority of them do not support this position. And if McCarthy made a deal like this with the White House, chances are a number of Republicans would join Gates in this effort to oust him. So that's why Gates is pressing for answers on this, even though McCarthy is denying it. And Rachel, the, the Democratic said, so the government was kept open by essentially cooperation between Democrats and Republicans. Think of that. Uh, <laughs> and, and it kept the government open. So now that Kevin McCarthy is endangered as speaker, uh, they're going to take a vote, I suppose, if Matt Gates gets his way on whether he should remain as Speaker. Do you think he could get some support from Democrats to keep him as Speaker of the House? Terry, I'm, I'm really skeptical on that. I mean, anything is possible. It certainly sounds like a West Wing fantasy. But, I mean, Democrats are going to be talking about this today up here on Capitol Hill. I talked to a number of Democrats on the phone yesterday after Gates made this announcement, and every single one of them, to a T, had nothing but scorn and fury for Kevin McCarthy. They say he's a liar. They say he went back on the bipartisan spending caps deal that he struck with the White House earlier this year. They're infuri infuriated with him for trying to impeach Joe Biden. And so... It's hard for me to see a scenario where they rally around McCarthy, but hey, there is a price for everything. And I'm told that Democrats actually have running wish lists right now of concessions they would want from Kevin McCarthy if they were to bail him out. Things like a power sharing agreement, uh, things like ending impeachment. Now, if McCarthy were to give Democrats that, chances are he would lose a whole bunch of Republican support and be in just as much trouble as he potentially is in right now, if not more. But one last thing I'll say about this. The first vote on this issue is actually going to be a vote to, quote, table or kill this motion. And McCarthy only needs a couple of Democrats to actually potentially help him get through this. And if, you know, Democrats potentially want to rally themselves against McCarthy, which we could see happen in the next 24 hours, we could see a couple of Democrats break off, centrist Democrats in more redder districts who want to show that they want this place to function. That is another thing that I'm going to be watching very closely. Do Democrats come unified at this, or could there be some people who flake off and help McCarthy. Yeah.
We'll be watching right along with you. Rachel Bade, appreciate your reporting as always. No way to run a popsicle stand, that's, <laughs> that, that, that's for sure. Good luck to them all. Well, coming up, we're going to turn the page and talk about the fentanyl overdose crisis. They are surging in New York overdose, overdoses, and officials are scrambling for answers. We'll speak with New York City's health commissioner about efforts to curb drug use right after this break. I mean. Whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting with the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today? YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about. The new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You got to think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Glad you're streaming with us. Well, the overdose crisis in New York City has reached historic levels, and its health commissioner now has a desperate request. Please carry Narcan. According to the city's Department of Health, there are more than 3,000 overdose deaths in 2022, with fentanyl detected in 81% of those overdoses. So now New York City's health department has issued a new warning rep recommending that New Yorkers carry emergency drug Narcan everywhere they go and know properly how to use it to save lives. This recommendation comes after a one-year-old died after being exposed to fentanyl at a daycare center in the Bronx. New York City's health commissioner, Dr. Ashwin, Dr. Ashwin Vasan, joins us now for more on this crisis and on his call to action. Dr. Vasan, thank you for being with us. So. It, it seems extraordinary. You're asking every New Yorker to carry Narcon. Uh, what's the response you've received, and what do you hope this will do? Well, I think we're losing a New Yorker every three hours to an overdose. Less than that now, just under three hours. And as you showed, we're at a historic level of overdose deaths, and it shows us no sign of stopping. And now we're starting to see unexpected tragedies, like the one you mentioned in a daycare, where Fentanyl and its incredibly powerful toxic effects are appearing in settings that no one would have an expectation that uh, a person would be at risk, certainly not a baby. And so this is a call to action for New Yorkers to be prepared to learn the signs of an overdose and to be equipped and trained on how to use fentanyl. And certainly our health department is doing everything we can to make that a reality, just like we would have defibrillators behind every bar or EpiPens at at public sites, we think that Narcan needs to be everywhere. And my hope is that you never have to use it. My hope is that you never have to use it. But the idea that something could happen in front of you or near you, and you wouldn't have this life-saving medication is, is not one that I can certainly tolerate as someone who's here to save lives. The story, while it focuses on the tragedy of this one-year-old who lost Nicholas, who lost his life, four babies overdosed and three of them are saved with Narcan. And so that's part of what we're trying to lift up. 
As you mentioned, every single day someone is, is dying, uh, you know, because of this. And, and we were just talking about stories that we've been covering of, uh, you know, everyday Americans buying street drugs, you know, thinking, oh, they're just going to get high, but it's laced with fentanyl. And the next thing you know, they're having a heart attack. So here's my question is, how, what kind of response have you been getting? How, how are you going to get this? let's say, to every New Yorker or every New Yorker that wants to get it, is there going to be a cost? And then how do you make sure they know how to use it? Well, it's, it's a great question. So we distributed over 200,000 naloxone kits around our city last year alone. And those kits have two doses of Narcan, as well as the training and, and a guide on how to use it. We also offer free trainings regularly. The Biden-Harris administration just passed, the FDA just made Narcan free, uh, made Narcan available over the counter. So if you are an American who can afford $45, we also recommend that you go pick it up at your local pharmacy. And we are working to increase our distribution in New York City of Narcan at places like schools, but all, all sorts of other public sites um, around our city because we want it to be ubiquitous. And I know that for some New Yorkers, that means wait, you're asking me to be a part of this? Well, you know, you are a part of it already, whether you know it or not. And what I want as a doctor, as someone whose sole job is to save lives and to prevent suffering, is to say, you need to have the tools available to you, particularly when it's a tool as effective, as safe, and as simple as Narcan. And so it's our job as a city to make it as widely available as possible. But you also alluded to the fact that Narcan is pouring into our city and pouring into cities like ours all across the country. So this isn't just a public health crisis. This is a public safety and law enforcement and frankly, a geopolitical crisis, which is why today Mayor Adams and, and myself, we hosted a fentanyl summit for the for, from cities across the nation. We had, we had visitors from um, all sorts of cities um, today. And part of the message is that public safety, law enforcement, national security has to also partner with public health to cut off the supply of fentanyl to our cities because we can't keep expecting um, that things won't get worse if fentanyl continues to pour into our, into our cities like it is. And I want to raise one of the other uh, concerns about, about this policy uh, that you're talking about so passionately, Dr. Vasan, which is that the city council minority leader Joe Borelli has said this. He says that assuming everyone should carry Narcan is a wave of the white flag. You're surrendering to drug use. And we, one of the recommendations is don't use drugs alone. Now, I know, obviously, getting on top of why people are using drugs, the kind of drugs that they're using that are coming to your city, and rural America has been dealing with this for so long. I get it. But what do you, what do you respond to people who say, look, you're, you're, you're enabling, not solving the problem? I live in the world of reality and not fantasy. I would love to live in a world where no one used drugs, where no one had mental health issues or pain or trauma or social and economic need that turns that causes them to turn to powerful drugs like fentanyl. I want to live in that world. But in the meantime, everyone who's at risk, everyone who is currently using drugs deserves to live. And so it's my job as the leader of the public health system in New York to bring every tool I can to bear and to en enlist every New Yorker we can to be a part of the solution. So I would say that you're either a part of the solution or you're standing by and letting things happen. Um, but we live in the world of facts and we live in the world of reality. And the reality is things are getting worse and we need to bring an all hands on deck approach to battling this crisis here in New York City and around the nation. Absolutely, and we wish you well. Good luck to, to you on that and to the people of New York and the country who have really been struggling and dying because of this. Dr. Ashwin Thank Vasan, you. Thanks thank for you having very me. much. Thanks. Coming up, it's all in the name. Need any more proof that Simone Biles is one of the greatest athletes of all times? See her latest move and what it was named next. at stake. So much on the line. More Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. 
From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. We're honored. ABC's 2020 winner of three Emmy Awards for Excellence. Thank you for making 2020 Friday night's most watched and most honored news magazine. Babe Ruth, Hank Aaron, Shoei Otani, legends of the game. But now the list of greats redefined. From ABC News, reclaim the forgotten league, a side of the story of baseball you have never heard before like this. The award-winning podcast is back. Listen wherever you get your podcasts or scan the QR codes you see here. Reporting on the flooded streets of Treasure Island, I'm Ginger Z. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Glad you're streaming with us. Some other headlines that we're tracking for you this hour. Simone Biles proving once again she is one of the greatest athletes of all time. The seven-time Olympic gold medalist became the first woman to land the Yurchenko double pike at the World Championships in Belgium. Now, you won't have to remember that name for long because the move has now been named the Biles two on Volt, her fifth named skill by the way Biles will compete in all four individual finals and the all-around final later this week but let's not forget Yurchenko was an amazing young gymnast as well she was just uh, in the 80s uh, the Simone Biles <laughs> is astonishing she's an amazing <laughs> and the Las Vegas sphere is finally open after years of construction the venue which is the largest spherical structure in the world opened with a concert from you too <laughs> That is pretty cool. Do you get cool. dizzy? Uh, That's I what I want to know. Cool. <laughs> so the full show took advantage of the Sphere's wrap-around LED screen with dazzling visuals. U2 is holding a residency at the venue through the end of the year. Look at that. <laughs> Let's all go to Vegas. Thanks for streaming <laughs> with us. I'm Kira Phillips. And I'm Terry Moran. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context, and analysis. From breaking news to all the stories that matter to you, you can always find us on Hulu, Roku, the ABC News app, and of course, abcnews.com. The news never stops. We've got a lot more for you just ahead. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. 30 years my brother's death was this mystery was he pushed did he kill himself despite some human remains found at the bottom of north head and the body was naked committing suicide naked is almost unheard of what's going on here you had some chilling evidence oh my goodness no one knew it was coming it's about finding justice for my brother sometimes you just have to stir the pot All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. 
ABC News, America's number one news source. Today on ABC News Live, Donald Trump on trial, accused of inflating his net worth, the president making an unprecedented appearance in court, denying any wrongdoing and calling it the greatest witch hunt of all time. Speaker of the House Kevin McCarthy feeling the heat from within his own party. Congressman Matt Gates threatening to oust him as House Speaker. We're live on Capitol Hill with that drama. Well, the opioid crisis hits New York as overdoses hit historic levels. Fentanyl abuse surging. How officials are planning to fight back against the drug use. Hello, everyone. I'm Kira Phillips. And I'm Terry Moran. And our top story this hour, the unprecedented court appearance of a former U.S. president. Donald Trump is in a New York City courtroom today facing a $250 million lawsuit filed by the state of New York that could change the face of his empire and his net worth. Trump, his two sons, and Trump org execs are accused of acting in a decades-long scheme now using numerous acts of fraud and misrepresentation to actually inflate Trump's net worth while lowering his tax burden. Trump denying all wrongdoing, calling the case a political witch hunt and an effort to keep him out of the White House. Joining us now from the courthouse in Manhattan, our investigative correspondent and producer Olivia Rubin, also ABC News senior reporter Catherine Falders, and legal contributor and law professor at the University of Baltimore School of Law, Kim Whaley. So Olivia, the fir first witness, I understand, is on the stand. What do we know? Kira, Donald Bender is the first witness for the attorney general. He is the accountant for the Trump organization and at times uh, for Trump personally. He no longer represents them, but the attorney general has said that they are calling him for the purpose of introducing a number of financial documents that they are trying to get in on the case. So he has just taken the stand. When I uh, walked out of the courtroom, he was sort of laying the groundwork for his work that he did for Trump for the Trump Organization and doing audits for the company, doing tax turns for the company. So a lot of what is at issue here regarding the company and the way that it valued its assets. But, uh, you know, I will just point out, I know I've been saying it all day, but the former president, again, still in the courtroom as, you know, the trial in earnest gets underway. Opening statements are done. Testimony is happening. And he really still, Kira, is hanging on every single word in this trial. He is reacting when the judge is speaking when Donald Bender is speaking. He is nodding. He is shaking his head. He is very engaged with the testimony that is being laid out in front of him regarding his own company, Kira. Uh, and Olivia, so this is a, a trial in an unusual posture because the judge has already confirmed his opinion of the facts. He has found that Trump is, in fact, did these uh, fraudulent things and is liable for them. That's uh, a pretrial motion he found for the Attorney General of the State of New York. Trump is, is out there in the court of public opinion trying to convince people this is part of a political attack. That Attorney General did campaign against Donald Trump, saying she'd get Donald Trump. So do you see in the courtroom that sort of political end of this uh, sort of invading the trial? It's funny you bring that up, Terry, because right away, no. When his attorney, Trump's attorney, Chris Kyes, was giving his statement, it was very focused on the facts of the case, why the Trump organization valued the way it did, why the banks had their own responsibility to, to check the valuations that the Trump organization was putting forward. But then Alina Haba, another attorney for the former president, actually got up uh, and gave her own opening. And she actually said that she wasn't planning on giving an opening, but she decided to after she heard the attorney general speak on the court steps and saying that this was personal and she gave a much more impassioned plea and it was certainly much more uh, you know aligned with what the former president has been saying publicly though she certainly did not attack the judge as she was sitting there in front of him so you started to see a little bit of that creep in but by and large it has stuck you know quite close to the facts of the case which is really striking in itself Terry you have the former president coming out of court every chance he gets attacking the judge attacking the attorney general, attacking the case as a whole, and then walking 20 feet back towards his seat and sitting before the judge and continuing on with the trial. So it's a really fascinating split screen that we often do see with the former president, what he says publicly, and then the mood inside of the courtroom. Yeah, that's interesting. And, and just to remind people, uh, Letitia James, when she campaigned, she said, quote, 
She intended to, quote, shine a bright light into every dark corner of his real estate dealings and every dealing demanding truthfulness at every turn. So, uh, Catherine, at the end of the day, uh, look, this is a, the campaign promise being fulfilled in some ways. And the $250 million, how does that square with, with Trump's uh, liquidity, with his fortune? Could it really hurt him? Oh, well, I think the question of could it really hurt him is a good one because I think Terry, uh, at the end of the day, I think it ultimately already has. Now, during this trial, of course, the court still needs to decide six remaining causes of action, as well as the scope of the penalties, that $250 million, what we've been talking a, a lot about here. But it's really those pre-trial, that pre-trial motion by this judge uh, leading up to the trial was a really big blow for Donald Trump, taking away the business certificates for those New York companies uh, under control of key Trump organization figures. It effectively stops business in the state and could ultimately end operations at some of these iconic Trump properties, for example, Trump Tower being one of them. I think the legal team and sources that I've been talking to close to the legal team realize that this is an uphill battle for them. Of course, they've pledged to appeal. How that will work is still to be determined. Certainly something his lawyers didn't see coming this soon, at least from the judge, Terry. So, Kim, as Terry mentioned, Trump made the political, political argument that this is an attack on him because he's leading in the polls, or that Letitia James had political, uh, a political goal here. She campaigned that she would reveal every dark side of the former president. But how do you prove that this was political when the documents and the findings have now been presented? Listen, I mean, I think the reason, as Olivia reports, that Donald Trump is so on the edge of his seat is because this one already hit him where it counts. I mean, the big enchilada uh, is the ruling that already came down. And not only is it very, very strong on the facts and the law, but the judge also sanctioned uh, multiple lawyers, including Chris Kyes and Alina Haba, for repeating factually and legally frivolous arguments. I um, mean, you know, this is a case I actually taught my students today because it's so strongly worded. And I really think he has very little chance on appeal to get this reversed because they're so out on a limb, which is why he's trying to frame this as politics. But in the court of law, it's the facts and the law that govern, not politics. And I think that's hard medicine for someone like Donald Trump. But Kim, if I can just follow up on that, uh, about the general environment that this uh, prosecution came up in. I, my hunch is that Donald Trump is not the only New York real estate uh, developer who inflates the value of his assets, all right? <laughs> and here's the attorney general of the state of New York who had campaigned that she'd get him. Is that right? Well, you know, Laura, there, it is right in that, you know, prosecutors are elected in certain parts of the country. So the fact that there is an, an electoral part to this job is just by virtue of how they pick people in Manhattan, or excuse me, here in the state of, of New York. And just to be good, this is not a prosecution. It's a civil case, which is ironic because it's probably going to have the bigger impact uh, than potentially on Donald Trump than the various uh, criminal cases. But I just have to, the thing that jumped out of me at the decision was, you know, he notes, uh, the judge here notes, and it was a judge, not not Letitia James who made this decision, it was a judge, notes that, for example, Mar-a-Lago was inflated 2,300 times, 2,300 times. Um, my guess is, uh, you know, other people that might be in this neighborhood, you're talking negligible inflation, maybe double, triple, not 2,300 times. So I think the facts are so off the charts here that if you actually read the decision, and I encourage everyone to read that decision from last week who cares about this. Uh, I, I don't think this is political when you look at um, already an appeal he lost on the, the same ar arguments he's regurgitating. You know, I just don't think the political argument stands up to the facts and the law here, at least so far. All right. Uh, and Olivia, what's, what's coming up next in the trial then? Thank you, Kim, for that. Olivia? Well, they're going to start making their way through witness after witness after witness. And the state has said that they have 28 witnesses that they plan to call, according to the witness list that they submitted. And that does include Trump himself. That does include Eric Trump. That includes Don Jr., Ivanka. So almost the entire Trump family that is involved in the business there could get subpoenaed and come down to court where they have to testify. And then it moves over to Trump and his case. And his team has submitted over 100 witnesses 
witnesses that they could uh, theoretically call in this case. So the judge has lined out a case of nearly three months. So that is what we're looking at here, Terry. Opening statements are done, and now it's getting into the meat of the case. The accountants really are the ones that are going to come in and bring in the financial statements that they need to show the rest of their claims. Olivia, Catherine, Kim, thanks so much. And conservative Republicans say they plan to oust him, but House Speaker Kevin McCarthy vows he's not going anywhere. This call comes after McCarthy narrowly stopped a government shutdown by siding with Dems. He's now facing a direct threat from Florida Congressman Matt Gates, who's accusing the Speaker of secretly working with President Biden on funding for Ukraine. It is becoming increasingly clear who the Speaker of the House already works for and it's not the Republican conference. Members of the Republican Party might vote differently on a motion to vacate if they heard what the speaker had to share with us about his secret side deal with Joe Biden. Today, our rate pressed Speaker McCarthy on that alleged deal, that accusation from Matt Gates that there was some kind of secret deal with President Biden. It says that there was a deal made on Ukraine. Really? What is By he who? talking about? That's I have what, no that's idea. And the president he, said something similar to that. No. That the, it, was there a deal was, at all? You, you weren't at, There is no side deal going forward. There you have it. ABC News contributing political correspondent Rachel Bay joins us now on Capitol Hill. Rachel, uh, first I read your article in Politico sort of slicing and dicing. And it was great. Sort of. <laughs> Inside, you said it caught it in the weeds. I, I thought it was fascinating. What is going on here? Who's supporting Congressman Matt Gates? What are you looking at when you see the House? Are they going to kick out Kevin McCarthy from the speakership? I mean, we'll have to see, Terry. It's certainly going to be a roller coaster up here on Capitol Hill. In terms of who is actually supporting Matt Gates right now, it is a small group of lawmakers, both a mix of fiscal conservatives and sort of Trump allies, but they're all united behind this belief that Kevin McCarthy lied to them. He made a bunch of promises when he tried to get the gavel and eventually got their support uh, to become speaker, and he hasn't lived up to them. And truly, to be Truth be told, uh, he actually hasn't followed through a lot on a lot of those promises. They are also mad that he worked with Democrats to avert a shutdown. But I actually think the, the more interesting question here is who is not supporting Matt Gates? There's actually a lot of conservatives in the House who frankly don't like Kevin McCarthy and would love to see him go. But I'm thinking about people like House Freedom Caucus leader Scott Perry. These folks are out there actually blaming Gates for the fact that they got jammed by the Senate into accepting larger and higher funding levels. They're saying that Gates and this group of Republicans basically undercut the GOP's negotiating hand in a shutdown showdown. And so they're actually more mad at Gates than they are at McCarthy. And so I'm going to be watching this week as lawmakers come back tonight. Uh, what do these conservatives like Scott Perry actually say about this effort? Are they going to side with the speaker or are they going to side with Gates? because that could really impact how McCarthy is able to hold the gavel. Okay, well, that's the scoop we need from you. That's exactly what we're going to be looking to, uh, Rachel. So what about the White House? Uh, what's the White House saying about this uh, alleged deal with Speaker McCarthy where we just heard right there? Uh, he told our Rachel Scott, didn't happen. Kira, they are being extremely cryptic about this. I was on the phone with the administration last night at like 10 p.m. trying to get some clarity. They just wouldn't give it. And it's hard to tell, does that mean there actually was a secret deal or are they just trying to troll Kevin McCarthy? We just don't have enough clarity right now. People might wonder, why does this even matter? And it matters because a majority of Republicans just a few days ago uh, rejected a proposal for about $300 million worth of Ukraine funding. That's actually a lot smaller pot than the White House would like to see. But the vote showed that Republicans are not by and large, a majority of them do not support this position. And if McCarthy made a deal like this with the White House, chances are a number of Republicans would join Gates in this effort to oust him. So that's why Gates is pressing for answers on this, even though McCarthy is denying it. And Rachel, the, the Democratic said, so the government was kept open by essentially cooperation between Democrats and Republicans. Think of that. <laughs> uh, and, and it kept the government open. So now that Kevin McCarthy is endangered as speaker, uh, they're going to take a vote, I suppose, if Matt Gates gets his way on whether he should remain as speaker. Do you think he can get some support from Democrats to keep him as Speaker of the House? 
Terry, I'm, I'm really skeptical on that. I mean, anything is possible. It certainly sounds like a West Wing fantasy. But, I mean, Democrats are going to be talking about this today up here on Capitol Hill. I talked to a number of Democrats on the phone yesterday after Gates made this announcement, and every single one of them, to a T, had nothing but scorn and fury for Kevin McCarthy. They say he's a liar. They say he went back on the bipartisan spending caps deal that he struck with the White House earlier this year. They're infuri infuriated with him for trying to impeach Joe Biden. And so it's hard for me to see a scenario where they rally around McCarthy, but hey, there is a price for everything. And I'm told that Democrats actually have running wish lists right now of concessions they would want from Kevin McCarthy if they were to bail him out. Things like a power sharing agreement, uh, things like ending impeachment. Now, if McCarthy were to give Democrats that, chances are he would lose a whole bunch of Republican support and be in just as much trouble as he potentially is in right now, if not more. But one last thing I'll say about this, the first vote on this issue is actually going to be a vote to, quote, table or kill this motion. And McCarthy only needs a couple of Democrats to actually potentially help him get through this. And if, you know, Democrats potentially want to rally themselves against McCarthy, which we could see happen in the next 24 hours, we could see a couple of Democrats break off, centrist Democrats in more redder districts who want to show that they want this place to function. That is another thing that I'm going to be watching very closely. Do Democrats come unified at this, or could there be some people who flake off and help McCarthy. Yeah. We'll be watching right along with you. Rachel Bade, appreciate your reporting as always. No way to run a popsicle stand, that's, <laughs> that, that, that's for sure. Good luck to them all. Well, coming up, we're going to turn the page and talk about the fentanyl overdose crisis. They are surging in New York overdose, overdoses, and officials are scrambling for answers. We'll speak with New York City's health commissioner about efforts to curb drug use right after this break. I mean... When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. You're watching America's number one streaming news. Live reporting, breaking new exclusives. Keep streaming with ABC News Live. Glad you're streaming with us. Well, the overdose crisis in New York has reached historic levels and its health commissioner now has a desperate request. Please carry Narcan. According to the city's Department of Health, there are more than 3,000 overdose deaths in 2022, with fentanyl detected in 81% of those overdoses. So now New York City's Health Department has issued a new warning re recommending that New Yorkers carry emergency drug Narcan everywhere they go and know properly how to use it to save lives. This recommendation comes after a one-year-old died after being exposed to fentanyl at a daycare center in the Bronx. New York City's Health Commissioner Dr. Ashwin, Dr. Ashwin Vasan joins us now for more on this crisis and on his call to action. Dr. Vasan, thank you for being with us. So it, it seems extraordinary. You're asking every New Yorker to carry Narcon. Uh, what's the response you've received and what do you hope this will do? Well, I think we're losing a New Yorker every three hours to an overdose. Less than that now, just under three hours. And as you showed, we're at a historic level of overdose deaths, and it shows us no sign of stopping. And now we're starting to see unexpected tragedies, like the one you mentioned in a daycare, where fentanyl and its incredibly powerful toxic effects are appearing in settings that no one would have an expectation that uh, a person would be at risk, certainly not a baby. And so this is a call to action for New Yorkers to be prepared to learn the signs of an overdose and to be equipped and trained on how to use fentanyl. And certainly our health department is doing everything we can to make that a reality, just like we would have defibrillators behind every bar or EpiPens at, at public sites. We think that Narcan needs to be everywhere. And my hope is that you never have to use it. My hope is that you never have to use it. But the idea that something could happen in front of you or near you and you wouldn't have this life-saving medication is, is not one that I can certainly tolerate as someone who's here to save lives. The story 
while it focuses on the tragedy of this one-year-old who lost Nicholas, who lost his life, four babies overdosed, and three of them were saved with Narcan. And so that's part of what we're trying to lift up. As you mentioned, every single day someone is, is dying, uh, you know, because of this. And, and we were just talking about stories that we've been covering of, uh, you know, everyday Americans buying street drugs, you know, thinking, oh, they're just going to get high, but it's laced with fentanyl. And the next thing you know, they're having a heart attack. So here's my question is, how, what kind of response have you been getting? How, how are you going to get this? let's say, to every New Yorker or every New Yorker that wants to get it, is there going to be a cost? And then how do you make sure they know how to use it? Well, it's, it's a great question. So we distributed over 200,000 naloxone kits around our city last year alone. And those kits have two doses of Narcan, as well as the training and, and a guide on how to use it. We also offer free trainings regularly. The Biden-Harris administration just passed, the FDA just made Narcan free, uh, made Narcan available over the counter. So if you are an American who can afford $45, we also recommend that you go pick it up at your local pharmacy. And we are working to increase our distribution in New York City of Narcan at places like schools, but all, all sorts of other public sites um, around our city because we want it to be ubiquitous. And I know that for some New Yorkers, that means wait, you're asking me to be a part of this? Well, you know, you are a part of it already, whether you know it or not. And what I want as a doctor, as someone whose sole job is to save lives and to prevent suffering, is to say, you need to have the tools available to you, particularly when it's a tool as effective, as safe, and as simple as Narcan. And so it's our job as a city to make it as widely available as possible. But you also alluded to the fact that Narcan is pouring into our city and pouring into cities like ours all across the country. So this isn't just a public health crisis. This is a public safety and law enforcement and frankly, a geopolitical crisis, which is why today Mayor Adams and, and myself, we hosted a fentanyl summit for the for, from cities across the nation. We had, we had visitors from um, all sorts of cities um, today. And part of the message is that public safety, law enforcement, national security has to also partner with public health to cut off the supply of fentanyl to our cities because we can't keep expecting um, that things won't get worse if fentanyl continues to pour into our into our cities like it is. And I want to raise one of the other uh, concerns about about this policy uh, that you're talking about so passionately, Dr. Vasan, which is that the city council minority leader Joe Borelli has said this. He says that assuming everyone should carry Narcan is a wave of the white flag. You're surrendering to drug use. And we, one of the recommendations is don't use drugs alone. Now, I know, obviously, getting on top of why people are using drugs, the kind of drugs that they're using that are coming to your city, and rural America has been dealing with this for so long. I get it. But what do you, what do you respond to people who say, look, you're, you're, you're enabling, not solving the problem? I live in the world of reality and not fantasy. I would love to live in a world where no one used drugs, where no one had mental health issues or pain or trauma or social and economic need that turns that causes them to turn to powerful drugs like fentanyl. I want to live in that world. But in the meantime, everyone who's at risk, everyone who is currently using drugs deserves to live. And so it's my job as the leader of the public health system in New York to bring every tool I can to bear and to en enlist every New Yorker we can to be a part of the solution. So I would say that you're either a part of the solution or you're standing by and letting things happen. Um, but we live in the world of facts and we live in the world of reality. And the reality is things are getting worse and we need to bring an all hands on deck approach to battling this crisis here in New York City and around the nation. Absolutely, and we wish you well. Good luck to, to you on that and to the people of New York and the country who have really been struggling and dying because of this. Dr. Ashwin Thank Basson, you. Thanks thank for you having very me. much. Thanks. Coming up, it's all in the name. Need any more proof that Simone Biles is one of the greatest athletes of all times? See her latest move and what it was named next. I think vulnerability is extremely powerful. This is an artist that I looked up to at one point.
I never would have imagined that the ending would have been what it was. They do not shock me. The treatment was just so disgusting on everyone's part. Did Lizzo ever put her hands on you? No, she didn't get to that point. She attempted to come at me with her fist balled up. Lizzo is denying it all. Lizzo's legal limbo. You never, like, expect for it to turn into that. Now streaming on Hulu. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is OK. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today? YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about. The new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Glad you're streaming with us. Some other headlines that we're tracking for you this hour. Simone Biles proving once again she is one of the greatest athletes of all time. The seven-time Olympic gold medalist became the first woman to land the Yurchenko double pike at the World Championships in Belgium. Now, you won't have to remember that name for long because the move has now been named the Biles Two on Volt, her fifth named skill, by the way. Biles will compete in all four individual finals and the all-around final later this week. But let's not forget, Yurchenko was an amazing young gymnast as well. She was. Just uh, in the well, 80s. The Simone Biles <laughs> is astonishing. She's an amazing. <laughs> and the Las Vegas Sphere is finally open. After years of construction, the venue, which is the largest spherical structure in the world, opened with a concert from U2. That is do you get cool. dizzy? Uh, That's I what I want to know. Cool. <laughs> so the full show took advantage of the Sphere's wrap-around LED screen with dazzling visuals. U2 is holding a residency at the venue through the end of the year. Look at that. Let's all go to Vegas. Thanks for streaming with us. I'm Kira Phillips. <laughs> and I'm Terry Moran. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context, and analysis. From breaking news to all the stories that matter to you, you can always find us on Hulu, Roku, the ABC News app, and of course, abcnews.com. The news never stops. We've got a lot more for you just ahead. at stake. So much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. So what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. I think vulnerability is extremely powerful. This is an artist that I looked up to at one point. I never would have imagined that the ending would have been what it was. They do not shock me. The treatment was just so disgusting on everyone's part. Did Lizzo ever put her hands on you? No, she didn't get to that point. She attempted to come at me with her fist balled up. Lizzo is denying it all. Lizzo's legal limbo. You never, like, expect for it to turn into that. Now streaming on Hulu. America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from the Fulton County, Georgia Courthouse, I'm Rena Roy. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live.
everyone. I'm Kira Phillips. Some top headlines we're watching for you right here on ABC News Live this hour, starting with three years after a pandemic pause. Nearly 30 million Americans are back on the hook for their student loan debt. It comes after the Supreme Court struck down President Biden's attempt to cancel student debts from millions of Americans. If you have a student loan, well, you should expect a bill that lays out how much you have to pay each month at least 21 days before your due date. Interest started accruing again last month. While well, the closing bell sounding on Wall Street, major averages finishing the day with mixed results as investors kick off the month of October. The Dow and S&P 500 both lower for the day. The Nasdaq closing in the green, lifted higher by big tech stocks, Alphabet and Adobe. And good news for prices at the pump. Oil dipping back below $90, settling at $88.77 a barrel. And conservative Republicans say they plan to oust him, but House Speaker Kevin McCarthy vows he's not going anywhere. This call comes after McCarthy narrowly stopped a government shutdown by siding with Democrats. He's now facing a direct threat from Florida Congressman Matt Gates, who's accusing the Speaker of secretly working with President Biden on funding for Ukraine. It is becoming increasingly clear who the Speaker of the House already works for and it's not the Republican conference. Members of the Republican party might vote differently on a motion to vacate if they heard what the speaker had to share with us about his secret side deal with Joe Biden. Money for Ukraine was notably left out of the temporary spending bill that Congress approved to keep the government funded through November 17th. Now, earlier today, our Rachel Scott pressed Speaker McCarthy on that alleged deal with President Biden. You said that there was a deal made on Ukraine. Really? What are you talking about? That's I have what, no idea. Said. And the president he, said something similar to that. No. The, it, was there a deal was, at all? You, you weren't there. There is no side deal going forward. Congressman Gates conceded he doesn't currently have the votes to boot McCarthy from his job, but said he'll keep trying if his efforts fail. Thanks for streaming with us. I'm Kira Phillips. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on Hulu, Roku, the ABC News app, and of course on abcnews.com. The news never stops. GMA3 starts right now. What you need to know right now on GMA3. Opening statements in the $250 million civil fraud trial against former President Donald Trump. His New York City real estate empire possibly at stake. The NYPD's new commissioner, Edward Caban, on leading the fight against crime and his ancestry milestone in this Hispanic Heritage Month. While we're working on the sloth on the table, Maya's in the background dealing with Pringle. She basically let herself out. Hi. Plus, Dr. Oakley, Yukon vet, her hard work saving animals in trouble, and her big moment. And a Super Bowl champion times two. Malcolm Jenkins knows a lot about winning, and now he's taking his experience from the football field to the page. Plus, staying beautiful while on the go. New beauty Sarah Eggenberger puts travel tools to the test. And star power behind the camera, director Vivica A. Fox pulls back the curtain on her new BET Plus film. And fan alert, Beyonce's record-breaking Renaissance World Tour now coming to a theater near you. Now, from Times Square, DeMarco Morgan and Eva Pilgrim with Dr. Jen Ashton and What You Need to Know. We're going to start off Monday and the month of October, everybody. Good afternoon and welcome to What You Need to Know. Can you believe it's October I already? Believe it. I cannot believe it. September's done. Yes, it is blowing. done. Yes, and Ariel Reshef is here filling in for Eva Pilgrim. Always it's good always to be good with to you. See you. Especially on a Monday, you guys brighten my spirits. Good to be with Dr. Sutton as well this morning. Mm -hmm. This afternoon, I should say. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what time of day it is. Yeah, yeah. It's all good. You're here. You are I'm here. <laughs> you made it. Good afternoon, everyone. Our day, it is pink in the studio for a reason. October is Breast Awareness Cancer Month, and we're going to be talking about prevention, uh, how you can also uh, treat yes. the disease. 
and also how we can help. Yes, a very important month devoted to education, the importance of early detection, and access to quality care. So to get us all on the same level, I wanted to start with some basic numbers. So first off, breast cancer. It represents approximately 30% of all cancers. Um, and also, it, it unfortunately, it's the most common cancer diagnosed within the United States. That equates to approximately 20, 240,000 women and almost 2,000 men each and every year. Uh, the incident rate we've seen in recent years, unfortunately, has increased by about half a percent. Secondly, risk factors. The most common risk factor is age. The median age of diagnosis is the age of 62. That means that half of those diagnosed are under the age of 62. Also, inherited genetic risk factors, family history, first-degree relatives with a history of breast or ovarian cancer, and those who have dense breasts. And, and to, be, to be specific about that, density, breast density is diagnosed on imaging. It's not something that can be diagnosed on exam. Mm. You gotta, then, get your, you gotta get your imaging done. You gotta get the imaging done. Bringing it to that screening, uh, that discussion, screening and discussions about screening should start at the age of 40. And most people don't realize it, but most insurance coverage, it should be all, cover mammograms every one to two years for women at the age of 40. It's important to understand your coverage the very same way that you understand your, your bank account. And then I think the most important number is survivors. Uh, right now, in the United States, there are more than 4 million women and men that are surviving breast cancer and currently undergoing treatment. And I think that that number is the most important, especially mm -hmm. to draw on that collective strength. They are thriving, and early detection is key. Absolutely. And many don't realize it, but if you find breast cancer at the earliest stages, your five-year survival rate can be as high as 99%. So start that discussion about mammograms. Get in there and make sure that you just answer all your, get all your questions answered. And look, I can say it can be scary to go in and get that imaging done, Terrifying. but it's so much more important to do it now and yes. catch it early. Yes, mm -hmm. get it out of the way. Unfortunately, in the emergency room, I'm uh, usually at the very beginning of many stories of their breast cancer when they're finding masses and trying to understand what can be the cause. And the, uh, again, getting it out of the way is so key, so important. Don't put it off. It's your health. Treat it as the most important thing in your life. Can't say it enough, Doc. Thank you. Of course. And we turn now to ABC's Faith Abube in Washington with our latest headlines. Good afternoon to you, Faith. Good afternoon to you, Ariel. Good to see you. All right, let's begin here with the latest headlines. Former President Donald Trump in court today for alleged fraud. The former president in New York for the proceedings, he's been lashing out at that judge on social media. Trump and some of his family members were accused of repeated and persistent business fraud, inflating the value of properties. The judge has already ruled against the former president, saying he's living in a fantasy world. Prosecutors were seeking $250 million in penalties in the New York State lawsuit. Trump has denied any wrongdoing. And here in Washington, House Speaker Kevin McCarthy, who worked with Democrats to keep the country from shutting down over the weekend, now facing possible removal from a persistent critic within his own party. Far-right Florida Congressman Matt Gates, McCarthy saying that he wants him to bring it. Meanwhile, Democrats carrying that funding measure to the victory line this weekend with just hours to spare, but no additional funding for Ukraine for now. That short-term measure runs out just before Thanksgiving. And healthcare workers poised to walk off the job in five states as the contract with 75,000 Kaiser Permanente workers expires. Employees seeking pay raises, pensions, better pensions, and outsourcing protections. If they do walk, it would be the largest SARS strike in the nation. And federal student loan payments kick back in again starting today after a three-year pandemic pause. Two, 28 million borrowers across the country now beginning to make those, pay those payments again, an average of $200 to $300 a month. The Education Department now launching a new repayment program called SAVE, which could mean significant savings per month. Borrowers can check that out at studentaid.gov. And safety, Damar Hamlin, Seeing action for the first time since he was knocked out of play by cardiac arrest on the field uh, during Monday night football game back in January. That emotional huddle. Take a look here with Buffalo Bills teammates before Sunday's game. And then we saw DeMar Harmlin, the last to leave the tunnel to those cheers. Hometown cheers, of course. It was beautiful to see. And finally here, those billionaire dreams. Billionaire. Yeah, stir it up again. With tonight's Powerball jackpot topping $1 billion and some change, 
The dream is still very much alive, but the chances of winning still as low as ever, guys. Yes. <laughs> He's saying there's a chance. Oh, yeah, I love how she says the dream is still alive. There's a chance. Still alive, baby. Still alive. Still alive. Right, Someone right, won the lottery with you, their... Yeah. Good to see you, my friend. Still ahead on this morning on GMA3, a New York's new top cop on the fighting crime in what he calls the safest big city in the nation and how his Hispanic heritage plays a role in his policing. Plus, adventures in rescuing animals. We'll meet Dr. Oakley Yukon vet. GMA3 will be right back. Whenever news breaks, the crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. Thirty years. My brother's death was this mystery. Was he pushed? Did he kill himself? The spine and hemorrhage remains found at the bottom of North Head, and the body was naked. Committing suicide naked is almost unheard of. What's going on here? You had some chilling evidence. Oh my goodness! No one knew it was coming. It's about finding justice for my brother. Sometimes you just have to stir the pot. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Tomorrow. The heat is overwhelming. He's been right there as wildfires raged. And now, after the devastating Maui fires, GMA's Mac Gutman showing how quickly these fires can spread in a live demonstration that could save your home. Tomorrow morning on GMA. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today? YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about. The new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Welcome back to GMA3. It's Hispanic Heritage Month, and up to, until recently, the NYPD had never had a Hispanic leader in its 178-year history. Well, that finally changed when Edward Caban, whose family is from Puerto Rico, was sworn in as the NYPD's 46th police commissioner, and he is here now with the latest on this story. And But first, congratulations to you. Uh, this is a big honor here. Thank you very much, and thank you for having me this morning. Of course. Your father was a detective, so this must mean a lot to you to be the first Latino police commissioner. Yes, it is. You know, I remember at my swearing-in ceremony, uh, you're out there, you're looking, and in your mind, you're thinking you go from being a regular beat cop to the top cop. And I was very cognizant of the fact that I was walking down the stairs to don't look at him. Look at him. You're going to break down. He was a trailblazer in my life. He was one of the officers who fought for Hispanics to get better assignments, to get more promotions. So for me, you know, it was an honor, the yeah. highest. Mm -hmm. Definitely filling some big shoes there. And we know that you've got a lot of work to do. There's a migrant crisis facing this city. 118,000 migrants came mm -hmm. to New York City since the spring of 2022. Uh, the mayor has said that this could affect every facet of life. How is the police department going to tackle this issue? So I can tell you from a police perspective, 
New York City Police Department are going to enforce the laws. Doesn't matter if you came into our city three hours ago or if you came into our city three generations ago. We're going to make sure we enforce the laws in every community. Mayor Adams has signaled, though, that this may slash over time for police officers. Are you worried that this could affect policing in some way? It's not going to affect policing. The last couple of years, we have had diminished officers coming on our job. But look at the work they're doing. Since the administration began, officers on our job have taken over 12,000 illegal firearms off our streets. They've taken over 23,000 ATVs off our streets. Our cops are going to continue to work and make sure that New Yorkers are safe each and every day. Commissioner, you call New York the safest big city in the nation. In fact, according to the NYPD, uh, murders are down over 11 uh, percent, shooting incidents are down over 26 percent, and robberies are down over 5 percent compared to this same time last year. What do you say to, to those who disagree with you and say this is not the safest big city in the country? So first and foremost, I want to thank the men and women of the New York City Police Department for the work they do. They're not called New York's finest for no reason. So when we came, the administration came into focus in January 2022, crime was up historic levels, both on our streets and our subways. So that was part of our mandate to make sure we're safe, both from violence and from subway crime. We want to make sure people are safe, not only that they are safe, that they feel safe too. So we deployed over 1,000 officers in our subway systems. And today, we're down over 5% in subway crimes. Look at our streets from when we began, Crime in New York City was up over 40 percent. Now we're down in every cat crime category that we track, at least five out of our seven. As you mentioned, shootings are down, murders are down. And that's the great work the men and women of New York City Police Department are doing, and they're going to continue to do. Certainly a good trend, not to pan pre-pandemic levels quite yet. But we know that in 2020 there was a racial reckoning, and a lot of police departments across the country had to recalibrate their strategies. Uh, a recent report showed that the NYPD is still using controversial practices like stop and frisk. Mm -hmm. What do you say to those who may feel like police reforms haven't gone far enough? You know. I look back at my time growing up as a kid in the Bronx where myself and my brothers were stopped questioning and fritz. And I didn't like how that felt. So I'm going to make sure that we have a police department that polices constitutionally. NYPD Commissioner Edward Caban, a trailblazer. Thank you so much for being with Congratulations. us today. Congratulations. Good to see you. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Bless sir. And just ahead here on GMA3, Tales from the Wild. Yeah, animal rescues in some very rugged locations. Dr. Oakley Yukon Vet joins us on the new season. We're back in a moment. Stay with us. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Give it to me. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news.
ABC News Live Prime, winner of the Gracie Award for Best News Program in All of Television. Stream ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis, weeknights on ABC News Live. Reporting from the Gulf Coast of Florida, covering Hurricane Adalia. I'm Mike Ajachi. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. While we're working on the sloth on the table, Maya's in the background dealing with Pringle. She basically let herself out. Hi! She's eating her food that's inside the cage. She screamed. She couldn't get to her loose from the inside, so instead of moving across her cage, she went outside and came and started eating them from the outside. Are you trying to let yourself back in? She goes in and out as, as she please. She can't get her fat butt back in. <laughs> <laughs> the sloth was hungry. Can you blame her? Welcome back to GMA3. That's a clip from the new season of Dr. Oakley, Yukon Vet, which chronicles the incredible stories of resilience, compassion, and untamed nature in the world of veterinary medicine. I love it already. And the star of the hit series is here with us today. Please welcome Dr. Michelle Oakley. So good to have you with us. Good to us. see you. Thanks so much for having me. Of course. So being a vet in a while comes with its own challenges. What's yeah. been one of the most heartwarming experiences for you? Oh, I mean, the clip that you show with the sloth is a good reminder. We were just recently in Costa Rica working with sloths, and um, there was one female who'd been in captivity for two years since, since she was a baby. Um, they didn't feel comfortable releasing her because she didn't seem to have an initially use of her hind legs. Um, but we were able to come and bring some equipment, some x-rays and some treatments, and we showed that she could be released. And the whole time we were there, she was calling to the other sloths in the wild. And then Aww. we got to release her. And I mean, that's kind of what it's all about, right? Is that's getting a big them moment. back yeah, to the wild. What a so moment. those are the moments that, that we are working for. So, mm. what's unique here is you're often operating in very rugged terrain, the Yukon, yeah. places in Alaska. <laughs> how mm -hmm. does that create challenges for you? And how do you overcome that to make sure you can service these animals? Yeah, it's, it's all field medicine, right? So, it's trying to adapt the clinic to the wild. And we're working in the extreme environments. You know, Alaska and Yukon can be 20 below, 30 below. We've worked in 40 below, where like the instruments are freezing to my hands. You know, um, we work from boats, where we go to remote places on boat and set up the clinic. Um, sometimes we're traveling on snowmobiles, so we're trying to put everything on a snowmobile and that travel. Fun. Wow. So it's you know helicopter. Often I'm darting out of a helicopter or working. So. Really, it's all about adapting the clinic, you know, to whatever situation, whatever animal we're working on. There's a wide range of species. It's also like an adventure sport. Mm -hmm. <laughs> sort of, <laughs> yeah. An amazing commitment that you, you have. You also get a chance yeah. to bond with your family and your daughters on the show. What's that yeah. like? Uh, that's, I mean, I'm just so lucky. I feel like, you know, we've had 12 seasons now that people, we get to share, you know, our family working with animals with everyone who's watching. And, you know, the girls have grown up on the show mm -hmm. and they've really come into their own in terms of their own passions to help animals. You know, my oldest daughter, Sierra, started vet school this year, so Aww. that's exciting. Oh, nice. Now, yeah. that's a good <laughs> testament right? of mom's great work. Yeah, and then Maya um, is one of the best animal caretakers and, and just helps, you know, with the recovery. And so, and my youngest daughter, Willow, when we traveled remote places, she's often out trapping feral cats and brings them in. And, and she's one of the most feral of my, of my children. So it's like <laughs> everyone's kind of found their niche. And then we kind of work together to get the animals, you know, either get them homes or get them back to the wild. And we, is that your goal for everybody that's watching that they would develop a love for animals? Yeah, I mean, we get a lot, tons of fan mail now from, you know, little kids that want to be veterinarians or they want to help animals. And that's been by far the most rewarding part of, of this kind of decade that we've had, you know, with Nat Geo series. So, yeah, I mean, I want to encourage people to do this, and we're hoping to do more of this, especially international re rescue work. All right, Dr. Oakley, thank you very much. And folks, be sure to check out Dr. Oakley's Yukon Vet on Nat Geo Wild. And up next right here on GMA3, Dr. Darian with some important information this Breast Cancer Awareness Month. That's why we're wearing We've got today. our pink on. Yes, we do. Plus, this star now leading behind the lens, Vivica A. Fox, joins us on our directorial debut. Stay with us here watching GMA3. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. I think vulnerability is extremely powerful. This is an artist that I looked up to at one point. 
I never would have imagined that the ending would have been what it was. They do not shock me. The treatment was just so disgusting on everyone's part. Did Lizzo ever put her hands on you? No, she didn't get to that point. She attempted to come at me with her fist balled up. Lizzo is denying it all. Lizzo's legal limbo. You never, like, expect for it to turn into that. Now streaming on Hulu. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Tomorrow. The heat is overwhelming. He's been right there as wildfires raged. And now, after the devastating Maui fires, GMA's Mac Gutman showing how quickly these fires can spread in a live demonstration that could save your home. Tomorrow morning on GMA. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Give it to me. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. You're watching America's number one streaming news. ABC News Live. Breaking news, exclusives, live reporting across the globe. Keep streaming with ABC News Live. We are back on GMA3 with Dr. Darian Sutton, who's in for Dr. Ashton all week. It's good to have you, as always. Great to be here. And we are talking about a study that shows that at-home COVID tests are actually most effective on the fourth day of symptoms. Mm. That's a little bit of a change from the past. Break this down for us. It's a yeah. little bit of a change, and an important question as we step into this viral season. So in this study, they followed over 300 people, and they followed those who were newly diagnosed with COVID-19, and they tracked their viral loads. And they found that the viral load of these patients was highest on the fourth day of their mm. sickness. And also that corresponded with the most or the highest accuracy of those at-home rapid antigen tests. They found that they were most accurate on the fourth day. Now, why does this happen and why is this different from before? Many, many believe, and it's likely true, that the population that we're looking at right now is very different from when we first started this pandemic. We have a majority of whom have been vaccinated or have had a recent prior infection of COVID-19 and therefore that takes time to build up your viral load because your body is already uh, understanding what fighting that infection mm -hmm. looks like and fighting it. And so that is one of the reasons why it probably takes a little bit longer to get that rapid test accurate. So what should you do in between then if it's not, you know, accurate until the fourth day? You know, my recommendation is that if you have symptoms, regardless of whether it's COVID, the common cold or the flu, I think you should mask up and take precautions so that you do decrease the risk of transmitting it to others. And then if you test initially and it's negative and you're still symptomatic, repeat that test in about 48 hours or two days. Is that the same if you don't have symptoms, if you come in contact with someone? I believe that if you come into contact with someone and you believe that it was a high-risk interaction, you were very close to someone for a long period of time, then you should basically mind your level of risk when you're transmit or walking around with other people. I'd wear a mask, for example, if I wasn't sure, and then get tested about three or five days after that interaction just to make sure you're not infected. But these at-home tests, they still work. They still work, and the expiration dates are changing. And so if you're curious before you throw it out, check online to make sure it's not expired. Dr. Right, back in a moment. So much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? 
I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes. And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News live america's number one streaming news anytime anywhere streaming 24 7 straight to you for free thank you for making abc news live america's number one streaming news What's good to watch, read? Where can I get a great deal on what I'm just dying to buy? Oh, it's all right here. GMA Life. Get the latest celebrity buzz, deals and steals, and the coolest lifestyle tips from GMA. I love that so much. Streaming weekends on ABC News Live. You're watching America's number one streaming news. ABC News Live. Breaking news. Exclusives. Live reporting. Keep streaming with ABC News Live. Hello, everyone. I'm Kira Phillips. Top headlines we're following for you right now on ABC News Live, beginning with conservative Republicans say they plan to oust him, but House Speaker Kevin McCarthy vows he's not going anywhere. This comes after McCarthy narrowly stopped a government shutdown by siding with Democrats. He's now facing a direct threat from Florida Congressman Matt Gates, who's accusing the Speaker of secretly working with President Biden on funding for Ukraine. It is becoming increasingly clear who the Speaker of the House already works for, and it's not the Republican conference. Members of the Republican Party might vote differently on a motion to vacate if they heard what the Speaker had to share with us about his secret side deal with Joe Biden. Money for Ukraine was notably left out of the temporary spending bill Congress approved to keep the government funded through November 17th. Now, earlier today, our Rachel Scott press Speaker McCarthy on that alleged deal with President Biden. He says that there was a deal made on Ukraine. Really? What By who? Talking about? I that's have what, no idea. And the president he, said something similar to that. No. That the, it, was there a deal were, at all? You, you weren't there. There is no side deal going forward. Congressman Gates conceded he doesn't currently have the votes to boot McCarthy from his job, but said he'll keep trying if his efforts fail. And after three years of a pandemic pause, nearly 30 million Americans are back on the hook for their student loan debt. It comes after the Supreme Court struck down President Biden's attempt to cancel student debt for millions of Americans. Now, if you have a student loan, well, you should expect a bill that lays out just how much you have to pay each month at least 21 days before your due date. Interest started accruing again last month. Well, two scientists whose discoveries led to the mRNA vaccines have been awarded the Nobel Prize for Medicine. Caitlin Curico and Drew Weissman met in the 1990s just by chance while photocopying research papers together. Well, their discoveries led to the COVID-19 vaccines that helped slow the pandemic. Curico says that when she got the call about the prestigious award this morning, she thought it was a prank. All right, I want to take you uh, straight now to uh, Donald Trump is speaking just outside of court. Because the judge essentially conceded that the statute of limitations that uh, we won at the Court of Appeals is in effect. Therefore, about 80% of the case is over. I was going to come out and say that as you know, we're not entitled to a jury, which is pretty unusual in the United States of America. So uh, we think it's very unfair that I don't have a jury. But uh, the judge's last statement was very fair. And if I read it right, I'll let perhaps one of the lawyers speak to it. But Cliff, maybe you'll speak to it, if you would. 
But uh, the way I interpret that and the way everyone else in the room seems to interpret that is that the statute of limitations uh, is a very real thing in this country. And that would be about 80 percent of this case would be over. Uh, could somebody speak to that, please? Sure. So, based on the judge's comments, at, based on the judge's comments at the end of the here at the end of the trial today, it would appear that he is agreeing that all the transactions that closed prior to 2014 are now out of the case, which is about 80 percent of the case, and it's also uh, something that we won on appeal, but was not accepted by this court, but now seems to be accepted by this court. Uh, as far as the jury is concerned. It's much different now, I must tell you, than it was 20 minutes ago. But we were going to come out and complain that, you know, in this country, you're entitled to a jury. But we very much appreciate the judge's decision today, or his statement today, on statute of limitations, which is a very big thing. It's a limited time period. And we did nothing wrong. And if you look at the statements, they showed that even in 2011, I guess the number was $258 million in cash. Uh, very strong company. I don't believe we really, uh, maybe I wouldn't do a couple of deals or something, but I wouldn't have even needed to go to banks. Banks loved our business. They loved our deals. They weren't defrauded. They lost no money. They made money. They had the finest attorneys that there are. Frankly, their attorneys were better than my attorneys. And uh, they made a lot of money, and they considered me a very good client. I paid them back on time, on schedule. There was no default. They never even sent me a default letter. Not one. For years, never got a default letter. And there's no case here. There's no victim. The banks aren't a victim. The insurance companies are a victim. Everybody got paid. It's a terrible, terrible thing. This was for politics. Now, it has been very successful for them because they took me off the campaign trail. Because I've been sitting in a courthouse all day long instead of being in Iowa, New Hampshire, South Carolina, or a lot of other places I could be at. This is a horrible situation for our country. It's never happened before. It's election interference. They're interfering with the presidential election of 2024. And the people of our country see it. But this was a big, big, uh, I, I say surprise, but it was a great credit. All right, you're to listening to former President Donald to Trump there as he's getting ready to leave sort of court after his himself. fraud trial right. began great earlier this morning. That. As you know, Trump Thank is facing a $250 everybody. million dollar lawsuit. The New York Attorney General okay. accusing the former president well, there of fraudulent the business that's practices. That's uh, Letitia James actually turning to the title of Trump's best-selling book today when she addressed reporters saying, claiming you have money you do not have does not amount to the art of the deal, it's the art of the steal. The former president there saying he's done nothing wrong. Joining me now from the courthouse there in Manhattan, our investigative uh, reporter and producer, Olivia Rubin, also executive editorial producer, John Santucci, and former chief minority counsel of the U.S. Senate Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations, Jeff Robbins. Uh, all right, Olivia, let's go ahead and start with you. Uh, how many witnesses did we hear from today and what exactly happened and what did we learn? Well, just the one for today, Kira, it was that accountant from uh, the former president's former accounting firm, Mazars, who really sort of laid the groundwork for some of the uh, attorney general's case here. And like they said at the beginning, they were using this witness after opening statements to really bring in a lot of the documents that they were trying to get into the case. But also sort of a key moment there, Kira, was when they were asking uh, the accountant about sort of, you know, whose responsibility it was to, you know, pull together a lot of the facts that were in the financial statements. And what the accountant said was it was the Trump organization's responsibility. And we were sort of aggregators, but it was on them to catch errors. And if they wanted to depart from a certain standard, that was on them. So that was a little bit of a pushback to something that we heard from Trump's team earlier in the day, which is that Mazars was the accountants. They were responsible for the financial statements that are at issue here. So really just one witness in the books for today, Kira, one of dozens that the attorney general has said that her office plans to call. So really, really just the beginning of what could potentially be a months long case here in downtown New York. Months long, Jeff, but you know, the findings already revealed today, it's going to be a bench trial. So let's just talk about how this is going to play out differently from all the other ongoing cases we've seen the former president immersed in uh, when he has been charged or indicted. 
Well, as you have pointed out and as ABC has, has reported, the, the fundamental findings in the case have already been made on the question of whether or not Trump and his company and his family members submitted dishonest, misleading, fraudulent uh, statements to uh, financial institutions, that's done. That's, uh, that's already been established. So now where we are is trying essentially two issues. Uh, did these defendants defraud with the specific intent to defraud? Which sounds odd, right? Because if somebody has uh, committed fraud, of course you would imagine that's the same as saying that they acted with a specific intent to defraud, not under New York law. So now there'll be a trial on, did these defendants have a specific intent to defraud? And then, to what extent did they benefit? Did they get financial benefits, retain money, keep money, make money as a result of these actions? And that finding will determine how much uh, these defendants have to pay out, have to disgorge. Those are the two issues in the case now. Live pictures as we're watching the former president uh, actually get into the car there and leave the courthouse and uh, get ready for, for his next day in court. Uh, apparently this is going to go on until December. John, when push comes to shove, $250 million uh, is, is what this lawsuit uh, is talking about with regard to the civil fraud uh, trial that we've watched begin today. How much of a dent is that really for Donald Trump? Well, it's a definitely a dent. I mean, if you look at the case that the attorney general has brought, part of what she's saying is that Donald Trump has inflated all of his assets, all of his holdings. So this idea that Donald Trump is worth $4 billion, as he has liked to say repeatedly, uh, saying on the campaign trail, I'm rich, I'm very rich. Uh, Letitia James, the attorney general and her team saying, well, that's just simply not true. So we're not not going to know, quite frankly, uh, if Donald Trump can pay up until he may be forced to pay up. But as you know, Kira, that is a long time away between not only the length of this trial, but then we have to remember those magic words, appeal. He is entitled to an appeal. His attorneys have already said that after that summary judgment ruling that came down just a couple of days ago, they intend to appeal. And no matter which way this judge is going to rule, though you'd have to imagine, based on his ruling already, it will not be in Donald Trump's favor, we could look at another appeal based on this soon-to-be ruling. But that obviously is months away and months to come. So, Jeff, the, the former president is saying this is all political. This is all because he's leading uh, in the polls. Um, how much is there a, any ounce of truth to that when you think about Letitia James? Uh, and when she was coming out uh, announcing her platform, she made it very clear she was going to dig into every nook and cranny of uh, any dark spot within the former president's world and expose it. Yeah, this is not exactly a 10 cent uh, overcharge. The allegations of the attorney general are that uh, the former president inflated his assets by $3.6 billion. You know, $3.6 billion here, $3.6 billion there, pretty soon you're talking real money. And so for the attorney general, under those circumstances, uh, to walk away from a case like this, um, not that she would have been inclined to walk away from it, would be a stretch. And, you know, there's an expression that lawyers have, if you don't have the facts, argue the law. If you don't have the law, pound the table. Evidently, if you don't have a table, you accuse the judge of being a criminal. It's not a great move. It's not a move uh, by a defense team that thinks it's going to win the case. And I don't think they think they're going to win this case. So, Olivia, the, the first witness that we heard from, Donald uh, Bender, this former accountant uh, for this firm that handled Trump's taxes, what exactly did he lay out? Because I'm, I'm actually seeing, too, that there came a point where uh, they severed ways when talk of a, a, a lawsuit uh, was, was coming forward. So what did it seem like to you of how aware these accountants were of what they were doing and if indeed anything that they were doing was fraudulent. Well, there was actually one, uh, you know, really telling moment here, and you're right, this accountant no longer works for the former president or the Trump organization. They have severed ways when the New York Attorney General's findings came out, but there was this one moment where he was asked by the Attorney General's team while he's on the stand saying, 
can you ever recall a time where, you know, you bring up, you notice errors in the documents and you bring it to the team? He says, yes, of course. But then when asked specifically, did you ever bring an error directly to Donald Trump? He said no, that he did not. So that was something that definitely distanced this conduct away from the former president himself a little bit. But I think really the key here, Kira, uh, with some of his testimony was who was responsible for, you know, departing from standards that the Trump organization allegedly departed from, from catching errors in these documents, from deciding the specific ways that they were going to include things or not include things. And what he testified on the stand, Kira, was that that responsibility lied with the Trump organization, that when they came into this sort of, uh, you know, meeting together in 2011, when they came together, that they were just going to be aggregators. Mazars was just going to collect the information and prepare the statements. They weren't really doing the entire intense audits of the organization, like you may suggest. So that is really what his testimony was about. And then that moment, Kira, like I said, about asking, did you ever bring an error to Donald Trump? He said no. So that was sort of what some of his testimony was today. But it was really, really detailed financial testimony, Kira. And again, a lot about the documents that the New York Attorney General is trying to bring into this case here. One more question, uh, Jeff. You know, Trump uh, attorneys are saying that the attorney general's case here sets a dangerous precedent, uh, that it's, it's dangerous for any business in the state of New York when you look at, at, at what she's doing. I, I mean, yes, the, we know of millionaires, billionaires, wealthy businessmen that have cooked the books and fudged the taxes, and that's no surprise. Um, but we are talking about a former president and a man that wants to be president once again. I think it's a little bit of a different standard here when you're talking about Donald Trump versus um, other uh, businesses. Yeah, and clearly uh, half the country, roughly speaking, is unmoved uh, by these allegations, whether the 91 uh, separate indictments or uh, this evidence of, 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 of sort of cheating the system. You're cl clearly right about that. But boy, in terms of a dangerous precedent, what a dangerous precedent it would be if we threw up our hands, if law enforcement threw up their hands and said, corporate America can just uh, file dozens and dozens of, uh, of fraudulent uh, financial statements without any consequence. That seems to me is the most dangerous consequence of all, a point which the attorney general in effect made uh, when she made her statement on the courthouse steps today. Jeff, John, Olivia, thanks so much, guys. Former President Trump, they're leaving the courthouse, heading uh, who knows where. <laughs> but thanks for streaming with us. I'm Kira Phillips. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context, and analysis. And you can also find us on Hulu, Roku, the ABC News app, and of course on abcnews.com. The news never stops. More GMA3 right after a quick break. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? How cute. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. 
What's good to watch, read? Where can I get a great deal on what I'm just dying to buy? Oh, it's all right here. GMA Life. Get the latest celebrity buzz, deals and steals, and the coolest lifestyle tips from GMA. I love that so much. Streaming weekends on ABC News Live. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland, reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi, the Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City, getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime, we'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights, wherever you stream your news, only on ABC News Live. The plans for Halloween. Yeah, I got them screaming. What fun that is. We fly. Come on, Karen. We're falling behind. <laughs> Please don't call me Karen. It's focus. Don't lose focus. Give me what I love the most. It's spooky season. Yeah, I got them screaming. <laughs> Had enough? We're just getting started. Only one night of Halloween. Watch all October on Freeform. 30 years. My brother's death was his mystery. Was he pushed? Did he kill himself? There's been some human remains found at the bottom of North Head, and the body was naked. Committing suicide naked is almost unheard of. What's going on here? We had some chilling evidence. Oh my goodness. No one knew it was coming. It's about finding justice for my brother. Sometimes you just have to stir the pot. He posts his thirst traps in a leather-bound album. If you call him, he'll answer the phone. He gets the early bird special anytime he wants. Florida wants to retire and move to him. He's Gary. And I'm your first golden bachelor. Forget those sounds. Bow, bow. I go right back to the moment that it happened. I wasn't fast enough. Second, sixty-three. The United States. Just in Thursdays. What is Secretariat? A secretary? That's a woman? Kelly Ripa hosts the comedy game show where nobody acts their age. <laughs> Juniors and seniors work together to flex their pop culture knowledge for big prizes and bigger fun. Who is this Mr.? Mr. Rockstar? Mr. T is going to be very upset with all of us. <laughs> Generation Gap. Thursdays on ABC and stream on Hulu. What does it take to be America's number one news? It takes asking the straightforward, tough questions. Do you believe that Donald Trump should ever be president again? How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? The newsmaking interviews. You said that there were six friends. One of them was sick. Yeah. Do you have future political aspirations? Going to the front line. The search for survivors. How does this war end? And getting to the heart of the story. Thank you for being here. We'll be here for the long run. ABC News, number one in the morning. The number one newscast. Number one in daytime talk. Friday nights, Sunday mornings versus the competition. And the number one streaming news. Thank you for making ABC News America's trusted, straightforward, first choice. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey, I'm David Muir. Wherever the story, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. By the way, my mom told you he's gonna make some money right now. Look, my mom was telling me I'm gonna put you on. What's this? Scamming checks. Now, scamming checks is easy money. This is separate from the dope money. Dope money is what's keeping everything going on around here. You understand me? It's just something to put a little something in your pockets. Okay, all right. I'm ready. 
Oh, that's good. Got you us gotta hooked. watch it. Yeah. Got us hooked. I love watching you watch that. Welcome back to GMA3. That's a clip from an all new BET Plus film inspired by the real life story of a Midwest woman who rises in the ranks to eventually lead a drug empire. Mm -hmm. The film is called The First Lady of BMF, the Tonisa Welch story. And our next guest helps bring Welch's heroine tell to life on screen with her feature film directorial debut, by the way. Please help Woo! us welcome the one and only, the also lovely and talented Vivica A. Fox. Woo! Just telling uh, Dr. Darren in the dressing room, it's almost like you're the hardest working woman in TV. She yes. always has a project coming out. Yes. Yeah, congratulations. Thank you. Thank Are you surprised you so that it went off so smoothly? Uh, there were some challenging days. I mean, I definitely will admit that. We shot the film in 14 days in Washington, D.C., but I am so grateful that Tressa Smallwood of Megamind Media surrounded me with a wonderful crew, a wonderful cast that got in there and did the work. Mm. Because that's what you need as a director, is for your actors and everybody to come with their A-game, because mm -hmm. I came with mine. <laughs> As always. As always. You sure did. Yes. This is a riveting tale of yes. Tony Sewelch. Uh, why was this the role that you wanted to step behind the camera to produce? It's a story of redemption, and I'm all about girl power. I believe that women are capable of doing anything. We all make mistakes in life. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes we make choices that we regret. And she got out after going through this, you know, the glam of of being in that world that a lot of young girls can get caught up in. Mm -hmm. And the fact that she was able to redeem herself was one of the main things that, you know, drove me to this movie. And the fact that it was like I had to really get in there and do the work because I had some local actors. Mm -hmm. And first of all, I had to tell them, get over it that Vivica A. Fox is your director. Okay, <laughs> let's just go. Talk to her. Get that on out here. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Like, Stop being starstruck. Your man right here can't contain himself. <laughs> <it. laughs> <laughs> 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 Your son needs to be resuscitated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> but uh, we did we did the work, and I would be running lines with them because I'm like an actor's director, mm -hmm. so I would know when they weren't hitting moments that was a very mm. important. So I can't imagine the nervousness I would have by Vivica Fox watching me try to do something that she's so great at. Like right now. <laughs> yeah, I'm sweating under here. But when I watched it last night, yes. one of the things that I loved the most was the level of detail. Yes. I felt like when this story first came out, we were always asking questions: How did this happen? Yes. My question to you: When you were creating this, did Tanisa help? And how much was she involved in, in this detail? She was so available for us. Mm. And we would call her about the smallest details. Really? And she was always making herself available. We should also point out that you collaborated with Judge Mathis. Yes, I did. On this project. Why was it so important for you two to bring something like this to life? Well, Judge Mathis is from Detroit, so he knew Tonisa going through the court system. Mm. And so, he, yes. And so he was really one of the main reasons we got the film done, besides Mega My Media and Trusted Smallwood. But I just, you know, I, I love, love that finally we're able to tell our stories. Mm -hmm. And when I say that, color girl stories. Mm -hmm. That, you know, she went through the good, bad, and the ugly, and she has prevailed. And she is so grateful and so happy because for the longest time on the series BMF, she was portrayed inaccurately. So this is us giving Tonisa her truth. Vivica uh, A. Fox, the definition yeah, of a multi Yeah, you make us proud. Hail to the queen right here. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you Always so much. Always good to see you. Yeah, and good to have you on as well. Thank you. Thanks yeah, for so spending the time with the afternoon. Yeah, so the first lady of BMF, the Tonisa Welch story premieres October 5th on BET+. Plus. So go ahead and check it out and support Miss Vivica A. Fox. And that is what you need to know. I'm DeMarco Morgan. I'm Ariel Reshev in for Eva Pilgrim today. And I'm Vivica A. Fox's new assistant. <laughs> <laughs> new assistant. I like that. Promote yourself, yeah. man. Right. Have a good one, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Good job. Yeah. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. 30 years. My brother's death was his mystery. Was he pushed? Did he kill himself? Despite some human remains found at the bottom of North Head, and the body was naked. Committing suicide naked is almost unheard of. What's going on here? We had some chilling evidence. Oh my goodness. No one knew it was coming. It's about finding justice for my brother. Sometimes you just have to stir the pot. 
so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible EC News app. Breaking news, incredible video. Faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from Paris, I'm Brick Clement. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. It is a busy day. I'm Kana Whitworth here in Los Angeles and right now on ABC News Live. Donald Trump defiant as the future of his business empire hangs in the balance. The former president appearing in court today in his New York civil fraud trial. His harsh words for the judge who has already ruled the former president lied about the value of his assets and his net worth for years. And Kevin McCarthy under pressure from House Republicans after he aligned with Democrats to keep funding the government. What far right members are now saying about a plan to remove him as speaker. And student loan repayments resuming for tens of millions of borrowers. So we will hear from some Americans on the hook again as our nation faces a college debt crisis. But it is breaking news. That is our top story at this hour. What you're looking at live right now is Trump Tower, where former President Donald Trump has just left the courthouse and he was in his motorcade, drove home to Trump Tower. This is Fifth Avenue, uh, Midtown Manhattan. So not a far distance for the former president who had yet another day in court today. The trial began earlier today. Trump, his sons, Eric and Donald Jr., along with some Trump Organization executives, accused of acts of fraud and misrepresentation over decades to inflate Trump's net worth while lowering his tax burden. Now, Trump has denied all wrongdoing, calling the case an effort to keep him out of the White House. Take a listen. It has been very successful for them because they took me off the campaign trail because I've been sitting in a courthouse all day long instead of being in Iowa, New Hampshire, South Carolina, or a lot of other places I could be at. This is a horrible situation for our country. It's never happened before. It's election interference. They're interfering with the presidential election of 2024, and the people of our country see it. I want to bring in our ABC News senior investigative reporter Aaron Katursky from outside the courthouse there in New York, along with ABC News executive editorial producer John Santucci and attorney and former chief minority counsel for the U.S. Senate Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations, Jeff Robbins. Thank you, gentlemen, for being here with us. And Aaron, let's start with you. You know, one of Trump's attorneys actually said, you know, she hadn't planned on making any opening remarks, but then felt so moved to speak after hearing the states representing their case. So, Aaron, she went on to claim that this investigation and and the lawsuit were personal in nature. What's your take? We can take Alina Haba at her word that she wasn't planning to speak and was so enraged by the state's presentation that she felt so compelled. It's also possible that she was performing for her boss, with former President Trump seated there at the defense table, a scowl on his face, arms crossed, oftentimes looking displeased with things that the state said about the 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 real estate brand that catapulted him to the White House. Remember, the state, Kena, was saying for much of the day that Trump lied year after year about the value of his properties and about his net worth, sometimes for vanity, to try and bump himself up on the Forbes list of the wealthiest people, sometimes to get better deals from banks and insurance companies. And Alina Haba said, you can't put a put a price on some of the Trump properties because they're Mona Lisa properties, comparing them to priceless works of art. Yeah, Aaron, and you do have to always wonder if they are being performative in nature here. But also, Aaron, you know, Trump faces some stiff financial losses both immediately and down the line. So what's really at stake here? 
five channels. The judge has already decided the core of this case, finding that Trump committed fraud, overvalued his, his assets, and inflated his net worth by as much as $2.2 billion. And, and what's at stake now is how much he's going to have to pay in penalties. The state attorney general's office has asked for $250 million in disgorgement. But already the judge's ruling in partial summary judgment has consequences threatening Trump's control of some of his prized properties, including Trump Tower, where he stayed and where he rode the golden escalator down to announce his first run for the presidency. Uh, it was quite a moment there, Aaron, and we just saw him arrive back there today. Uh, John, to you, you know, earlier, Trump called the judge presiding over this case rogue. Uh, that's no surprise, that hyperbolic language from him, right? But then moments ago, he gave the judge a little credit. So let's take a listen to that. Mm -hmm. But this was a big, big, uh, I, I say surprise, but it was a great credit to the court that the judge was willing to do this. He sort of overruled himself, and I greatly respect that. Greatly respect that. So, John, what are you hearing from your sources in the Trump camp about particularly what does he greatly respect, respect right. and how are they explaining all of this? So let's back up a little bit here. So first, I, I, I think the big point we want to make here is that though Donald Trump uh, said to cameras at the end of court that he was off the campaign trail, uh, this proceeding was taking him away from anything else that he had to do. Let's be clear, he did not need to be there today. This was not a case where Donald Trump's attendance was required. This is a civil proceeding. So Donald Trump actually made the choice for Donald Trump Trump to physically be in New York today, to physically be in that courtroom from early this morning until just a few minutes ago, Kena. But to your question about what he was talking about there, so at the end of the proceedings today, the judge seemed to reference a bit of the timeline from when this went on, from 2011, 2014, and encouraged prosecutors to connect that because it gets a little bit out of statute of limitations. No ruling or anything like that. So Donald Trump, you know, trying to then play messenger in chief, heading outside a courtroom to speak spin a little bit on his own behalf, but the judge in no way said that there was a win, a ruling, a decision, anything like that. If anything, the judge said that we have a lot to get through here because Donald Trump's business is a lot. It is incredibly complicated. It is all over, as Aaron noted, New York between Trump Tower, a hotel just down the block from our headquarters here along Central Park South, and many other properties, Kena, that do come into question. And if, 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 if that ruling that came down a couple days ago from this judge on summary judgment is upheld, and if this proceeding, which just began, as you noted today, goes against Donald Trump, it does mean Donald Trump could be out of business in New York, which would obviously be a big blow to Donald Trump and the empire he had built. Certainly would be. And Jeff, to you, you know, uh, John's so right to point out that he did not have to be there today. He was almost using the cameras, which he referenced multiple times throughout the day today as some sort of campaign stop. I mean, we have, if the judge has already found him liable, what can his legal strategy be? And does just being there, is that part of it? Well, although nobody says this explicitly in law school, if a judge has found that you've engaged in persistent fraud and you stand on the courthouse steps and say that the court, uh, the judge uh, is a crook, it's not generally regarded as a good sign for your case. Uh, and I think that the Trump legal team knows that it is in the deepest of legal holes. And it may well, the only strategic uh, sort of gain from this, which is uh, Hail Mary upon Hail Mary, upon Hail Mary is to see if he can goad the judge into making some kind of reversible error. Because if he thinks that he's going to intimidate this judge by making these accu accusations against the judge, he's very likely wrong. He is in a deep hole. They have a very tough road to hoe with these findings of fraud already on the books and only two narrow issues left. A, did they specifically intend to defraud uh, uh, and, and how much has to be paid back? All right. And John, you know, back to you, we heard him mention New Hampshire and Iowa, some of these early voting states. But the Trump base, I mean, they have been electrified by all of his recent indictments. However, 
Is this one a little bit different, a little bit more personal? I actually heard you say earlier, John, it's almost like a divorce from New York. <laughs> Kena, I'm glad you watch all of our programming on ABC News Live. But yeah, it definitely is. Look, Donald Trump uh, and, and New York are synonymous. You know, there's a famous uh, piece of footage that I'm personally obsessed with in our ABC archives, and it's Barbara Walters, the late, great Barbara Walters, flying over New York skyline with a young Donald Trump, and she talks about the New York City skyline, how Donald Trump wanted to reimagine the New York City skyline. And he walked Barbara through the things that he liked, didn't like, the little tweaks he would make. That's what Donald Trump always wanted. He always wanted to be in Manhattan. His father, of course, built an empire in Queens and Brooklyn, but it was Donald Trump that had to cross over and get into New York City. That was the goal, and now it may be an end. All right, Aaron Katursky, John Santucci, and Jeff Robbins, thank you all for your time. We appreciate it. And now to a new and growing battle on the Hill. Kevin McCarthy facing a threat to his speakership as far-right members from his own party in the House wage a push to remove him. Those Republican members voicing outrage over McCarthy working with Democrats to pass this last-minute spending bill to temporarily avoid a government shutdown. GOP member Matt Gates has been leading the charge. You see him there in the yellow tie, accusing the House Speaker of making a secret deal with the White House to keep funding Ukraine's war effort. So on the House floor today, the Florida representative even suggested a vote to oust McCarthy is coming. Take a listen. So for all the crocodile tears about what may happen later this week about a motion to vacate, working with the Democrats is a yellow brick road that has been paved by Speaker McCarthy, whether it was the debt limit deal, the CR, or now the secret deal on Ukraine. Secret deal on Ukraine. Jay O'Brien is joining us now live on Capitol Hill. So Jay, you actually had a chance to catch up with uh, Kevin McCarthy. What is the latest from him today? Yeah, well, it takes one member, remember, of the House Republican Conference to call for a vote to oust McCarthy. Matt Gates is threatening to do just that this week. But then, if you're Matt Gates, you got to win that vote. And so the question becomes how many of the further right of the Republican Conference want to join with Gates and boot McCarthy out? Kevin McCarthy will tell you he is not worried. I asked him earlier today if he's looking to Democrats to try to offset any Republicans that vote against him if there were to be a motion to vacate him from his job. Here's what he told me. Mr. Speaker, have you spoken to any Democrats about a uh, motion I to vacate? Spoken to Democrats. Will you speak to Democrats? I, I talk to Democrats all the time. About I'm, motion to vacate? No, I'm fine with that. It's fine without them. That was the last little word of that. So Kevin McCarthy confident he'll have enough Republicans going his way if Gates moves to oust him. I can tell you right now, Kena, I've been calling around to some of the Republicans who often oppose Kevin McCarthy, and I'm getting a lot of maybes. Maybe we would move against him, but I'm not getting a lot of people saying right now they're firmly in Matt Gates's camp. Okay, so Matt Gates, though, obviously not saying maybe. He is definitely not backing down. So here he is speaking to ABC senior congressional correspondent Rachel Scott earlier on the Hill. If this does fail, will you bring this up again? Yeah, well, like I've said, it took Speaker McCarthy 15 votes to become the speaker. So until I get to 14 or 15, I don't think I'm being any more dilatory than he was. All right, so Jay McCarthy, we all remember, had this hard time even winning the speakership earlier this year. It took that 15 rounds of voting. Uh, he made some serious concessions to hardline members to even get this job. So how does that now impact the fight to remain there? Well, it's why we're here in the first place, Kena. One of the biggest concessions McCarthy made, possibly the biggest, was to lower the threshold of how many members can call for a motion to oust him from his job, called, remember, the motion to vacate. And he lowered that threshold down to one, which is why Matt Gates could potentially call the vote this week, as he's promised, in the first place. So the speaker battle is why we're here. And I can tell you, McCarthy's been asked repeatedly today, what does he think of that rule and that one member threshold? And is he worried that Gates, as he just said to Rachel, will just keep coming with motion after motion after motion if he loses the one that he's promised to bring this week? McCarthy says he believes that rule is counterproductive to the House and he believes that it's contrary to the House's best interest to keep trying to remove a speaker, but it's unclear how he would try try to get that rule off the books if he wanted to and if he survives this challenge from Gates. 
All right, let's turn to some other news here on the Hill. Jay, as many are mourning uh, the late Dianne Feinstein, California's Governor Gavin Newsom has now appointed activist and labor leader LaFonza Butler to fill the seat of the late trailblazing Senator Dianne Feinstein. So, uh, after her death, so can you tell us a little bit more about this new appointee that will be sworn in, right, Jay, as early as tomorrow? Well, she's the head. She will be sworn in tomorrow by the vice president. That, according to the vice president's calendar, she'll be sworn here at the United States Capitol. She's the head of Emily's List. She spent the last time in that role trying to elect women, particularly women who are advocates for abortion rights, to lawmaking positions and to Congress and other places. She was a priority of the governor's. This was a quick announcement after the passing of Senator Feinstein. Newsom had said he would appoint a black woman to this job. One more interesting point here, Kate is that there was thought that Newsom would appoint a caretaker to this role, someone who would essentially fill the seat while the primary, the Democratic primary ongoing in California that was already raging because Feinstein said she would not seek re-election played out, but he didn't necessarily put those qualifiers on this appointment so Butler could jump into the race just like the other candidates who have already jumped in. All right, interesting. Jay O'Brien, our thanks to you as always. And we have some more breaking news here tonight. Uh, North Dakota State Senator Doug Larson has been killed in a plane crash, along with his wife, Amy, and their two young sons. Their plane crashed on Sunday evening, shortly after takeoff, and they were in Utah, just north of the Moab area. That's according to the Grand County Sheriff's Department. His death was confirmed today in an email from the North Dakota Senate Majority Leader, and it was obtained by the Associated Press. Doug Larson was a Republican, first elected to the North Dakota Senate in 2020. North Dakota Governor Doug Burgum said that Senator Larson was a father, husband, coach, entrepreneur, businessman, state senator, and lieutenant colonel in the North Dakota National Guard, who committed himself fully to each of those roles with unwavering sense of honor and duty. And coming up next here, 28 million student loan borrowers back making payments after the pandemic pause on those student loans expired. Also, she is the queen bee, and now she's headed to the big screen when we come back. Whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. Thirty years. My brother's death was this mystery. Was he pushed? Did he kill himself? There's been some human remains found at the bottom of North Head, and the body was naked. Committing suicide naked is almost unheard of. What's going on here? You had some chilling evidence. Oh my goodness! No one knew it was coming. It's about finding justice for my brother. Sometimes you just have to stir the pot. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show.
and welcome back. The pandemic era three year pause on federal student loan payments is officially over with 28 million borrowers now making payments for their loans. The restart of payments comes after eight separate extensions of that pause that started now with former President Donald Trump's administration. So the end of this came after President Biden's attempt at broader debt cancellation was struck down by the Supreme Court in June. ABC's Elizabeth Schulze spoke to borrowers who now have to start making those payments again. Whoa. For Sarah Wood's family of four in Denver, the three-year pause on federal student loan payments was a rare financial reprieve. It was a huge, huge relief. Apples and peanut butter. With her $440 in monthly student yeah. debt payments on hold, Wood started putting aside savings for her twin daughter's education. My husband and I sat down and with us both on a payment pause, it's like, let's put whatever we can towards our daughter's 529s. Her hope? The interest is 7.65. That her daughters won't be burdened with student debt like hers, totaling more than $180,000. What is that number? mean to you? You know, it's this thing that I am probably the most ashamed of in my life. We have to think of and we have to budget for every day and we have to budget for, for the future consequences of this loan every single day. Now with payments due, Wood says she will forego saving for her daughter's future education fund to pay off her own. You need to live in a house, you need to pay groceries, you need to eat. And then from there on, you kind of have to figure out where to skimp and save. It's a harsh reality for 28 million borrowers like Wood. The government's years-long pandemic freeze on student loan payments ends today. The average federal student loan borrower owes more than $37,000 in debt. And for borrowers with a master's degree, it's nearly $92,000. Well, it's, it's not great. Economist know. Mark Zandi says the restart of these payments will add to the financial stress borrowers are already feeling with inflation. I think for most student loan borrowers, what it means is that they got to make some hard choices. I really want stability for us. 33-year-old Michael Lopez in Anaheim, California, is a first-generation college graduate who went on to get his master's in social work and now owes about $240,000 in student debt. He says the freeze on payments opened up an avenue to another major first in his family. And this is your house. Buying a home with his wife, a baby now on the way. Like, I don't know if we'll ever own a home. Um, and the fact that we were able to do that because of the pause was just like, I mean, mind blowing. Lopez followed every twist and turn of the pause, hoping it could lead to broader student debt reform. I've become more plugged into politics than I ever have in my life. As a presidential candidate, Joe Biden pledged he would cancel thousands of dollars in student debt, eventually following through a year and a half into his term. Using the authority Congress granted the Department of Education, we will forgive $10,000 in outstanding federal student loans. But 10 months later, the Supreme Court struck down the plan, leaving Lopez and millions of borrowers like him disappointed. Do you feel like President Biden let you down? In some ways, yes. Um, I also recognize nobody's perfect. He can't get it 100% right. Um, but that's also why, you know, he's president. Like, that responsibility is on his shoulders. Critics of loan forgiveness, especially with student debt, say so many Americans had to pay their own debt. Why should this generation be any different? Yes, there are folks who have worked for it and were able to pay. Um, mind you, some of those folks paid uh, a lot less than what we're paying these days. Um, but. You know, that, that's a privilege to be able to do that, right? After the Supreme Court's decision, with loans still scheduled to restart this fall, the president launched a narrower Plan B. He directed the Education Department to try to cancel debt through a different law, established a one-year grace period for borrowers who miss payments, and rolled out a new plan that could lower people's monthly payments. But Lopez and Wood say those backup plans aren't broad enough to affect them and their debt will still be looming large at the ballot box. Is student loan debt an issue that you will vote on in the 2024 election? Absolutely. It's essentially one of the major issues of our generation and of our time. And our thanks to Elizabeth Schulze for that report. And coming up next here, well, she's putting B in the box office. The hive is buzzing over Beyonce's big announcement. Stay with us. This is ABC News Live.
is the crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Give it to me. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from the Capitol, I'm Rachel Scott. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. All right, attention, Beehive. Beyonce's dazzling Renaissance World Tour may have come to an end, but the mega pop star revealed a huge announcement last night for fans. She is taking the experience to the big screen. When I am performing, I am nothing but free. Is it recording? <laughs> The goal for this tour was to create a place where everyone is free and no one is judged. Actually, I have chills watching that. Uh, we're looking at the trailer to Renaissance, a film by Beyonce. It dropped overnight following the close of her tour in Kansas. And if you're feeling dangerously in love and want to relive the Renaissance experience, or if you didn't have a chance to see the concert, now is your chance to get cozy, purchase the tickets. The film will debut in theaters across the country on December 1st, 2023, and tickets are available now for purchase. I think that's why my producer Alyssa is not paying attention to me. She's trying to buy tickets, yeah? <laughs> we have a lot more ahead here on ABC News Live. And today's big story, Kevin McCarthy is under serious pressure from far-right House members. Could he lose his job as Speaker after he turned to Democrats for help funding the government? I'll speak with Republican Congressman from Texas, Pete Sessions, about the growing push to oust McCarthy. And in our spotlight, student loan repayments resuming after an unprecedented three-year pause, how it will impact tens of millions of American borrowers who are now on the hook again. I think vulnerability is extremely powerful. This is an artist that I looked up to at one point. I never would have imagined that the ending would have been what it was. They do not shock me. The treatment was just so disgusting on everyone's part. Did Lizzo ever put her hands on you? No, she didn't get to that point. She attempted to come at me with her fist balled up. Lizzo is denying it all. Lizzo's legal limbo. You never, like, expect for it to turn into that. Now streaming on Hulu. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. 
first thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today? YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> How cute. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. You're watching America's number one streaming news, ABC News Live. Breaking news, exclusives, live reporting across the globe. Keep streaming with ABC News Live. Kevin McCarthy's job in jeopardy as far-right House members turn up the heat on the speaker. I'm Kana Whitworth here in Los Angeles. In today's big story, McCarthy under pressure from Matt Gates and other Republicans waging a push to remove him. Can the GOP leader weather the storm and will he turn to Democrats to help him again? I'll speak with Republican Congressman from Texas Pete Sessions about McCarthy's future and the next spending showdown looming on the Hill. And in our spotlight, tens of millions of Americans on the hook again as student loan repayments resume. The impact on struggling borrowers caught in America's college debt crisis. But of course, we begin with our big story here. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy under pressure as far-right Republicans wage a push to oust him. So joining us now here is GOP Congressman from Texas, Pete Sessions. Thank you so much for being with us, Congressman. And let me first ask you, what is your reaction here to this possible motion to remove McCarthy from his post altogether? This is not a new issue for Kevin. Kevin has been faced with this uh, for quite some time. This is part of what comes with uh, the failures of last November's elections. Uh, Mr. McCarthy uh, said we win by 60, then he said we would win by 20. We ended up winning by five, and that was the beginning of many people questioning uh, the resiliency of not just our majority, but of his ability to lead. And then since then, it has been, while I've seen great flashes of, of good policy, from not only Kevin, but but the management team, the leadership team here, he has continued to be a part of the problem as we have had them getting votes and, and our agenda done. Part of the problem. Well, Congressman, you voted, though, uh, for McCarthy's temporary spending measure over the weekend. And we've seen, though, in the meantime, of as you mentioned, all this you know kind of Republican infighting. Your GOP colleague, Mike Lawler of New York, on ABC's This Week just yesterday, went so far as to call Matt Gates' moves against McCarthy delusional thinking. So why can't Republicans unite, work with Democrats if that's needed, and find a long-term spending solution that can pass both chambers? Well, that, that's a, an entirely different issue. If you want to talk about that, we, what we would need to go to is the issue of the, the fight that they have with 
Kevin McCarthy. The fight that they have with Kevin McCarthy essentially goes back to the debt limit when Mr. McCarthy did this almost exact same thing where he negotiated instead of for spending, he negotiated for time frames that would be for jamming as much spending uh, to debt as was chosen by January of a full year from now in 25. And that's where people, a lot of them fell off the wagon. Look, I'm not for chaos. I'm for the success of our organization. But they have continued not to negotiate with the, the people that are not in his favor and that oppose him. And I, I think that we're seeing the frailties of that now. Frailties. And let's talk about Donald Trump here. You know, he was in court in New York today for the start of his civil fraud trial. The judge is already ruling that he lied to banks, insurers, and others for years about his net worth and his assets. So what does it mean for the future of your party when your primary frontrunner, leading by double digits in the polls, but his future is tied up in courts? Well, I think it is. I think it is tied up in court. And while I know few of the real facts of the case, uh, everyone can see this for what it is and has been able to see this uh, ever since the day he was elected. And the, the bottom line to this is, is that if he defaulted on things and did not pay loans, I think that is a problem. I have no clue what the facts of the case are, but their values go up and down wildly in commercial uh, pro on commercial properties and in particular in New York City. So it is it is going to be experts against experts and knowledge against knowledge. But I think it all gets down to if he did not pay some loans where he uh, either over or understood, uh, misunderstated uh, those n numbers, I think he is in trouble. And now you sit on the House committee leading the impeachment inquiry against President Biden, looking into his family business dealings, specifically those of his son, Hunter. Uh, the president there, of course, denies any wrongdoings, but these allegations have essentially been swirling around for years. Uh, and even uh, last, last week, the panel's own witnesses is questioning the amount of evidence that this committee actually has. So what do you say to Republicans who want an impeachment here and Americans as a whole who are concerned that this could end up being yet another distraction from the people's business? Well, it, it is a, a, a perhaps a valid question, but I think that if you looked at both sides of the equation, it is very clear that this is an inquiry to determine what the facts are. It is not an inquiry to go to a conclusion. And with that said, we know that for uh, literally two years, we were told by 60 intelligence uh, experts and admirals and generals that the Hunter Biden laptop was not true. It was a false uh, story. And in fact, the FBI had it the entire time and knew what it was. The Department of Justice has aided and abetted Hunter Biden by not moving towards the president and his behavior like they would have anyone else. And when you fail, to follow the same examples that you would in, in periods of law enforcement where you gather your data and evidence and you're stopped by the Department of Justice, which they were by the IRS, then it does lead questions. And that's why it's an inquiry, an inquiry as to the facts of the case. So we would expect now for the FBI to do the same thing that they do in all other matters especially where there's an investigation like this, where the FBI will show up and they too will do an investigation and give that information to the United States House of Representatives. Right, Republican Representative Pete Sessions from Texas, thank you so much for spending some time with us. We truly appreciate yes, it. Of course. And now I want to bring our big story to our panel. So joining us today is ABC News contributor Mike Muse, ABC News political contributor and former Republican congressman from Virginia, Barbara Comstock, president of Next Gen America, Christina Sinsoon Ramirez, and ABC News contributing political correspondent and co-author of the Politico playbook, Rachel Bade. Thank you all so much for being here. So Congress, as you know, has temporarily averted this government shutdown until November 17th, but the GOP is still divided over for the budget. Barbara, to you first, you know, what do you make of Sessions' stance there on all of this? He said that he actually saw great flashes of good policy, but do you think that all of this hap that's happening with Matt Gates and these threats, I mean, is that being taken seriously on Capitol Hill? 
No, I, I think really uh, Matt Gates. I think it's been notable today that he's really standing alone. You're not seeing any members uh, joining up with him. He did not file his motion today. Yesterday, when Donald Trump was asking about it, he notably said, well, Kevin McCarthy has said nice things about me this morning. And when you look at, say, Fox News and even the most right-wing talk radio, um, like Mark Levin, they are standing with Kevin McCarthy. And uh, you're just not seeing the kind of support for Matt Gates. And the one thing that unites everybody in Washington is loathing for Matt Gates. So if you wanted to have a political enemy in Washington, uh, Matt Gates is pretty much uh, somebody that you know is pretty great to have because it unites everybody. And I really don't think Kevin McCarthy is going to have to worry about this. Matt Gates looks very weak and weaker by the day, and I don't think this motion to vacate is going to go anywhere. All right, the one thing. So, Rachel, to you, we have this extension. We know it's not going to last forever, just till mid-November here. Uh, what are your sources telling you about a possible deal? Uh, a possible deal to save McCarthy's speakership with Democrats? Yeah. OK, well, it seems unlikely at this point. I mean, Matt Gates might be a, kind of on an island right now, but keep in mind that he only yeah. needs five friends right now if all Democrats vote against Kevin McCarthy. That means Kevin McCarthy is toast. So the big question is, does he have those five? It appears that he might right now. Can Kevin McCarthy win them back? And if Kevin McCarthy can't, he's going to have to turn to Democrats for help. This is where things are going to get complicated for the speaker. Democrats, I talked to a whole bunch of them yesterday after Gates made this announcement, and every single one of them had nothing but negative things to say about Kevin McCarthy. They say he's a liar, that he reneged on a White House deal on spending caps. Uh, they don't like that he began, began an impeachment inquiry uh, of Joe Biden. And frankly, they just say that they can't trust him. But they are writing a bunch of wish lists, things that they could extract from McCarthy, a power sharing agreement, an end to the Biden impeachment if he turns to them for help. And these are things that if McCarthy gives them, uh, he's going to lose additional Republican support mm -hmm. and more people will join Matt Gates. Interesting. All right. And Mike, you know, to you, meanwhile, of course, we have this fraud trial is underway in New York City against former President Donald Trump. Uh, he continues to call it a witch hunt as he seeks another term in the White House. It seems, though, I mean, it's like he remains invincible in these polls. And he almost used the cameras today as some sort of campaign stop, it looked like. You know, that's what I was thinking, too, as well. It felt very much like, a, like a, almost like a stump speech. You know, former President Trump has not appeared to any of his other cases uh, the way that he did in such grand style. Uh, he didn't miss an opportunity not to talk in front of the cameras and really frame this as a political stunt. And what's interesting, I was listening to your interviews you had with Representative Sessions, yes. he also, too, isn't serving the American public well at all. He's also, too, feeding into this narrative that it's a political issue at hand versus a legal issue. So the more the Republican Party takes a position that this is more political, it reinforces what some people in the American public sees as a political stunt and not a legal stunt by not framing it in the legal ramification that it is. And unfortunately, Kena, I just think that no matter how many indictments goes before former President Trump, the American public, in particular those who vote Republican, only emboldens and gets them more excited to support him um, mm -hmm. in moving forward. It's a really fascinating case study to observe and what's happening in real time. Right. There's a lot of Americans out there that really do feel like they're witnessing the weaponization of the justice system in this. And Christina, to you, you know, what do you make of the current snapshot of American politics here? I know that's an overarching question, but, you know, we have Trump's legal woes, his impeachment inquiry into President Biden, a looming government shutdown. Uh, how do you think this is going to play out for voters? Well, I think voters are watching what happens when Republicans are in charge. It's a circus. It's chaos. And ultimately, while people are discussing Kevin McCarthy's leadership role, I think I and most Americans don't actually care about his leadership role. What we care about is his impact of his lack of leadership on the American people that you know, his leadership is in question because he's allowed a far extreme right Republican party to control what's happening. And what we have to remember is, yes, we have 45 days right now, and that's a, a great reprieve. But ultimately, the vast majority of the Republican Party supported a draconian spending bill that would have left a million children without food assistance, tens of thousands of veterans, 
would have lost their homes. 60,000 seniors would have lost Meals on Wheels, and there would have been a 70 percent cut to heating assistance right before we enter winter. So I think that's what's on the minds of most American people are the consequences of failed leadership like this when there's so much infighting within their own party. I, certainly, I think there's a lot of American people, though, too, that would also be concerned if we pass bills through without border security and things like that as well. So uh, we'll, of course, keep our eyes on the Hill. Mike, Barbara, Christina, and Rachel, thank you so much to all of you. And coming up next here, uh, the bill is due for 28 million Americans with student loans, and the college debt crisis seems to be worsening here. We will talk about that when we come back. Whenever news breaks, the crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. Thirty years, my brother's death was this mystery. Was he pushed? Did he kill himself? There's been some human remains found at the bottom of North Head, and the body was naked. Committing suicide naked is almost unheard of. What's going on here? You had some chilling evidence. Oh my goodness! No one knew it was coming. It's about finding justice for my brother. Sometimes you just have to stir the pot. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. I believe the court's decision to strike down my student debt relief program as a mistake was wrong. What I did I thought was appropriate and was able to be done and would get done. I didn't give bars false hope, but the Republicans snatched away the hope. Well, that is President Biden back in June after the Supreme Court struck down his plan to wipe out more than $400 million in federal student loans. It was a blow to the president and to millions of borrowers with hopes that their loans would be forgiven. And now federal student loan payments have officially resumed after this three-year pause that began during the pandemic. And according to the Department of Education, more than 28 million Americans now with bills due starting October 1st. So I want to bring back our panel here, Mike Muse. Barbara Comstock, Christina Sinsun Ramirez, and joining us is ABC's Elizabeth Schulze. So thank you all so much for being here. And, and Mike, let's start with you here. What does the end of this pause mean as you look broadly, you know, across all Americans? Yeah, what this pause means is just more complication for President Biden. Um, I believe that the way that we've been framing this conversation is Biden or bust. I don't think that's necessarily fair to frame it in that. We're in a situation where we have told all the Americans that to achieve this American dream, that you must go to college in order to do that. Uh, but at the same time, we see interest rates raising, we see inflation, uh, we see jobs uh, becoming minimized, we see job loss um, with unemployment, and then the interest 
from technology, which is rechanging the workforce altogether. So when these students come out with such high debt at a time when college is at an all-time high when it comes to tuition, what are they actually achieving at the end goal besides being mm -hmm. saddled with debt? And so it makes it difficult for them to achieve that American dream of home ownership or creating generational wealth. I think it's really up to this, uh, the nation to have an all hands on deck. And I would love to see President Biden convene um, at the White House state government to really figure out how they can work with public institutions, which is funded federally and by the state, to figure out how to lower college tuition costs, how to get private mm -hmm. institutions to focus more on alumni donations and endowment, all in the effort all hands on deck to lower the cost of tuition so that Americans are not saddled with debt as we all try and achieve this American dream. Achieve the American dream. And Elizabeth, you know, I mean, we're talking about people that graduate with all this debt and then they can't earn a living wage and the house prices are sky high. Uh, you have done great reporting on this and you spoke with a woman about her student loan balance. So let's take a listen together. What does that number mean to you? You know, it's the thing that I am probably the most ashamed of in my life. We have to think of and we have to budget for every day and we have to budget for, for the future consequences of this loan every single day. You need to live in a house, you need to pay groceries, you need to eat, and then from there on you kind of have to figure out where to skimp and save. I was so struck by what she said to you, Elizabeth. Tell us more about these stories that you found there in your reporting. Well, and Kena, it was striking talking to borrowers who say when they took out those loans, maybe they were 18 at the time, they didn't mm -hmm. realize how quickly interest would add up. That was one of the biggest changes that was in place from this pause on payments over the past three years. Not only did you not have to make payments, there was no interest accruing. So when you looked at your balance this month, for the first time since March 2020, it was about the same. And for a lot of borrowers, just that psychological toll, like Sarah Wood, like that woman I spoke to that you just heard from, the psychological toll of that number, she has $180,000 in debt. She actually took out $118,000 in loans, but it got up that high mm -hmm. because of the interest rates. And that's something that we heard from so many borrowers. I talked to another man named Michael Lopez. He's in Anaheim, California. He has $240,000 in student debt. And most of that is from a master's degree, and that was another theme from our reporting was that those master's degrees especially can get a lot of uh, borrowers in the hole, but he wanted to pursue a career in public service. He said that's what he had to do, and he doesn't have any regrets, he said. No regrets. Wow. And Barbara, to you, you know, the Supreme Court ruling, it was a pretty big setback for some of these borrowers struggling with their debt, but are there other measures out there that can help them? Yeah, I think, you know, dealing, you know, if Congress could do something on dealing with those interest rates, I think Asa Hutchison has actually, actually suggested maybe doing something on the interest rates. I'm certainly concerned that I think two-thirds of the debt is women have two-thirds of that debt, and disproportionately minority women have it. So addressing that issue, I mean, I know I stopped paying my college and law school debts about the time that I was paying my children's uh, college uh, debts, and mm -hmm. so public service does pick up some of those debts and finding ways that um, we can, you know, make sure kids know about how, where you can um, get additional ways to help that and maybe government can help, uh, you know, help, help out kids in that way too. And potentially, and Christina, to you, you know, you see this crisis really with the younger generation, the generation coming up and coming into the workforce next. Do they view it as a call to action for change here when it comes to higher education? Yeah, you know, you had millions of young people turn out last election um, and, and presidential election and vote specifically on this issue. And Biden and Harris did take action, but it's not ultimately enough. I think, you know, Mike brought up a really good point that we have to decide as a country if we're going to invest in our greatest asset, which is the American people. And I want to say, you know, what we have to do is that uh, what a high school diploma was is what a college degree is today. We need to make sure we're working towards making sure a college is affordable for every single American or this crisis is just going to continue and grow. Wow. All right, Mike, Barbara, Christina, Elizabeth, thank you all. We appreciate it. And coming up here in our last call, the Supreme Court justice who left behind a long legacy will show you how the notorious RGB is being honored in our last call. This is ABC News Live.
to crush the families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. Give it to me. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from the scene of a massive earthquake along the Turkey-Syria border, I'm James Longman. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. We're streaming ABC News Live. It's time for our last call, and in honor of the late Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the Postal Service is releasing a new forever stamp today. So I want to bring back our panel to discuss Mike, Barbara, Christina, and Elizabeth. And Mike, I'm going to start with you here. Um, we asked you how you felt in email, and you just wrote, I support the stamp. This, that's the whole email. Do you care to elaborate? <laughs> <laughs> Kata, you put me on front street. <laughs> it's almost like enough said, right? Like some stamps just don't need an explanation. It just <laughs> is, right? And I think we don't know too many, uh, you know, Supreme Court justices of the past, but she had the ability to rise through that and to yes. become a pop cultural phenomenon. And I think at a time when Supreme Court matters so much, given the state of our democracy right now, I think it does twofold. It honors her honors her legacy, but it also brings awareness to the American public about the importance yeah. of the Supreme Court and how we all must pay attention uh, to the majority opinions and also to the dissenting opinions because it's such, such yeah. precedent moving forward. Absolutely. Rachel, I mean, this has only happened 14 times before. What's your take? Yeah, I mean, clearly it's very significant. I mean, I will tell you, my husband, who's probably watching right now, he collects stamps, and I'm sure he's going to want one of these. But I do think the timing of this coming out is actually interesting uh, because it, it comes as the, the Supreme Court is starting its new term. This is a Supreme Court that is dominated by conservatives and just overruled uh, Roe v. Wade recently. And part of the reason conservatives now have power is in part because Ruth Bader Ginsburg for, would not step aside and retire when Democrats wanted her to appoint her seat or fill her seat with a Democrat. And so it was instead, I'm sorry, with a, with a progressive slash liberal judge and said it was filled with a conservative. So interesting timing. All right. And Barbara, what's your take? Well, I think it's wonderful. And in that same spirit, I'd like to give a plug for George Mason University uh, is starting at the Scalia Law School, a Scalia Ginsburg dialogue because of their great friendship. Oh, wow. uh, so I'd also like to see a Scalia stamp, stamp too. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. We're hearing that from a lot of people. And Christina, how about you? Well, you know, I get to work with millions of young people, and I see a lot of young people really cynical about the courts right now because of overturning of Roe. And so to me, 
this stamp is a symbol of what our court can be, of what we have when we have Supreme Court justices that are really trying to uphold the Constitution for every single American. And so for me, I'm going to be putting that stamp on every single letter I mail out and let it be a symbol of how we're not going to give up on the courts. We're going to take back the courts and make sure they're not just ruling in a minority ideological, ideological opinion that doesn't serve the vast interest of the American people. All right, so we will know right away if our mail came from Christina with that stamp. Thank you so much. That is it for our last call in this half hour. Mike, Barbara, Christina, and Rachel, thank you. I support the stamp, he says. That's it. All right, thank you so much for streaming with us. I'm Kana Whitworth. Follow ABC News Live on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, and more. And coming up at 7 p.m. Eastern, be sure to catch ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis for the day's biggest stories and the impact they have on you. The news never stops, neither do we. Keep it right here on ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. Busy day. I'm Kana Whitworth here in Los Angeles right now on ABC News Live. Donald Trump defiant as the future of his business empire hangs in the balance. The former president appearing in court today in his New York civil fraud trial. His harsh words for the judge who has already ruled the former president lied about the value of his assets and his net worth for years. And Kevin McCarthy under pressure from House Republicans after he aligned with Democrats to keep funding the government. What far right members are now saying about a plan to remove him as speaker. And billions of dollars in pandemic era funding for child care centers now expired. The challenges for families across our nation and the warnings of a so-called child care cliff. Let's start with our top story this hour, though. Former President Donald Trump arriving back home 
at Trump Tower. This is after leaving a New York City courthouse in that civil fraud trial that began today. Trump, his sons Eric and Donald Jr., along with some Trump Organization executives accused of acts of fraud and misrepresentation over decades to inflate Trump's net worth while lowering his tax burden. Trump has denied all wrongdoing, calling the case an effort to keep him out of the White House. Take a listen. It has been very successful for them because they took me off the campaign trail because I've been sitting in a courthouse all day long instead of being in Iowa, New Hampshire, South Carolina, or a lot of other places I could be at. This is a horrible situation for our country. It's never happened before. It's election interference. They're interfering with the presidential election of 2024, and the people of our country see it. I want to bring our ABC News senior investigative reporter there, Aaron Katursky, from outside the courthouse in New York, an attorney and former chief minority counsel for the U.S. Senate Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations, Jeff Robbins. Thank you both so much for being here. And Aaron, you know, starting with you here, one of Trump's attorneys claims this investigation, even the lawsuit, were a bit more personal in nature. Why so personal? The former president's attorneys have been arguing for a long time, Kana, that this investigation and the trial that's now resulting were preordained because Attorney General Letitia James ran for office here in New York on a promise to get Trump. And so they say that this is the fulfillment of that promise, that Trump had no real chance here, that she was going to investigate and move forward with this case no matter what. The judge has ruled that whatever James said on the campaign trail when she was first running for attorney general has no bearing on the case, and he was upheld by the appellate division in New York. So Trump's attorneys continue to press that message publicly and politically, but legally, uh, the judge has already ruled that it has no bearing. No bearing. So, Jeff, to you, you know, the judge already found Trump liable. So what can his legal strategy really be? I mean, they can't just go around and espouse things, right? They need an actual strategy here. Well, that is a good question. I mean, they are, uh, they have very few cards. They have made every procedural argument known to man, some of them more than once. They've been rejected. Uh, the judge has found that the submissions were all false uh, and fraudulent. So that issue is out of the case. So they're left trying to uh, you know, make a couple of Hail Mary passes. One, that they didn't have the specific intent to, to defraud. The judge looks like he's not likely to buy that. And the second is that they didn't uh, benefit uh, by, by filing these false submissions, which is also an uphill battle. So you ask a very, very good question. Uh, there doesn't seem to be a whole heck of a lot of room for them. And they're just sort of hunkering down, making the best political case for him that they can make. Well, and Jeff, we heard the former president today say, you know, I should be in New Hampshire, I should be in Iowa. He's still, of course, running for president. But as John Santucci rightfully pointed out, he did not have to be there today, yet he was. What does all of this mean in the grand scheme of things as Trump moves forward and tries to become president yet again? Well, as John suggested, uh, the reason that he wasn't out on the campaign trail but was where he was was because he knew that's where the cameras were going to be. And so it is an opportunity to once again play the aggrieved victim. Uh, it's another disgrace. Every one of these cases, the criminal cases, the civil cases, the rape cases, they're all disgraces. But that uh, that cry of it's a disgrace seems to be working for him in the Republican primary and at least with about half of the American electorate. So he was where the cameras were. He was, and he has a double-digit lead over any other contender, and he hasn't even attended a debate. Aaron Katursky and Jeff Robbins, our thanks to both of you. And now to a new and growing battle on the Hill. Kevin McCarthy facing a threat to his speakership as far-right members from his own party in the House wage a push to remove him. Those Republican members voicing outrage over McCarthy working with Democrats to pass a last-minute spending bill to temporarily avoid a government shutdown. GOP member Matt Gates has been leading the charge, accusing the House Speaker of making a secret deal with the White House to keep funding Ukraine's war effort. So on the House floor today, the Florida representative even suggested a vote to oust McCarthy is coming. So for all the crocodile tears about what may happen later this week about a motion to vacate, working with the Democrats is a yellow brick road that has been paved by Speaker McCarthy, whether it was the debt limit deal, the CR, or now the secret deal on Ukraine. 
Harsh words. Joining us now is ABC News' Jay O'Brien, who's live on Capitol Hill uh, with the latest for us. So, Jay, I know you had a chance to catch up with Speaker McCarthy today. What's the latest? Well, first things first, Speaker McCarthy says there is no secret deal with the president over Ukraine. Now, remember, the rules that Speaker McCarthy agreed to to become the Speaker of the House mean that only one House Republican can call for a vote for his ouster, and that's what Gates is threatening to do. But Gates has still got to win that vote, which means he's got to convince House Republicans to get onto his side here. Meantime, Kevin McCarthy has got to convince House Republicans to back him here. The question facing McCarthy also is, will he turn to Democrats if enough House Republicans go Gates's way. I asked the speaker about that earlier today. Here was his response. Have you spoken to any Democrats about uh, motion I have to vacate? Spoken to Democrats. Will you speak to Democrats? I, I talk to Democrats all the time. About motion to vacate? No, I'm fine with that. The speaker there saying that he's fine without them. Those were his words. Now, I've also asked some Republicans whether or not they would go Gates's way. These are the usual suspects who are often a thorn in McCarthy's side, these members. And I'm getting a lot of maybes back, Kena, but I've yet to have some members say that they're firmly in Gates's corner. Gates, meantime, promises to bring that motion to boot McCarthy from his job this week. All right. Even our panelists saying it seems like Gates is standing alone right now. Jay O'Brien, our thanks to you as always. And now the U.S. government has narrowly avoided the shutdown over the weekend, of course, but a different kind of funding is now at stake. This is important. Funding for child care expired on Saturday, which provided nearly $24 billion as part of a rescue package to combat the pandemic in 2021. Now, this drop-off in funding is expected to affect more than 3 million children nationwide, with more than 70,000 child care programs likely to close. So joining me now with more on this is Julie Cashin, the Director for Women's Economic Justice at the Century Foundation. Julie, thank you so much for being here with us. And you know, the members from the foundation, a rough estimate here, that's what we're talking about, but could you explain to us what the end of this funding really means and are we already seeing the ramifications of it? Thanks, Kena. Yes, exactly. We are already seeing some of the ramifications of this, where in Wisconsin, we've seen 42 child care providers shut down already. And in many places, what we're seeing is rising prices. Where that's what we're expecting, because in order to make the you know math work, in order to keep open, providers need to make up that money that was coming from the federal government. In order to do that, they're charging parents more. So parents are already starting to feel that. There's not a lot of room there. Child care already costs the same as rent or public college tuition in many places. And so now it's breaking budget. Budgets, and that's if you can find it. Even before the pandemic, it was hard to find. So now it's going to be even harder to find. You know, I'm a parent myself, and I know firsthand what these costs are like. And politicians here on both sides of the aisle agree on child care provisions, yet yeah. they disagree on how to pay for it. Where is the middle ground? Well, what I am hopeful, you know, they were able to come together to keep the government open. Now they need to do the same thing, come together for child care. What's really needed is significant funding. Members of Congress have called for $16 billion in emergency child care funding. I believe that they can come together in an end of year package and make sure that, you know, people don't feel the awful consequences of this cliff. We estimated that about 3.2 million children could lose their child care. That impacts their parents. Parents. Their parents are going to have to make tough choices, look, cut their work hours, leave their jobs. That's going to hurt the whole economy. And so I think this is a really pressing issue, and I'm hopeful that Congress will act. I know that you're hopeful, but you've actually spoken with some lawmakers about this so-called child care cliff. Are any of those conversations fruitful? One of the best things is that we've got folks like Senator Murray, you know, who ran as a mom in tennis shoes, who is a grandmother herself. She's the chair of the Appropriations Committee. You've got her on board. You've got Rosa DeLauro, Congresswoman from Connecticut, who is the Democratic ranking member there. And so we have important leaders who are moms themselves, grandmothers themselves, who get this issue firsthand and who are fighting with everything they've got to make this a reality. Is there something that lawmakers can do realistically and can they do it quickly enough for parents to feel that? Look, right now, the cost of this is going to be felt by parents, is going to be felt by the children who are going to miss out on 
these important opportunities. It'll be felt by businesses who rely on parents in their workforce. It's going to be felt by a lot of folks, but what we really need to do is partner with the public sector, put the dollars in that are necessary so that we can support childcare in every community. Ultimately, what's really needed is we need to get through this emergency moment, and then we need to build the childcare and early learning system that we've long needed. The House of Representatives passed such legislation in 2021, but the Senate it left it on the cutting room floor. I still think that that's the pathway forward. And is this really on lawmakers' radar? I mean, it's it's been chaos there in Washington. So is this on the radar right now? I think that child care providers and parents are reaching out to their members of Congress to let them know that they are concerned about this. We know that there are some employers who are reaching out about it because they hear about it from their employees. So I think the voices are getting louder and louder. I know in the next few weeks, moms and providers will be on Capitol Hill talking to providers, talking to sorry members of Congress directly about it. So hopefully they'll be hearing those stories. They'll understand how it will impact their communities and they'll act. All right, Julie Cashin, thank you so much for your insight, and we'll be watching that story as it unfolds. We appreciate your time. And coming up next here, a Ukrainian gymnast loses her leg in a missile attack, but that does not keep her down. The seven-year-old's inspiring story when we come back. Whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. Thirty years. My brother's death was this mystery. Was he pushed? Did he kill himself? There's been some human remains found at the bottom of North Head, and the body was naked. Committing suicide naked is almost unheard of. What's going on here? You had some chilling evidence. Oh my goodness! No one knew it was coming. It's about finding justice for my brother. Sometimes you just have to stir the pot. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. In our Prime preview tonight, a new series launching that revisits major news stories and how they've impacted people. In the first installment, we meet a family who was impacted by the Zika virus back in 2016. It's a mosquito-borne infection that gravely impacts pregnant women and their unborn children. Seven years ago, Dara was born with the Zika virus and as a result, suffers from microcephaly, a condition when the brain and the skull can't grow properly. Our team in beds with Dara's family and tells the story of how a virus that gripped the nation and Latin America seven years ago still affects this family today. Ya se declaró la emergencia también en Honduras, pero ahora, además de la declaración de emergencia, necesitamos actuar. Ese fue el día que que me dio el Zika. Tenía exactamente ocho semanas de embarazo. Ahí fue donde ese virus me afectó a, a dar. Porque nos cambia la vida de 180 grados y donde tenemos que, que comenzar a ver la vida de diferente manera. 
iba a traer a mi hijo a la escuela y me sentaba en el carro y comenzaba a llorar porque no entendía cómo había, me había pasado eso y cómo mi hija se había afectado. Entonces me dijo, creo que él, eh, tenemos que dejar nuestra comodidad por la comodidad de ella. And our thanks to our team that embedded with the family to give us that powerful story. And be sure to catch it tonight on ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis, coming up at 7 p.m. Eastern right here on ABC News Live and streaming on Hulu. Also tonight, Sasha Pascal lost her leg in a missile attack in the ongoing war in Ukraine. But the seven-year-old rhythmic gymnast is continuing to fight and has big dreams for her future. ABC's Britt Clinton has her inspiring story. At this gym in Chornomorsk, southern Ukraine, victories are etched in time. It's a place where gold medals are born, where dedication, hard work and sacrifice is expected. This is seven-year-old Sasha Paska, one of Ukraine's hopeful young rhythmic gymnasts. She trains every single day. But Russia's brutal war in Ukraine has left Sasha impaired. You know, her coordination is really impressive and she's treated exactly the same as all the other girls. Are you tired now? No. You're not tired. Do you ever feel like your prosthetic leg makes you more tired sometimes? Because you're a superstar. Superstar. What's your dream, Sasha? What do you want to do? I want to be a champion, then a trainer. So. It's a big dream. Yes. You can do it. Sasha's determination unwavering, despite being one of countless children harmed in this war. This is the moment the missile strikes their seaside home. Sasha and her mother Maria take me there. This is the house. Sasha was on the third floor at the time. You can see why. They're so happy that she came down just in time. You're just here? Yeah. What the thought? As a mom, you must have been horrified and, and terrified that the, of the worst. Бог говорила спасибо, что она стала жива, потому что при таком ударе остаться живы это просто вот как в рубашке родились. What's it like being here again? Аж страшно сюда приходить, О, очень страшно, потому что сразу мысли вот как мы ее доставали, как мы ее везли в больницу, вот эта нога, рука, очень, очень тяжело, очень. Sasha in intensive care for two weeks. 
Half a year later, she was back in gym training. Then she entered her first post-trauma competition and won it. Weeks later, she won again. Sasha swims. And ballroom dances. This strong little girl even capturing the attention of Vogue. And winning hearts at the highest levels, like Ukrainian First Lady Elena Zelenska. I know. I know you've met yeah. her before and she's amazing. She's incredible. I just want you to show you a video of, of when we saw her. This is Sasha. Yeah. <laughs> we just couldn't believe she, it. You know, she's back, back flipping and, and jumping around like any of the other girls. They look the same. You know, I, I guess my question is, kids are very resilient. Yeah. The, we don't know the impacts that the war is going to have later on. Ну, на жаль, таких дітей уже багато. Саші пощастило. У неї є люблюча родина. В неї є оточення, яке її підтримує. В неї є можливості розвиватися, жити далі. Саша still has medical hurdles to clear. She's constantly outgrowing her prosthetic leg. But back on the beach, yards away from where she nearly lost her life, Sasha looks ahead. That was just incredibly inspiring. And our thanks to Britt for that report. Coming up next here tonight, the late night talk shows, well, they're back. What Jimmy Kimmel has teed up for his return to late night. That's right after the break. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Give it to me. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're gonna take you there. You're streaming ABC News live. I mean, it's been 150 days since we did a show, and I'm happy we're back at the show. But you don't care. You don't even like the show, I guess. No, that's where I think that you're wrong. If anything, I was like, I don't like, and I told Chloe, I don't like your look. I don't like this. I don't like... You don't like my look? What's wrong with my look? It's not that original. Everyone does 90s. <gasps> 
Jimmy Kimmel uh, posting that video with Kim Kardashian on social media over the weekend. He stole my look, by the way. Uh, he's back on the air on ABC tonight after nearly five months off due to the writer's strike. It's the long-awaited return of our favorite late-night TV shows, Jimmy Kimmel Live, airing its first episode tonight. His guest lineup includes Arnold Schwarzenegger, Kathy Griffin, Wanda Sykes, and Dax Shepard. And we have missed you, Jimmy, indeed. Uh, Jimmy Kimmel Live, by the way, airs at 11.35 p.m. Eastern on ABC. And there's a lot more news ahead here on ABC News Live Prime. In today's big story, Kevin McCarthy under pressure from far-right House members. Could he lose his job as Speaker after he turned to Democrats for help funding the government? I'll speak with Republican Congressman from Texas, Pete Sessions, about the growing push to oust McCarthy. And in our spotlight, student loan repayments resuming after an unprecedented three-year pause. How it will impact tens of millions of American borrowers on the hook once again. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. 30 years. My brother's death was this mystery. Was he pushed? Did he kill himself? Despite some human remains found at the bottom of North Head, and the body was naked. Committing suicide naked is almost unheard of. What's going on here? You had some chilling evidence. Oh my goodness. No one knew it was coming. It's about finding justice for my brother. Sometimes you just have to stir the pot. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Hi, <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. McCarthy's job in jeopardy as far-right House members turn up the heat on the speaker. I'm Kana Whitworth here in Los Angeles. In today's big story, McCarthy under pressure from Matt Gates and other Republicans waging a push to remove him. Can the GOP leader weather the storm and will he turn to Democrats to help him again? I'll speak with Republican Congressman from Texas Pete Sessions about McCarthy's future and the next spending showdown looming on the Hill. And in our spotlight, tens of millions of Americans on the hook again as student loan repayments resume. The impact on struggling borrowers caught in America's college debt crisis. But of course, we begin with our big story here. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy under pressure as far-right Republicans wage a push to oust him. So joining us now here is GOP Congressman from Texas, Pete Sessions. Thank you so much for being with us, Congressman. And let me first ask you, what is your reaction here to this possible motion to remove McCarthy from his post altogether? This is not a new issue for Kevin. Kevin has been faced with this uh, for quite some time. This is part of what comes with uh, the failures of last November's elections. Uh, Mr. McCarthy uh, said we win by 60, then he said we would win by 20. We ended up winning by five, and that was the beginning of many people questioning uh, the resiliency of not just our majority, but of his ability to lead. And then since then, it has been, while I've seen great flashes of, of good policy, 
from not only Kevin but but the management team the leadership team here he has continued to be a part of the problem as we have had them getting votes and, and our agenda done part of the problem. Well, Congressman, you voted, though, uh, for McCarthy's temporary spending measure over the weekend. And we've seen, though, in the meantime of, as you mentioned, all this, you know, kind of Republican infighting. Your GOP colleague, Mike Lawler of New York, on ABC's This Week just yesterday, went so far as to call Matt Gates' moves against McCarthy delusional thinking. So why can't Republicans unite, work with Democrats if that's needed, and find a long-term spending solution that can pass both chambers? Well, that, that's a, an entirely different issue. If you want to talk about that, we, what we would need to go to is the issue of the, the fight that they have with Kevin McCarthy. The fight that they have with Kevin McCarthy essentially goes back to the debt limit when Mr. McCarthy did this almost exact same thing where he negotiated instead of for spending, he negotiated for time frames that would be for jamming as much spending uh, to debt as was chosen by January of a full year from now in 25. And that's where people, a lot of them fell off the wagon. Look, I'm not for chaos. I'm for the success of our organization. But they have continued not to negotiate with the, the people that are not in his favor and that oppose him. And I, I think that we're seeing the frailties of that now. Frailties. And let's talk about Donald Trump here. You know, he was in court in New York today for the start of his civil fraud trial. The judge is already ruling that he lied to banks, insurers, and others for years about his net worth and his assets. So what does it mean for the future of your party when your primary frontrunner, leading by double digits in the polls, but his future is tied up in courts? Well, I think it is. I think it is tied up in court. And while I know few of the real facts of the case, uh, everyone can see this for what it is and has been able to see this uh, ever since the day he was elected. And the, the bottom line to this is, is that if he defaulted on things and did not pay loans, I think that is a problem. I have no clue what the facts of the case are, but their values go up and down wildly in commercial uh, pro on commercial properties and in particular in New York City. So it is it is going to be experts against experts and knowledge against knowledge. But I think it all gets down to if he did not pay some loans where he uh, either over or understood, uh, misunderstated uh, those n numbers, I think he is in trouble. And now you sit on the House committee leading the impeachment inquiry against President Biden, looking into his family business dealings, specifically those of his son Hunter. Uh, the president there, of course, denies any wrongdoings, but these allegations have essentially been swirling around for years. Uh, and even uh, last, last week, the panel's own witnesses is questioning the amount of evidence that this committee actually has. So what do you say to Republicans who want an impeachment here and Americans as a whole who are concerned that this could end up being yet another distraction from the people's business? Well, it, it is a, a, a perhaps a valid question, but I think that if you looked at both sides of the equation, it is very clear that this is an inquiry to determine what the facts are. It is not an inquiry to go to a conclusion. And with that said, we know that for uh, literally two years, we were told by 60 intelligence uh, experts and admirals and generals that the Hunter Biden laptop was not true. It was a false uh, story. And in fact, the FBI had it the entire time and knew what it was. The Department of Justice has aided and abetted Hunter Biden by not moving towards the president and his behavior like they would have anyone else. And when you fail to follow the same examples that you would in in periods of law enforcement where you gather your data and evidence and you're stopped by the Department of Justice, which they were by the IRS, then it does lead questions. And that's why it's an inquiry, an inquiry as to the facts of the case. So we would expect now for the FBI to do the same thing that they do in all other matters, especially where there's an investigation like this, where the FBI will show up and they, too, will do an investigation and give that information to the United States House of Representatives.
Republican Representative Pete Sessions from Texas, thank you so much for spending some time with us. We truly appreciate yes, it. Of course. And now I want to bring our big story to our panel. So joining us today is ABC News contributor Mike Muse, ABC News political contributor and former Republican congressman from Virginia, Barbara Comstock, president of Next Gen America, Christina Sinsoon Ramirez, and ABC News contributing political correspondent and co-author of the Politico playbook, Rachel Bade. Thank you all so much for being here. So Congress, as you know, has temporarily averted this government shutdown until November 17th, but the GOP is still divided over over the budget. Barbara, to you first, you know, what do you make of Sessions' stance there on all of this? He said that he actually saw great flashes of good policy, but do you think that all of this hap that's happening with Matt Gates and these threats, I mean, is that being taken seriously on Capitol Hill? No, I, I think really uh, Matt Gates. I think it's been notable today that he's really standing alone. You're not seeing any members uh, joining up with him. He did not file his motion today. Yesterday, when Donald Trump was asking about it, he notably said, well, Kevin McCarthy has said nice things about me this morning. And when you look at, say, Fox News and even the most right-wing talk radio, um, like Mark Levin, they are standing with Kevin McCarthy, and uh, you're just not seeing the kind of support for Matt Gates. And the one thing that unites everybody in Washington is loathing for Matt Gates. So if you wanted to have a political enemy in Washington, uh, Matt Gates is pretty much uh, somebody that you know is pretty great to have because it unites everybody. And I really don't think Kevin McCarthy is going to have to worry about this. Matt Gates looks very weak and weaker by the day, and I don't think this motion to vacate is going to go anywhere. All right, the one thing. So, Rachel, to you, we have this extension. We know it's not going to last forever, just till mid-November here. Uh, what are your sources telling you about a possible deal? Uh, a possible deal to save McCarthy's speakership with Democrats? Yeah. Okay, well, it seems unlikely at this point. I mean, Matt Gates might be a kind of on an island right now, but keep in mind that he only yeah. needs five friends right now if all Democrats vote against Kevin McCarthy. That means Kevin McCarthy is toast. So the big question is, does he have those five? It appears that he might right now. Can Kevin McCarthy win them back? And if Kevin McCarthy can't, he's going to have to turn to Democrats for help. This is where things are going to get complicated for the speaker. Democrats, I talked to a whole bunch of them yesterday after Gates made this announcement, and every single one of them had nothing but negative things to say about Kevin McCarthy. They say he's a liar, that he reneged on a White House deal on spending caps. Uh, they don't like that he began, began an impeachment inquiry uh, of Joe Biden. And frankly, they just say that they can't trust him. But they are writing a bunch of wish lists, things that they could extract from McCarthy, a power sharing agreement, an end to the Biden impeachment if he turns to them for help. And these are things that if McCarthy gives them, uh, he's going to lose additional Republican support mm -hmm. and more people will join Matt Gates. Interesting. All right. And Mike, you know, to you, meanwhile, of course, we have this fraud trial that's underway in New York City against former President Donald Trump. Uh, he continues to call it a witch hunt as he seeks another term in the White House. It seems, though, I mean, it's like he remains invincible in these polls, and he almost used the cameras today as some sort of campaign stop, it looked like. You know, that's what I was thinking, too, as well. It felt very much like, a, like a, almost like a stump speech. You know, former President Trump has not appeared to any of his other cases uh, the way that he did in such grand style. Uh, he didn't miss an opportunity not to talk in front of the cameras and really frame this as a political stunt. And what's interesting, I was listening to your interviews you had with Representative Sessions, yes. he also, too, isn't so serving the American public well at all. He's also too feeding into this narrative that it's a political issue at hand versus a legal issue. So the more the Republican Party takes a position that this is more political, it reinforces what some people in the American public sees as a political stunt and not a legal stunt by not framing it in the legal ramification that it is. And unfortunately, Kena, I just think that no matter how many indictments goes before former President Trump, the American public, and particularly those who vote Republican, only emboldens and gets them more excited to support him um, mm -hmm. in moving forward. It's a really fascinating case study to observe and what's happening in real time. Right, there's a lot of Americans out there that really do feel like they're witnessing the weaponization of the justice system in this. And Christina, to you, you know, what do you make of the current snapshot of American politics here? I know that's an overarching question, but, you know, we have Trump's legal woes, his impeachment inquiry into President Biden, a looming government shutdown. Uh, how do you think this is going to play out for voters? 
Well, I think voters are watching what happens when Republicans are in charge. It's a circus. It's chaos. And ultimately, while people are discussing Kevin McCarthy's leadership role, I think I and most Americans don't actually care about his leadership role. What we care about is his impact of his lack of leadership on the American people that you know, his leadership is in question because he's allowed a far extreme right Republican party to control what's happening. And what we have to remember is, yes, we have 45 days right now, and that's a, a great reprieve. But ultimately, the vast majority of the Republican Party supported a draconian spending bill that would have left a million children without food assistance, tens of thousands of veterans, would have lost their homes, 60,000 seniors would have lost Meals on Wheels, and there would have been a 70% cut to heating assistance right before we enter winter. So I think that's what's on the minds of most American people are the consequences of failed leadership like this when there's so much infighting within their own party. I, certainly, I think there's a lot of American people, though, too, that would also be concerned if we pass bills through without border security and things like that as well. So uh, we'll, of course, keep our eyes on the Hill. Mike, Barbara, Christina, and Rachel, thank you so much to all of you. And coming up next here, uh, the bill is due for 28 million Americans with student loans, and the college debt crisis seems to be worsening here. We will talk about that when we come back. at stake. So much on the line. More Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Give it to me. number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. We're honored. ABC's 2020 winner of three Emmy Awards for Excellence. Thank you for making 2020 Friday night's most watched and most honored news magazine. I think vulnerability is extremely powerful. This is an artist that I looked up to at one point. I never would have imagined that the ending would have been what it was. They do not shock me. The treatment was just so disgusting on everyone's part. Did Lizzo ever put her hands on you? No, she didn't get to that point. She attempted to come at me with her fist balled up. Lizzo is denying it all. Lizzo's legal limbo. You never, like, expect for it to turn into that. Now streaming on Hulu. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. I believe the court's decision to strike down my student debt relief program as a mistake was wrong. What I did I thought was appropriate and was able to be done and would get done. I didn't give bars false hope, but the Republicans snatched away the hope. Well, that is President Biden back in June after the Supreme Court struck down his plan to wipe out more than $400 million in federal student loans. It was a blow to the president and to millions of borrowers with hopes that their loans would be forgiven. And now federal student loan payments have officially resumed after this three-year pause that began during the pandemic. And according to the Department of Education, more than 28 million Americans now with bills due starting October 1st. So I want to bring back our panel here, Mike Muse. 
Barbara Comstock, Christina Sinsun Ramirez, and joining us is ABC's Elizabeth Schulze. So thank you all so much for being here. And, and Mike, let's start with you here. What does the end of this pause mean as you look broadly, you know, across all Americans? Yeah, what this pause means is just more complication for President Biden. Um, I believe that the way that we've been framing this conversation is Biden or bust. I don't think that's necessarily fair to frame it in that. We're in a situation where we have told all the Americans that to achieve this American dream that you must go to college in order to do that. Uh, but at the same time, we see interest rates raising, we see inflation, uh, we see jobs uh, becoming minimized, we see job loss um, with in unemployment, and then the interim technology, which is rechanging the workforce altogether. So when these students come out with such high debt at a time when college is at an all-time high when it comes to tuition, what are they actually achieving at the end goal besides being mm -hmm. saddled with debt? And so it makes it difficult for them to achieve that American dream of home ownership or creating generational wealth. I think it's really up to this, uh, the nation to have all hands on deck. And I would love to see President Biden convene um, at the White House state government to really figure out how they can work with public institutions, which is funded federally and by the state, to figure out how to lower college tuition costs, how to get private mm -hmm. institutions to focus more on alumni donations and endowment, all in the effort, all hands on deck, to lower the cost of tuition so that Americans are not saddled with debt as we all try and achieve this American dream. Achieve the American dream. And Elizabeth, you know, I mean, we're talking about people that graduate with all this debt and then they can't earn a living wage and the house prices are sky high. Uh, you have done great reporting on this and you spoke with a woman about her student loan balance. So let's take a listen together. What does that number mean to you? You know, it's the thing that I am probably the most ashamed of in my life. We have to think of and we have to budget for every day and we have to budget for, for the future consequences of this loan every single day. You need to live in a house, you need to pay groceries, you need to eat, and then from there on you kind of have to figure out where to skimp and save. I was so struck by what she said to you, Elizabeth. Tell us more about these stories that you found there in your reporting. Well, and Kena, it was striking talking to borrowers who say when they took out those loans, maybe they were 18 at the time, they didn't mm -hmm. realize how quickly interest would add up. That was one of the biggest changes that was in place from this pause on payments over the past three years. Not only did you not have to make payments, there was no interest accruing. So when you looked at your balance this month, for the first time since March 2020, it was about the same. And for a lot of borrowers, just that psychological toll, like Sarah Wood, like that woman I spoke to that you just heard from, the psychological toll of that number, she has $180,000 in debt. She actually took out $118,000 in loans, but it got up that high mm -hmm. because of the interest rates. And that's something that we heard from so many borrowers. I talked to another man named Michael Lopez. He's in Anaheim, California. He has $240,000 in student debt. And most of that is from a master's degree, and that was another theme from our reporting was that those master's degrees especially can get a lot of uh, borrowers in the hole, but he wanted to pursue a career in public service. He said that's what he had to do, and he doesn't have any regrets, he said. No regrets. Wow. And Barbara, to you, you know, the Supreme Court ruling, it was a pretty big setback for some of these borrowers struggling with their debt, but are there other measures out there that can help them? Yeah, I think, you know, dealing, you know, if Congress could do something on dealing with those interest rates, I think Asa Hutchison has actually, actually suggested maybe doing something on the interest rates. I'm certainly concerned that I think two-thirds of the debt is women have two-thirds of that debt, and disproportionately minority women have it. So addressing that issue, I mean, I know I stopped paying my college and law school debts about the time that I was paying my children's uh, college uh, debts, and mm -hmm. so public service does pick up some of those debts and finding ways that um, we can, you know, make sure kids know about how, where you can um, get additional ways to help that and maybe government can help, uh, you know, help, help out kids in that way too. And potentially, and Christina, to you, you know, you see this crisis really with the younger generation, the generation coming up and coming into the workforce next. Do they view it as a call to action for change here when it comes to higher education? Yeah, you know, you had millions of young people turn out last election um, and, and presidential election and vote specifically on this issue. And Biden and Harris did take action, but it's not ultimately enough. I think, you know, Mike brought up a really good point that we have to decide as a country if we're going to invest in our greatest asset, which is the American people. And I want to say, you know what? We have to do is that 
uh, what a high school diploma was is what a college degree is today. We need to make sure we're working towards making sure college is affordable for every single American or this crisis is just going to continue and grow. Wow. All right, Mike, Barbara, Christina, Elizabeth, thank you all. We appreciate it. And coming up here in our last call, the Supreme Court justice who left behind a long legacy will show you how the notorious RGB is being honored in our last call. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. 30 years my brother's death was this mystery was he pushed did he kill himself despite some human remains found at the bottom of north head and the body was naked committing suicide naked is almost unheard of what's going on here you had some chilling evidence oh my goodness no one knew it was coming it's about finding justice for my brother sometimes you just have to stir the pot All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. You're watching America's number one streaming news, ABC News Live. Breaking news, exclusives, live reporting across the globe. Keep streaming with ABC News Live. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from Atlanta, I'm Steve Osinsami. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. It's time for our last call, and in honor of the late Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the Postal Service is releasing a new forever stamp today. So I want to bring back our panel to discuss Mike, Barbara, Christina, and Elizabeth. And Mike, I'm going to start with you here. Um, we asked you how you felt in email, and you just wrote, I support the stamp. This, that's the whole email. Do you care to elaborate? <laughs> <laughs> Kata, you put me on front street. <laughs> it's almost like enough said, right? Like some stamps just don't need an explanation. It just is, right? And I think we don't know too many, uh, you know, Supreme Court justices of the past, but she had the ability to rise through that and to yes. become a pop cultural phenomenon. And I think at a time when Supreme Court matters so much, given the state of our democracy right now, I think it does twofold. It honors her honors her legacy, but it also brings awareness to the American public about the importance yeah. of the Supreme Court and how we all must pay attention uh, to the majority opinions and also to the dissenting opinions because it's such, such yeah. precedent moving forward. Absolutely. Rachel, I mean, this has only happened 14 times before. What's your take? 
Yeah, I mean, clearly it's very significant. I mean, I will tell you, my husband, who's probably watching right now, he collects stamps, and I'm sure he's going to want one of these. But I do think the timing of this coming out is actually interesting uh, because it, it comes as the, the Supreme Court is starting its new term. This is a Supreme Court that is dominated by conservatives and just overruled uh, Roe v. Wade recently. And part of the reason conservatives now have power is in part because Ruth Bader Ginsburg for, would not step aside and retire when Democrats wanted her to appoint her seat or fill her seat with a Democrat. And so it was instead, I'm sorry, with a, with a progressive slash liberal judge and said it was filled with a conservative. So interesting timing. All right, and Barbara, what's your take? Well, I think it's wonderful. And in that same spirit, I'd like to give a plug for George Mason University uh, is starting at the Scalia Law School, a Scalia Ginsburg dialogue because of their great friendship. Oh, wow. uh, so I'd also like to see a Scalia stamp, stamp too. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. We're hearing that from a lot of people. And Christina, how about you? Well, you know, I get to work with millions of young people, and I see a lot of young people really cynical about the courts right now because of overturning of Roe. And so to me, this stamp is a symbol of what our court can be, of what we have when we have the Supreme Court justices that are really trying to uphold the Constitution for every single American. And so for me, I'm going to be putting that stamp on every single letter I mail out and let it be a symbol of how we're not going to give up on the courts. We're going to take back the courts and make sure they're not just ruling in a minority ideological, ideological opinion that doesn't serve the vast interest of the American people. All right, so we will know right away if our mail came from Christina with that stamp. Thank you so much. That is it for our last call in this half hour. Mike, Barbara, Christina, and Rachel, thank you. I support the stamp, he says. That's it. All right, thank you so much for streaming with us. I'm Kana Whitworth. Follow ABC News Live on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, and more. And coming up at 7 p.m. Eastern, be sure to catch ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis for the day's biggest stories and the impact they have on you. The news never stops, neither do we. Keep it right here on ABC News Live. For 30 years, my brother's death was this mystery. Was he pushed? Did he kill himself? There's been some human remains found at the bottom of North Head, and the body was naked. Committing suicide naked is almost unheard of. What's going on here? You had some chilling evidence. Oh my goodness, no one knew it was coming. It's about finding justice for my brother. Sometimes you just have to stir the pot. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from Santa Fe, New Mexico, I'm Lindsay Davis. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Tonight, all of the day's major developing stories here on Prime. This is a continuation of the single greatest witch hunt of all time. My message is simple. No matter how powerful you are, no matter how much money you think you may have, no one is above the law. It's the $250 million fraud trial that could bar Donald Trump from doing business in New York. What happened in court today and what it could mean for the former president's own re-election campaign. Plus, que comenzar la, ver la vida de diferente manera iba a traer a mi hijo a la escuela y me sentaba en el carro y comenzaba a llorar. 
They're crushed by media attention when news breaks, but contend with their grief once the cameras are gone. Tonight in our new series, Micro, we look at the lives left behind and report on the first child born with Zika seven years later. And he spent 13 years in the league as one of the NFL's top safeties. Three-time pro bowler and Super Bowl champ Malcolm Jenkins is here to talk about the work he's doing on and off the field. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We're following those stories and much more, including the latest legal battle involving Donald Trump. The former president and current Republican 2024 frontrunner chose to appear in a lower Manhattan court today for opening statements in New York State's $250 million fraud trial against him. Attorney General Letitia Lee uh, Letitia James had a front row seat. She says the Trump organization profited for years by intentionally inflating the value of their properties to receive favorable bank rates. In a blow to Trump's defense before the trial began, the judge in the case ruled last week that the Trumps did engage in fraudulent behavior. And while Trump may have sat largely silent inside the courtroom outside, he spoke several times defending his business empire and lashing out at the legal system. ABC senior investigative correspondent Aaron Katursky leads us off tonight from the courthouse. Tonight, former President Trump in court, stone-faced at the defense table for the opening of the civil trial that threatens to shatter the success story at the heart of his brand. New York Attorney General Letitia James in court, too, staring at Trump from her seat in the front row. She's accusing the former president of being a fraud and a liar. No matter how powerful you are, no matter how much money you think you may have, no one is above the law. On the bench, Judge Arthur and Gorin, who has already dealt Trump a severe blow, ruling he did commit fraud, inflating his net worth by as much as $2.2 billion by overvaluing much of his real estate empire. It could mean Trump will have to give up control of his signature properties in New York. In court today, lawyers for the state arguing Trump lied year after year, and they had the receipts. Take the Trump Tower penthouse. The state says the Trump organization inflated its value by some $200 million, declaring it was 30,000 square feet. But the attorney general's team showed Trump's signature on a document certifying the apartment is actually a third that size, 11,000 square feet. And while Trump said Mar-a-Lago was worth up to $600 million, the state contends its assessed value is actually no more than $27 million. And they played video from the deposition of Trump's former lawyer and fixer Michael Cohen, who says he and former chief financial officer Alan Weisselberg artificially boosted the value of certain properties at Trump's direction if, say, he wanted to move up on the Forbes list of the wealthiest people. Mr. Trump would call Alan and I into the office and let's say it said he was worth six billion dollars well he wanted to be higher on the forbes list and he then said i'm actually not worth six billion i'm worth seven in fact i think it's actually now worth eight with everything that's going on alan and i were tasked with taking the assets increasing each of those asset classes in order to accommodate that eight billion dollar number Trump's lawyers said real estate values, even square footage, are subjective, and the Trump properties are Mona Lisa properties, suggesting they're priceless. Throughout opening statements, Trump sitting with his arms crossed, shaking his head. He sometimes muttered under his breath, often whispering with his attorneys. He wasn't required to be in court today, but he came anyway, and several times spoke to reporters in the hallway, attacking Attorney General James and Judge Ngoran. Trump was given the option of a jury trial, but his lawyers didn't take it, and now his fate is in the hands of the judge. This is a judge that should be disbarred. This is a judge that should be out of office. Using familiar language from the Trump playbook. So very simply put, it's a witch hunt. It's a disgrace. He's calling this one the greatest witch hunt of all time. Let's get right to Aaron Katursky outside the courthouse. Aaron, what's at stake here for the former president? There's already a very real possibility Trump is going to lose control of the business empire that propelled him to the White House. And the state is now asking the judge to impose a $250 million penalty. The attorney general's office argues Trump inflated his net worth in order to get better terms from banks and insurance companies, something you and I can't do. And so the attorney general's office says the former president shouldn't be allowed to do it either. Lindsay? Aaron Katursky, our thanks to you. 
For more now, I'd like to welcome back Khan Nowaday, a former federal prosecutor in the South District of New York who fought against fraud cases. Khan, thanks so much for coming on the show as usual. Let's talk about what Americans saw today. You have a former American president in the same courtroom as the attorney general who's investigated him and the judge who's going to rule on the case. What's your takeaway on day one? My takeaway, three of them. One, I think the fact that the former president came to be present at the first day of his trial, of this trial, the civil trial, shows he knows how serious mm. it is. Uh, that's number one. The other two things I'd say are that these were not, this was not a good day for the former president. It hasn't been a good week. And the reason for that are two things. One, when you're a defendant, whether a civil defendant or a criminal defendant, you have to speak through your lawyer. And I am certain that it was difficult for the former president to allow his lawyers to do their job um, in that room with the judge, the fact finder, with his adversary, uh, Attorney General Tish James on the other side. And number three, he's behind on the pitch count. He already knows that the fact finder, the judge, has already ruled against him. So he's behind, and I think it's a, it was a bad day for him. That judge has ruled that Trump engaged in repeated fraud. What does that mean? It basically eviscerates a lot of the case and defense for uh, the former president, uh, his company, and his children who have been charged as well in, in the case. So what that means is that a lot of this trial, which is going to last two, two months at least, is going to be about damages, and it's going to be about the other claims that the judge did not decide on, the claims about insurance fraud, for instance. We saw that video there of Trump speaking in the hallway. Were you surprised that he spoke out? I wasn't surprised, <laughs> um, because that seems to be a, a calculated risk that the former president is taking. Um, most defense lawyers would tell their clients, don't say anything. Um, and especially for the former president, it's risky because he has all these other cases out there pending against him. So he knows anything he says, those other prosecutors, guess what? They're listening. And in that moment, he's slamming the attorney general and the judge. I mean, how much of a risk is that for him? It's a big risk. Uh, you know, he's facing a potential gag order in one of the cases because of these very statements that he's been making. I'll tell you this, I am sure his lawyers are telling him, please, please, Mr. President, don't do this. Do you expect Trump to testify? I do not. I, I don't think there's any upside for him. He's already testified in a deposition format in this case. I, I think for him, there really is no upside in getting up on that stand. Is this a slam dunk case? I think... Given the judge's ruling, uh, it is for now. Um, it will go up on appeal, I am sure. Con Nowaday, always appreciate your time and analysis. Thank you. Thank you. Now to Capitol Hill, where this weekend Congress narrowly avoided a government shutdown, but it could prove costly after House Speaker Kevin McCarthy had to rely on Democratic votes to secure the last-minute deal. And that's led to a threat by fellow Republican Matt Gates to try to oust him as the GOP leader. So is McCarthy's speakership in doubt? We have team coverage tonight from Capitol Hill and begin with our senior congressional correspondent, Rachel Scott. Do you think your job is Tonight, after cutting a deal with Democrats and a large number of moderate Republicans to prevent a government shutdown, Kevin McCarthy facing threats from members of his own party. Recognize the gentleman from Florida, Mr. It Gates. is becoming increasingly clear who the Speaker of the House already works for, and it's not the Republican conference. Florida Congressman Matt Gates vowing to force a vote this week to remove McCarthy as Speaker. Speaker are you confident you can survive this? It would take as few as five Republican votes to remove McCarthy. The big question, would Democrats step in to bail him out? Speaker McCarthy said he will survive this. Should he be that confident? Well, he's probably right. If Kevin McCarthy works for Democrats and utilizes Democrats in order to keep power, that would be consistent with everything we've seen from him. After failing to win over the far right wing of his party, McCarthy suddenly dropped his demands and worked with Democrats on a short-term solution to keep the government funded until November 17th. Democrats agreed to strip out additional funding for Ukraine, but President Biden says McCarthy assured him the money would be approved separately. I hope my friends on the other side keep their word about support for Ukraine. They said they're going to support Ukraine in a separate vote. Gates pounced. So, Mr. Speaker, just tell us. Just tell us. What was in the secret Ukraine side deal? And late today, McCarthy insisting he did not make a deal with the president. 
Jake says that there was a deal made on Ukraine. Really? What is By he who? talking about? That's I have what, no that's idea. What he's and the president said something similar too. That, no, that there, was there a deal at all? You, you weren't there. There is no side deal going forward. All right, now I want to go to Rachel. Scott, Rachel, I know there are a lot of moving parts right there at the Capitol. What's the latest as far as Speaker McCarthy and Matt Gates? Yeah, well, I'm looking at my producer right now who's been monitoring the floor, and we have just learned that Congressman Matt Gates has officially made good on those threats. He has moved forward with the first step to try to remove Speaker of the House Kevin McCarthy from his job. And so far, he is getting some support. We can tell you that on our list, we have four Republicans who would support the so-called motion to vacate, this move that would remove Kevin McCarthy uh, from his speakership. At this point, it's unclear when they'll go forward with the actual vote, and I just want to make these numbers very clear for everyone again. If all Democrats uh, vote to kick McCarthy out of speakership, then all that would be needed would be five Republicans to support that move, Lindsay. Any indication that uh, he has the full support of Democrats? Right now, that is the big question. What will Democrats do? Will Democrats try to help Speaker Kevin McCarthy? Will they try to bail him out? I've certainly talked to some Democratic members who say they are looking to leader Hakeem Jeffries to decide how they should move forward on this. Is there some type of deal that they can make with Speaker McCarthy so that he can remain in the Speaker's office? Others point out that this is a Speaker that has launched an impeachment inquiry into President Biden who has blocked their, their priorities, and they have made it clear they're not interested in helping him this time around, Lindsay. All right, Rachel Scott, I know we'll be talking to you a lot in the coming hours and, and days. Thank you so much for your reporting, as always. Now I want to bring in Jay O'Brien, uh, who's also on the Hill. Uh, Jay, we knew that from the very beginning, uh, Speaker of the House uh, Kevin McCarthy got the job by a razor-thin margin. Give us the latest of where things stand tonight. Yeah, Lindsay, so uh, let me walk you through a little bit of what you just saw on the House floor. And it was a bit of an anticlimax because Matt Gates has been hyping up this motion to vacate for weeks and months. He publicized that he was going to the floor this afternoon in which he gave a speech about Ukraine funding and criticized, as you heard in Rachel's piece, Speaker McCarthy for, as Gates put it, cutting a deal with President Biden. That's a deal that Speaker McCarthy denies. And then, of course, we don't hear anything from Gates over the course of the day. And then, right as this vote is going on, as the House is voting, we start to get rumblings from sources that Matt Gates is going to give a floor speech. And he did exactly what you just saw a little bit of and a little bit of what Rachel just described, which is Gates goes out to the well of the House and he just introduces that motion to vacate against McCarthy and then that was it. Next steps here are they have to schedule that vote on the motion to vacate, it would likely come two legislative days from now, so not tonight, but in the near future. Gates signaled that he was preparing for that earlier today. Uh, let's take you back all the way, Lindsay, to the speaker fight in which you and I were on the air together for hours and hours and hours because that is what brought us to today. McCarthy made a concession to become speaker, to lower the threshold of the number of members who could call for a motion to oust him to one. That was a big concession he made to get into his current job. And that is what Matt Gates just did. Called him on it, used that motion to vacate, and now both sides are going to try to figure out what kind of support they have to boot McCarthy, or if you're McCarthy, to stay in that job. All right, all really fascinating, and I know it's all developing and unfolding as we speak in real time. Jay O'Brien, our thanks to you as always. Heartbreaking news in Philadelphia, where a freelance journalist and former city employee was shot and killed early this morning. Local officials arrived at Josh Kruger's home around 1.30 a.m., where they found him shot seven times in the chest and abdomen. He was taken to a local medical center, where he was then pronounced dead. Kruger was openly queer and was currently working as a freelance reporter and previously employed by the Philadelphia City Paper and Philadelphia Weekly. No arrest or weapon has been recovered at this time. And we turn next to the investigation of a tragic emergency at a home-based daycare in California where several children fell into a swimming pool. Three of them were taken to the hospital, with two of them later pronounced dead. Here's ABC's Irene Shah. Tonight, the San Jose Police Homicide Unit and the Santa Clara County DA's office are investigating the deaths of two children after they fell into a pool at this daycare. 
It happened around 9 a.m. local time at the Happy Happy Daycare based out of a residence. From above, you can see the pool in the backyard surrounded by a tall protective fence. We have three patients all together. Um, two are going to be immediate. I need two more ambulances. There were reportedly five children at the daycare at the time. Ambulances rushing three to the hospital in critical condition. Two of the children later pronounced dead. The third child expected to survive. And Lindsay, police say they will be on the scene for a significant amount of time as they investigate with the DA's office. Lindsay. Zoreen, thank you. California Governor Gavin Newsom has tapped LaFonza Butler as the interim pick to fill the late Senator Dianne Feinstein seat. Newsom pledged to fill the Senate vacancy with a black woman. Butler was previously an advisor to Vice President Kamala Harris during her 2020 presidential campaign. If appointed senator, Butler will become the first openly black lesbian to serve in the position in the history of the United States. Newsom called the former advisor a fighter, and she will, quote, represent us proudly. A warning tonight from actor Tom Hanks about the dangers of artificial intelligence. He says that a video circulating that appears to be of him promoting a dental plan is a fake. Here's Arcana Whitworth. Tonight, one of Hollywood's most beloved stars warning against the dangers of artificial intelligence. Tom Hanks sharing this on Instagram, writing, Beware, there's a video out there promoting some dental plan with an AI version of me. I have nothing to do with it. The actor seeking to protect his fans from being duped by the power of technology when videos, likenesses, even voices can be manipulated by AI. The use of artificially generated images in the entertainment industry, one of the core issues at the heart of the SAG after strike, actors seeking protection against their image being used without their consent. Hanks cautioning against artificial intelligence in a recent interview. Outside of the understanding that has been done with AI or deep fake, there'll be nothing to tell you that it's not me and, uh, and me alone. And Lindsay, you know, Hanks is really just the latest person to discuss the dangers that AI can pose. This as lawmakers are trying to figure out how to regulate it and protect consumers. Lindsay? Kena, thank you. So much more to get to tonight here on Prime. New fallout from a police raid at a newspaper and at the home of the publisher who's now being suspended from their job. But next, our new series, Micro, following what happens to people at the center of a major headline after the cameras are all gone. One family tells us how the Zika virus left a lasting impact on their family. Que nos cambia la vida de 180 grados y donde tenemos que que comenzar a ver la vida de diferente manera y va a traer a mi hijo a la escuela y me sentaba en carro y comenzaba a llorar. Whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. 
Welcome back, everyone. When news breaks, camera crews descend, reporters and producers converge, and those at the center of the story are bombarded. After that initial crush of media attention, cameras pack up, the reporters leave the scene, but the subject of the news themselves continue to grapple with their grief as the world moves on. And that's the focus of our new series, Micro. In this first installment, we bring you the story of Claudia Funes and her husband, Christian Hiron, who came to America and whose daughter, Dara, was the first Zika-affected child born in the U.S. Seven years later, we show the struggles and everyday joys of this family as they still reel from the impact of Zika. Son los que estamos aquí eh, celebrando la vida de Dara. Cada año, cada día nos enseña cosas nuevas. Estamos un año a la vez siempre pues viendo que, que sobrepasa las expectativas, que ella está bien, que puede estar sana y que, y que va creciendo. Claro, siempre es como la ilusión de que si tenemos el varón, pues queremos la niña. Me casé. Tuve a mi hijo mayor, a David Andrés, porque teníamos una vida en Honduras, una vida que, que era relativamente cómoda, teníamos muy buenos empleos, donde se manejaba toda la parte de marketing y el personal. Aba y daba clases en la universidad también, entonces estábamos pues estables y todo iba bien. Y... En el 2015 comienza todo lo, de, lo del virus. Brazil, the epicenter for the Zika virus epidemic. The country grappling with the devastating effects it has on babies of infected women. Pero pues lo veíamos tan largo porque nosotros vivimos en Centroamérica. A call for the Summer Olympics in Brazil to be canceled or postponed because of Zika. The recent cluster reported in Latin America constitutes a public health emergency of international concern. Y salgo embarazada de Dara. En el primer trimestre, eh, pues todo iba bien, solo que un día Cris eh, comenzó con muchos síntomas, ojos rojos, fiebres altas, dolor de cuerpo, escalofríos. Comienzo yo también con una alergia en el cuerpo, pero solo era la alergia. Ya se declaró la emergencia también en Honduras, pero ahora, además de la declaración de emergencia, necesitamos actuar. Ese fue el día que que me dio el Zika, tenía exactamente ocho semanas de embarazo. Ahí fue donde ese virus me afectó a, a dar. Porque nos cambia la vida de 180 grados y donde tenemos que, que comenzar a ver la vida de diferente manera. Iba a traer a mi hijo a la escuela y me sentaba en el carro y comenzaba a llorar. Porque no entendía cómo había, me había pasado eso y cómo mi hija se había afectado. Entonces me dijo, creo que él, eh, tenemos que dejar nuestra comodidad por la comodidad de ella. Y Dara nació a las 3 y 5 de la tarde, el 31 de mayo. Tenía 35 semanas. Tonight, doctors in New Jersey are revealing new details about that first Zika-affected baby born in the continental U.S. Doctors saying today the mother was infected in Honduras and came to the U.S. just last week for better care. The baby girl that was born to the mother with Zika infection is currently being evaluated for complications related to congenital Zika. Dara nació así por el virus del Zika. El cráneo no crece y su cerebro está, compri está como comprimido por su cabeza, por eso es chiquitita. Pero tocó su visión, donde Dara no, no puede ver, ni aunque se le pongan lentes. Así que tiene 30% menos de audición en, un oído, en el, su oído derecho. Tiene más daño cerebral en su parte, en su cerebro izquierdo, en el lado izquierdo de su cerebro. Y es lo que este virus vino. Green pepper, cilantro, asparagus. Es pues, atrasado porque tiene siete años y todavía come puré. No podemos darle sólido. ¿Qué pasó? The first time when, when she laughed, was when uh, I made a cow sound. 
ya no. ¿Ya me la vaca? The same, the same reaction six years ago. Pero tal vez no tienen los materiales ni los tratamientos como el que Dara recibió porque no existen. Por ejemplo, los niños con discapacidad en Honduras no tienen derecho a una escuela. ¿no? Por ser una persona con discapacidad no tiene seguro. Descartada al 100. Deja la puerta abierta. ¿Esta también? Sí, para que ya André va a entrar. Oh. ¿Verdad? Sí. André también pues, se va a beneficiar de todo este cambio que para él fue pues, un poco más difícil. Déjame aportar el que. Dame lo que sea, mi mamá. También fue difícil para él adaptarse a otra cultura, venir a, a las escuelas. Nosotros no venimos a, a quitarle nada a nadie, ni, ni abusar de un sistema, ni nada de eso. Solo queremos que Dara tenga una mejor calidad de vida que, y que pueda ser feliz. Eso es lo único que queremos. Sí, porque no se Entonces. Estamos ahorita trabajando con el láser, con alimentación. Esta es una terapia que ayuda a regenerar las células. Esto hace que muchos niños que tienen problemas eh, cerebrales eh, tengan una pubertad eh, más temprana. De lo... Muy bien, Dara. Muy bien, Dara. Mal y Dara pues apenas va a cumplir siete y ya comenzó con esto. Ya, solo es suavecito. Sí. Cada uno de estos implementos que ustedes que ven no las cubre el seguro, lo hemos intentado. Nosotros hacemos campañas de recaudación de fondos, vendemos camisetas, eh, hacemos sorteos, hacemos muchas actividades y así es que podemos adquirirlo. Sí está cansada, sí está cansada, sí yo la entiendo, ¿ok? El ver niñas de la edad de edad y verlas que van a la escuela con sus uniformes, platicando con sus papás, si yo no puedo no llevar a mi hija de la mano, que me diga que qué muñeca quiere o qué dibujito es el preferido de ella. Es difícil ver a otras niñas y, y solo me imagino a mi hija que tal vez estuviera haciendo eso. ¿Ese es agua? Sí. ¿O es el, el agua? Ok. Sí, sí ha sido difícil, han sido siete años que no han sido fáciles, donde he llorado, donde me he deprimido. El dolor siempre existe porque es una herida que nunca se sana, jamás se va a sanar. Y, pero sí como que no es forrarnos al dolor, sino que a la oportunidad, a ver la alegría, a ver cómo puedo sacar a dar adelante. Estoy además más ocupadas. Mis 23 horas y media. Son de ellos y los otros, los, tengo una media hora, por ejemplo, que puedo tomar un tiempo más para bañarme. Eh, leo un libro, pero leo dos páginas diarias, que es lo que me permito. Ya hoy, este año, me quiero emprender, trabajar desde mi casa. Quiero ayudar a otras familias que pasan por lo mismo que yo he pasado. Eh, antes, Dara, antes de nacer, eh, los doctores habían hecho ultrasonido y decían que solo pesaba tres libras, que tal vez no iba a vivir, que estuviéramos preparados para eso, pero aquí estamos siete años después agradecidos por la vida de ella, por tenerla. Still finding those moments to celebrate. And we still have much more to get to. Coming up, he served as former President Trump's vice president for four years, but Mike Pence says he's well known, but not known well. We get to know the former vice president in our new series, Who Is, and how he hopes his life story will ultimately help him win the presidency. I'm going to work my heart out to take all those values and those principles and uh, earn the right to carry them uh, into 2024 and hopefully to the White House.
But next, millions of Americans will be tightening their belts once again. Student loan payments resume. We take a closer look at life after the pandemic pause by the numbers. So much at stake, so much on the line. More Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. You're along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching? Watching Saturdays on ABC News Live. What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. I think vulnerability is extremely powerful. This is an artist that I looked up to at one point. I never would have imagined that the ending would have been what it was. They do not shock me. The treatment was just so disgusting on everyone's part. Did Lizzo ever put her hands on you? No, she didn't get to that point. She attempted to come at me with her fist balled up. Lizzo is denying it all. Lizzo's legal limbo. You never, like, expect for it to turn into that. Now streaming on Hulu. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey, I'm David Muir. Wherever the story, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back, everyone. The turning of the calendar page this month is a rude awakening for millions of Americans paying back student loans. We take a closer look by the numbers. 45 million people in the U.S. currently have federal student loan debt at an average of $37,338 a borrower. That adds up to a whopping $1.6 trillion owed. It's been more than three years since former President Donald Trump first hit pause on student loans as the pandemic took hold. The Biden-Harris administration continued the policy extension ending the grace period eight times. President Biden even took his attempt to forgive at least $10,000 in debts all the way to the Supreme Court, where he lost. Interest resumed last month, and now after a 42-month hiatus, the first bills are coming due. With inflation still up 4.3% year over year, it's another cost to contend with, and economists fear consumer spending could take a hit. We should note there is a 12-month on-ramp period that will allow you to miss a payment without seeing your credit score suffer. And you may be eligible 
eligible for some relief. The White House SAVE plan ties loan repayment to income and could save certain borrowers roughly $1,000 a year. In some cases, it will actually zero out repayments. We know this is a complicated topic and one that many have been dreading. You can learn more about your federal student loan repayment options at studentaid.gov. And we still have much more ahead here on Prime. He's a three-time Pro Bowler and two-time Super Bowl champion. Malcolm Jenkins tells us why he's now revealing what winners won't tell you. And her world tour may have just come to an end, but Beyonce is not taking a break. She reveals the next project in her Renaissance era. What does it take to be America's number one news? It takes asking the straightforward, tough questions. Do you believe that Donald Trump should ever be president again? How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? The news-making interviews. You said that there were six friends. One of them was sick. Yeah. Do you have future political aspirations? Going to the front line. The search for survivors. How does this war end? And getting to the heart of the story. Thank you for being here. We'll be here for the long run. ABC News, number one in the morning. The number one newscast. Number one in daytime talk. Friday nights, Sunday mornings versus the competition. And the number one streaming news. Thank you for making ABC News America's trusted, straightforward, first choice. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're gonna love it. Wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Streaming free on ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Welcome back. We turn now to the dramatic rescue of a nine-year-old girl who'd been missing since Saturday evening tonight, found alive. The young girl vanished while camping with her family in upstate New York. Police said that they had believed she had been taken. The New York governor called it every parent's nightmare. Let's go now to ABC Stephanie Ramos for the latest. 
Hi there, Lindsay. I'm standing outside the Morrill Lake State Park. You can see that they've just put a sign behind me that says road closed. State troopers are still there. We learned from New York State Police tonight that, as you mentioned, nine year old Charlotte Senna was found alive and in good condition tonight. Just a few moments before we got that confirmation, we saw her family arrive here at the park. And then moments later, they came out to thank everyone who assisted in this massive search multiple agencies involved in this search more than 400 people combing this area trying to find that little girl who disappeared while riding her bike in this area around the park just north of Albany here in New York but tonight she has been found alive and police say she is in good health and also Lindsay a suspect is in custody Lindsay I know authorities had said all weekend that they believe she was in imminent danger after this exhaustive search so what a miraculous outcome Stephanie Ramos thank you so much for your reporting new developments for a police department that raided a newspaper the investigation into the killing of a man known for exposing child predators and Beyonce closes out her world tour with a major announcement about her next step these stories and much more in tonight's rundown A Kansas police chief is suspended from the job after a raid at a local newspaper. Chief Gideon Cody initially justified the raid on the Marion County record and the seizure of computers and cell phones, saying that he was acting on allegations that the paper had used private information about a story on a local business owner. County officials later withdrew the warrants, and now the city has suspended Chief Cody without comment. The newspaper reports that it's obtained body-worn camera footage from the day of the raid that suggests Cody was looking for reporters' notes about him. Hollywood writers and late-night shows are back to work, but actors are still on strike and are expected to resume negotiations with top studios over a new contract. The Screen Actors Guild represents about 160,000 people and began striking in July along with the Writers Guild. The Actors Guild is pushing for higher residual payments from successful shows and clearer guidelines on the use of artificial intelligence for on-screen work. Robert Lee, known as Bupa Tricor on social media, was a child predator vigilante. He posed as an underage girl to catch sexual predators. The conversations that he had with them would then be forwarded to police. And sometimes Lee himself would confront the would-be predators and even recording those interactions and then posting them on social media. Lee was killed late Friday night inside Universal Coney Island near North Perry and MLK Boulevard in Pontiac. The Sheriff's Department says Lee confronted two men, ages 17 and 18, inside the restaurant, even accusing one of the men of being a pedophile. Police arrested the two men involved in Lee's shooting on Saturday. The names of the men have not been released because formal charges have not been filed. Two University of Pennsylvania scientists, Dr. Drew Weissman and Dr. Catalin Carrico, won the Nobel Prize in Medicine. Their discoveries led to the creation of the mRNA vaccines that protect against COVID. Before COVID, mRNA was tested on diseases like Zika and rabies. Now, after the commercial and medical success of the mRNA COVID vaccines, scientists are trying to use mRNA to help alleviate allergies and possibly even cure cancer. 13-year-old Davian Kimbrough made history this weekend in the United Soccer League, becoming the youngest professional athlete in American team sports. Kimbrough was brought on as a substitute in the 87th minute of the Sacramento Republic's 2-0 victory against the Las Vegas Knights. The teenager grew up in Sacramento and was a star on the Republic's youth team before getting the call to play for the main squad. Big B. The B stands for box office. Time Grammy winner confirming that a concert film of her record-breaking Renaissance World Tour is anticipated to hit theaters December 1st in a deal with movie chain giant AMC. The hugely successful platinum album Renaissance making way for the highest grossing tour by a solo female artist. Renaissance raking in a reported $450 million and generating an estimated $4.5 billion dollars for the U.S. economy. Movie theaters looking to cash in at a time of slumping ticket sales and as several high-profile films face delays because of the actor strike. 
may know him as the conservative politician who served as President Trump's VP for four years, but tonight we are getting to know who is Mike Pence the person. He says he's well known, but not known well. We recently sat down with him in Iowa, where he hopes his personal brand of politics will translate into results. It's the latest in our series, Who Is? Giving viewers a chance to hear from presidential hopefuls. It's especially initial, it's, it's a special initially brought to us by ABC News legends Peter Jennings and Charlie Gibson. Were you conscious as a child and as a young man that you came from a life of privilege? So did you think to yourself, Barack, what kind of hubris is this? Being president. And they said, be a man. <laughs> yeah, they said, be a man. They said, we're not accepting girls. But you're a Mormon kid. No drinking, no smoking. Growing up as a child, what did you think you wanted to be? I've heard you say before that you're a Christian, a conservative, and Republican in that order. Mm -hmm. If I could get you to just elaborate with a few more words, who is Mike Pence? Well, I, I, I can't say it much more succinctly than that. I mean, my faith is the most important thing in my life. My family is everything to me. But my values are the principles that have always made this country strong and prosperous and made America everything that it's been before. And, but I'm also a proud Republican. I believe the Republican Party holds the keys today to really restore our country, to put our economy back on a path of prosperity, and also to have America standing tall in the world as the leader of the free world. And uh, I'm going to work my heart out to take all those values and those principles and uh, earn the right to carry them uh, into 2024 and hopefully to the White House. There was an editor of your hometown paper who said that Mike Pence wanted to be president practically since he popped out of the womb. Uh, <laughs> when did you first know that, that you had this calling or desire? Well, I, you know, I didn't grow up in a political family. My father was a combat veteran. My grandfather was an immigrant. My dad ran a small business. As a young man, I was deeply inspired by the life and example of the late President John F. Kennedy and the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. It was their example that, that drew me to early activism in the Dem Democratic Party. What made you switch teams? Well, it was just the voice and the values of the 40th president of the United States. And Ronald Reagan, who also grew up in the Midwest. I can't tell you how terrific it feels to get out of Washington and to be here with you. I heard uh, the strength of a commitment to those timeless American ideals, but I also heard the way he spoke about them, always with gentleness and respect, even with people that would differ with him. I knew that uh, uh, the Republican Party uh, was my future, and I joined the Reagan Revolution and never looked back. Your greatest strength? My family. Greatest weakness? Impatience. Fairest criticism of you? Um, I tend to expect too much. He says his faith is not just the foundation of his family and his core beliefs, but it also informs many of his policies, from his stance on gay marriage to abortion. And I couldn't be more proud to be part of an administration that has stood strong and stood without apology for the sanctity of human life. Tell me about the, uh, the, the Christian concert that you went to in Kentucky early on. And <laughs> imagine you would think changed your life did. I found my way uh, along with a small group of college students to Asbury University where there was a Christian music festival taking place where there was some of the early contemporary Christian bands were performing and in between them there was preaching and, and it was as though I, I heard for the first time that God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son that whoever might believe in him might not perish but have everlasting life. And on a rainy night in 1978, as a freshman in college, I, I, I stood up, um, uh, not just out of a sense of agreement with the truth of the gospel, but because my heart was broken with gratitude for what had been done for me on the cross. And I walked down and I prayed to receive Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior, and it's changed my life forever. We brought in Karen, his wife of 38 years and mother of his three children, to keep Mike honest about their love story. You all remember the first time you met? <laughs> you better believe it. <laughs> Tell me about it. Well, I was, uh, I was attending a little Catholic church, actually just a block away from the Indiana governor's residence, where we would live a long time later. And I saw this beautiful brunette with a guitar uh, up in the worship group. And uh, 
I followed her out the back of the church that day, and then we walked out of the front of a church a year and a half later. And uh, <laughs> she's been my wife for 38 years, and God's greatest blessing in my life. Is it true the first time he called, he didn't say anything and hung up the phone? That's exactly true. How did yes. that happen? Yeah. Well, I was watching my sister's kids, and he was <laughs> calling her to see what the scoop was on me, because uh, I had told him that she attended the same law school that he was at. And I was watching her kids that week, and so I answered. And when he realized it was me on the phone, he hung up. <laughs> Great first impression. <laughs> but I called her right back. <laughs> Tell me about eight months later, the loaf of bread. Well, we had made, we had made a habit of heading down to uh, uh, Broad Ripple Canal. Uh -huh. It's in the heart of Indianapolis. And um, part of what was supposed to be the old Erie Canal system. And uh, we would feed the ducks uh, and uh, enjoy some conversation and some time. And so uh, I hollowed out the end of a, of a loaf of French bread um, on one and on the other. And I hit a, I hit a bottle of champagne in, in one of the loaves and uh, a ring box <laughs> in the top. And uh, she opened up uh, as, she, as she broke the bread, the ring popped out. and. Uh, I dropped down on one knee with the traffic whizzing by and uh, asked her to be my wife at that park bench. Kind of romantic. Very romantic. He is a romantic. <laughs> <laughs> they say they still pray together and view the presidency not as a goal but a calling placed on his heart by God. You have a favorite scripture? Over the mantle in my study in Indiana and it's Jeremiah 29 11, for I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. It's very much been our, our family's lodestar, but I also believe uh, it's part of how we bring this country back. If people of faith will simply turn their hearts back to him, renew their faith in him, I know that America's will again renew its hope and find a boundless future for all the American people. Our thanks to Mike Pence for that conversation. He spent 13 years in the league as one of the NFL's top safeties. Along the way, Malcolm Jenkins was a three-time Pro Bowler and two-time Super Bowl champion, but he also has made an impact off the field. Jenkins remains a champion of social justice, and his activism can be seen in his work with the Malcolm Jenkins Foundation. We are happy to be joined in studio by the NFL standout himself, who now has a new book out, What the Winners Won't Tell You. Malcolm, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. Me. I want to just start right out with the title. What won't winners tell you? <laughs> <laughs> you got to read the book to see the whole thing. It's not a step-by-step, -step, you know, thing, but it's definitely one of those things. When we see winners and people who are successful, we usually see the end product, uh -huh. and there seems to be a gap between us and them. But what we don't really realize is there's a process uh -huh. to that success. There's things that they had to learn along the way and evolution that had to take place and many losses that they've learned from. And so for me, this is a opportunity to kind of unveil the the inner workings of you know my 13 year career and show people exactly what made me me you retired in 2022 didn't waste any time what made you decide i want to walk through these parts i, I need to write all this down yeah i actually started writing it while i was still playing mm -hmm. that last year i could just tell that you know it was getting to the end of the road of my career and as an athlete so much so much is written about you so many th people say things about you and rarely do we get to tell our own stories uh, and so it was a little therapeutic for me to go back through all of these games, all of these you know, situations and connect the dots between, you know, what people see today and those moments that made me who I was, the people who've influenced me along the way and those experiences that have shaped who I am. Uh, but you don't just talk about those 13 years in the NFL. You no. actually take us all the way back to kindergarten, learning yeah. the lyrics of Lift Every Voice and Sing, yeah. uh, Ohio State becoming a Q, Omega yeah. Sci-Fi. Uh, and, and I'm just curious why you decided, you know what, I'm going to take it way back. Because yeah, that's the part that people don't see, right? You know, it's we've all watched the Super Bowls and, and things like that, but what you don't see is what led up to those moments, those moments where, you know, my grandmother pushes me outside and tells me to fight for myself. Right, that's why you see me as, as a person who's constantly using his voice and defending his people in his neighborhood. Those lessons were put into me early. Uh, you also talk us through your football career, obviously, from Ohio State, the Saints, the Eagles, and not only that, but winning Super Bowls against arguably the best NFL quarterbacks of all time, Peyton Manning and, and Tom Brady. When you look back, what do you make of it all? 
You know, I, I look every day now, and I'm watching each week how many, you know, nights a week that football dominates the prime time, yeah. right? How, how we as a society wrap ourselves around this game. And I'm, I'm almost taken aback to know that I was standing sitting stage mm. at that stage, you know, and, and, and being a part of it. So I'm extremely grateful. But you also write about your leadership and your involvement in the peaceful protests in the locker room. And you write, normally before games, I didn't notice the crowd. It was like white noise and vibrations mostly. But this night on primetime football, Monday night, I felt like the world was watching. As we went through our normal game day routine and took to the field, this time felt anything but normal. You were one of the first players to start that NFL group chat about the play players needing to do something. Take us back to that moment. Yeah, you know, Colin Kaepernick started something when he took a knee, right? It, it a conversation was birthed out of sports and went around the world where you had young people and activists coming together trying to figure out what to do. And I realized that that wasn't just like a flash moment. This was something, this is an opportunity. And so we began to try to organize, which I learned was a very difficult thing to do. But what we got out of it was the Players Coalition. And, and what started with a group of about a dozen players is now expanded to uh, represent players in over a dozen uh, professional sports leagues doing work all over the country. I just want to go back to a point you made earlier. You saw, talked about suffering from anxiety. I think a lot of people are going to look at you and your career and say, what, not Malcolm yeah. Jenkins. How did you cope with that? Uh, I didn't cope with it very well at first, you know, because I tried to compartmentalize it. I had the same thoughts as, as what you just said. Like, well, come on, you have everything. You shouldn't feel this way, but anxiety doesn't really <laughs> live, doesn't right. really work <laughs> like that. Um, and so I struggled, you know, and, and it got to the point where it was so bad that I, I had to ask for help. I was scared. And uh, that's something I don't do often. And so I share that because it was one of my most vulnerable moments. Um, but asking for help led me into understanding myself a little bit more, understanding my role as a leader, what I could handle, what I couldn't, what was my responsibility and what wasn't. Uh, and what I could do, I, you know, I, I should do, but what I can't is I have to be okay with, you know, not. And I think that's something that we all struggle with, right? It's trying to be everything for everyone and that's just really not the reality. Malcolm, so good to talk with you Thank and you. have you on the show. Really appreciate your time. Want our viewers to know that his new book, What Winners Won't Tell You, is now available wherever books are sold. And that is our show for this hour. I'm Lindsay Davis. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Up in the next hour, there's an increasingly contentious battle on Capitol Hill over funding for Ukraine, what well, the Pentagon is saying as Ukrainians worry about future aid. And a possible solution to help curb the dangerous and deadly gun violence in Haiti, the action the UN Security Council is now taking. Wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Getting you behind the stories as they happen, ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Streaming free on ABC News Live. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. This is ABC News Live. The crushing the families Trump. here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. I think vulnerability is extremely powerful. This is an artist that I looked up to at one point. 
I never would have imagined that the ending would have been what it was. They do not shock me. The treatment was just so disgusting on everyone's part. Did Lizzo ever put her hands on you? No, she didn't get to that point. She attempted to come at me with her fist balled up. Lizzo is denying it all. Lizzo's legal limbo. You never, like, expect for it to turn into that. Now streaming on Hulu. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Good evening, everyone. This is ABC News Live Prime. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. We've got a lot of news to get to this evening, including the fraud trial that could bar Donald Trump from doing business in New York. What happened in court today and the late news about what we can expect tomorrow as the trial continues. And a new warning from the Pentagon after Congress stripped money for Ukraine from the deal to keep the government open and a deadly end to a church service after a roof collapses. Now there's an urgent search through the rubble for dozens of missing worshipers. But we do begin with late developments on Capitol Hill and a major step in attempts by some House Republicans to replace Speaker Kevin McCarthy. Florida Congressman Matt Gates appearing on the House floor to offer his motion to vacate the Speaker's chair. Mr. Speaker, pursuant to Clause 2A1 of Rule 9, I rise to give notice of my intent to raise a question of the privileges of the House. Declaring the office of Speaker of the House of Representatives to be vacant. Resolved that the office of Speaker of the House of Representatives is hereby declared to be vacant. The move sets up a showdown over McCarthy's leadership and follows a last-minute deal to avoid a government shutdown that relied on Democratic votes. Speaker McCarthy already responded by simply saying, bring it on. So will Gates get any traction? We have team coverage tonight from Capitol Hill. But we begin with our senior congressional correspondent, Rachel Scott, who just spoke with Matt Gates. And before we hear what he had to say, just give us the latest, Rachel, on what's unfolded tonight in this effort to remove House Speaker Kevin McCarthy. Another chaotic week is beginning here on Capitol Hill, Lindsay, and I can tell you what we just witnessed on the House floor was history. No member has brought a motion to vacate to the floor to try to oust the Speaker of the House in 100 years. We are watching a once-in-a-century fight once again here on Capitol Hill. All of this comes after House Speaker Kevin McCarthy made a deal with Democrats, working with them and moderate Republicans to keep the government open and funded. He tried again and again to try to satisfy the far right wing of his conference it was never enough. So frustrations boiling over here on Capitol Hill. Congressman Matt Gates finally making good on those threats, moving forward with this effort to try to oust him. Now, this is just the first step. What we're going to see next is a vote to either table the motion to simply put it aside or to bring it to the floor for a vote where McCarthy's speakership will be on the line. All of this comes down to numbers. This is a game of math, okay? So if all Democrats vote in support of kicking McCarthy out of the Speaker's office, then Matt Gates only needs four other Republicans to join him, a total of five. And right now I could tell you we've been out here on Capitol Hill. We've been here on the steps. We've already talked to at least four Republicans who say they do support this effort to kick out Kevin McCarthy from the Speaker's office, Lindsay. Oh, four and plus one Matt Gates equals five. Four, including Matt Gates so I far. See. So they're looking for one other. And, and I can tell you that we have been talking to some, some Republicans that we know were frustrated with that deal that Kevin McCarthy made with Democrats who are on the fence. I can tell you Congresswoman Nancy May said to me that Con uh, that Matt G that uh, Kevin McCarthy has her number and that if he wants her support, he should give her a call.
Okay, all right, Rachel. Congressman Gates spoke moments ago. You asked him about his lack of Republican support. Let's listen to that exchange for a moment. So you've made it clear that if this fails, you will try again. How soon would that happen? Well, I'm not so pessimistic as to immediately accept that it'll fail. I think that's the likely outcome. Uh, but, you know, this won't be the only time. That's probably all I'll, all I'll uh, say on that. So what does that mean for how this could all play out in the next 48 hours and beyond? Yeah, it means Gates is relentless at this point. He is committed to this effort. He has made it clear he does not believe that Kevin McCarthy should be the Speaker of the House. So he can bring this motion to try to force this vote to oust Speaker McCarthy, and then it could fail. We could see this fail. And Gates says at some point, he may try again. So there are bigger questions here about the timing of all of this, because you certainly have Republicans who are frustrated with McCarthy, but they do not believe now is the time and the place to be doing this. Remember, this is a short term deal to keep the government funded. We will be revisiting this fight in about 45 days, right before Thanksgiving. And I've talked to a lot of Republicans here on Capitol Hill who say the focus needs to be on that, Lindsay. Yeah, a lot of people think this is a distraction. Rachel Scott, our thanks to you as always. Now I want to bring in ABC's Jay O'Brien who's also on Capitol Hill. Uh, Jay, what are you hearing about McCarthy's strategy here? Uh, how is he going to try to hold on to his job? Well, he's got two tracks to look to hold on to his job here, Lindsay, in theory. One, he's got to talk to Republicans. As Rachel said, it's going to come down to Republican votes. As you alluded to, five is that magic number. Once he loses the fifth Republican, every Republican from number five onwards, he's got to try to offset, in theory, with Democratic votes. And I asked the Speaker earlier today, is he in conversations with Democrats about a potential mo motion to vacate? He told me... He doesn't need them. He's trying to project yeah. this air of confidence. It's unclear what he knows and what votes he thinks he has. But I can tell you, Lindsay, as Rachel just alluded to, I've been talking with what we call the usual suspects, the Republicans who often are a thorn in McCarthy's side who are critical of them. And the line I keep getting back is they're waiting to see. They're waiting to make their mind up. They haven't yet come out fully and saying that they're backing Gates yet. Again, as Rachel said, the number we right now have is four in including Gates, but you've got two days in theory before this vote were to happen. And you were there, of course, the night of the speaker vote. You saw how heated things got, very contentious between McCarthy and Gates, who was resistant to him taking the role of speaker in the first place. What is McCarthy saying about this challenge to his job? We know that he's saying bring it, but uh, what are you hearing about his strategy to really hold on to power? Well, the other thing we're hearing, too, is that this traces, remember, all the way back to the speaker fight. It traces back to a concession that McCarthy made to become the Speaker of the House, in which he lowered the threshold for the number of members it would take for him to be called to be ousted from his job. He lowered that threshold to one. Matt Gates is the one today. By the way, this is Kevin Gar McCarthy's response. Bring it on. Now, it, what we've asked Kevin McCarthy repeatedly is, do you want to change that rule when you ask about his strategy? Do you want to change the rule that creates only a one-person threshold to boot you out of your job because it might infect the workings of the House of Representatives? That's certainly the argument that McCarthy's allies are making. He said he doesn't like the rule. He doesn't view it as productive for the House, but it's unclear what his strategy would be to change it. Right now, he's got to survive this bid to take him out of his job. Very confident, though, with his response, simply bring it on. Jay O'Brien, our thanks to you, as always. Now to the latest legal battle involving Donald Trump. The former president and current Republican 2024 frontrunner chose to appear in a lower Manhattan court today for opening statements in New York State's $250 million fraud trial against him. Attorney General Letitia James had a front row seat to it all. She says the Trump organization profited for years by intentionally inflating the value of their properties to receive favorable bank rates. And while Trump may have kept quiet in front of the judge outside of the courtroom, he spoke several times defending his business empire and lashing out at the legal system. Here's ABC senior investigative correspondent Aaron Katursky. Tonight, former President Trump in court, stone-faced at the defense table for the opening of the civil trial that threatens to shatter the success story at the heart of his brand. New York Attorney General Letitia James in court, too, staring at Trump from her seat in the front row. She's accusing the former president of being a fraud and a liar. No matter how powerful you are, no matter how much money you think you may have, no one is above the law. 
On the bench, Judge Arthur N. Gorin, who has already dealt Trump a severe blow, ruling he did commit fraud, inflating his net worth by as much as $2.2 billion by overvaluing much of his real estate empire. It could mean Trump will have to give up control of his signature properties in New York. In court today, lawyers for the state arguing Trump lied year after year, and they had the receipts. Take the Trump Tower penthouse. The state says the Trump organization inflated its value by some $200 million, declaring it was 30,000 square feet. But the attorney general's team showed Trump's signature on a document certifying the apartment is actually a third that size, 11,000 square feet. And while Trump said Mar-a-Lago was worth up to $600 million, the state contends its assessed value is actually no more than $27 million. And they played video from the deposition of Trump's former lawyer and fixer Michael Cohen, who says he and former chief financial officer Alan Weisselberg artificially boosted the value of certain properties at Trump's direction if, say, he wanted to move up on the Forbes list of the wealthiest people. Mr. Trump would call Alan and I into the office and let's say it said he was worth six billion dollars well he wanted to be higher on the Forbes list and he then said I'm actually not worth six billion I'm worth seven in fact I think it's actually now worth eight with everything that's going on Alan and I were tasked with taking the assets increasing each of those asset classes in order to accommodate that eight billion dollar number Trump's lawyers said real estate values, even square footage, are subjective, and the Trump properties are Mona Lisa properties, suggesting they're priceless. Throughout opening statements, Trump's sitting with his arms crossed, shaking his head. He sometimes muttered under his breath, often whispering with his attorneys. He wasn't required to be in court today, but he came anyway, and several times spoke to reporters in the hallway, attacking Attorney General James and Judge Ngoran. Trump was given the option of a jury trial, but his lawyers didn't take it, and now his fate is in the hands of the judge. This is a judge that should be disbarred. This is a judge that should be out of office. Using familiar language from the Trump playbook. So very simply put, it's a witch hunt. It's a disgrace. Our thanks to Aaron Katursky. Now to the war in Ukraine tonight and a new warning from the Pentagon after Congress stripped money for Ukraine from the deal to keep the government running. ABC's Tom Sufi Burge reports from Ukraine. The Pentagon tonight warning that U.S. funding to provide arms and ammunition for the war in Ukraine is running low. Congress avoided a government shutdown in part by stripping $6 billion of funding for the war. Pentagon officials saying existing funds are dwindling to the point where the U.S. has already slowed down resupplying some of its own forces. The demand for weapons and munitions is staggering. New video showing the ferocity of the fight on the war's main southern front. Formidable Russian defences and firepower holding Ukraine back, with casualties mounting. Hospitals full of badly wounded soldiers. Taras losing an arm to an explosive drone after an assault on Russian positions went horribly wrong. Out of seven men in his unit, he believes four did not survive. The enemy's advantage is enormous, he tells us. It's why when our infantry advances, they just die. Lindsay, officials say there is hardly any money left for additional humanitarian and financial aid for Ukraine, but a new military aid package could come as soon as this week using existing funding. Lindsay? Tom, thank you. Still much more to get to tonight on Prime. Coming up, he's known as Hollywood royalty, but behind the scenes, his life was not always glamorous. Ed Begley Jr. tells us how his new memoir is revealing his personal struggles. The next, a deadly end to a church service after a roof collapses. Now there's an urgent search through the rubble for dozens of missing worshipers. Whenever news breaks, to crush the families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. NBC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. 
here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Reporting from outside the courthouse in Walterboro, South Carolina, I'm M. Wynn. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back. We're tracking several headlines around the world. The U.N. Security Council just voted to authorize the deployment of an intervention force in Haiti, first called for a year ago by Haiti's interim leader. The resolution put forward by the U.S. and Ecuador recognizes that the Kenyan government will lead the force, authorizing it to operate for one year with a scheduled review after nine months, according to an advanced copy reviewed by the Associated Press. The force is expected to comprise of less than 1,500 police officers for now, the vast majority of whom will come from Kenya alongside contributions from several Caribbean countries. A church roof collapsed during Sunday mass in a northern Mexican city, killing at least nine people and injuring 40, authorities said, with another 30 people still believed to be trapped under the debris. Rescuers and volunteers were seen removing debris, such as wooden pillars, with their bare hands as a priest gave instructions, while others raised their fists to call for silence as they tried to hear survivors under the rubble. Authorities in Zimbabwe are still searching for survivors trapped underground when a gold mine that was no longer used collapsed last week as some relatives started to lose hope their loved ones could be saved. Accidents in these mines are common in Zimbabwe where artisanal or small-scale miners defy authorities by mining in old shafts that are prone to collapse. Actor Ed Begley Jr. is Hollywood royalty, son of Oscar-winning actor Ed Begley. Ed has always wanted to follow in his father's footsteps. Begley has been in the industry for 46 years now and still going strong. In his new memoir, To the Temple of Tranquility and Step on It, Ed takes a deep dive into the ups and downs of family, addiction, activism, and redemption. To the Temple of Tranquility and Step on It, where'd you come up with that title? My friend Dick Stahl, a wonderful actor, an actor in TV and films, and on stage as an improv actor. But this one, I'm told, if the story I heard is correct, he said that in real life. He had, like me, been really motivated by the Beatles when they went to see the Maharishi and began pursuing different, you know, philosophical and spiritual paths and what have you. So he made arrangements to go to this ashram somewhere in Indonesia, in some little island somewhere called the Temple of Tranquility. But his flight was late leaving LAX. So he missed the flight in Hawaii that was going to the Philippines. And then he didn't get on the merchant marine vessel. He had booked a passage. So when he finally did get there and was much delayed, he ran up the dock, got a little rickshaw, and said to the driver, he said, the Temple of Tranquility and step on it. So I thought that was rather ironic and funny. So I thought it would be a good title, title of the book. You really talk a lot about addiction, failure, redemption. What was it like for you to revisit those experiences of your life? It's been good because a lot of it I've revisited many times over the years, but some I had not. So the keyboard in writing this became like a Ouija board that actually worked. I started, you know, taking notes for the different chapters in the book just to give to somebody else, to maybe my kids to archive so their kids, my grandkids, could know about my life, my father's life. And something I hadn't thought about in 30, 40 years just came to my mouth and came to the keyboard. Uh, you mentioned your father, uh, Oscar winner Ed Begley. Uh, how did he really shape your life and, and your character? 
My father was an incredible influence on me, very positive influence, because he was a guy that had made it as a factory worker in his 40s as an actor. He wanted to be an actor his whole life, but it didn't seem to be in the cards for him. So he worked hard and continued to work at a factory in, in Hartford, Connecticut, where he was born, called the Wire Mold Plant. And then he started to work in theater and then finally went to New York, made a career in theater and in radio and finally in films and TV. He was a very successful man in nearly every part of his life. I really loved my father. Tell us about your mom and, and how you learned just going to get your driver's license that the woman you always thought was your mother um, really wasn't your biological mother. It was a big shock, you know, and there was no big father knows best moment uh, involved when I learned it. We had gone to my dad's business manager's office and he had to get that document that you need to get your driver's license, the birth certificate. Hand it to me, I'm writing in the back of the car, I figured I better look at it, see how they wrote these things back in 1949 when I was born. Did they do it with a, a quill and some ink and a, from an ink pot? I mean, how, how, what does this look like? And then I saw on the birth certificate, there's no mother's name. I thought that odd, so I said to my dad who was driving, Dad, mm-hmm. Why is there no mother's name under my birth certificate? And he says, Amanda wasn't your mother. That was a woman I knew to be my mother because she had raised me, passed away when I was seven, and that was mom, only that was not the case. So there was no, hey son, sit down. No, and, no, okay. there was no pulling off the road even, he just kept driving. My dad certainly had his great attributes, but those kind, dealing with those kinds of things was not one of them. So you never asked why they didn't tell you? Why didn't they tell you from the beginning, Sandy's your mom? That's a good question. I, everybody's gone now. I don't really have an answer for that. So you I never asked? I, I never asked. You didn't ask certain questions in my household. I learned that my, my brother Tom was not my brother fairly late in life. My aunt got drunk one day at a party at my house and went over to my brother Tom and said, you know, you're not really my nephew. You're my son. Your dad raised you and she was drunk and she told him this. He went to my dad and it turned out it was true. I didn't learn that till I was about 25 years old. We were good at keeping secrets. And that's what happens when you numb things with drugs and alcohol. You think things should be kept uh, under lock and key, and maybe they shouldn't. You talk about the, the alcohol and the, and the drugs, and you really credit John Belushi for, for being your savior. He was. And, and, and how so? He and Judy took me out of the uh, conversation pit at the El Presidente Hotel in Durango, Mexico. I was drinking so much I became a source of concern for John Belushi. So I was really a quarter day alcoholic madman and uh, John was quite helpful in me getting sober. So a great comedian and uh, you know I don't like to focus on the, the problems he had in his sadly short life but uh, I had a lot myself and he, he and Judy both helped me with him. How did you end up becoming an environmentalist? I mean, today it's kind of in vogue for people to talk about saving the planet and climate change, global warming, but, but you've been really talking about this for, for decades. Because it was affecting me as a young man. I lived two decades, 20 years in that smoggy air in L.A. After two decades, I said, enough already. What, they're having something called Earth Day? What does that mean? How can I help? And, what are you going to do after that one That one day is great to celebrate the earth for one day. What about the other 364? And some of the organizers told me, said, well, what we intend to do is clean up the air in L.A. and clean up the water. And I knew both were true because I'd lived with the smog. It seared my lungs. So I got involved in 1970, and we've cleaned up a lot of the waterways. The air is not dirtier. It's cleaner in L.A. than it was in 1970. Now we still have people that we got to help today. People live near the ports of Long Beach and Los Angeles. People near the shipping centers, those fulfillment centers. There's now additional pollution because of those industries. We have to help those people, and I mean today, and we can do it. We've proven that we can do it. What would you like readers to take away from the book, and, and was there anything that, that you learned about yourself as you were writing it? I learned some lessons about addiction. You know, I certainly was addicted not just to drugs and alcohol when I got well in that area, but I had other addictions, gambling and philandering, you know, that were problematic in my life. So I sought help and got well in those areas too. And also, just philosophically, I devote a certain amount of time talking about getting serenity in some f manner in your life. Ed's new book, To the Temple of Tranquility and Step on It, is out tomorrow wherever books are sold. And still to come, amid a breast cancer diagnosis, many patients have to take on another fight, the difficult decisions about their future and families that many women have to make.
When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. From America's number one news comes the all new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. All right, here we go, you ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching? Watching Saturdays on ABC News Live. What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Welcome back. Fertility can become a second battle for many women who are already fighting breast cancer. Certain treatments can lead to infertility, giving some of those women yet another difficult set of decisions to make once they're diagnosed. Our Rebecca Jarvis has more. At 38 years old, Sarah Strimmel Bentley, a former Broadway performer turned yoga instructor, was in a new relationship and a picture perfect image of health until she found a lump the size of a walnut in her left breast. I got the biopsy results back that indeed I had stage two invasive ductal carcinoma and it was like time stopped and of course I was terrified. In the same breath, her doctor recommending an appointment with a fertility specialist. I had no idea that when you have breast cancer that you know your fertility would be affected. It was my dream. Uh, for as long as I can remember to be a mother. Studies have found that about half of young women with breast cancer say they'd like to have a child after completing the treatment. But some treatments, including certain types of chemotherapy, can affect fertility. We try to be extremely proactive when a young woman is diagnosed with breast cancer about preserving her fertility. Sarah undergoing two rounds of IVF with her then boyfriend James resulting in a single embryo. I feel so lucky that we have this chance to be able to, to make embryos before I go into treatment. Sarah holding on to hope and her positive spirit through rigorous rounds of surgery, chemo, and radiation. Through it all, her future baby remaining in sight despite the challenges. My oncologist had told me that Due to my age, my type of cancer, and the fact that we only had one shot, she said, you need to have a surrogate if you want to bring this baby to life. Sarah and her now husband, James, documenting their surrogacy journey every step of the way. Surrogacy is not a straight line and it is not easy. The Bentleys finally matching with Whitney, their surrogate. Leading up to finding out that the embryo transfer was successful was the longest two weeks of my life. That call was either going to be the best day of my life or the hardest news. I lost my mind. Oh my God. Oh my God. The most in incredible moment of my life. Now, the couple are eagerly awaiting the arrival of their baby boy. It's becoming real and we can't wait to meet the little guy. Just know that if you get diagnosed with breast cancer and you are a young woman, and you think your life is over, it is not. I'm so, so thankful to be here. Love her reaction. Our thanks to Rebecca Jarvis for bringing us that. And that is our show for tonight. I'm Lindsay Davis. ABC News Live is here for you all tonight with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on Hulu, Roku, the ABC News app, and of course, on abcnews.com. Have a great night. This is ABC News Live.
to the crush of families China. here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. You're along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. I think vulnerability is extremely powerful. This is an artist that I looked up to at one point. I never would have imagined that the ending would have been what it was. They do not shock me. The treatment was just so disgusting on everyone's part. Did Lizzo ever put her hands on you? No, she didn't get to that point. She attempted to come at me with her fist balled up. Lizzo is denying it all. Lizzo's legal limbo. You never, like, expect for it to turn into that. Now streaming on Hulu. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. This is Nightline. It was a major cultural phenomenon. The Victoria's Secret fashion show in its heyday was full of glitz and glamour, bejeweled bras, and over-the-top angel wings. Giselle, Heidi, and Tyra stomping down the runway. You look at all these gorgeous women just strutting in confidence, so much power and so much beauty. With iconic performances from Taylor Swift and Justin Bieber. But it all came crashing down in 2018 after a series of scandals, including controversial comments in vogue from one executive about transgender and plus size models. I knew I had a, a pretty sensational uh, interview on, on my hands. Pretty much from start to finish, I was uh, jaw on the floor. And as for the show itself, its models were getting skinnier and skinnier. We didn't see new talent. We didn't see diverse bodies. Selling the fantasy was more important than catering to everyday women. For years now, Victoria's Secret, which was once the largest lingerie retailer in the U.S., has tried to overhaul its image. The brand quickly moving away from the iconic scantily clad angels to naming ambassadors instead, including trans model Valentina Sampaio and athletes like Megan Rapino and Eileen Gu. I think it remains to be seen if these efforts are enough. Let's see that, you know, it's not just them jumping in on a trend, that this is actually something that's here to stay. Now it's rebranding its iconic show for the first time in five years, hoping to recapture some of its former magic with a more diverse and inclusive set of models, designers, and other creatives. Fashion is deep. Yeah. The new fashion show isn't really a fashion show at all. It's a feature-length documentary called The Tour 23. 
Rather than women being the objects of the gaze, they're in front of the camera, they're behind the camera. And I think that that goes a, a good way to reframing what the company stands for. The film marks a new chapter in the brand's history. I do believe that they want to achieve something greater and to the next level and do more for this community of women. But the question remains, is it too little, too late? The Victoria's Secret Fashion Show was first broadcast to the world in 1999 to much fanfare. Hey guys. She is nice. Oh. Hey. So this is what New York is all about, huh? Yeah. Baby got back, huh? Year after year, the lingerie became flashier, the stage grander, the acts bigger. As a model, your, your pinnacle was Victoria's Secret or Vogue or, you know, Sports Illustrated. At its peak, more than 10 million people tuned in. Um, I'm excited to see everyone. I'm excited to see all these beautiful girls strut. Nightline was behind the scenes at its last show in 2018, which the company touted as one of its most diverse yet. And I'm just so happy that Victoria's Secret is including models of color. We're celebrating diversity. We have angels from all over the world. I think diversity is so important. I mean, I wouldn't be doing it if I wasn't empowered. Still, many women felt as though the models never reflected the increasing diversity of the brand's target consumers. I would judge my body so harshly and really compare it to the women on that catwalk. I felt, why not just show a few more sizes on that runway or a few more ages? Like, what's, what's so wrong about that? And then it completely went the opposite way. It went very young and it went skinnier, if possible. I mean... I was so disappointed. I stopped loving them as a brand. Australian model Robin Lawley, once a huge fan of the show who even auditioned for it twice, has long been critical of Victoria's Secret and what it represented to many young women around the world. If you're walking Victoria's Secret if you're in that fashion show, you weren't eating. You know, these girls were going to crazy lengths to walk that runway. I mean, some of them weren't even drinking water you know, because it was like muscle definition on their bodies. In 2018, she started an online petition urging people to boycott the Victoria's Secret fashion show, writing, as women, I want us all to join together and say, I am enough, I am beautiful, I am unique, and I want to see my body shape represented in your shows. I remember how I felt as a teenager by watching such shows and not seeing my body represented. I have a daughter and I wouldn't want my daughter to go through that at all. You know, I'm not going to let her go through that. But for Robin, Victoria's Secret's efforts to change its image feel hollow. I think the rebranding for me personally is a little bit too late. I do want them to change, but I want the show back. <laughs> I don't want it in TV form. I want the actual show back, and I want them doing that down that runway to an audience like they used to do. The criticism goes beyond just a lack of inclusivity. In 2018, a longtime powerful senior executive, Ed Razik, made controversial comments in a Vogue interview, saying Victoria's Secret doesn't hire, quote, transsexuals for their iconic runway show because the show is a fantasy. Nicole Phelps wrote that 2018 Vogue article. The interview that we published came out the morning of the show of the show taping in 2018. But by the time uh, the show would have come around the following year, the, the company decided to cancel the show. There had been growing criticism. Razik later apologized for his, quote, insensitive remarks and resigned the next year. I think the brand got in trouble saying that they weren't representative of all types of bodies. You know, it didn't make all women feel sexy. It just made a certain category of women feel sexy. And that's a problem when you're talking about something as intimate and as personal as lingerie. But for all its efforts to move past the controversies, public perception of the brand is still on shaky ground. Since going public in the summer of 2021, Victoria's Secret stock price has been on the downward trend. They have to play catch up to the brands that came out saying, we see you and we represent you and we have something for you. And we're not going to make you feel ashamed of what your body looks like in its most intimate shape. Victoria's Secret has to start from ground zero with that. I do think our generation is becoming more and more conscious about our 
purchasing choices. We think about、um, what kind of image are they trying to portray, and we think about diversity a lot. 25-year-old social media influencer Zoe thinks the company can bounce back. I think it still holds a lot of power in the market and in the culture. So, if it were to make a comeback and be a little bit more inclusive, it will do a lot of greatness for the new generation of young girls, where they feel like. Their body is beautiful in one way or another. Still, she says there is a certain nostalgia for the former years. Why can't these women have the same type of glam outfits and wings as the prior runway shows? I feel like Victoria's Secret, if anything, they're trying to steer away from that to show their new image. But it just so happened that people also really miss the old image that they have, and they just wish to see it on more diverse individuals. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers in Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat four storm. Here along I five. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, anytime, anywhere, streaming 24/7, straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is what would you do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, two to six Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Get ready, America! Every Friday, the hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes, and save big time too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're gonna love it. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight, we are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today? YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about: the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward, with some fun in between. A real-life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wiener Mobile. First thing in the morning. America this morning. America's number one early morning news on ABC News Live. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. As a fashion designer and artist, I'm really big on Black female identity. So everything that I do has a deeper meaning to it, and it's seen in the collections that I create. Asha Daniels is a fashion designer with a passion for making inclusive clothing. Now she's coming forward as a new accuser with her own story about working as part of Lizzo's The Special Tour. As a Black woman in the industry, whenever I kind of suffer an abuse or a injustice, I've kind of taken it on the chin and kind of just gone back to work. 
While she never interacted with the star directly, she's accusing the star's team of racial and sexual harassment. I'm coming into work with someone who has physically assaulted me, with someone who's threatened me, someone who is not allowing me to go eat when I need to eat. I think it's extremely damaging in the court of public opinion because of the image that we've all believed Lizzo to be. Daniel's complaints are part of a growing list of legal actions mounting against the pop star. Back in July, three dancers filed a lawsuit against the singer and her production company, alleging sexual and racial harassment, even assault, plus creating a hostile work environment. Lizzo is denying it all, defiant for all to see. From shopping sprees in Beverly Hills to popping up at Beyonce's show in LA. For years, Lizzo has been known for promoting body positivity and self-love. Okay, oh. With songs like About Damn Time. It's about damn time. I think vulnerability is sexy. I think vulnerability is extremely powerful. That's why, you know, you see me in my most vulnerable state. I was already a fan of her message about love, about women's empowerment, about black women's empowerment. And so I was really excited to get to design for this world stage where such a beautiful message was going to be delivered every night. I decided to go with this white lace. Daniels had already proven her chops on Project Runway. Seeing my look come down the runway, I am like, yes, God, honey. Later, starting her own line. You look beautiful. And eventually finding her way to Lizzo's tour in February. I feel very pretty. But within her first few days on the job, Daniel says things weren't quite as beautiful as she'd hoped. In particular, with Amanda Nomura, a supervising agent for Lizzo. She says she was helping her move a clothing rack when things started to go awry. She rolls over my foot with this really heavy rack. And so I kind of like wince and I'm like, wait a minute, my foot is really hurting. Like, yeah. I need to stop, I need to sit down. And so she pushes me into the rack and she says, don't make excuses, like take this rack. According to the claims in the lawsuit, Daniels claims due to being shoved, she lost her balance and rolled her ankle, which led her to wearing more comfortable shoes the next day to minimize the pain. She alleges Nomura demanded that she change into tennis shoes. And so I'm stunned because I've never had anyone put their hands on me, especially in a workplace, um, and of all places on tour with Lizzo. The only thing that's different be between how she interacted with me and how I saw her interact with other people is that I was a black woman, and she felt like she could get away with treating me that way. But Daniel says Nomura wasn't the only staff member who was unprofessional. She says the tour was an overly sexual workplace, pointing to one alleged incident in a team group chat with Lizzo staffers. You say in the lawsuit that there was a group chat with nearly three dozen people, more than 30 people, and there were times that what was discussed made you uncomfortable. There is a picture that was sent to all 30 plus of us of a porn star who was erect and his genitalia was out. Management was in that group chat as well. Nobody reprimanded the person who sent it. Daniel says she was inspired by the three young dancers who were also suing Lizzo to tell her own story about working for the star. When I saw them speak up, I thought that's what Strong looks like. And I was really proud of them because I knew how toxic the work culture was on that tour uh, firsthand. The two lawsuits are now renewing scrutiny about Lizzo. We reached out to Lizzo and her attorney to sit down with us. They declined. Daniels claims she heard a senior staffer on Lizzo's team mocking the girls and even Lizzo herself in a racist way. You say that uh, Amanda would allegedly mock Lizzo. Yeah, Amanda would regularly mock both Lizzo and the big girls, and she would re refer to them as fat or just like a bevy of like really inappropriate things, useless, lazy. And I told her like, this is actually really offensive. And you know, she just laughed it off. Most of your allegations are against Amanda Nomura. What about Lizzo herself? Since you never interacted with her, how much responsibility do you think she has in all of this? I'm a business owner myself, and I was so shocked that Lizzo's workplace wasn't in line with who we know as the star Lizzo. So 
I can say in my own life, I'm responsible for the people who work for me and who work on my projects. And I think that everybody is. Asha was let go by Lizzo's tour manager just a few weeks after joining the team. We reached out to Amanda Nomura for comment. She didn't respond. I think being famous puts a target on your back, but I think anyone who's known online, if there's a parasocial relationship that someone has with the public, there's always a risk of something happening. Lizzo recently received a humanitarian award from the Black Music Action Coalition, where some of her dancers introduced her talking about her positive impact on them. For a lot of us, you know, um, she was the first person to ever believe in us and actually just like show us love and believe in our talent and our craft. And we thank you so much for that. Yeah. Thank you so much. The singer later said in her acceptance speech. And I'm going to continue to put on and represent and create safe spaces for black fat women. On the day that Lizzo received that award, a spokesperson for Lizzo sent Impact a statement saying in part that Asha Daniels' lawyer tries to sully this honor by recruiting someone to file a bogus, absurd publicity stunt lawsuit who, wait for it, never actually met or even spoke with Lizzo. We will pay this as much attention as it deserves. None. Would you ever go on tour with another artist? Absolutely never. <laughs> really? Yeah. I want a world where black women can come and perform at the height of their career for their talent and not suffer these abuses and not be silenced and not be treated unfairly. Our thanks to Janae. For more, the full episode of Lizzo's Legal Limbo is now streaming on Hulu. Clean my room until I got high. <laughs> it was the beginning of a new millennium when a rapper by the name of Afro Man climbed to the top of the charts with a song like None of Its Kind. Then came Crazy Rap, and a year later, a Grammy nomination. Singing them dirty rap songs. Stop and hit the block. I got this one done. I'm going to wear this to my son's basketball game. Fast forward two decades later, this is life for Afro Man now, living in Winchester, Ohio, playing the songs that made him famous. But he also has some new tunes. Will you help me repair my game? Will you help me repair my door? Baby, pound game. These days, Afro Man isn't just singing about weed. He's also rapping about his experience with police. Why you disconnected my video camera? Did you find what you was looking for? How long did it take you to write that song? To be fair, maybe a good 30 minutes. I just, uh, I think I just wanted to say whatever I was feeling. Most rappers, when they portray the police, they have to hire actors. Thanks to the Adams County Sheriff Department, they saved me a whole lot of money. They came over here with guns to kill me. The best thing I came up with was write songs about my experience and try to sell them and make some money to pay for the destruction that they brought to my house. On August 21st last year, deputies from the Adams County Sheriff's Department pulled up in front of Afro Man's house in Winchester. I was driving home. Like, I don't know, like 65 miles away from home, I get a call. My kids was next door playing in the yard when they could see the police officers pulling up. Armed with long guns and wearing tactical gear, the officers kicked down the door and entered the property. The whole thing playing out on Afro Man's security cameras. Afro Man says he watched his house get raided right from his phone. No matter how hard you try to be a law-abiding citizen, this is how, you know, America treats you, you know, like... You know, I felt powerless. The warrant obtained for this raid lists some serious allegations, evidence of drug possession and trafficking, as well as kidnapping. 
It also states that the police received a tip from a confidential informant who had seen large amounts of weed and money at the property and claimed Afro Man kept women locked in his basement. I didn't get charged. I didn't kidnap. I don't know where they got that. You know what I'm saying? And I think they just made it up. And I talked to the head officer. I asked him uh, if I was under arrest. He said no. Then I asked him, were there any charges? He said no. Then I asked him if he would help me put my door back on the hinges and help me fix my gate. And uh, that's when he cracked a little smile and said, we're not required to do that. And that's their way of just letting you know that that's how it is and you can't do nothing about it. So I got to start from right there and figure out what's my move. The Adams County Sheriff kicked down my door. Afro Man went on and wrote three songs about the incident. Using the security camera video, he then released a music video that quickly went viral. Lemon pound cake, he want to put down his glass. Lemon pound cake, trending on TikTok. 